the marvelous grimoire of the Chateau de Dampierre, in the Santon region to which Cologne belongs sur la Tise, the chief town of the canton where the beautiful home of Louis de Stissac once stood, the informed tourist can discover another castle, that of Dampierre sur Bouton, whose conservation and the importance of a singular decoration make it more interesting, that of Dampierre sur Bouton, Charenton Ferrier. Built at the end of the 15th century, and under Francois of Clermont, the castle of Dampierre is currently the property of Mr. Dr. Texier, of St. Jean Dangely. By the abandonment and variety of symbols that he offers, as much as by the enigmas, to the sagacity of the researcher, it deserves to be better known. We are happy to signal it particularly to the attention of the disciples of Hermes. Externally, its architecture, although elegant and of good taste, remains very simple and has nothing remarkable. But there are buildings like certain men, their discreet dress, the modesty of their appearance often serves only to veil what they have of superior. Among the round towers, capped with conical roofs and machicolations, extends a Renaissance body of buildings whose facade opens to the outside by ten arched arcades. Five of them form a covered walkway on the ground floor, while the five others, stacked on the preceding ones, at the first stage. These openings light the access galleries to the interior rooms, and the whole thus offers the appearance of a large loggia crowning an ambulatory of a cloister. Such is the humble cover of the magnificent album whose stone leaves garnish the vaults of the high gallery, P.L. 23. But, what is known today about the one who was the constructor of these new buildings intended to replace the old feudal castle of the Chateau Biard? It is almost certain, and we share the opinion of Léon Palustre, that the coffered ceiling of the high gallery, where, at least, Dampierre, was executed in 1545 or 1546 at the latest. This is without considering the attribution that has been made of this work to certain characters, notable sainter, who are completely foreign to it. Certain authors indeed, who completely ignore them, claim that the emblematic motifs emanated from Claude de Clermont, Baron of Dampierre, armor-bearer of Ardres, Colonel of Grison and gentleman of the Chamber of the King. However, in his Life of Illustrious Ladies, Brantome tells us that Claude de Clermont fell from the King of England and the King of France, and died in 1545. He could not have ambushed by the enemy, unless the works executed after his death. For little that one does in his daughter, Mrs. de Vivonne, Lady of the Castle Jane of Vivonne, André de Vivonne's daughter, Lord of the Châtelaine, Jean d'Estissac, Counselor and Chamberlain of the King, Seneschal of Poitou, etc., and of Louise de Dion du Lude, was born in 1520. She remained a widow at 25. Her spirit, her distinction, her high virtue acquired such a reputation that, like Brantome, praising the extent of her erudition, Léon Palustre gives her the honor of being the instigator of the Bari Leafs of Dampierre. It is, he says, that Jean de Vivon amused herself to have executed, by these sculptures, a whole series of compositions with more or less merit. Finally, a third attribution does not even deserve to be retained. The abbot Nagues, putting forward the name of Claude Catherine de Clermont, daughter of Claude and Jean de Vivon, emits an opinion absolutely unacceptable. As Palustre says, this future lady of Dampierre, born in 1543, was a child at the time the works were completed. Thus, not to commit an anachronism, one is obliged to attribute to Jean de Vivon alone the paternity of the symbolic decorations commissioned at Dampierre. And yet, some incredibly claim the impossibility of finding it. It is not impossible to smile, to recognize a 28-year-old woman in the enigma, who was the sole beneficiary of a science demanding a double effort of rigorous observance. Enduring more than twice the solid and sustained studies, and despite all the rules that she despised, in her persevering neglect, in spite of the oral initiation of some unknown artist, there remains less that she would have failed to control. By a laborious, tenacious, and personal effort, the truth of this mentor, or, rather, the series of experiences, of essays, of attempts demanding constant assiduity, the abandonment of all affairs, of all relations, of all exterior preoccupation. The voluntary reclusion, the renunciation of the world are indispensable to observe with benefit, with the necessary prudence, the notions of this symbolic science, still more secret, which covers and hides from the vulgar. Jean de Vivon, did she submit herself to the exigencies of a formidable mistress, prodigal of infinite treasures, but intrusive and despotic, wanting to be loved exclusively for herself, imposing on her adorers a blind obedience, a fidelity to all proof? We find nothing in her that can justify such a concern. On the contrary, her life was uniquely mundane. Admitted to the court, Brantome writes, at the age of eight years, she was journeying, had no fixed home, and if she had any property, all had left no trace, and you will not find it again. 
she seems to take singular pleasure in work, for she knew all of her time and of the past, so well that her language was taken as an oracle. Also, King Henry III and the last made her lady of honor of the realm, her see, living at court, she sees successively five monarchs on the throne, Francis I, Henry II, Francis II, Charles IX and Henry III. Her virtue, known and reputed to the point of being respected by the Reverend Talamant de Rayo, about her knowledge, it is exclusively historical. Facts, anecdotes, chronicles, biographies constitute the only luggage. It was definitely a woman of excellent memory, having listened a lot, retained a lot, had a good mind, Brantome, the biographer, speaking of Mrs. de Dampierre, says that she was and is true register of the court. The image is speaking, Jean de Vivon was an educated, pleasant to consult, we do not doubt it, but also what else? Entered so young into the intimacy of the sovereigns of France, what else could she have been but a resident, more or less, at the castle of Dampierre? Such was the question we asked ourselves. Leafing through the beautiful collection of Jules Robichon, one comes across a note by Mr. Georges Mousset, former student of the School of Chartes and member of the Society of Antiquaries of the West, which appropriately came to support and bolster our conviction. But, writes G. Mousset, here are unpublished documents complicating the question and seeming to create impossibilities. A vow to Dampierre is made to the king, at the sound of the bell of Niort, on the 9th of October 1547, on the arrival of Henry II. The avowals are Jacques de Clermont, legitimate usufructuary of the land, and Francois de Clermont, his emancipated son, for the new propriety. The duty consists of a ubeau and a roebuck without a foal. From this act, it seems to result, one degree that it is not Jean de Vivon who enjoyed Dampierre, nor her daughter Catherine who owned it. Two degrees that Claude de Clermont had a young brother, Francois, emancipated minor in 1547. It did not take place, however, to suppose that Claude and Francois would be the same person, since Claude made peace during the campaign of Boulogne, finished, we know, by the treaty between Francois I and Henry VIII, on June 7, 1546. But then what became of Francois, who is not indicated by Anselm? What happened, relative to this land, from 1547 to 1558? How, from such a beautiful association of incapacities from the point of view of possession, usufructuaries or minors, could come such a luxurious habitation. These are mysteries that we cannot clarify. It is already much, we believe, to glimpse these difficulties. Thus the opinion is confirmed that the philosopher to whom we owe all the embellishments of the castle, paintings and sculptures, remains unknown to us and perhaps will remain so forever. In a spacious room on the first floor, one notices especially a large and very beautiful fireplace, gilded and covered with paintings. Unfortunately, the main surface of the mantle has been lost, under an awful reddish coating, the subjects that decorated it. Only a few isolated letters remain visible in its lower part. On the other hand, both sides have retained their decoration and make us deeply regret the loss of the main composition. On each of these sides, the motif is similar. One can see appearing, in the high part, a forearm whose hand holds a raised sword and a balance towards the middle of the sword winds the central part of a floating phylactery, adorned with the inscription. That justice freeness of purpose. The just man gives reins to the proud. Two gold chains, connected at the top of the balance, and at the bottom, one with a collar of a molasses, the other with the carcass of a dragon whose tongue hangs out through the open mouth. Both lower their heads and direct their gazes toward the hand. The two plates of the balance carry rolls of gold coins. One of these rolls is marked with the letter L topped with a crown. On another, there is a small balance with, underneath it, the image of a menacing dragon. Above these large motifs, that is to say at the upper end of the side faces, two medallions are painted. The first shows a Maltese cross, flanked at the corners by fleur de lis the second bears the effigy of a graceful figure. As a whole, this composition presents itself as a paradigm of hermetic science. Dog and dragon hold the place of the two material principles, assembled and retained by the gold of the sages according to the required proportion and natural balance, as the image of the balance indicates to us. The hand is that of the artisan, firm to maneuver the sword, hieroglyph of the fire that penetrates, mortifies, changes the properties of things, prudent in the distribution of materials according to the rules of philosophical weight and measure. As for the rolls of gold coins, they clearly indicate the nature of the final result and one of the objectives of the work. The mark formed by an L crown has always been the conventional sign charged, in the graphic notation, to designate the gold of projection, that is to say alchemically fabricated. Equally expressive are the small medallions, one of which represents nature, 
which must constantly serve as a guide and mentor to the artist, while the other proclaims the quality of Rosequa that the learned author of these varied symbols had acquired. The heraldic fleur de lis, in effect, corresponds to the hermetic rose, joined to the cross, it serves, like the rose, to instruct and emblazon the knight practicing with divine grace, realize the philosopher's stone. But, if this emblem has the virtue of proving that the adept unknown of Dampierre, it also serves to convey to us the vanity of the attempts that we might make in the search for his true personality. It is known why the rose croix are called invisible, it is therefore likely that, from his environment, ours had to surround himself with indispensable precautions, illustrious actions, a magnanimous heart, a glorious renown that does not end in disgrace, a modest fortune well acquired, honorably amassed and always regarded as a gift from God, this is what cannot be reached by injustice and envy, and what must be forever, for the family, a glory and an example. As for this text, long disappeared, Mr. Dr. Texier has been willing to communicate some details to us. The Latin inscription that you mentioned, used to exist on a beam in a room on the first floor, which fell about 60 or 80 years ago. The inscription was high, but the fragment of beam, where it was painted in golden letters, has been lost. My father-in-law, to whom the chateau belonged, remembers it very well. Paraphrase of Solomon in Ecclesiastes, where it is said, ch. 3, v. 13, that everyone should eat and drink, and enjoy the benefits of all his labor, for it is a gift from God, this piece definitively and positively suffices to explain what was the mysterious occupation under the mantle, the enigmatic Chatelaine of Dampierre. The inscription revealed, in its author, a wisdom quite uncommon. No laborer, whatever he may be, can procure a better ease of life. The worker receives from nature even the full salary to which he is entitled, and it is accounted to him pro rata according to his ability, his efforts, his perseverance. And as practical science has always been recognized as a true gift from God by all holders of the magisterium, the fact that this profession of faith considers the acquired fortune as a gift from God is enough to uncover the alchemical origin. Its regular and honorable growth would, in these conditions, surprise no one to take all measures proper to dissimulate his identity. He wanted that man to fade before science and that his stone work contained no other signature than the high, but anonymous, title of the Rosicrucianism and of the adept. At the ceiling of the same room where the large fireplace we pointed out stands, there was once a beam adorned with this curious Latin inscription. Factorum claritas fortis animus secundus fama sine vilifine cursus modici opes beni parti innocent or amplificati semper abita numera de sunt extra invidia invidias positi aeternum ornamentum et exemplum opid suos futura. Distinguished actions, a magnanimous heart, a glorious renown that does not end in shame, a modest fortune well acquired, honorably and always regarded as a gift from God, here is what cannot be reached by injustice and envy, and what must be eternally, for the family, a glory and an example. Regarding this text, which has long since disappeared, Mr. the Dr. Texier has kindly communicated to us some clarifications. The inscription that you speak of, he tells us, existed on a beam of a room on the first floor, which, falling from old age, was changed 60 or 80 years ago. The high relief inscription, where it was painted in golden letters, has been lost. My father-in-law, to whom the chateau belonged, remembers having seen it. Paraphrase of Solomon in Ecclesiastes, where it is said, ch. 3, v. 13, that everyone should eat and drink, and enjoy the fruits of all his labor, for it is a gift from God. This piece definitely determines in a positive way what was the mysterious occupation under the cloak the enigmatic lord of Dampierre. The inscription, revealed, reveals, according to its author, a wisdom quite uncommon. No laborer, whatever he may be, can procure an easy better acquired. The worker receives from nature even the salary to which he is entitled, and this one is counted to him in proportion to his skill, of his efforts, of his perseverance. And as practical science has always been recognized as a true gift from God by all possessors of the master's degree, the fact that this profession of faith considers the acquired fortune as a gift from God has been enough to discover the alchemical origin. Its regular and honorable increase should, under these conditions, surprise no one. Two other inscriptions emanating from the same home deserve to be reported here. The first, painted on the mantelpiece of a fireplace, includes a dozen lines that dominate a subject composed of the letter H, holding two Ds intertwined and adorned with human figures, seen in profile, one of an old man, the other of a young man. This little piece, cheerfully written, exalts a happy existence, marked by calm and serene benevolence, the hospitality that our philosopher in his seductive lodgings. Dulce, E-S-T, L-A, Vi, A, L-A, 
Yan, Spiever, Emmy, Soye, Prin.Tans, Soye, Hivers, Sobs, Blanche, Nej, Of, Remix, Ver, Van, Brees, Amos, Noves, L.A., Font, Vivra, Ains, Lever, Place, Atoffs, E.S.T., E.C., Com, A.V.X., Vfls, A.V.X., Jevons, of C, or, sweet, is, the, life, to, the, good, follow, among, b, springtime, b, winters, under, white, snow, or, green, branches, when, true, friends, make, us, live, thus, there, place, to, all, is, here, as, to, Old, too. Young, also. The second, which adorns a larger chimney covered with red, gray, and gold ornaments, is a simple maxim of a noble character, but which humanity superficial and presumptuous of our time refuses to practice. S.E. Cognister. Est. E.T. Non. Brester. Or. To be known, to be, and not to seem. Our adept is right. Self-knowledge allows to acquire science, but also the reason for being alive basis of all real value, and this power, lifting the laborious man who can acquire it, encourages him to remain in a modest and noble simplicity, eminent virtue of the superior spirits. It was an axiom that the teachers repeatedly told their disciples, and by which they indicated to them the only way to achieve supreme knowledge. If you want unique wisdom, they would say, know yourself well and you will be recognized. The high gallery, whose ceiling is so curiously adorned, occupies the entire length of the building raised between the towers. It is lit, as we have said, by five bays separated by squat columns, equipped on the inside with engaged supports receiving the falling of arches. Two windows with straight mullions and rectilinear lintels open at the ends of this gallery. Transverse ribs follow the subarched form of the bays and are intersected by two longitudinal ribs, parallel, thus determining the framing of the coffers that are the subject of our study, pl. 24. These were, well before described to us by Louis Audiot, but the author, ignorant of the science to which they refer, and the essential reason that links the bizarre images, has endowed his book with an incoherent character that the figures themselves affect the profane. To read the epigraphy Santoni, it would seem that whim, fantasy and extravagance presided over their execution. Also, the least we can say about this work is that it appears crafted without seriousness, lacking in depth, with a Baroque style, without any other interest than a few serious, unfounded, inexplicable errors adding to its excessive singularity. Certain improprieties further contribute to the unfavorable impression it receives. It is thus, for example, that the author takes a cubic stone, cut and placed on the water, series I, coffer 5, for a ship, tossed by the waves, elsewhere, series 4, coffer 7, a bent woman, planting nuts near a tree, becomes for him a traveler painfully making his way through a desert. In the first coffer of the fifth series, the editors forgive him this involuntary comparison, he sees a woman instead of the devil in person, veiled, winged, horned, perfectly clear and visible. Such mistakes denote an inexcusable carelessness on the part of an epigraphist aware of his responsibility and the exactitude demanded by his profession. Almost all the emblematic compositions feature, on the outside of a subject sculpted in bar relief, an inscription engraved on a phylactery. However, while the image directly relates to the practical side of science, the epigraph offers primarily a moral or philosophical meaning. It addresses the worker rather than the work, and sometimes employing the apothem, sometimes the parable, defines a quality, a virtue that the artist must possess, a point of doctrine that he should not ignore. Now, for the very reason that they are provided with phylacteries, these figures reveal their secret scope, their affectation to some hidden science. Indeed, the Greek phi upsilon lambda alpha kappa tau rho iota omicron nu, phylacterian, formed from phi upsilon lambda sigma sigma omega, phylaso, garter, preserver, and tau eta rho omega, terio, conserve, indicates the function of this ornament, charged with conserving, preserving the occult and mysterious sense hidden behind the natural expression of the compositions that accompany it. It is the sign, the seal of that wisdom that keeps watch, against the wicked, as Plato says, sigma omega phi rho omicron sigma nu eta phi upsilon lambda alpha kappa, so for synphilate, whether or not an epigraph, it is enough to find the phylactery on any subject to be assured that the image contains a hidden meaning, 
a secret significance proposed to the seeker and marked by its simple presence. And the truth of this meaning, the reality of this significance is always found in the hermetic science, qualified among the ancient masters of eternal wisdom. One should not be surprised to encounter banners and parchments, abundantly represented among the attributes of religious scenes or profane compositions of our great cathedrals, as well as in the less severe framework of civil architecture. Arranged in three rows, particularly along the axis, the carvings of the high gallery number 93. Of these, 61 are related to science, 24 offer monograms destined for the separated parts by series, 4 present only ornaments of geometrical figures, devoid of any figurative meaning, and the last four display a bare and smooth table. These last emblems, on which the interest of the place of Dampierre focuses, constitute a set of figures spread out in seven series. Each series is isolated from the following one by three coffers, arranged in a transverse line, alternately decorated with the monogram of Henry II and intertwined crescents of Diana of Poitiers or of Catherine de' Medici, figures that one remarks in quantity on edifices of the same period. Now, we have made this observation, quite surprising, that the majority of hotels or castles bearing the double D linked to the letter H and the triple crescent have an undeniable alchemical character. But why are these same lodgings qualified with the title of castles of Diane de Poitiers by the authors of monographs and on the sole existence of the figure in question? However, neither the residence of Louis de Stissac at coulanges sur lautais nor that of Clermont, both placed under the aegis of the two famous favorite, have ever belonged to him. On the other hand, what reason could be given for the monogram and crescents that would be of a nature to justify their presence in the middle of hermetic emblems? What thought, what tradition could the initiates of the nobility have obeyed, placing under the fictive protection of a monarch and his concubine, objects of general reprobation, their work hieroglyphically painted or sculpted? Henry II, a sly one, brutal and of profound insouciance, wrote the abbot of Montgaiar, this bad king who constantly fought for the good of his peoples, but what can one make of this? Different is the truth, for the crescent does not belong either to Diane de Poitiers, nor to Catherine de Medici. It is a symbol of the moon known to the ancient Egyptians and Greeks, used by the Saracens well before its introduction in the West. It is the attribute of Isis, of Artemis or of Diane, of Selene, or of the moon, symbolizing the alchemical silver and the color white. Its spagyric significance is triple, alchemical, magical, cabalistic, and this triple hierarchy of meaning synthesized in the image of intertwined crescents, encompasses the extent of the ancient and traditional knowledge. Thus, it is less surprising to see this triad symbol alongside obscure signs, since they offer a support and allow the investigator to orient themselves towards the science to which they belong. As for the monogram, it is easily explainable and shows, once again, how the philosophers have used emblems of known significance, conferring upon them a special meaning generally ignored. It is the surest way they had to mask the science exposed figuratively to all looks, a renewed process revealed by the Egyptians whose teaching, translated into hieroglyphs on the exterior of temples, remained a dead letter for those who did not have the key. The historical monogram is formed from the two Ds, intertwined and united by the letter H, initial of Henri II. It is, at least, the ordinary expression of the cipher which veils, under its image, a whole other thing. It is known that alchemy is based on the physical metamorphoses operated by the spirit, a term given to the universal dynamism emanating from divinity, which maintains life and movement, and which can evoke the beginning and the end, substance and its negation, animate matter or what we call spirit. In this, the Latin notation differs not from the letter H of the Latins and of the Greeks. We will give further information later on, when studying one of the coffers where this crowned figure appears, series 7, 2, some of whose applications are symbolic. For the moment, it suffices to know that the work, being universal, consists in the realization of the work, in the principle unknown which ensures full success. But this one, going beyond the bounds of human understanding, can only be acquired through divine revelation. God, repeat the masters, gives wisdom to whom he pleases and transmits it through the Holy Spirit, light of the world. This is why science is said to be a gift of God, once reserved for his ministers, from where the name of sacerdotal art which it originally bore. Let us add that in the Middle Ages the gift of God was applied to the Secretum Secretorum, which precisely comes back to the secret par excellence, that of the universal spirit. Thus, the Donum Dei, knowledge revealed by the science of the great work, key to the materializations of the spirit and of the light Eta Lambda Iota Omicron Sigma, Helios, appears unmistakably under the monogram of the double D, Donum Dei, joined to the sign of the spirit, H, Greek initial of the sun, father of the light, Helios. 
one could not better indicate the alchemical character of the figures of Dampierre, which we are now going to undertake to study. 4. Case in 1. Two trees of the same dimension and seemingly similar thickness are depicted side by side on the same ground. One is green and vigorous, the other inert and withered. The banner that seems to unite them carries these words. Dot sore. Non. Omnibs. Eth. Fate is not equal for all. This truth, limited to the period of human existence, seems all the more relative as destiny, whether sad or smiling, tranquil or tumultuous, leads us all, without distinction or privilege, towards death. But if we transpose it into the hermetic domain, it then takes on a clearly positive meaning and one that had to ensure preference by our adept. According to alchemical doctrine, common metals, stripped of their state to meet the needs of industry, forced to bend to the demands of man, thus appear as the victims of a flagrant ill fortune. Whereas in their mineral state they lived at the bottom of the rock, evolving imperceptibly towards the perfection of native gold, they are condemned by our hasty appetite for extraction and persist under the harmful action of the reducing fire. Casting, extraction, and sintering kill them with nutritive elements associated with mineralizers charged with enhancing their activity, kills them by fixing the temporary and transient form they had acquired. Such is the meaning of the two symbolic trees, one expressing mineral vitality and the other metallic inertia. From this simple image, the intelligent and sufficiently instructed investigator of the art's principles can draw a useful and profitable consequence. If he remembers that the old masters recommend to begin the work precisely where nature has finished its own, if he knows how to revive the same dead, he will certainly discover which metal he must choose and which mineral he must elect to begin the first labor. Then, reflecting on the operations of nature, he will learn from it how to unite the revivified body to another living body, for life desires to be linked with life, and, if he has understood us, he will see with his eyes and will touch with his hands the material testimony of a great truth. These are the two succinct words, no doubt, and we regret it, but our submission to the rules of the traditional discipline does not allow us to specify them further or to develop them more. Case in 2, a fortress tower, built on an ice rink, crowned with battlements and machicolations, provided with murder holes and topped with a dome, is pierced by a narrow grilled window and a door solidly bolted. This edifice, of a powerful and forbidding aspect, receives from the clouds a downpour that the inscription describes as being a shower of gold. .avro.clavza.patent Or in English closed with gold, they open. Put another way, gold opens locked doors. Everyone knows this. But this proverb, which is the basis of privilege, of favoritism, and of all bypasses, should not, in the philosopher's mind, be understood in the literal sense we know. It is not corruptible gold that is at issue here, but rather the mytho-hermetic episode that contains the fable of Jupiter and Danae. The poets tell us that this princess, daughter of the king of Argos, Acrisius, was locked in a tower because an oracle had announced to her father that he would be killed by his grandson. Now, the walls of a prison, no matter how thick, could not constitute a serious obstacle to the will of a god, Zeus, great lover of adventures, and of metamorphoses, always preoccupied with evading the vigilance of Hera and extending his progeny, noticed Danae. Unencumbered by the choice of means, he introduced himself to her in the form of a shower of gold, and, at the expiration of the required term, the prisoner gave birth to a son who received the name of Perseus. Acrisius, displeased with this news, had the mother and the child locked in a chest that was thrown into the sea. Carried by the currents to the island of Seraphos, the fisherman retrieved the singular vessel, and opened it. Beneath this magnificent story lies an important secret, that of the preparation of the hermetic subject, or the primary matter of the work, and the obtaining of sulfur, the prima materia of the stone. Danae represents our raw mineral, as extracted from the mine. It is the earth of the sages which contains within it the active and hidden spirit, capable, Hermes says, of realizing by these things the miracles of a single thing. Danae indeed comes from the Doric Delta Nu, Dan, earth, and from Ada, A, breath, spirit. The philosophers teach that their primary matter is a part of the original chaos, and this is exactly what the Greek name of Alpha Kappa Rho Sigma Iota Omicron Sigma, Acrisius, king of Argos and father of Danae, suggests. Alpha Kappa Rho Sigma Iota Omicron Sigma, Acrisius, signifies confusion, disorder. Rho Gamma Omicron Sigma, Argos, means raw, uncultivated, unfinished. Zeus, for his part, symbolizes the sky, the air, and the water. By such a sign, the Greeks, to express the action of raining, said, Upsilon Epsilon Zeta Epsilon Sigma, Hi A Ho Zeus, Jupiter sends the rain, or, more simply, it rains. Thus, 
This god appears as the personification of water, of a water capable of penetrating bodies, of a metallic water, since it is made of gold or at least gilded. This is exactly the case with the hermetic solvent, which, after fermentation in an oak barrel, takes on, upon decantation, the appearance of liquid gold. The anonymous author of an unpublished manuscript from the 18th century writes on this subject, If you let this water flow, you will see with your own eyes the shining gold in its primal state, with all the colors of the rainbow. The very union of Zeus and Danae indicates the manner in which the solvent should be applied. The body, reduced to fine powder, digested with a small amount of water, is then gradually moistened, sprinkled little by little, as it absorbs, a technique that the sages call imbibition. One thus obtains a paste that becomes increasingly soft, which becomes syrupy, oily, and finally fluid and clear. Then, under certain conditions, when subjected to the action of fire, part of this liquor coagulates into a mass that settles at the bottom and is carefully collected. This is our precious sulfur, the newly born child, the little king and our dolphin, symbolic fish otherwise called Echeneus, Remora or pilot fish, Perseus or fish of the Red Sea, in Greek pi epsilon rho sigma epsilon sigma, Perseus, etc. Case in 3. Four blossomed flowers, erect on their stems, are in contact with the sharp edge of a naked saber. This small motif has for its motto, dot nutri dot etium dot responsa dot ferenture. Or in English, nourished, also, answers are carried slash born. Or said another way, in nurture, too, responses may be brought forth. It also develops the so-called oracles. It is advice given to the artist so that he, in practicing it, can be assured of directing suitably the cooking, or second operation of the magistery. Nutri etium responsa ferenture, that is nourished, even answers are brought forth entrusts him the spirit of our philosopher, through the intermediary of the petrified characters of his own work. These oracles, four in number, correspond to the four colors or tinctures that reveal themselves during the evolutions of the rebus and reveal the successive phases of internal work. These phases, variously colored, bear the name of regimes or kingdoms. There are ordinarily seven. To each regime the philosophers attribute one of the superior deities of Olympus, and also one of the celestial planets whose influence exercises itself in parallel with theirs, at the same time delivers their domination. They release their power in a usual planetary system and an invariable hierarchy. At the Mercury regime, Romeo Sigma, Hermes, Base, Foundation, the first stage of the work follows that of Saturn, Kappa Rho Nu Omicron Sigma, Kronos, the old man, the mad, Jupiter then governs, Zeta Epsilon Sigma, Zeus, Union, Marriage, then Diana, Rho Tau Epsilon Mu Iota Sigma, Artemis, Whole, Complete, or the Moon, whose sparkling robe is sometimes woven with dog's teeth, sometimes made of the crystals of the night, Venus, whose favor, Alpha Phi Rho Omicron Delta Tau Eta, Aphrodite, Beauty, Grace, fixes colors on the throne, but Mars, Rho Eta Sigma, Aries, Adaptability, Art, and the belligerent prince, with garments dyed in blood coagulation, is himself overturned by Apollo, Alpha Pi Lambda Lambda Omega Nu, Apollon, the triumphant, the son of the magistery, emperor dressed in brilliant scarlet, which definitively established his sovereignty and his power on the ruins of his predecessors. Some authors, assimilating the colored phases of the cooking to the seven days of creation, have designated the entire labor by the expression Heptameros Hebdomadon, literally seven days of weeks, the week of weeks, or simply the grand semen, because the alchemist must follow more closely, in its microcosmic realization, all the circumstances that accompany the grand work of the creator. But these regimes differ more or less openly and very greatly. Case 4. An old dismantled tower, whose door, torn from its hinges, leaves the entrance free, this is how the imaginer has depicted the open prison. Inside, one still sees in place another trap as well as three stones indicated in the upper part of the entrails, extracted from the ice, which mark the sides of the ruin. This composite image of the wall signifies the completion of the three medicinal stones successively obtained, which are designated by the philosophers under the names of philosophical sulfur for the first, elixir or potable gold for the second, philosophical stone, absolute or universal medicine for the last. Each of these stones had to undergo cooking in the Athenor, the prison of the great work, and this is the reason why the last, finding itself sealed in, has accomplished its time of mortification and penance, and left its marks visible on the outside. The small bar leaf has for its motto the words of the Apostle Peter, Acts, ch. 12, v. 2, which was miraculously delivered from his prison by an angel. The text references a quote from the Apostle Peter, 
which is likely from the Christian Bible in the book of Acts, chapter 12, verse 2. The reference, Acts, ch. 12, v. 2, is transcribed from the text as it indicates a citation, not a term needing translation. nvnc.sco.vir. Now I truly know, words of vivid joy, a burst of intimate satisfaction, a cry of delight that the adept utters in the presence of the certainty of the prodigy. Until then, doubt could still assail him, but in the presence of perfect and tangible realization, he no longer fears error, he has discovered the way, recognized the truth, inherited the donum day. The great secret is now no longer unknown. Alas! How many, among the crowd of searchers, can flatter themselves to reach the goal, to open, before their eyes, the prison, forever closed to the greatest number. The prison still serves as an emblem for the imperfect body, the initial subject of the work, in which the aqueous and metallic soul is strongly attached and retained. It is this imprisoned water, said Nicolas Valois, that constantly cries out, help me, I will help you, that is to say, expand my prison, and if once you can bring me out, I will make you master of the fortress where I am. The water which is enclosed is the same nature of water as that which is in this body to drink, which is called Mercury Trismegistus, to whom we give the nomenclature, when he says, nature rejoices in nature, nature speaks of Parmenides, when he says, nature rejoices in nature, nature overcomes nature and nature contains nature. For this enclosed water rejoices with its companion who comes to deliver it from its shackles, mixes with the latter and finally, converting the said prison in them, discarding what is contrary to them, which are the preparations, are converted into mercurial and permanent water. It is therefore with good reason that our divine water is called the key, light, Diana who shines in the thickness of the night, for it is the entrance to all the work and the one that illuminates all mankind. Case 5. Having experimentally confirmed it, the philosophers certified that their stone is nothing other than a coagulation complete with the mercurial water. This is what our bar relief, where one sees the cubic stone of the ancient Freemasons floating on the marine waves, translates, although such an operation seems impossible, it nevertheless does not cease to be natural, because our mercury carries within it the sulfurous principle solubilized, to which it owes the coagulation later. It is regrettable, however, that the extreme slowness of action of this potential agent does not allow the observer to record the slightest sign of any reaction during the early stages of the work. This is the cause of many an artist's failure, who, quickly disappointed, abandon a laborious work, which they deem futile, although they have followed the right path and operated on the proper materials, canonically prepared. It is to these that the words of Jesus to Peter, walking on the waters, which St. Matthew reports, ch. 14, 31, Modus. Fidii, bear. D. Vitasti, in English as, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? B. L. XXV1. Paris, Conservatoire des Arts et Métiers, Bar Relief Original de la Fontaine du Verboy, 1633. Why do we, men of little faith, indeed, we can know nothing without the help of faith, and certainty, which we do not possess, cannot be built upon doubt. We have only seen that skepticism does not endure for long, it is an invalid judgment, a cloud of the moment. One must often remember that it is written, Man, do not waver, because it is the profound conviction of the age called stables, agit noble moles, or in English, stable, it moves the noble mass, because this truth will lead the wise worker to the happy end of his search. It is in this robust faith that he will find the virtuous resolution of this work. The term is not exactly suitable for a resolution, indeed, facing a real mystery, as much by its chemical development contrary to the laws of chemistry as by its obscure mechanism, mystery that the learned man better instructed and the adept more expert would hardly explain. All true and true is simple, and it is to simplify, to offer enigmas in front of which our logic retreats, our reason is troubled, our judgment strays. Now, this cubic stone, which industrious nature engenders from water, the universal matter of peripatetism, and from the art which shapes its six faces according to the rules of hidden geometry, seem to be on the path of formation in a curious 17th century bar relief decorating the fountain of Verboy, in Paris, pl. 26. As these two subjects are closely related, a tight correspondence, we took the first one part, plus the other, hoping to shed some light on the too concise symbolic expression of the Santon image. Built in 1633 by the Benedictines of St. Martin de Champs, this fountain was originally erected within the enclosure of their priory, attached to the enclosure wall. In 1712, the religious offered it for public use, to the city of Paris, with the necessary space for its re-edification, 
under this condition that the view would be established in one of the towers of their convent, and that there would be made an outer entrance. The fountain was then placed at the corner of the Rue du Verboy, situated Rue Saint-Martin, and took the name of Saint-Martin Fountain, which it kept for more than a century. The small building, restored at the expense of the state in 1832, has a unique regular shape, framed by two pilasters of the Ionic order, vermiculated, which support the cornice through a lintel. On the cornice rests a kind of netting that crowns a cartouche with wings. A marine conch supports this cartouche. The upper part of the niche is occupied by a ship, a frame in the center of which is sculpted a ship. This bar relief, on stone, measures 0.8 meters in height and 1.05 meters in width. Its author is unknown. Thus, among all the descriptions relating to the fountain of Verboy, only some, without further defining it, a ship among others, limit themselves to signaling the Moisey, responsible for illustrating the note on the main motif. The design teaches us nothing more. His ship, of pure Amaury Duval style, does not show any trace of its unique cargo, and is not decorated, among the entanglements of marine volutes, the beautiful and large dolphin that accompanies it. Others, less attentive to detail, see in this subject the heraldic ship of Paris, without doubting that it proposes to the curious the enigma of a truth quite other and of a less vulgar order. Certainly, one could doubt the accuracy of our observation, and, where we recognize a huge stone, armed to the ship that makes body, we notice only an ordinary bale of some merchandise. But one would be wrong, in this case, quite embarrassed to give the reason for the raised sail, very tangled on the yardarm of the mainmast, a feature that puts into light the voluminous package, thus unveiled by design. The intention of the creator of the work is therefore obvious, it is about an occult loading, normally hidden from indiscreet eyes, and not about a bale wandering on the deck. Furthermore, the ship, seen from the back, seems to move away from the spectator and shows that its displacement is ensured by the sail of Artimon to the exclusion of others. Alone, it receives the effort of the wind, blowing on the stern. Alone, it transmits the energy to the ship gliding over the waves. Now, the Kabbalists write Artimon and pronounce Antimon or Antimony, a word behind which the sages hide the subject of their sages. Antimony, in Greek, signifies flower, and it is said that it is the first or of all metals. It is the flower of flowers, flos florum, the root of the word, anthos, also expresses youth, glory, beauty, the noblest part of things, everything that possesses brilliance and shines like fire. We are amazed at this point, then, that Basile Valentine, in his chariot of Phoebus Antimony, has already pointed out the subsoil stone he describes as the denomination of Pierre de Fou. As much as the rest remains fixed to the hermetic ship, this stone, as we have said, must be considered as being in the process of elaboration. The upper part of the niche is occupied by a ship, in the center of which is sculpted a ship. This bar relief, on stone, measuring 0.8 meters high and 1.05 meters wide, its author is unknown. Thus, among all the descriptions relating to the Verboy fountain, only some, without further defining it, a ship among others, are limited to noting de Moisy, charged with illustrating the note on the principal motif. The design does not teach us any more. His ship, of the pure Maori Duval style, does not bear any trace of its singular cargo, represented in vain among the entanglements of marine volutes, the large and beautiful dolphin that accompanies it. Besides, many people, little concerned with detail, see in this subject the heraldic ship of Paris, without doubting that it proposes to the curious the enigma of a truth of another and less vulgar order. Indeed, one might doubt the correctness of our observation, and where we recognize a huge stone, rigged to the ship that makes body with it, we note only an ordinary bale of some merchandise. But one would be wrong, in this case, quite embarrassed to give reason for the raised sail, clumsily entangled on the yard arm of the main mast, a feature that puts into light the voluminous package, thus unveiled by design. The intention of the creator of the work is therefore manifest, it concerns an occult cargo, normally hidden from indiscreet looks, and not about a bale traveling on the deck. Furthermore, the ship, seen from the rear, seems to move away from the spectator and shows that its displacement is ensured by the Ardimon sail, to the exclusion of the others. Alone, it receives the wind's effort, blowing on the stern. Alone, it transmits energy to the ship gliding on the waves. Now, the Kabbalists write Ardimon and pronounce it Antimon or Antimony, a term behind which the sages hide the name of the wise. In Greek, Anthos signifies flower, and it is said that the prime matter is called the flower of all metals. It is the flower of flowers, Flos florum, the root of the word, anthos, also expresses youth, glory, beauty, 
the noblest part of things, all that possesses shine and shines like the fire. We must be amazed then, that Basile Valentin, in his chariot of Phoebus antimony, has given to the primary substance of the work the name Pierre de Fou. As long as it remains attached to the hermetic ship, this stone, as we have said, must be considered as being in the process of elaboration. It is, especially in the practical domain, the graphic sign of the crucible, on which rests, so to speak, the secure concentration of water by mercury. It is in this vessel, by bringing its constituent molecules together, under the will of the metallic spirit and with the constant help of fire. For the spirit is the only force capable of transmuting into compact masses again the dissolved bodies, just as it compels the crystals from mother solutions to take a specific, invariable form by which we can identify them. This is why philosophers have combined the molecular aggregation of the mercurial solid under the secret action of the spirit, to that of a bag strongly compressed by laces crossed. The stone seems tied like a sekina, from the Greek sigma phi rho alpha gamma zeta omega, sfragizo, to seal, close, and this corporification is made evident by the cross, image of the passion, that is to say during the work at the crucible, each time that the heat is prudently applied in the degree required and following the suitable rhythm. Thus it is appropriate to specify the particular meaning of cable, which the Greeks called kappa lambda omicron sigma, kalos, synonym of the adverb kappa alpha lambda sigma, kalos, which means in a suitable and effective way. This is the most delicate phase of the work when the prime coagulation of the stone, unctuous and light, appears on the surface and floats on the waters. It is then necessary to redouble caution and prudence in the application of fire, if one does not want to redden it before time and prematurely. It manifests at the beginning under the aspect of a thin film, very brittle, whose fragments detached from the edges retract, then coalesce, thicken, take the form of a flat islet, the island of the cosmopolite and the mythical land of Delos, animated by gyratory movements and subject to continual displacements. This island is but another figure of the hermetic fish, born from the sea of the sages, our mercury which Hermes calls mare patterns, the pilot of the work, the first solid state of the embryonic stone. Then they solder together, thicken, and take the form of a flat islet, the isle of the cosmopolite and the mythical land of Delos, animated by gyratory movements and subjected to continuous displacements. This isle is nothing but another figure of the hermetic fish, born of the sea of the sages, our mercury which Hermes calls mare patterns, the pilot of the work, the first solid state of the embryonic stone. They have named it Eschenius, others dolphin, with as much reason, for if the Eschenius passes, in the legend, for stopping and fixing the ships because of its slowness, the dolphin, when one perceives its head emerging in our bar leaf, possesses a positive, active matrix. Its Greek name, Delta Epsilon Lambda Phi Sigma, Delphus, designates the matrix, and no one ignores that it is the mercury which is called by the philosophers the receptacle and the matrix of the stone. But, so that no one is mistaken, let us repeat once more that it is not the vulgar mercury that can affect the change, although its quality provides the radical metallic moisture. The powerful assimilation to water furnishes, in a few words, the real characteristics of the mercurial philosopher. In the description of the underground temple of the divine bottle, Pantagruel, Book 4, Chapter 11, there is, in the center and the most prominent part of a circular fountain, a statue which occupies the center and the largest part of the fountain. Around this fountain rise seven columns which are gems, says the author, this, antique Chaldean and Magi attributed to the seven planets of the sky. To talk about something else, from the rude Minerva we hear, on the first sapphire which was at the top of the chapter, a living and vertical line perpendicular, in lead illusion well precious, Saturn holding his scythe, having at the feet a gilded cock artificially enameled according to the competence of the naive colors due to the bird Saturnine. Under the second, of hyacinth, turning to the left, was Jupiter in enstatite Jovian, on the third in gold or enameled according to the natural order. Under the third, Phoebus in gold or enstatite, on his main rooster white, under the fourth, in Corinthian Arane, Mars, and at his feet a lion, under the fifth, Venus in copper, of material similar to that of which Aristonides made the statue of Athamas, a dove at its feet, under the sixth, Mercury in fixed hydrargyre, malleable and immobile. As for the stork, the text is formed and cannot be confused with the Mercury of the sages, all authors attest to it, it presents itself as an immobile body with a metallic appearance, of solid consistency, finally capable of fixing itself by simple coction in a closed vessel. As for the stork, which Rabelais attributes to Mercury, it takes its significance from the Greek word pi epsilon lambda alpha rho gamma sigma, pelargos, stork, formed of, it is bruised or blackish brown, 
and rho gamma upsilon rho omicron sigma, are gyros, white, which are the two colors of the water and those of the philosophical mercury. Pi epsilon lambda alpha rho gamma sigma also designates the hermetic base made of black and white earth. Emblem of the hermetic base, it is a pot made of black and white earth, emblematic of mercury, whose water, living in white, loses its luster, becomes mortified and turns black, abandoning its soul to the embryo of the stone, which is born of its decomposition and nourishes itself from its ashes. In order to testify that the fountain of Verboi was originally consecrated to the philosophical water, mother of all metals and base of the sacred art, the Benedictines of St. Martin de Champs had sculpted, on the cornice serving as a support to the bar relief, various attributes relating to this fundamental liquor. Two oars and a crossed caduceus bear the pedicus of Hermes, depicted in the modern aspect of a winged helmet, on which a small dog keeps watch. Some cords, coming out of the visor, unfold their coils over the oars and it is the winged rod of the god of the work. The Greek word pi lambda tau eta, plate, by which the oar is designated, simultaneously implies the sense of ship and that of fan. The latter is a sort of osier basket attributed to Mercury, and which the Kabbalists write of the wind. This is why the emerald tablet allegorically says, speaking of the stone, that the wind has carried it in its belly. This fan is nothing other than the matrix, the vessel bearer of the stone, emblem of Mercury and the main subject of our bar relief. As for the caduceus, it is well known that it belongs to the messenger of the gods, with the winged patassos and the telaria. We will only say that the Greek word kappa eta rho kappa epsilon iota omicron nu, caracayan, caduceus, by its etymology recalls the cock, kappa rho upsilon xi, carex, dedicated to Mercury as the herald of light. All these symbols converge, as we see, towards a single and same object, also indicated by the little dog, placed on the vault of the helmet, of which the special sense, kappa rho nu omicron sigma, cranos, head, summit, marks the important part, in the species the culminating point of the art, the key of the great work. Noel, in his Dictionary of Fable, writes that the dog was consecrated to Mercury as the most vigilant and the most cunning of all the gods. According to Pliny, the flesh of young dogs was reputed to be so pure that it was offered to the gods in sacrifice, and that it was served in the feasts prepared for them. The image of the dog posed on the protective helmet of the Mercury. It is a true riddle still applicable to Mercury. It is a figurative translation of the Kappa Upsilon Nu Omicron Kappa Phi Alpha Lambda Omicron Sigma, Kynakephalos, which has a dog's head, a very venerated mystical form of the Egyptians, who gave it to some superior deities, and particularly to the god Thoth, who later became Hermes for the Greeks, the Trismegistus of the philosophers, the Mercury of the Latins. Case in 6. A die is placed on a small garden table. In the foreground vegetate three herbaceous plants. For all signs, this bar-relief bears the Latin adverb, ut que move, which is an acronym standing for ubi two keys, ego kaya, which translates to where you, are, keys, I, am, kaya in English. This was a traditional phrase used in Roman marriage ceremonies, expressing the unity and mutual support between husband and wife. In a certain way, that is to say in an analogous fashion, which might lead one to believe that the discovery of the stone was due to chance, as if the birth of the magisterium remained tributary to a lucky throw of the dice. But we know pertinently that science, a true gift from God, spiritual light obtained by revelation, is not subject to chance, there is elsewhere. It is not that one cannot find a rebellious streak in the turns of events. However, if alchemy lends itself to a special technique, of some crafty operation for acquiring a skill with very little and not exceeding the value of a trifle, Indeed, science far surpasses the synthetic fabrication of precious metals, and the philosophical stone itself is only the first positive step allowing the adept to rise to the most sublime knowledge. By remaining even within the physical realm, which is that of material manifestations and fundamental certainties, we can assure that the work is not subject to the unexpected. It has laws, its principles, its conditions, its secret agents and results, from too many combined actions and diverse influences to obey chance. One must discover it, understand the process, its causes and its accidents before proceeding to execution. And anyone who sees can see in spirit his time coming, and the one who wishes to find through practice. The wise man has his eyes in his head, says Ecclesiastes, ch. 2, 14, and the fool walks in darkness. The die thus has another esoteric significance. Its figure, which is that of the cube, kappa beta omicron sigma, kybos, die to play, cube, designates the cubic stone, or carved, our philosophical stone and the cornerstone of the church, but, to be regularly erected, 
This stone requires three successive repetitions of the same series of seven operations, which brings their total to 21. This number corresponds exactly to the sum of the points marked on the six faces of the die, since by adding the first six numbers one obtains 21, and the three series of seven will be found again by totaling the same numbers of points in booster feeding. 1, 2, 3, 6, 5, 4. Placed at the intersection of the sides of an inscribed hexagon, these figures carry the circular movement inherent to the interpretation of another figure, emblematic of the great work, that of the serpent or Boris, out serpentis qui caught am devor of it in English or of the serpent that devoured its tail. In any case, this particular arithmetic, in perfect accord with the work, attributes the attribute of the cube or of the die to the symbolic expression of our quintessence mineral. It is the Esiac table realized by the cubic throne of the great goddess, placed at the intersection of the sides of an inscribed hexagon, these figures trace the circular movement inherent to the interpretation of another figure, emblematic of the great work, that of the serpent or Boris, out serpentis qui caught am devor of it again or of the serpent that devoured its tail. In any case, this peculiarity in arithmetic, in perfect accord with the work, ascribes the attribute of the cube or the die to the symbolic expression of our mineral quintessence. This is the Esiac table realized by the cubic throne of the great goddess. It is therefore sufficient, analogically, to throw the die three times on the table, which is equivalent, in practice, to resolving the stone three times, to obtain it with all its qualities. These are the three vegetative phases that the artist has represented here by three plants. Finally, the indispensable repetitions for the perfection of the hermetic labor provide the reason for the hieroglyphic book of Abraham the Jew, as Flamel tells us, of three times seven leaves. Likewise, a splendid illuminated manuscript, executed at the beginning of the 18th century, contains 21 painted figures each adapted to the 21 operations of the work. 5. Second Series, PL. 27. Case and I, thick clouds intercept the sunlight and cast a shadow over a wildflower that is accompanied by the motto, dot reverter, et, reverter, return, and I will return. This herbaceous plant, entirely fabulous, was named by the ancients, Baraz. It is found, it is said, on the slopes of Mount Lebanon, above the road that leads to Damascus, that is to say, cabalistically, to the feminine principal Mercury, Delta Mu Alpha Rho, Damar, wife slash spouse. It was only seen to appear in the month of May, when the springtime removed the snow shroud from the earth. As soon as night came, we said, this plant begins to catch fire and to emit light like a small torch. But as soon as day comes, this light disappears, and the plant becomes invisible. Even the leaves that one has wrapped in handkerchiefs can no longer be found which gives credence to those who say that this plant is obsessed by demons, because it has, according to them, a hidden property to break charms and spells. Others assure that it is able to transmute metals into gold, and that is why the Arabs call it Arab Dolor, gold grass, but they would not dare to pick it, nor even approach it, for they have, they say, experienced several times that this plant causes the sudden death of the one who pulls it from the earth without taking the necessary precautions, and, as they are unaware of these precautions, they leave it untouched. From this small subject there esoterically emerges the artifice of the solution of sulfur by mercury, the plant expressing the vegetative virtue of the latter, and the sun the igneous nature of the former. The operation is all the more important as it leads to the acquisition of philosophical mercury, a living, animated substance, arising from pure sulfur radically united with primitive and heavenly water. We have previously said that the external character, allowing for certain identification of this water, is a starry and radiant figure that coagulation makes appear on its surface. Let us add that the astral signature of Mercury, as it is customary to call the impression in question, asserts itself with all the more clarity and vigor as the animation progresses and proves to be more complete. Now, the two paths of the work require two different ways to animate the initial Mercury. The first belongs to the short way and includes only one technique by which one moistens little by little the fixed, for all dry matter avidly drinks its moisture until the reiterated effusion of the volatile upon the body swells the compound and makes it into a doughy mass, or syrupy according to the case. The second method consists of digesting the entirety of the sulfur in three or four times its weight of water, then decanting the solution, thereafter desiccating the residue and taking it up again with a proportional quantity of new mercury. When the dissolution is complete, one separates the feces, if there are any, and the liquors, once gathered, are subjected to a slow distillation in a vein marie. The superficial humidity is thus released, and the extraction of the subtlety by the artifice of coagulation can be better judged. One understands without difficulty the star, the external manifestation of the internal sun, 
represented each time a new portion of mercury comes to bathe the indissoluble sulfur, and as soon as the latter ceases to be visible to reappear at the decantation, that is, at the departure of the astral matter. Return, and I will return, as the passive clouds, the thick fogs, conceal from view sometimes the star, sometimes the flower, according to the phases of the operation, so that the artist can never, in the course of the work, perceive simultaneously the two elements of the compound. And this truth is confirmed up to the final act of the work, since the coction of philosophical mercury, otherwise, called the starry ostrum of the sages, transforms it into fixed sulfur, fruit of our emblematic vegetable, whose seed is thus multiplied in quality, in quantity, and in virtue. Casein too, at the center of this casein, a fruit, which one generally takes for a pear, but which can, with as much verisimilitude, be an apple or a pomegranate, takes its meaning from the legend underneath which it figures. Digna.merces.labor. In English as dignified work is rightly rewarded. This symbolic fruit is none other than the hermetic gem, the philosopher's stone of the great work or medicine of the ancient sages, also still called the absolute, small coal or carbuncle precious, carbunculus, the brilliant sun of our microcosm and the star of eternal sapience. This fruit is double, for it is picked at the same time on the tree of life, specially reserved for therapeutic uses, and on the tree of science, if one prefers to employ it for metallic transmutation. These two faculties correspond to two states of the same product. The first characterizes the red stone, translucid and diaphany, apt in medicine as potable gold, and the second, the yellow stone, because of its metallic orientation and its fermentation by natural gold renders it opaque. For this reason, Cyrano Bergerac gives two colors to the fruit of the magister in his description of the emblematic tree at the foot of which it rests. It was, he writes, a rustic bush, so fully discovered that not only a view, but also a longer bearing bush found itself not only in a vision, the bush, and it had, in my dream, no resemblance to a tree, in comparison, however, the most precious cedars in silver and their branches would not equal its trunk or massif, did not equal its precious surface, which, on top of the flashing glimmers of its precious fruit, self-reproduces, and casts around it nothing but leaves, the echo hanging around. But just as a mirror divides the unity of each, and inflamed with a large fruit should possess half of the material of each, the flame tree or scarab covered with widespread chrysolite or suspended if it should seem like the thick roses of amber gold, their big pear-shaped diamond roses, and the buds of their ability, care, prudence of the artist, and the buttons of the larvated tree. According to the scientific testimony of a virtue, the philosophical fruit that the great work stone is a more extended mutation of metals, is not a philosopher's stone, commonly used in historical projections. J.B. Van Helmont, in his laboratory in Vilvoorde, near Brussels, in 1608, proved the same power, the powders of mercury, which were transformed into 18,740 times their weight in gold, obtained a result equivalent to a product of 22,334 times its weight in gold. The projection on mercury at Frankfurt sur le Main was situated in 1603, at the merchant Koch's place, which was proven more effective, in Dippel's report, the powder that Lascaris gave was equal to 1,155 times. It produced 600 times its weight in quicksilver for his son, but another batch provided by Lascaris, which he showed more efficiently done at Vienna in 1716, in the presence of the councillor Panzer of Hesse, Count Charles Ernest of Rapich, and Count Joseph of the Werben and Freudenthal estates, the comet and baron of Metternich, the coefficient was 10,000 times greater. It is not useless to know that the maximum of 10,000 is achieved by the employment of mercury, and the same quality of stone is realized with variable results according to the nature of metals serving as the base for projections. The authors of Lettera du Cosmopolite affirm that if an ordinary part of elixir converts or perfects a thousand parts of ordinary mercury, it will only transform 20 parts of lead, 30 of tin, 40 of copper, and 50 of silver. As for the white stone, it will act to the degree of multiplication, acting on half about these quantities. But, if philosophers have spoken little of the variable yield of the chrysopia, on the contrary, their songs are very prolific about the projections. So fully uncovered that not only could one have a view, but also from a greater distance, a bush was found beneath a tree, and however, at my awakening, nothing reminiscent of a tree, in comparison, was there, and the highest cedars in silver in their herbaceous branches, solid or massive, did not equal its precious surface, which, resting on the sparkling shimmer of the precious fruit it reproduces, only reflected around it nothing but leaves. The echo spreading around, but as a mirror divides the unity of each, and as if inflamed, 
a large fruit must possess half of the material of each, the flame tree or scarab beetle full of expanded chrysolite or of a drop hanging in suspension if it would tend to look like the thick droplets of golden amber, the large diamond roses in pear shapes, and the buds according to the skill, care, the prudence of the craftsman, the fruit of the tree of scientific knowledge bears witness to a virtue, the philosophical fruit because it is incontrovertible that the stone from the more or less extensive mutation of metals, is never philosophical stone, used in historical projections gives us no proof of the same power. The operation done by J. B. Van Helmont provides a certain proof. In Vilvoord, near Brussels, in 1618, the stone transformed a grain of mercury into 18,740 times its weight in gold. Richthausen, with the help of La Bougardier's product, obtained a result equivalent to 22,334 times the unit. The projection that Sethen made, which took place at the Merchant Cokes in Frankfurt sur le Main in 1603, proved to be equal to Dippel's report, the powder that Lascaris gave multiplied about 1,155 times. It yielded about 600 times its weight in quicksilver for his son, but another batch provided by Lascaris proved more effective when performed in Vienna in 1716, in the presence of the councillor Panster of Hesse, Count Charles Ernest of Rapich, Count Joseph of the Werben and Freudenthal, the comet and baron of Metternich, the coefficient reached the neighboring power of 10,000. It is not pointless to know that the maximum of 10,000 is reached by the use of mercury, and that the same quality of stone produces variable results according to the nature of the metals serving as the base for projections. The author of the letters of the Cosmopolite affirms that if an ordinary part of elixir converts or perfects a thousand parts of ordinary mercury, it will only transform 20 parts of lead, 30 of tin, 40 of copper, and 100 of silver. As for the white stone, at the same degree of multiplication, it acts on about half of these quantities. But, if philosophers have spoken little of the variable yield of the chrysopia, they have on the contrary shown themselves very loquacious on the subject of the projections. The medical properties of the elixir, as well as its surprising effects that allow one to obtain the rain over the vegetable kingdom, the elixir blanc, made in Batsdorf, works wonders on all sorts of ailments and particularly those of women. Because it is the true drinkable gold of the ancients, the anonymous author of the Clef du Grand Uber recounts the text of Batsdorf and assures that this medicine has other virtues still more unbelievable. When it is and the white elixir render a body as robust and vigorous as it was in its youth. For this effect, one first prepares a bath with several fragrant herbs, which they must scrub themselves with to remove dead skin. Then, they enter a second bath without herbs, but in which one has dissolved, in a jug of brandy, three grains of the white elixir, which one keeps quiet, without stirring, for a quarter of an hour and on which, without wiping off, one makes a great fire to dry this precious liquor. They then feel so strong within themselves, and their body is restored to the white elixir they could not have imagined having experimented. Our good father Hermes remains in agreement with the ancient principle. But he wants, beyond these baths, that at the same time, for seven consecutive days, one takes internally this elixir, and he adds, if a lady does the same thing every year, she will live free from all the ailments to which other women are subject, without experiencing any inconvenience. Huginus of Barma certifies that the stone, fermented with lore can be used in medicine in this manner. One takes a scruple or twenty-four grains, which one dissolves according to the art in two ounces of spirit of wine, and from this one will give thereafter two or three drops up to four drops, depending on the needs of the illness, in a little wine or some other suitable vehicle, according to the old authors, cases that would have been radically cured in one day for those who suffer from a new ailment, for old ailments, older than a year, in a month if their origin goes back to days of the same year. But in this, as in many other things, it is necessary to guard against the excesses of the imagination. Too enthusiastic, the author of the Clef du Grand Uber sees wonders only in the limits of the reasonable. The boastful claims of the stone's virtue are not in vain, sparkling with golden brightness. It must emit sparks and a great variety of ardent colors, some allege, and they go far beyond what is written in the philosophical base of the ancients. To go there is to go too far, says this philosopher who does not stray far from the limit marks of the elixir, the leprosy, the evil caducus, the gout, he does not recognize the phenomenal medicine, the hydropesia. Paralysis, incurable illnesses seem to yield to the famously deaf virtues of the stone, those that even the most renowned deaf could not resist, and as if this healing were not enough, it still impresses more remarkable properties. It can restore sight to the blind, speech to the mute, hearing to the deaf, it can make the whole old man fall, walk the lame, extend the nails and hair, 
change the white hair to black. In short, it makes them grow and gives them a white, leprosy-free skin in place of a spotted one, according to the white that we attribute to the majority of sages, humor and buffoonery. In spring, the stone can give excellent results for the vegetable kingdom, in particular for fruit trees by spreading the elixir largely on the soil near their roots during the first showers. It strengthens them against all causes of decay and drought. It makes them more resistant to all causes of fruit failure and sterility. They produce such healthy and tasty fruits that one could even say that the growth of exotic vegetables would be possible, using the same process, even within our latitude. Delicate plants, which have trouble coming to our climates of a temperate nature opposite to their natural one, in lands well watered, become as vigorous as if they were in their native soil and proper sunlight of nature. Among other wonderful properties attributed to the philosophical stone, the authors cite many examples of the transformation of crystal into rubies and of quartz into diamond, a kind of progressive tempering. They even consider the possibility of making glass ductile and malleable, which, despite the affirmation of Siliani, we will be careful to certify, for the way of acting proper to the elixir, a contraction and hardening, seems contrary to the obtaining of such an effect. Regardless, Christopher Merritt cites this opinion and thus speaks of it in the preface of his treatise, as for the malleability of glass, upon which the blows of the hammer do not leave a mark. Alchemists base the possibility of their elixir on it, albeit rarely, but solidly, on the following passage by Pliny, Book 36, it is said that in the time of Tiberius, a way was found to make glass flexible, and that the artisan who discovered it brought a vessel made of it to the emperor, who ordered him to be beheaded on the spot, fearing that gold and silver would lose their value if glass should not fall into disrepute, nor be held in such estimation. But this rumor, though widely spread, is no more certain. Other authors have recounted the same event after Pliny, but with some variations on the details. Dion Cassius, Book 57, says, At the time when the great portico started to tilt, an architect whose name is unknown, because the jealousy of the emperor prevented him from being registered in the records, offered to Tiberius, after being paid, to be banished from Rome. This worker returned under the pretext of asking the emperor for pardon and let fall in his presence a glass cup, which bounced and was dented rather than breaking. He then took a hammer and straightened it out in front of everyone. I could have secured myself against your envy, he said to Tiberius, but it was condemned to death. Isidore confirms the same story. He only adds that the emperor, indignant, threw the glass onto the pavement, which remained intact. Tiberius then asked if there was still anyone who knew the secret, and having ensured by oath that no one but him knew it, the emperor had him beheaded so that, if he kept his word, the method would not fall into contempt and would not reduce the metals to their value. In acknowledging the exaggeration and legendary contributions, it remains no less true that the hermetic fruit bears in its highest reward perhaps that which, for the extremism of nature, can grant here to men of good will. Case in 3, the effigy of the serpent Ouroboros is raised on the capital of an elegant column. This curious bar relief is distinguished by the axiom, dot nos dot te dot ipsum. Latin translation of the Greek inscription that was on the frontispiece of the famous temple at Delphi. Gamma nu omega theta iota sigma epsilon alpha upsilon tau omicron nu, genothi se autan. Know thyself. We have already met, on some manuscripts of unknown authors, the maxim thus conceived. You who want to know the stone, know yourself well and your own. Such is the affirmation of the analogical law that gives, in this way, the key to the mystery, or, which characterizes precisely our figure, the key of the great work. It is the column charged with supporting the emblematic serpent, found reversed in relation to the meaning of the inscription, deliberate volute, reflective, premeditated, giving the whole the appearance of a closed eye. The sign grafted onto it represents the alchemist's customary way of noting their mercury. The key and the column of the work are thus named because of the epithets applied to mercury, for it is in this that the element's detachment takes their provenance and their natural quality. It is from him that all provision can be obtained, to see dissolving, mortifying, and destroying the body, to dissociate it, to draw from it the pure portions, to join them to spirits and to generate new mixtures of metals, different from the earlier natures. The alchemists therefore have reason to affirm that all that the wise seek to find in the soul mercury, and it is this that must carry the alchemist towards the desired works acquisition, of an indispensable body. But, to achieve this, we advise him to proceed with method in studying, in a simple and rational way, how nature operates, in living beings, to transform ingested foods, rid by digestion of substance inertias, into absorbed blood, into red blood, the generator of organic tissues and of vital energy. Know thyself. He will thus recognize that the mineral producers of mercury, which are also the artisans of its nutrition, 
its growth and its life, must first be chosen with discernment and work with care. 4. Although theoretically all may serve for this composition, certain elements are nevertheless too far removed from the metallic active nature to be genuinely useful, either because of their impurities, because their maturation was stopped too soon or pushed beyond the required term. Rocks, stones, metallic iodides belong to the first category, gold and silver lack in the second. To the melancholic, the agent we demand screams for vigor, and this weakness cannot be of any help. In gold and silver, on the contrary, one would search in vain. Nature has separated from perfect bodies when they appeared on the physical plane. By pronouncing this truth, we do not want to say that it is absolutely necessary to ban gold and silver, nor do we pretend that these metals are excluded from the work by the masters of science. But we warn the disciple that neither gold nor silver, even modified, enter into the composition of mercury. And if one were to find, in the classical authors, some contrary assertion, we should believe, against the established order, that Philolethes, Basile Valentine, Nicolas Flamel and the Trebizond, spoke of philosophical gold or silver, and not of precious metals with which they have nothing in common. Case in four, placed on the background of an overturned bowl, a candle burns. This rustic motif has the following epigraph. Sick.lshiat.lvx.vestra. Thus let your light shine. From Vulgate, Matthew 5.16. Let your light thus shine. The flame symbolizes for us the spirit that is the purest, clearest part of the body, its most subtle, metallic part, which is always inclined to ascend, and its light proper, although this essential part loses nothing in brightness in terms of quantity. We always have it in us to elevate, and that it starts to shine as soon as it is separated from the coarse opacity that surrounds it. It is written that we do not light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, so that it gives light to all who are in the house. Likewise, let us not hide this internal fire, this light that must be made manifest in the plower, the necessity of revealing this internal fire, this light that must be made manifest, this first light or this soul, invisible under the hard bark of heavy matter. The process that served the old philosophers in making the descent, named by them sublimation, well refines the thing, even when nothing more than a very subtle operation far removed from spagyrics. For the spirit, eager to strip itself of what surrounds it, as soon as the means are provided to it, cannot, however, completely leave the body, but it makes for itself a garment much closer to its nature, more supple to its will, of particles rendered finer than it previously gathered around itself, so as to use it as a vehicle anew. It then gains the outer surface of the substance stirred and continues to move over the waters, as it is said in Genesis, ch. 1, 2, until the light stops. It is at this moment, in the coagulation, where the luminous particle ceases, that the operation of the mass is made very easy, since the light has placed itself on the bowl, leaving it to the artist to collect it. Let us learn again so that the student is not ignorant of the practice, that this separation or sublimation and the refining operation of the spirit, are to be repeated as many times as will be judged expedient. Each of these repetitions takes the name of eagle, and Philolethes assures us that the fifth eagle dissolves the moon, but that it is necessary to use seven to nine to obtain the characteristic splendor of the sun. The word phi sigma, phos, old light or the light of the first term of the duo, signifies light, clarity, luminosity, flame. To make the eagle fly, according to the hermetic expression, is to make the light shine by uncovering it from its dark envelope and by bringing it to the surface. But we must add that, unlike chemical sublimation, the spirit in small quantity entitled with respect to the body, our operation provides little of the sky and organizes from which the philosopher from Dampier draws. According to the philosophy of Dampier, the cautious artist should select the occult manifest and to make the metallic light which is below go up, if he wants to see the metallic light which is above to the exterior. Panel 5, a moving scroll used to accompany it, the design of which has disappeared today. If we believed in the symbolic meaning, the egg would have held a pike. Only the phylactery and its inscription, amputated from the last two letters, dot non dot sun dot tails dot nvs dot amores. These are not the nos amores, but this solitary Spanish phrase, so vague, hardly allows any serious commentary. Rather than spreading an erroneous version, we prefer to keep silence about this incomplete motif. Panel 6, the reasons of impossibility invoked for the preceding bar relief are also valid for this one. A little foot, cut, as if slashed by the wheel of a car does not allow to identify it. Seemingly imprisoned in a birdcage, this motif has suffered a lot. From its motto, we can barely read two words, liberta.ver, belonging to this phrase preserved by some authors, .ampanza.liberta.vera.copy.ins, 
here is even the abuse of liberty. It is probably about, in this case, the spirit, first free, then imprisoned within the coarse body, like an egg in a bird's nest. It seems evident also that the animal, taking the ordinary place of a bird, appears, by its name or by its species, a special, precise, easy to situate meaning for the worker. These elements, indispensable for the interpretation, missing, forces us to move to the following panel. Panel 7, Giant on the Soil, a lantern unhooked from which the cover opened shows a snuffed candle. The phylactery which deals with this subject contains a warning to the artist impatient and versatile. Dot sick dot parrot dot in co and stands. Thus perishes the inconstant. As the lantern goes out, so ceases to shine, easily defeated, incapable of reacting, it falls and searches in vain for the brightness that surrounds it, that clarity which one would know how to find within oneself. But, if the inscription offers nothing equivocal, the image, on the other hand, is much more transparent. This comes from the fact that the interpretation we put on it does not deviate from the path taken and thus extends to the path followed. We discover first an alloy fire of low heat, which barely maintains its course, resulting in a significant loss of matter, that is, without pausing in an instant in its action. Already, in the long path, a slowing down of the action, a cooling of the temperature, are prejudicial accidents to the regular operation. If the sign is lost, time, already constrained by the formulation, becomes acute. However, if the philosophical amalgam is simply scorched, and not calcined, it is possible to regenerate it by dissolving it again, according to the Council of Cosmopolite, and to take up the work with more prudence. But the complete extinction of the hearth causes immediately the ruin of the content, although this, upon analysis, does not seem to have undergone sublimation. Also, during the entire course of the work, one must remember the hermetic axiom reported by Le Mojon de Saint Didier, which says that gold, once turned into spirit, if it feels the cold, becomes entirely a work. So do not light the flame too much inside your lantern, nor let it go out, do not let it go out, you would fall from Charybdis to Scylla, apply to the short path, the symbol of the lantern provides us another explanation of one of the essential points of the great work. It is not the elementary fire, but the fire potential, flame hidden by the first element, which the artist detests to show under this familiar image. What is then this mysterious, natural, unknown fire that the artist must know how to introduce into his subject? It is a question that no philosopher has solved, even by pleading the silence of the sages. Artephius and Pontanus speak of it so obscurely that this important thing remains unnoticed if it goes unnoticed. Limojon de Saint Didier assures that this fire is of the nature of quicklime. Basile Valentine, usually more verbose, writes, All in the lamp and search the lost draft, meaning nothing else but this fire, fa, idle, in the fern or in the earth that it holds enclosed. Most of the other authors design this internal light, hidden in the darkness of the substance, under the epithet of lamp fire. Batsturf describes the philosophical lamp as always needing to be abundantly supplied with oil, so that the term intermediary of an asbestos wick, which signifies inextinguishable, of divine quality, unburnable, qualities unintelligible, of asbest in nature. Now, Basile Valentine, does not burn and is not our secret fire, unattainable, inextinguishable which we find in the Greek word sigma beta epsilon sigma tau omicron sigma, asbestos, which designates the lamp or fire pot that is not burned. As for the lamp, we designate the vase or the pot that holds the lamp, lantern, torch, which itself is a dispenser of wood fire for lighting. This is a term akin to lambda alpha mu pi sigma, lampas, lamp, the hermetic vocable lambda upsilon chi nu alpha, lichnia. Finally, what rises to the surface, foam, moss, expresses all that is possessed by the envelope tincture of science, etc. and this lamp which only needs to be the mineral envelope containing the fire of the more surprising. Metamorphoses, a word uttered at the address of our brothers. Hermes, in his emerald tablet, pronounces these serious words, true and consequential, you will separate the earth from the fire, the subtle from the dense, gently, with great industry. It mounts from the earth to the sky, and descends again from the sky to the earth and receives thus the power of things superior and inferior. Notice then that the superior things and those that separate, divide, not to destroy, nor to sacrifice one for the sake of the other. If it were to be so, we ask you to conserve the body and of the spirit, but in what earth would the fire descend again? However, Pontanus affirms that the drosses on the surface of the stone are converted, under the action of fire, into a unique essence, and consequently he who pretends to separate the least thing from it understands nothing of our philosophy. Panel 8, two vases, one in the form of a repoussé and chaste jug, the other, 
a common clay pot, are figured in the same framing that occupies this word of St. Paul. Contumelium, a vessel for honorable uses, another for dishonorable. In a great house, says the Apostle, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some for honor and others for dishonor. These two vases therefore well define the vile uses they are destined for, and in absolute accordance with the precepts of the hermetic distinction. One is the vase of nature, made of the same clay that the one served God to form Adam's body, the other, the vase of art, from which all matter is composed of pure gold, clear, red, uncombustible, fixed, diaphanous and of incomparable beauty. And what are these two vessels, if not the representational embodiment of our two dissimilar paths, holding the spirit's metallic, sole agents we must have need of? The reader who is au fait with the way of writing of philosophers, the traditional manner that we strive to emulate well, so that one can explain the ancients by us and be checked by them, it will be easy for him to understand that the Hermetists understand by their vessels. Because these have not undergone extended matters, or the same matter at different states of evolution, but they still symbolize our two paths, based on the use of these different bodies. The first of these paths, which uses the base of art, is long, laborious, ungrateful, accessible to wealthy individuals, but honorable nonetheless, despite the expense it necessitates, because it is this one the authors have defended greatly. The second path, a clear shortcut, coming at the theoretical development of the work, requires an uninterrupted travail of 12 to 18 months, and takes part of the natural preparedness, in the philosophical mercury, lifted and sublimated in glass mattresses. It is the honorable vessel, reserved for noble usage of these very precious substances, which are gold exalted and the mercury of sages. The second path requires, from the beginning to the end, that one runs through vile earth, abundantly spread, of which the price until our epoch defies all sound competition for anyone who knows superior needs. It is the earth and the path of the poor, of the simple and modest, of those whom nature marvels to its most humble manifestations. Of extreme facility, it demands only the presence of the artist, hardly any exterior labor and is completed in seven or nine days at most. This path, unknown to the majority of practicing alchemists, is entirely elaborated in a single crucible of refractory earth. It is this one that the ancients call a woman's work and a child's play. It is to this they apply the old hermetic axiom, una res, una vea, una dispositio. One single matter, one single vessel, one single furnace. It is this vessel of the earth, simple, common, and despised by all, which is before everyone's eyes, which costs nothing and is found with all people, but which no one nonetheless can know without revelation. Panel 9, cut in the middle, a serpent, despite the character mortally wounded by his injury, yet believes he can live for a long time in this state. dvm.spiro.sparabo. As long as I breathe, I hope, the serpent, an image of the mercury, expresses, through its two parts, the two parts of the metal which, separate, expressed by their two sections, the one in the assembly of which will later fix one by the other, and by the assemblage of which it will take its new, individual and physical nature, its effectiveness. For sulfur and mercury are the first agents, the disaggregating energy of the nature of metals, extracted and isolated under the violent reduction of themselves, by simple agent, or dissolving secret, becomes a greasy viscosity, coagulable in the form of a visible humid radical, metallic and mercury of the sages. Hence it follows that this liquor, despite the apparent homogeneity of the two elements, is really composed of two different components, and it can be considered logically representative of all metallic bodies, liquidified and re-encruited that is to say artificially representing a state adjacent to their original form. But these elements, being simply associated and not radically united, it seems that our symbolist has thought of representing the mercury in the aspect of a reptile sectioned, whose two parts each preserve their activity, their virtues proper to them. And it is this which justifies the lapidary exclamation of the confiding alchemist, as long as I breathe, I hope, in this state of simple mixture, the philosophical mercury preserves the equilibrium, the stability, the energy of its constituents, although they are nevertheless destined for mortification, for the decomposition which precedes and realizes their perfect mutual interpenetration. Also, as long as the mercury has not felt the constriction of the igneous mediator, is it possible to preserve it indefinitely, provided one takes care to extract it from the combined action of air and light? This is what certain authors suggest, when they assure that the philosophical mercury always retains its excellent qualities if it is kept in a well-stoppered flask. And it is known that in the alchemical language everything that is stoppered, covered, obstructed, when it is said of something is bottled up, corked, or fought over, 
when it is kept in complete darkness. Vi. 3rd Series, PL. 28, Case in 1, erected on its base, and half dipping into the trough, a sandstone grindstone awaits only the grinder to set it in motion. However, the epigraph of this subject, which should underline its meaning, seems, on the contrary, to have no connection with it, and it is with some surprise that we read this unique inscription. Disciples.podior.magistro is the student superior to the teacher? It will be readily conceded that there is hardly any need for a serious apprentice to spin a grindstone, and we have never heard that the most skilled petty trader, on his rudimentary device, having acquired rights to fame. For useful and honorable as it may be, the grinder's profession does not require the contribution of innate gifts, of special knowledge, of rare technique, nor the least patent of mastery. It is therefore certain that the inscription and the image have another, distinctly esoteric sense, which we will now provide an interpretation of. Considered in its various applications, the grindstone is one of the emblems of philosophical operations charged with expressing the hermetic solvent, or that first mercury without which it is utterly pointless to undertake or to hope for anything profitable. It is our only material capable of opening, animating, and reviving the common metals because they easily dissolve in it, divide and adapt under the effect of a mysterious affinity. And although this primitive subject does not present the qualities nor the power of the philosophical mercury, it nevertheless possesses everything necessary to become it, and it does indeed become so, provided that only the metallic seed that it lacks is added to it. Art thus comes to assist nature, allowing this skillful and marvelous worker to complete what, for lack of means, materials, or favorable circumstances, she had to leave unfinished. Now, this initial mercury, subject of the art and our true solvent, is precisely the substance that the philosophers named the unique matrix, the mother of the work, without it, it would be impossible to achieve the prior decomposition of metals, and subsequently, to obtain the radical humidity or mercury of the sages, which is truly the philosopher's stone. Therefore, those who claim to make the mercury or the stone with all metals, as well as those who assert the unity of the primary matter and mention it as the only necessary thing, are not in the truth. It is not by chance that the Hermetists have chosen the grindstone as the hieroglyphic sign of the subject, and our adept has certainly followed the same traditions by giving it a place in the panels of Dampierre. We know that grindstones have a circular shape, and that the circle is the conventional signature of our solvent, thus moreover. Indeed, under the multiple and varied hieroglyphs of the panels of Dampierre, the Greek name Mu Delta Omicron Upsilon Sigma Alpha, Medusa, has its roots in Mu Delta Omicron Mu Alpha Iota and Mu Delta Omega, the name given to Medusa, reflects a favorite study, Mu Delta Omicron Mu Alpha Iota formed the thought we are dealing with, prudence and wisdom. On the other hand, Mu Delta Omega, whose meaning evokes prudence, the Greeks taught us that Medusa was known to the Greeks as Gorgon, which also served to qualify Minerva or Pallas, goddess of wisdom. Perhaps this is discovered, in the secret reason, of the Aegis, Minerva's shield covered with the skin of Amalthea, the goat that nourished Jupiter and decorated with the mask of Medusa Ophiortix. In addition to bringing together the goat and the ram, the latter could represent the golden fleece, the one provided with the horn of abundance. Medusa, we know that the attribute of Athena had the petrifying power that hers had, they say, turning to stone those who met her gaze, Medusa, Euryale, and Steno. Finally, the very names of Medusa's sisters bring their part of revelation. Euryale, in Greek epsilon rho upsilon lambda eta, signifies wide, large, spacious, Steno comes from sigma theta nu omicron sigma, force, power, energy. It is thus that the three gorgons symbolically express the idea of power and range proper to natural philosophy. These converging relations, which we are forbidden to expose more clearly, allow us to conclude that, apart from the esoteric fact hardly effleured, our motif has permission to indicate wisdom as the source and guardian of all our knowledge, save from the laborious work to which it uncovers the hidden secrets in nature. Panel 3 Placed on the altar of sacrifice, a forearm is consumed by fire. The emblem of this fiery sign is contained in two words. Dot Felix dot infortunium. Happy misfortune. Although the subject seems, at first glance, very obscure and without equivalent in the literature and hermetic iconography, it nonetheless yields to analysis and aligns perfectly with the technique of the work. The human forearm, which the Greeks simply called the arm, beta rho alpha chi omega nu, serves as a hieroglyph for the short and abbreviated path. Indeed, our adept, playing on words as an informed Kabbalist, disguises under the substantive beta rho alpha chi omega nu, Brashen, a comparative of beta rho alpha chi sigma, which is written and pronounced in the same way. This means short, brief, of little duration, 
and forms several compounds, including beta rho alpha chi upsilon tau eta sigma, brevity. It is thus that the Greek terms transcribed are beta rho alpha chi omega nu, Brashen, and beta rho alpha chi sigma, brachys, with a related term beta rho alpha chi upsilon tau eta sigma, brides. It is thus that the comparative beta rho alpha chi omega nu, Brashen, brief, homonym of beta rho alpha chi sigma, brachys, takes on the particular sense of a brief technique, ars brevis. But the Greeks had yet another expression to qualify the arm. When they evoked the hand, chi epsilon rho, care, they applied it, by extension, to the entire upper limb, and endowed it with the figurative value of an artistic production, skillful, of a special procedure, of a personal manner of work, in summary of a tour domain acquired or revealed. All these meanings precisely characterize the subtleties of the great work in its prompt, simple, and direct realization, since it only requires the application of a very energetic fire, to which is reduced the tour domain in question. Now, this fire is not only figuratively represented, on our bar leaf, by the flames, but it is also by the limb itself, which the hand indicates as being a dexterous arm, and we know well enough that the proverbial expression to be the right arm always refers to the agent charged with executing the wishes of a superior, the fire in the present case. Beside these reasons, it is necessary to admit that certain parts are veiled under the lapidary form of an abstract image because there is another, concrete, which comes to support and confirm, in practice, the esoteric filiation of the first. We thus warn anyone who, ignorant of the tour domain of the operation, risks engaging in it should fear fire above all. This one runs a real danger and must avoid falling into the consequences of an irretrievable and rash act. So why then, some will ask us, do we not provide the key to revealing such a manipulation of this order? We would respond that we have neither received from God nor from our brothers the authorization to discover such a mystery. It is already a lot that we can prompt the solicitude to warn the beginner, that his lucky star will lead him to the threshold of the antechamber, to be on his guard and to redouble caution. A warning like this is rarely found in the books, very succinct on everything regarding the brief work, but the adept of Dampierre was also as perfectly aware as Ripley, Vasile Valentine, Philolethi, Albert the Great, Hugunus at Barma, Siliani or Naxagoras. However, and because we deem it useful to warn the neophyte, it would be wrong to conclude that we are looking to dissuade him. If he wants to take the risk, so be it for him la prouve du fou, to which the future initiates of Thebes and Hermopolis had to submit, before receiving the sublime teachings. Is not the inflamed arm on the altar not an express symbol of sacrifice, of the renunciation that science demands? Everything is paid for here below, not with gold or money, but with pain, patience. Suffering often leaves us having lost a part of ourselves, and one cannot pay too dearly for the possession of the slightest secret, of the most profound truth. If therefore the aspirant feels endowed with faith and armed with the necessary courage, we fraternally wish for him to emerge safe and sound from this harsh experience, which most often ends with the explosion of the crucible and the projection of the oven. Then perhaps he will exclaim, like our philosopher, happy misfortune, for the accident, forcing him to reflect on the mistake made, will lead him to discover undoubtedly the means to avoid it, and the tour domain of regular operation. Panel 4 Fixed on a trunk of a tree covered with leaves and laden with fruits, an unfurled banner bears the inscription, Dotma lives. S.P.E. Lysbat. It was better to hope or another way one could hope for better. This is the image of the solar tree, green in color, which Cosmopolite signals in his allegory of the green lion, and which will lead us to the nymph Venus. At the foot of this metallic tree, so to speak, the old Saturn works in the presence of a bewildered bellows operator, who says he took the fruit of the solar tree, put it into ten parts of a certain water, very rare and difficult to procure, and easily carried out its dissolution. Our adept thus speaks of the first sulfur, which is the green work, fruit of the work, of the labor scientist. If the Latin phrase betrays deception rather than a normal result, and many artists would be easily able to obtain it, it is through the operation of this sulfur that one must still perform transmutation. The philosophical gold is not the stone. Philolethi takes care to warn the student that it is only by this first matter. And as this sulfur principle, according to the same author, demands an uninterrupted labor of about 40 days, it is logical, and above all human, to think that a result as mediocre in appearance could not satisfy the artist, who hoped to obtain with a single stroke the elixir, as happens in the direct path. Having reached this point, the apprentice must recognize the impossibility of continuing the work, pursuing the operation that provided him with the first sulfur. If he wants to go further, he must retrace his steps, undertake a second cycle of trials, go back anew, labor for a year, 
and if the desired coagulation does not happen, follow the example of Saturn and dissolve again in Mercury, according to the indicated proportions, this fruit that divine goodness has allowed him to gather, and then he will see what follows. Nor all the appearances of progressive and perfect maturation, we would be reminded too well of a long path filled with founders' pitfalls, a long and arduous path, however, that art, having sowed more thorns and occasions to err, and schools are no less numerous than nature itself, has preferred to take. His attention on Mercury, numerous philosophers have sometimes called it double, sometimes sharp because of its own. Salt. It should be known, without cause, that sometimes it is the philosopher's suffering that is first water, the one before performing the solution, is too simple and too weak for him which gave him the philosophical goal. And to conquer this difficulty, to feed this seed is the allegory of the massacre of the innocents, he tries to understand the explanation in Nico's Flamenco, as clearly as a master of the art. Dennis Limjohn, as well as Flamel, as well as the spirits of the bodies designated by the blood of slaughtered innocents, that the alchemist operates differently, once he has overcome the last obstacle of the differentiation of the two Mercuries, which will not leave him frustrated with nothing, later on, but his impatience, will frustrate him from the expected result. Panel 5, two pilgrims, each equipped with a rosary, are approaching a building, a church or chapel, that one perceives in the background, of these very old men, bald, with long beards, wearing a staff, the other, who has the cream, one supports his walk with the help of a stick, the other, who is protected by a capacious cape, seems to manifest a lively surprise at the adventure, and exclaims, trop.tart.cognef.trop.toast.less. Or too much, too late, have known, too soon, leave, words of a disappointed bellows operator, happy to finally recognize, at the end of his long journey, that radical humidity so ardently desired, but saddened by having lost, in vain efforts, the physical vigor indispensable to the realization of the work with his best companion. For it is indeed our faithful servant, Mercury, which is here represented in the form of an old beggar. A slight detail signals it to the observer's sagacity, the rosary that he holds forms, with the staff, the image of the caduceus, symbolic attribute of Hermes. Moreover, we have frequently said that the dissolving material is commonly recognized, among all philosophers, to be the old man, the pilgrim, and the traveler of the great art, as well as the teaching of Michel Meyer, Stolicus, and a host of other masters. As for the old alchemist, so joyous at this encounter, if he has not yet found Mercury, he shows quite clearly how the material is familiar to him, for his own rosary, hieroglyphically representing the circle surmounted by the cross, symbol of the terrestrial globe, remains and is the signature of our little world. It is then understood why the unhappy artist regrets this knowledge acquired too late, and his ignorance of a common substance that was within his reach, without ever thinking that it could procure the mysterious water, vainly sought elsewhere. Panel 6. In this bar leaf are depicted three neighboring trees of the same size. Two of these show their trunks and branches dried up, while the last, remaining healthy and vigorous, seems to be both the cause and the result of the death of the others. This motif is adorned with the motto, dot si, in dot viridi dot in dot arido dot fit, if in the green, in the dry, what, if this is so in the case of green things, what will it be in the case of dry things? Our philosopher thus lays down the principle of the analogical method, the unique means, the only resource available to the hermeticist for the resolution of natural secrets. Therefore, we can answer, according to this principle, that what happens in the vegetable kingdom should correspond to equivalents in the mineral kingdom. Consequently, if the dry and dead trees give up their part of nourishment and vitality to the surviving plant next to them, it is logical to consider the latter as their heir, the one to whom, upon dying, they have bequeathed the full enjoyment of the estate from which they derive their sustenance. From this angle and point of view, it thus appears as their son or their descendant. The three trees thus constitute a transparent emblem of how the stone of the philosophers is born, the first being or subject of the philosophical stone. The author of Triophere Matique, rectifying the erroneous assertion of his predecessor, Pierre-Jean Fabre, states unequivocally that our stone is born from the destruction of two bodies. We will specify that one of these bodies is metallic, the other mineral, and that they both grow in the same earth. The tyrannical opposition of their temperament holds them back from ever agreeing, except when the artist will subjects them to the violent action of fire, these resolved antagonists. After a long and harsh struggle, they perish exhausted. This is the origin of our stone, endowed from its birth with a double metallic disposition, which is dry and igneous, and a double mineral virtue, whose essence is to be cold and humid. Thus it achieves, in its state of perfect equilibrium, 
the union of the four natural elements, which are found at the base of all experimental philosophy. The heat of the fire is tempered by the frigidity of the air, and the dryness of the earth is neutralized by the moisture of the water. Panel 7. The geometric figure that we often see adorning the frontispieces of alchemical manuscripts from the Middle Ages is commonly called the Labyrinth of Solomon, and we have noted elsewhere that it was reproduced on the flooring of our great Gothic churches. This figure carries the following motto, dot fata dot vm dot invenient. The fates will find a way. Fate will indeed find its way. Our bar-relief, characterizing only the long path, reveals the formal intention, expressed by the plurality of motifs of Dampierre, to teach mainly the work of the rich. For this labyrinth offers us only one entrance, while the designs of the same subject generally show three, which correspond, moreover, to the three porches of cathedrals Gothic under the invocation of the Virgin Mother. One, absolutely right, leads directly to the central chamber, where Theseus kills the Minotaur, without encountering the slightest obstacle. It translates the short, simple, easy path of the poor work. The second, which also leads to the center, does not lead to anything after a series of detours, of detours, of circuits, it is the hieroglyph of the long path, and we have said that it refers to the esotericism preferred by our adept. Finally, a third gallery, whose opening is parallel to the previous ones, ends abruptly in a cul-de-sac, a short distance from the threshold, and leads to nothing. It causes the despair and the ruin of wanderers, the presumptuous, those who, without serious study, without solid principles, nevertheless set out and risk the adventure. Whatever their form, the complexity of their design, the labyrinths are speaking symbols of the great work considered from the point of view of its material realization. Thus we see ourselves charged with expressing the two great difficulties that the work entails. First, to access the inner chamber. Second, to have the possibility of survival. Of these two points, the first concerns the knowledge of the matter, which ensures entry, and the one of preparation, that the artisan accomplishes at the center of the maze. The second concerns the mutation, by the aid of fire, of the prepared matter. The alchemist therefore retraces, in reverse order but with prudence, perseverance, the journey quickly undertaken at the start of his labor. To avoid going astray, having rapidly established how to identify his route at the start, so that philosophers advise him to call analytical, in undertaking the operations that we could denominate synthetic, risking strongly not being able to return, that is to say, to stray during the period of the work that applies to this second phase. Indeed, from the moment the Latin motto of the labyrinth is applied, the vitalized bodies begin their evolution, the compost, formed of vital bodies then covers the order, the most impenetrable mystery veils the progress of. This admirable metamorphosis, the rhythm, the harmony, and the profit that the man does not have the faculty to understand or to explain, abandoned to its own fate, subjected to the vicissitudes of fire and the darkness of its narrow prison, the regenerated matter follows the secret path traced by the fates. Panel 8 design erased, sculpture in relief disappeared, only the inscription remains, and the sharpness of its engraving stands out against the uniformity of the surrounding limestone. It reads, Nietzsche.self, heaven for me or the sky for me, to me the sky. An exclamation of ardent enthusiasm, of joyful boasting, some will say, from an adept in possession of the mastery. Perhaps. But is that really what the author's thought wants to convey? We allow ourselves to doubt it, because, Based on so many serious and positive motifs, epitaphs with a measured sense, we would prefer to see there the expression of a radiant hope directed towards the knowledge of celestial things, rather than the presumptuous and baroque idea of an illusory conquest of the Empyrean. It is evident that the philosopher, having achieved a tangible result of the hermetic labor, no longer ignores what is the power, the profoundness of the spirit, nor the truly prodigious action that he exercises on the inert substance. Strength, will, even science belong to the spirit. Life is the consequence of its activity, movement, evolution, progress are its results, and since everything holds together because of him, that everything is generated and discovered by him, it is reasonable to believe that everything must necessarily return to him. It is therefore important to observe its manifestations in serious matter, to study the laws to which it seems to obey, to know its directives to acquire. How can we retain hope of acquiring some notion of things and of the prime laws of the universe? Also, the less vague study of the hermetic work, the elements of a divine great work, from the conception of what is below is similar to what is above, Hermes has said, and it is through the persevering study of everything that is accessible to us that we can elevate our intelligence to the understanding of the inaccessible. It is there the nascent idea, in the ideal of the philosopher, of the fusion of the human spirit and the divine spirit, from the divine hearth, the return of the creature to the creator, 
from the burning, unique and pure hearth from which the martial spark ought, on the order of God, to associate itself with vile matter, until the completion of its earthly journey. Panel 9. Our predecessors did not recognize in this small subject the symbol attributed to the king of France Henri II. It consists of a simple lunar crescent, which this motto accompanies. Donic.totum.implete.orbum. Until it fills the entire world. Until it fills the entire world. We do not believe that the interpretation of this emblem, which Diane de Poitiers remains entirely committed to, may lend itself to the slightest equivocation. The youngest of the sons of science does not ignore the fact that the moon, the spagyric hieroglyph of silver, marks the final point of the work in white and the period of transition of the work from white to red. It is in the reign of the moon that the characteristic color of silver, that is, white, appears. Artifius, Nicholas Flamel, Philolethe, and the quantity of other masters teach that until this phase of the cooking the rebus offers the aspect of fine and silky hair, stretched out on the surface and converging from the periphery towards the center. Hence the name capillary whiteness, which designates this coloration. The moon, the texts say, is what serves as a sign for the first quarter. Under the influence of fire, the whiteness deepens, pervades the entire mass and turns, on the surface, to lemon yellow. It is the full moon, the crescent has amplified until it forms the perfect lunar disk, it has completely filled the orb. The matter is endowed with a certain degree of fixity and dryness, assured signs of the completion of the lesser mastery. If the artist does not wish to go further or cannot lead the work up to the red, he will only have to multiply this stone, by repeating the same operations, to increase it in power and virtue. And these repetitions can be renewed as many times as the matter will allow, that is to say as long as it is saturated with its spirit and that it fills the entire world. Beyond the point of saturation, its properties change, too subtle, it can no longer be coagulated. It remains thus as a thick oil, luminous in the darkness, henceforth without action on living beings, as on metallic bodies. What is true for the work in white is equally true for the great mastery. In this last one, it is enough only to increase the temperature, as soon as we have obtained the citrine whiteness, without however seeking or opening the vessel, on the condition that we have, at the beginning, subtitled the red ferment to the white sulfur. That is, at least, what Philolethe recommends and does not make Flamel disagree, although their apparent disagreement is easily explained if one well possesses the directives of the paths and operations. Whatever the case, in pursuing the action of the fourth degree of fire, the compost dissolves itself, of new colors succeed one another until what a weak red, qualified as peach blow, becoming little by little more intense as the dryness extends, announces the success and perfection of the work. Cooled, the material offers a crystalline texture, seemingly, it is said, of small rubies clumped together, rarely free, always of strong density and bright luster, frequently coated in an amorphous, opaque, and russet mass, named by the ancients the damned earth of the stone. This residue, easy to separate, is of no use and must be discarded. 7. Panel 1. This bar leaf presents to us a rock that the raging sea attacks and threatens to engulf, but two cherubs blow upon the waves and calm the tempest. The scroll that accompanies this figure exalts constancy in the face of dangers. In. Pericles. Constantia. In dangers, constancy. The philosophical virtue that the artist must preserve during the course of the coction, and especially at the beginning of it, when the unleashed elements clash and repel each other with violence. Later, despite the length of this thankless phase, the burden is less onerous to bear, for the effervescence calms down, and peace finally arises from the triumph of the spiritual elements, air and fire, symbolized by the cherubs, agents of our mysterious elementary conversion. However, regarding this conversion, is it not superfluous to provide here some clarifications on the manner in which the phenomenon occurs, about which the ancients have made evidence, in our opinion, of excessive reserve. Every alchemist knows that the stone is composed of the four elements united by a powerful cohesion, in a state of perfect equilibrium. What is less known, is the way in which the natural and perfect equilibrium of these four primary elements dissolves into three principles, following the physical rules that the artist must assemble in the art of coction. Indeed, these primary elements, considering the preparations by the sea, water, the rock, earth, the sky, air, presented in our panel as angels, are reduced to salt, sulfur, and mercury, representing water, fluid, fire, ignition, and mercury, spirit, and the stone itself. From these principles, material principles notably combined in mercury, because they are reputed to be partly composed of metallic substances, one, the salt, appears to be partly made up of volatile substance. 
In chemistry, we know that salts, formed in part of volatile substance, by their decomposition, the volatility of an acid and of a base, fixed by each other. As the salt participates in the nature of the same igneous and fixed earth, earth, and of the sulfur principle by its igneous dryness and volatility, air, and of the sulfur principle by its components sulfur and mercury, fire, it thus serves as a mediator between the qualities, the salt allows to realize our embryo. Thanks to its double quality, the salt permits the conjunction, which would be impossible without it, between one and the other antagonistic principles of the hermetic star. Thus, the four primary elements effectively affect their dual in pairs in the stone in formation because the salt possesses the fire and air necessary for the assembly of the sulfur earth and mercury water. However, although the saline components are neighbors to the sulfurous and mercurial natures, because the fire searches for earthly food and the air willingly mixes with water, they do not have such an affinity for the material and ponderable principles of the work, sulfur and mercury, that their mere presence, their catalysis, are capable of avoiding any discord in this philosophical marriage. On the contrary, it is only after long debates and multiple clashes that the salt, that air and fire, breaking their saline association, act together to re-establish concord among enemies that a simple difference in evolution has separated. The task, therefore, completed, our young monarch dies so that he may spread his sovereign will over the entire metallic nature. Case in two, the humidity has rusted the table in such a way that it deprives it of the relief it once had. The imprecise and broken features could previously have belonged to some plants. The inscription has suffered a lot. Only a few letters were able to resist the damage of time. M.Re, V.Rv. It is impossible, with so few elements, to restore the phrase. However, according to the work entitled Paysage at Monuments du Poitou, which we have already cited, the plants would be ears of weed and the inscription should read. Mihi.mori.lucur. For me, to die is gain, or the word is a gain for me. It is an allusion to the necessity of the mortification and decomposition of our mineral seed. For just as the grain of wheat could not germinate, produce and multiply if putrefaction had not liquefied it in the earth, so it is indispensable for the disintegration of the philosophical rebus, where the seed is enclosed, to generate a new being of a similar nature but capable of increasing itself, both in spirit and volume, in power and virtue. At the center of the closed, informed, living, immortal vessel, always ready to manifest its action, awaits only the decomposition of the body, the dislocation of its parts, to work towards the purification and then the refinement of the substance, with the help of fire. Thus it is matter, made coarse by the crude mercury of the philosopher, which speaks in the epitaph mihi mori lucrum. Not only does it assure the physical benefit of a corporeal envelope much more noble than the first, but it also gives, in addition, an energetic life force which it did not possess, and the generative faculty which a bad constitution had until then deprived it. Such is the reason why our adept, in order to give a sensible image of the hermetic regeneration by the death of the compost, has sculpted ears under the parabolic motto of this little subject. Case in three, issuing from thick clouds, a hand whose forearm holds an olive branch. This coat of arms, of a morbid character, has for motto, Pratenti, Linetver. Dollar. To the prudent one, the pain is soothed, the sage knows how to soothe his pain. The olive branch, a symbol of peace and concord, signifies the perfect union of the elements that the creators of the philosopher's stone promise. Indeed, this stone, through the knowledge it bestows upon the philosopher, allows one to dominate the suffering that affects other men, and to overcome the moral pains and the effects of a large number of physical diseases by suppressing their cause. The very elaboration of the elixir shows that death, a transformation necessary but not real annihilation, should not scare us. Quite the contrary, the soul, freed from the heavy corporeal burden, enjoys, in full expansion, a marvelous independence, bathed in this ineffable light, accessible only to pure spirits in certain phases of material vitality and existence. It knows that the others follow each other according to the laws that govern their rhythm and their periods. The soul does not leave its terrestrial body except to animate a new one. The elder of yesterday is the child of tomorrow. The missing ones find each other, the lost come closer, the dead are reborn. The mysterious attraction that binds among them beings and things of evolution, unknown to them, reunites those who still live and those who are no more. There is no real, absolute separation for the initiated, and only the absence can cause him sorrow. His affections, although clothed in a different envelope, will be recognized easily, though wearing a different guise, because the spirit, of immortal essence and endowed with eternal memory, will know how to make him discern these certainties, materially verified through the long work on the great work, Grant him an unshakable moral serenity, calm amidst human agitations, 
disdain for worldly joys, a stoic resolve, and above all, that powerful comfort which comes from the secret knowledge of his origins and his destiny. Physically, the medicinal properties of the elixir protect its fortunate possessor from defects and physiological miseries. Thanks to it, the sage knows how to soothe his pain. Batster certifies that it cures all the body's external diseases. Ulcers, scrofula, paralysis, wounds, and such other afflictions, being dissolved in a suitable liquor and applied to the ailment, by means of a cloth imbued with the liquor. On his part, the author of an enlightened alchemical manuscript also extols the high virtues of the medicine of the sages. The elixir, he writes, is a divine ash, more miraculous than otherwise, and it separates itself, as one can see, according to the recalcitrant nature of the evil. The necessity that presents itself does not refuse anyone, as much for the health of the human body as for the nourishment of this perishable and transitory life, than for the resurrection of the metallic bodies imperfect. In truth, it surpasses all the theriacs and medicines more excellent that men could make, so subtle they are, it makes the man who possesses it blessed, serious, dignified, notable, bold, generous, magnanimous. Finally, Jacques Tesson converted the wise counsel on the employment of the art, of the fruit of which we have spoken, the author says, addressing the subject on how it should be applied, it's a blessing coming from you. Now, we will say away with worldly pomps, apply it, it's to relieve the poor, and not the rich and powerful, it's to heal the needy sick, and not the great ones of the earth. For we must take care to whom we give, and see who we must relieve, in the infirmities and diseases that afflict the human race. Do not administer this powerful remedy except by an inspiration from God, who sees all, knows all, orders all. Case in one, here now is one of the major symbols of the great work, the figure of the Gnostic circle, formed by the body of the serpent that devours its tail, with, for device, the Latin word, amicidia, or friendship friendship. The circular image is, in effect, the geometrical expression of unity, of affinity, of balance, and of harmony all points on the circumference being equidistant from the center and in close contact with one another, they realize an orb that is continuous and closed, which has no beginning point and can never end, just as God in metaphysics, infinity in space and eternity in time. The Greeks named this serpent the Ouroboros, from the words Omicron Rho, tail, and Delta Omega, eating. In the Middle Ages, it was assimilated to a dragon, imposing an attitude and esoteric value similar to those of the Hellenic serpent. Such is the reason for the associations of reptiles, natural or fabulous, that one almost always finds in old authors. Draco out serpents qui caudam de borvit, serpents out lacerta veritas k proprium caudam de borvit, etc. Draco out serpents qui caudam de borvit, a dragon or serpent that has devoured its tail, serpents out lacerta veritas qua proprium caudam de borvit, a serpent or green lizard that has devoured its own tail. So we have, a dragon or serpent that has devoured its tail lizard that has devoured its own tail, and a serpent or green, they write frequently. On the monuments, on the other hand, the dragon, allowing more movement and picturesque than in decorative composition. It seems to please artists more, it is him that they represent most, given the importance of this emblem. It is, along with the seal of Solomon, a distinctive sign of the magnum opus, its meaning allows for varied interpretations. A hieroglyph of absolute solubility, of the indissolubility of the four principal elements and the two principles combined into unity in the philosopher's stone, this universality allows its use and attribution to the various phases of the work, since all aim at the same goal and are oriented towards assembly, homogeneity of the original natures, the mutation of their native antipathy into solid and stable friendship. Generally, the head of the dragon or of the Ouroboros marks the fixed part, and its tail the volatile part of the compound. This is how the commentator Mark Francis Antonio understands it. This earth, he says speaking of sulfur, by its innate dryness and infertility, attracts to itself its own humidity and consumes it. Because of that, it is compared to the dragon that devours its tail. For the rest, it does not attract and assimilate its humidity except that which is of the same nature. Other philosophers make a different application, like Linthout, who relates it to the colored phases. There are, he writes, three principal colors that must appear in the work, black, white, red. The black color, the first color, is named by the ancients the venomous dragon, when they say, the dragon devours its own tail. Esotericism is equivalent in the Très Précieuse Don de Dieu, by Georges Auroch. David de Plainus Campi, further removed from doctrine, sees only one version of spagyric cohabitations. As for us, always understanding the Ouroboros as a complete symbol of the alchemical work and of the felt continuum, 
whatever the opinion of the scholars of our time on this figure, we can at least be certain that all the attributes placed under the aegis of the serpent biting its tail are exclusively those of the grand oeuvre and present a particular character, conforming to the secret teaching of the hermetic science. Box 5, yet another subject has disappeared from the ducal stone. Some incoherent letters appear only on the crumbled limestone. C.O. Ia. Box 6, a large six-rayed star shines over the waves of a moving sea. Above it, the banner carries this Latin motto of which the first word is written in Spanish. .lbz .in .tenebris or light shines in the darkness. The light shines in the darkness. We would be astonished that others do not take the same precautions for their works as we do, thinking that the sculptor must have been mistaken. But, once the clouds clear and the representation of the water and the stars is made, we will quickly be convinced that there is no error, contempt, or bad faith on our part. However, by this starfish, the author of the image does not pretend to represent the common starfish, vulgarly called sea star. This one only has five radiating arms, while ours lacks the sixth distinctive branch. We must therefore see here the indication of a starry water, symbolized by another star the Virgin Mother and her son symbolize, Stella Maris, Mercury obtained in the form of a white and bright metallic water, which the philosophers also call Ostra, from the Greek sigma tau rho, bright, shining. Thus, the work of art makes manifest and external what was previously diffused in the dark, coarse, and vile mass of the primitive subject. From the obscure chaos, it brings forth the light after having gathered it, and this light now shines in the darkness, just as a star in the night sky. All chemists have known and acknowledged this subject, which not many can extract the quintessence of, radiant, so important for its virtues in the opacity of the body. This is why Philolethes recommends to the student not to despise the astral signature, revealing the prepared mercury. Take care, he says, to set your course by the north star, which our magnet will make appear. Then the wise will rejoice, the fool, nevertheless, will hold on to little and will not learn wisdom, and even less, without understanding its value, this central pole made of cross lines, a wonderful mark of the Almighty. Greatly intrigued by this star, of which he could not explain the importance or the meaning, Hofer turned to the Hebrew Kabbalah. Yesod, he writes, signifies at the same time foundation and mercury, because mercury is the foundation of the transmutational art. The nature of Mercury is indicated by the names, El Chai slash God Living, whose letters produce, by their summation, the number 49, and Kokaf, star. But what sense should we attach to the word? Let's, listen to the Kabbalah, the character of the true Mercury consists in covering itself, by the action of heat, with a film approaching more or less the color of gold, and this can be done even in the space of a single night. This is the mystery indicated by the word, star. This exegesis does not satisfy us. A film, of whatever color it may be, does not resemble at all the starry, radiations, and our own works are guaranteed by an effective signature, which presents all the geometric and regular characters of a perfectly designed star. Also, let us adopt the language, less chemical but truer, of the ancient masters, to this Kabbalistic description of red oxide of mercury. It is in the nature of light, says the author of a celebrated work, to not appear to our eyes without being dressed in some body and it is necessary for that body to be also suitable for receiving the light, where there is light, there must also be necessary the capacity to receive it. It is therefore clear that the body itself must also be suitable for receiving light, and so that light, which the spirit envelops and conceals from us, must necessarily also be the vehicle of that light. This is the easiest way to ensure you do not stray into error mingled with the light of your spirit, the light that is shrouded in darkness, and then learn that the most vile of all subjects according to the ignorant, is the most noble according to the wise. In an allegorical account regarding the preparation of Mercury, Trismason is more categorical still, he affirms, as do we, the visual reality of the hermetic seal. At the break of day, says our author, one will see emerging above the person of the king a very resplendent star, and the daylight will illuminate the darkness. As for the mercurial nature of the support of the star, which is the sky of philosophers, Nicolas Valois has given us a clear explanation in the following passage, the wise, he says, call their whole work the sea, and as soon as the body is reduced to water, which it was first composed of, it is called sea water, because it is truly a sea, in which many wise navigators have suffered shipwreck, not having this star as a guide, which will never fail those who have once known it. It is this star that led the wise at the birth of the Son of God, and the same that makes us see the birth of this young king. Finally, in his catechism or instruction for the apprentice, attached to his work titled The Flamboyant Star, Baron Chaudy informs us of the name of the philosophers among the French Freemasons.
Nature, he says, is not visible, although it acts visibly, for it is only a volatile spirit, which does its work within the body, and which is animated by the universal spirit, which we know, in common masonry, under the respectable emblem of the flamboyant star. Box 7. At the foot of a tree laden with fruit, a woman plants several seeds in the ground, on the phylactery, one end of which is held by the trunk, and the other unfolds above the character, we read this Latin phrase, tv.me.c.malice, which is do not yield to misfortunes or do not give in to evils, do not give in to errors, it is an encouragement to persevere on the path that our philosopher has followed, a method that does not give itself to the simplistic, naive imitation of nature, rather than chasing vain chimeras. The ancients often designated alchemy under the name of agricultural work, because it follows, in its laws, circumstances and conditions, a certain relationship with terrestrial agriculture. There is no classic author who does not take examples and establishes demonstrations on the rural labors. The hermetic analogy thus appears based on the art of the cultivator. Just as the same wheat grain is necessary to obtain an ear, item est granum frumenti, so it is essential to have the metallic seed first, in order to multiply the metal. Indeed, each fruit carries within it its seed, and every body, whatever it may be, possesses its own. The delicate point, which Philolethes calls the pivot of the art, consists of knowing how to extract the metal or the mineral from the raw prime matter. That is the reason why the artist must, at the beginning of his work, decompose entirely what has been assembled by nature, for he who ignores the means of destroying the metals, also ignores that of perfecting them. Having obtained the ashes of the body, they are subjected to calcination, which will expel the impure and heterogeneous dross, and leave the essential metal, the incorruptible and pure part that the flame cannot overcome. The wise have called it sulfur, the first agent or philosophical, but every seed capable of germinating, of growing and of bearing fruit, claims its own proper soil. The alchemist also needs, a terrain appropriate to the species that nature of his seed. Here again, it is the mineral kingdom that will provide the land. Certainly, this second task will require more effort and time than the first. Does it not perfectly align with the art of the cultivator? Do we not see all the care of this last one directed towards an exact and perfect preparation of the soil? While the seeds are done quickly and without much effort, the earth, on the contrary, it requires several laborious tasks, a fair distribution of hard work, and the long breath of one who knows how to handle manures, etc., painful tasks and long patience whose analysis of fertilizers and the philosophical great work share an analogy. May the true disciples of Hermes then study the simple and effective means capable of isolating the metallic seed, mother and nurse of our mercury, mercury, and sulfur, that they strive to purify this mercury and to exalt its faculties, to increase the fecundity of the humus by absorbing it instead of the peasant who incorporates the necessary organic products, especially since they scorn sophisticated procedures, capricious formulas subject to the greed of the ignorant or the abbot, those who interrogate nature, who ask how it operates, diligently seek to closely imitate her. If they do not let themselves be led astray by the error spread profusely in the rejected and discredited books, without a doubt, they will finally see the success crown their efforts. All art is summarized in discovering the seed, sulfur or means, in a specific earth or mercury, then to subject these elements to fire, according to a regimen of four increasing temperatures, which constitute the four seasons of the work. But the great secret is that of mercury, and it is in vain that one cherishes the operation in the works of the most celebrated authors. Is it not preferable to go from the known to the unknown, by the analogical method, if one desires to approach the truth about an object that has caused the despair, and has been the ruin of so many more enthusiastic than profound investigators? Case in eight, this bar-relief bears only the image of a circular shield, and the historical injunction of the mother Sparta. Dot AVT. HVNC. AVT. Spur. Dot HVNC either this or upon this, which is the condensed version of a longer Spartan phrase, originally in Laconian, a dialect of ancient Greek, which was traditionally said to have been told by Spartan mothers to their sons as they handed them their shield before going to battle, implying that they should either return carrying their shield in victory or carried upon it in death, as losing one's shield in battle was considered a disgrace. With him, or upon him, nature here addresses the son of science who is preparing to undertake the first operation. We have already said that this manipulation, very delicate, involves real danger, since the artist must provoke the old dragon, guardian of the Hesperides orchard, compel it to fight, then kill it without mercy if it refuses to be a victim. To conquer or to die, such is the veiled meaning of the inscription. Our champion, despite his bravery, must not act with too much prudence, 
for the future of the work and his own destiny depend on this first success. The figure of the shield, in Greek sigma pi sigma, aspis, shelter, protection, defense, indicates the need for a defensive weapon, that is the spear, lambda gamma chi eta, lash, fate, destiny, as for the weapon of attack, it is the lance, delta rho upsilon, dori, or the estoc, a 14th century sword, called, stiletias, in Greek, semicolon that he must employ. Unless he prefers the method used by Bellerophon, riding Pegasus, to kill the chimera, the poet's fame that he plunged deeply into the throat of the monster a wooden spear, hard as lead, as soon as the lead melted, flowed down to the entrails of the beast, this simple and profound device quickly made sense. The chimera, irritated, vomited flames, and the artifice took swift reason from its guts. We call the attention of the beginner to the lance and to the shield, which are the best weapons that the knight, expert and confident in himself, can use if he emerges victorious from combat, those that will sign if he gets our symbolic shield, assuring him the possession of our crown. It is thus that, from laborer one becomes a knight, kappa nu pi iota sigma, root word of knuckle bones, which carry the caduceus. Others, even braver and with ardent faith, more combative in their own strength, gave up the sword, the lance, and the broadsword for the cross. Those conquered even better, for the dragon, material and demonic, never resisted the spiritual and almighty effigy of the Savior, to the ineffable sign of the Spirit and of the incarnate light, in hoc signo vincis. To the wise man, it is said, few words suffice, and we believe we have spoken enough for those who will take the trouble to understand us. Case in 9, a wildflower, having the appearance of a poppy, receives the light of the sun shining above it. This bar leaf suffers from unfavorable atmospheric conditions, or, perhaps, from the poor quality of the stone. The inscription that adorned a band roll whose trace is still visible has been completely erased. As we have previously analyzed a similar subject, series 2, case in 1, and since this motif is susceptible to several very different interpretations, we will keep silent, for fear of an error, given the absence of its particular motto. 8. 5th series, PL. 30. Case in 1, a horned stridge, hairy, provided with membranous wings, with veined and clawed feet and hands shaped like talons, is depicted crouching. The inscription makes this nightmare character speak in Spanish verses. Mas .penedo .mas .perdido .y .menos the more you have tormented me, the more you have lost me, and the less I have repented. The devil, the image of material grossness opposed to spirituality, is the hieroglyph of the first mineral substance, such that we find it in the dark places where miners go to extract it. It was once represented, in the figure of Satan, at Notre Dame de Paris, and the faithful, in a show of contempt and aversion, came to extinguish their candles by plunging them into its mouth, which it held open. It was, for the people, Master Pierre du Coignet, the cornerstone and the primitive block upon which the entire work is built. It must be admitted that, to be thus symbolized by such different and monstrous forms, dragon, serpent, vampire, devil, tarasque, etc. This unfortunate subject must indeed diverge from nature, made of black, seductive matter. Black, covered with flames, often adorned with red dots or with a yellow, friable and earthy coating, of strong and nauseating smell, which philosophers define as toxicum et venenum. It stains the fingers when it is touched and seems to gather all that can displease. Yet it is he, the primitive subject of the sages, vile and despised by the ignorant, who is the soul, the unique dispenser of the celestial water, the first mercury that the great alkaest. It is this loyal servant, not the same as the one that Mr. H. J. H. Potter, who calls Gaia, who made his master triumph over the contempt of Vera, also has it been named the universal solvent, not because it is capable of dissolving all the bodies of nature, which many have mistakenly believed, but because it can do everything in this small universe that is the grand work. In the 18th century, a time of passionate discussions among chemists and alchemists about the principles of the old science, the universal solvent had to be rediscovered anew. J. H. Pot, who aspired to a revival towards the numerous formulas of menstrua and strove to give a reasoned analysis, especially brings us the proof that none of their inventors understood what the adepts meant by their dissolution. Although these say that our mercury is amalgamated homogeneous to metals, most claim that our mercury sets itself outside and estranges the more or less distant metals from the mineral kingdom. Some believe they were preparing it by saturating it with volatile urinous spirit, ammoniac, or some acid, and then circulating this mixture. Others expounded on the urine's vaporous essence, in the design to produce the aerial spirit, etc. Becker, Physica Subterranea, Frankfurt, 
1669, and Bone, Epistle on the Insufficiency of Acid and Alkali, think that the alkahest is the purest mercury principle that is extracted from mercury or sea salt, by particular processes. Zobel, Margarita Medicinalis, and the author of the Lolius Redivivus prepare their solvent by saturating the spirit of sal ammoniac, hydrochloric acid, with the spirit of tartar, impure potassium carbonate, and crude tartar, potassium bitartrate. Hoffman and Paterius volatilize the tartar salt by first dissolving it in water, exposing the liquid to putrefaction in a wooden vessel in the heat, then subjecting it to sublimation once the earth that is in it has settled. The one that pot assures, is the precipitate that remains at the bottom behind the solvent, is the corrosive sublimate and the ammonia salt mixture. Whoever uses it properly can consider it as a true alkahest. Lefevre, Agricola, Robert Flood, De Nismet, Le Breton, Et Muller and others still, preferred the spirit of dew, as well as analogous extracts prepared with thunderstorm rains or with the oily scum that floats over mineral waters. Finally, after Longlay du Fresnoy, Olias Berichius, de origine chimie ad in conspectu chimiorum celebriorum, noon, 14, notes that Captain Thomas Perry, English, saw practiced in 1662 this same science, alchemy, at Fez in Barbary, and at the Grand Alcahest, the first matter of all the philosophers, has been known for a long time in Africa by the skillful Moorish artists, the Mohammedans. In summary, all the recipes for alcohest proposed by authors, particularly aiming at the liquid form attributed to the universal solvent, are useless, if not false, and are only good for spagyric. Our first matter is solid. The mercury it yields always presents itself with a saline aspect and with a hard consistency. And this is rightly stated by Bernard of Treviso, in his treatise on magnesia by its repeated destruction, by resolving and sublimating. With each operation, the body crumbles, disintegrates little by little, without apparent reaction, by abandoning a quantity of impurities, the extract, purified by sublimations, also loses heterogeneous parts, so that its virtue is condensed in the end into a weak mass, a volume and weight very inferior to those of the primitive mineral. This is what very precisely justifies the Spanish axiom, for the more numerous the iterations are, the more harm is done to the alcohol, because the more reiterations there are, the more one does wrong to the spirit. Case in two, a crown made of leaves and fruits, apples, pears, quinces, etc., is tied with ribbons from which equally four small laurel branches are knotted. The epigraph that frames it teaches us that no one will obtain it if they do not comply with the laws of combat. .nemo.accipit.key.non.legitime.certiverit. No one receives who is not fought lawfully. M. Louis Audiot sees it thus, his subject wears a laurel crown, this would not surprise us. Such an observation is often imperfect and the study of the detail does not preoccupy the observer. In reality, it is neither the ivy with which we crown the poets, nor the humble myrtle, nor the palm dear to the martyrs, nor the myrtle, the vine or the olive tree of the gods, which are here figured, nor the simple iron crown fructified by the sage. Its fruits mark the abundance of earthly goods acquired and multiplied by the skillful practice of the agriculture celeste. This is the modest laurel, a few twigs of which add so little, a little guide to pain. This is the honor of the hard working. And yet, this wisdom offers to learned and virtuous investigators a prize that is not easily won. Our philosopher tells us without ambiguity, harsh is the combat that the artist must deliver to the elements, if he wants to triumph in the great ordeal. As the errant knight, he must, orient his march towards the mysterious garden of the Hesperides and provoke the horrible monster that defends its entry. Such is, to remain in tradition, the allegorical language by which the sages intend to reveal the first and most important of the operations of the work. In truth, it is not the alchemist himself who defies and fights the hermetic dragon, but another beast, equally robust, charged with representing it and that the artist, as a prudent spectator, must always be ready to intervene, to encourage, to help and to protect. This is the master of arms of this strange and thankless duel. Few authors have spoken of this first encounter and of the danger it entails. To our knowledge, Siliani is certainly the adept who has pushed the furthest in the metaphorical description he gives of it. However, we have found nowhere a description so detailed, as exact in its images, as close to the truth and at the same time, as careful to guard the secret of life. The Eschenius is the pilot of the wave, our engraved stone, the alchemist, who must absorb the secret fire, the igneous energy of the salamander, and, finally, remain stable, permanent, always victorious under the safeguard and with the protection of his master. These two principles, of opposite nature and tendencies, manifest one towards the other in antipathy, an irreducible aversion. Brought into presence, they attack each other furiously, 
defend themselves with bitterness, and the combat, without truce or mercy, only ends with the death of one of the antagonists. Such is the esoteric duel, frightful but real, that the illustrious Cyrano tells us about in these terms. I walked about the space of 400 stages, at the end I noticed, in the middle of a very large countryside, balls that, after having briskly turned around each other for a long time, approached and then recoiled. And I observed that, when the time to strike was right, it was then that one heard those great blows. A bit far from me, there were two balls, and, from a distance, I recognized that which, although round at the bottom, formed at the top triangular animals. One of the heads was very high, with its red hair that floated through the middle, and was arranged in a pyramid. Its body was pierced like a sieve, and through these delicate orifices that served it for pores, one could see gliding small flames that seemed to cover it with a plumage of fire. In the middle of this combat, I met a very venerable old man who was watching this famous fight as much as I was. He signaled me to approach, I obeyed and we sat down one next to the other. Here is how he spoke to me. One would see in this globe where we are, the woods very clear seated, because of the great number of bed afu that desolate them, without the icy animals which, every day, come to the prayer of the forest their friends, come to heal the sick trees, I heal them, this, barely with their frozen mouth have they breathed on the burning coals, that they extinguish them, in the world from where I come and where I am, the bed afu is called salamandre, and the icy animal is known under the name of remor. Now, you will know that the remors are born towards the pole, in the deepest part of the glacial sea, and it is the extreme coldness of these fishes, through their scales, which makes evaporate in those parts the sea water, although salty. That Stygian water, with which the great Alexander was poisoned, which petrified his entrails, was the urine of one of these icy animals. Behold the creature that is made of such animals, the true animal glasson. But when it comes to the bed afu, they lodge in the earth, under mountains of lit bitumen, like Etna, Vesuvius, and the red cap, these buttons of bitumen ignited, as you see at the throat of this one, which proceed from the inflammation of his liver, are. We remained after that, silent, to witness this famous duel. The salamander attacked with a lot of ardor, but the remora supported imperturbably. Every blow they dealt was like a thunderclap, as it happens in the worlds around here, where the encounter of a warm cloud with a cold one excites the same noise. From the eyes of the salamander, there darted, at every sidelong glance of anger she gave towards her enemy, a red light that appeared a light, in flight, it sweated boiling oil. The remora, on its side, pisses burning water, completely scaly with ice, its large square and squat body of ice, its large eyes like two crystal torches, whose gaze carried a light so cold, that I felt winter shivering on any part of my body it attached to. If I thought of putting my hand forward, the hand, without touching it, felt cold, the air around it, reached by its rigor, turned into snow, the earth dried up because of it and I could count the traces of the beast by the number of patches of ice that welcomed me when I walked on them. At the beginning of the combat, the salamander, because of the vigorous contention of its first ardor, had made the whole plain sweat, but in the long run, this sweat having cooled, had iced the whole plain with such a slippery frost, that the salamander could not reach the remora without falling. We both agreed, the philosopher and I, that as much as she fell and got up so many times, she was tired, because these claps of thunder, previously so frightful, that gave birth to the shock with which she hit her enemy, were only the dull sound of these little blows that marked the end of a storm, and this dull sound, gradually fading, turned into a trembling similar to that of a red-hot iron plunged into cold water. When the remora saw that the combat was drawing to the woods by the weakening of the shock and that the shelter was barely shaken, she rose on an angle of her cube and let herself fall with all her weight on the stomach of the salamander, with such success that the heart of the poor salamander, where all the rest of her ardor was concentrated, by bursting made such a frightful crack that I know nothing in nature to compare it to. Thus moved the bed afu under the lazy resistance of the animal glasson. Some time after the remora had withdrawn, we approached the remains of the battlefield, and the old man, having smeared his hands with the earth over which it had walked, like a preservative against it, offered to dispose of the carcass of the salamander. With this body of the animal, he said to me, I have nothing to do but skin, because, provided it is hung on a rack, it will boil and roast everything I would have put on the other. As for the eyes, I keep them carefully, if they were cleansed of the shadows of death, you would take them for two little sons. The ancients of our world knew well how to put them to work, it is what they called lamps or dentists, and they were only hung on Pompeian sepulchres from illustrious persons. Our moderns have found in the rubble of some of these famous tombs, but their ignorance of what lies behind, in their view, the broken branches, this fire they thought they found behind the memory stones, 
they saw shining. Case in 3, a 15th century artillery piece is represented at the moment of the firing. It is surrounded by a phylactery bearing this Latin phrase, S.I. Non. Persero. Terribo. In English, as, if I hit no one, at least I will frighten. It is quite obvious that the creator of the subject meant to speak figuratively. We understand that he addresses himself directly to the profane, to the investigators devoid of science, incapable of consequently understanding these compositions, but who are nevertheless astonished by their number as much as by their singularity and their incoherence. The modern sages will take this ancient laborer for a work of art, and, just like a cannon misfired will only be noticed by its bang, our philosopher thinks rightly that what can be understood by all will astonish by the enigmatic, strange and discordant character that so many symbols and scenes inapplicable affect. Let us also think that the curious and picturesque side of these figures retains the spectator above all, without enlightening him. This is what seduced Mr. Louis Audiot and all the authors who have occupied themselves with Dampierre. Their descriptions are at the bottom of a noise of parrot's confections, useless and disproportionate. But, useless for the instruction of the curious, they nevertheless bring us the testimony that no observer, to our knowledge, has discovered the general idea hidden behind these motifs, nor the high range of the mysterious teaching that emerges from it. Case in 4, Narcissus tries to seize, in the basin where he sees himself. Thomas de Cornet reports that in 1401, a peasant unearthed near the Tiber, at some distance from Rome, a lamp of palace which had burned for more than 2,000 years, as seen by the inscription, without anything being able to extinguish it. The flame went out as soon as a small hole was made in the ground. It was discovered also, during the pontificate of Paul III, 1534-1549, in the tomb of Tullia, daughter of Cicero, a perpetual lamp, still burning and giving off a bright light, although this tomb had not been opened for 1550 years. The Reverend S. Matir, of the London Missions, reports a lamp in the Temple of Trevendrum, Kingdom of Travancore, Southern India. This gold lamp, shining in a hollow covered with a stone has been burning for more than 120 years, and is still burning at the present time. The admiration of his own image, causing his metamorphosis into a flower, so that he may come back to life, thanks to these waters which have given him death. Ut. Productres.puriet.vivere.posset.acvis. Narcissuses are plants with white or yellow flowers, and these are the flowers that have been distinguished by mythologists and symbolists. They indeed offer the respective colorations of the two sulfurs that orient the two masters. All alchemists know that one must use exclusively white sulfur for the celestial work, and yellow sulfur for the solar work, carefully avoiding mixing them, following the excellent advice of Nicolas Flamel. From it would result a monstrous generation, without future and without virtue. Narcissus here is the emblem of the dissolved metal. His Greek name, Nu Rho Kappa Iota Sigma Sigma Omicron Sigma, comes from the root Nu Rho Kappa Eta or Nu Rho Kappa Alpha, numbness, stupor. Now, the reduced metals, whose life is latent, concentrated, drowsy, rekindled by this very fact to remain in a state of inertia analogous to that of hibernating animals or of the sick under the influence of a narcotic, Nu Alpha Rho Kappa Omega Tau Iota Kappa Sigma, narcoticos, for which the root is Nu Rho Kappa Eta, narke. Also, one says, dead, by comparison with alchemical metals that art has vivified and vitalized. As for the sulfur extracted by the solvent, mercurial water of the basin, it remains the only representative of Narcissus, that is to say, of the metal dissociated and destroyed. But, just as the image reflected by the mirror carries all the apparent characters of the real object, similarly, the sulfur retains the specific properties and the metallic nature of the decomposed body. So much so that this sulfur principle, a true seed of the metal, finding in the mercury of the living nutritive elements and vivifiers, can thereafter generate a new being similar to it, of superior essence, however, and capable of obeying the dynamic evolutionary. Therefore, it is with good reason that Narcissus, metal transformed into a flower, or sulfur, as the philosophers say, is the flower of all metals, hopes to find existence again, thanks to the particular virtue of the waters that caused its death. If he cannot extract his image from the wave that imprisons him, at least it will allow him to materialize in a double in which he will find his essential characteristics preserved. Thus, what causes the death of one of the principles gives life to the other, since the initial mercury, the living metallic water, dies to provide sulfur to the dissolved metal elements of its resurrection. This is why the ancients always affirmed that it was necessary to kill the living in order to resurrect the dead. The practical application of this axiom assures the wise man the possession of live sulfur, the main agent of the stone and of transformation. Without any additional commentary, 
Please translate this entire French text verbatim into English. When doing so note that there may be Greek or Latin text throughout this work. Translate the French but only transcribe the Greek or Latin. It still allows one to realize the second axiom of the work, to join life to life, by uniting the mercury firstborn of nature, to this active sulfur to obtain the mercury of philosophers, a pure, subtle, sensitive, and living substance. This is the operation that the sages have reserved under the expression of the comical wedding of the brother and sister, for they are all of the same blood and have the same origin, of Gabricius and Bea, of the sun and the moon, of Apollo and Diana. This last term has provided to the Kabbalists the famous ensign of Apollonius of Tiana, under which one believed to recognize a pretended philosopher, although the miracles of this fictitious character, of undeniably hermetic nature, were, for the initiated, dressed with the symbolic seal and consecrated to alchemical esotericism. Case in 5, Noah's Ark floats on the waters of the flood, while nearby a boat threatens to sink. In the sky of the subject read the words, Veritas.Vincent, or in English as, Truth Conquers, Victorious Truth. We have already said that the arch represents the totality of materials prepared and united under various names of compound, rebus, amalgam, etc., which properly constitute the archi, the igneous matter, the base of the philosopher's stone. The Greek rho chi, arch, signifies commencement, principle, source, origin, under the action of external fire, exciting the internal fire of the archi, the entire compost liquefies, takes on the appearance of water, and this liquid substance, which fermentation agitates and swells, takes on, among authors, the character of the diluvian flood. First jaundiced and turbulent, it is given the name of Latin or Laeton which is none other than that of the mother of Diana and Apollo, Latona. The Greeks called it Lambda Tau Nu, Latin, from Lambda Tau Sigma, Latos, also written as the Ionic variant of Lambda Tau Sigma, Latos, with the Ionic sense of common, common house Tau Lambda Tau Nu, to Latin, indicative of the common protective envelope to the double embryo. Let us note, in passing, that the Kabbalists, by one of these calms of which they are accustomed, have indicated that the fermentation must be done with the help of a wooden vessel, or, better, in a tonneau cut in two, to which they apply the epithet of Shen Kru. Latona, mythological princess, becomes, in the language of the adepts, La Tun, La Tano, which explains why beginners find it so difficult to identify the secret vessel where our matters ferment. After the required time, one can see rising to the surface, floating and constantly moving under the effect of ebullition, a very thin film, in meniscus, that the sages have named the philosophical isle, manifestation of the thickening and of the coagulation. It is the famous Isle of Delos, in Greek Delta Lambda Omicron Sigma, that is to say apparent, clear, certain, which offers an unexpected refuge to Latona fleeing the persecution of Juno, and fills the heart of the artist with an immense joy without mixture. This floating isle, which Poseidon, with a strike of his trident, made emerge from the depths of the sea, is also Noah's saving ark carried on the waters of the flood. Cum viderem quad aqua sensum crassior, Nobis disit Hermes, Duriurc Fieri and Cyparet, Gaudabam, Certo enim Siabam, Ut in Venerum quad quarabam, or in English as, when I saw that the water gradually became thicker, Hermes tells us, and began to harden, I rejoiced, for I certainly knew that I would find what I was searching for. Gradually, and under the continuous action of the internal fire, the film thickens, spreads in extent until it covers the entire surface of the molten mass. The floating isle is then fixed, and this spectacle gives the alchemist the assurance that the time of the layers of Latona has arrived. At this moment, the mystery reasserts its rights. A heavy, dark, livid cloud rises and exhales from the warm and stabilized isle, shrouding this land and partitioning, enveloping and dissolving all things in its opacity, filling the philosophical sky with Sumerian shadows, kappa upsilon nu epsilon rho epsilon nu, chimerin, literally to be dark, and, in the great eclipse of the sun and the moon, steals from the eyes the supernatural birth of the hermetic twins, future parents of the stone. The Mosaic tradition reports that God saw the light, that it was good, and towards the end of the flood, makes a warm wind blow over the waters which evaporates them and lowers the level. The tops of the mountains emerge from the immense liquid sheet, and the ark then comes to rest on Mount Ararat, in Armenia. Noah, opening the window of the vessel, releases the raven, which is, for the alchemist and in his tiny genesis, the replica of the Sumerian shadows, of those dark clouds that accompany the elaboration of new beings and regenerated bodies. Through these correspondences, and the material testimony of the work itself, truth asserts itself victorious, despite the deniers, the skeptics, men of little faith, 
always ready to reject, in the domain of illusion and the marvelous, the positive reality they could not understand because it is not known and even less taught. Case in 6, a woman, kneeling at the foot of a tomb on which this strange word is read, Tiasi. The deepest despair is conveyed, the banner that adorns this figure bears the inscription, Victa.jasset.virtus, or in English that is virtue lies defeated, truth lies vanquished, the motto of André Chenier, Louis Audiot tells us, by way of explanation, and without considering the time elapsed between the Renaissance and the Revolution. It is not here a question of the poet, but of the truth of sulfur, or of the wise men's gold, which rests under the stone, waiting for the complete decomposition of its perishable body. For the sulfurous earth, dissolved in the mercurial water, prepared by the death of the compound, the liberation of this virtue, which is mainly the soul or the fire of sulfur, and this virtue, momentarily predominant over the corporeal envelope, or this immortal spirit, floated on the chaotic waters, until the formation of the new body, as Moses indicates in Genesis, ch. 1, v. 2. It is therefore the hieroglyph of mortification that we have under our eyes, and it is this which is also repeated in the engravings of the Preciosa Margarita novella that Pierre Bon de Lombardie illustrated in his treatise on the Grand Oeuvre. Many philosophers have adopted this mode of expression and veiled, under funereal or macabre subjects, the putrefaction specifically applied to the second work, that is to say, the operation charged with decomposing and liquefying the philosophical sulfur, derived from the first labor, into a perfect elixir. Basile Valentin shows us a skeleton standing on its own coffin, in one of his deuce clefts, and paints us a scene of inhumation in another. Flamel places not only the humanized symbols of the Ars Magna on the chariot of the innocents, but also decorates his tombstone, which can be seen exposed in the chapel of the Cluny Museum, with a skeleton gnawed by worms with this inscription. Of earth I came and to earth I return. Dot Senior Zadith contains, within a transparent sphere, a dying emaciated figure. Henri de Linthout sketches, on a page of the Aurore, the lifeless body of a crowned king lying on the mortuary slab, while his spirit, in the shape of an angel, rises towards a lantern lost in the clouds. And we ourselves, after these great masters, have exploited the same theme in the frontispiece of the mystery of the cathedrals. As for the woman who, on the tomb of Arcason, translates her regrets into disordered gestures, she represents the metallic mother of sulfur. It is to her that the singular vocable engraved on the stone that covers her child belongs. Tiasi. This Baroque term, undoubtedly born from the whimsy of our adept is, in reality, nothing but a Latin phrase assembled in reverse order so that it can be read starting from the end. Sic I at, alas, thus at least. Could he be reborn? The ultimate hope at the heart of the utmost pain. Jesus himself had to suffer in his flesh, die and remain three days in the tomb, in order to redeem mankind, and then to resurrect in the glory of his human incarnation and the fulfillment of his divine mission. Case in 7. Represented in full flight, a dove holds an olive branch in its beak. This subject is distinguished by the inscription, .si, k.fata.vocant, or in English if the fates call you, if destiny calls you. The emblem of the dove with the olive branch is given by Moses in his description of the universal deluge. It is indeed said, Genesis, ch. 8, v. 11, that Noah, having released the dove, saw it return towards evening bringing back an olive branch. This is the sign par excellence of the true path and the march of the operations. For the work of the work being an abbreviation and a reduction of creation, all the circumstances of the divine work must be found in small in the work of the alchemist. Consequently, when the patriarch sends out the raven from the ark, we must understand that it is a question, for our work, of the first durable color, that is to say the black color, because once the composition has become effective, the materials putrefy and take on that dark blue color comparable to the very dark one that the metallic reflections allow to guess on the feathers of the raven. Moreover, the biblical account specifies that this bird, detained by the cadavers, does not return to the ark. However, the analogical reason which attributes to it the black color and the term raven is not uniquely due to its dark appearance. The philosophers have again given to the compost the old medieval oath name of core blue, from which comes the cabalistic term corbeau. Not that it is pleasing to the sight, but because it brings the first happy omen of the philosophical materials. Nevertheless, despite the appearance of the black color, we are inclined to recognize in the apparitions that with reserve, we refuse to welcome these demonstrations which do not attribute any more value than they have. We know how easy it is to detect foreign substances, as long as they comply with the rules of the art. This criterion, therefore, 
is insufficient and justifies the common axiom that any matter dries up and corrupts in the humidity that is natural and homogeneous to it. This is the reason for which we caution beginners, before giving themselves over to the transports of a joy without tomorrow, to prudently await the manifestation of the color green, the symptom of the desiccation of the earth, of the absorption of the waters, and of the vegetation of the newly formed body. Thus, brother, if heaven deigns to bless your labor and, as the saying of the adept goes, si te fata vocant, you will first obtain the olive branch, symbol of peace and union of the elements, then the white dove that will have brought it to you. Only then can you be certain of possessing that admirable light, the gift of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus sent, on the fiftieth day, Pentecost, to his beloved apostles. Such is the material consecration of the initiatory baptism and of the divine revelation, and as Jesus came out of the water, St. Mark tells us, ch. 1, v. 10, John suddenly saw the heavens open and the Holy Spirit descend upon him in the bodily form of a dove. Case in 8, two forearms whose hands join together, emerge from a cord of clouds, they have for their motto, dot accepti dot 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 for them, or in English as, accept and give trust, receive my word and hold it dear. This motif is, in essence, a translation of the sign used by alchemists to express the element water. Clouds and arms form a triangle with the tip pointing downwards, a hieroglyph of water, opposed to the fire symbolized by an upright triangle that seems similar but inverted. It is certain that we could not understand our first mercurial water under this emblem of union, since the two clasped hands in a pact of fidelity and attachment belong to two distinct individuals. We have said, and we repeat here, that the initial mercury is a simple product, and the first agent charged with extracting the sulfurous and fiery part of metals. However, if the separation of sulfur by this solvent allows some mercury to be retained, or allows it to absorb a certain amount of sulfur, although these combinations can receive the denomination of philosophical mercury, we should not yet hope to realize the stone solely by this mixture. Experience shows that philosophical mercury, subjected to distillation, easily leaves its fixed body, leaving the pure sulfur at the bottom of the flask. On the other hand, and despite the assurance of authors who grant mercury preponderance in the work, we note that sulfur designates itself as the essential agent, since ultimately it is the one that, as the agent of the elixir or multiplied under that of the stone, is exalted under the name of philosophical fire. Philosophical, in the final product of the work. Thus mercury, whatever it is, remains subject to sulfur, for it is its servant and its slave, which, allowing itself to be absorbed, disappears and confuses with its master. As a consequence, as the universal medicine is a true generation, all generation cannot be accomplished without the aid of two factors, of similar species but of different sex, we must recognize that the philosophical mercury is impotent to produce the stone, and this because it is alone. It is, however, the one that plays the role of the female, but this one, say dispagnet and philolethe, must be united with the second male, if one wants to obtain the compound known under the name of rebus, the first matter of the magister. It is the mystery of the hidden word, or verbum demissum, which our adept has received from his predecessors, which he transmits to us under the veil of the symbol, and for the conservation of which he asks us for our oath, that is to say the promise not to disclose what he has judged good to keep secret, excipi dac fidem. Hasten 9. On rocky ground, two doves, unfortunately decapitated, face each other, they carry for an epitaph the Latin adage, dot concordia dot infiara dot amram. Concord nourishes love. Eternal truth, which we find application of everywhere here below, and which the great work confirms by the most striking example that it is possible to encounter in the mineral order. The hermetic work in its entirety is, in effect, a perfect harmony realized after the natural tendencies of inorganic bodies among themselves, of their chemical affinity and, if the word is not too excessive, of their reciprocal love. The two birds composing the subject of our bar relief represent those famous doves of Diana an object of despair for so many searchers, and famous enigma imagined by Philolethe to cover the artifice of the wise man's double mercury. By proposing to the sagacity of the aspirants this obscure allegory, the great adept did not elaborate on the origin of these birds, he only teaches, in the briefest way, that the doves of Diana are inseparably enveloped in the eternal embraces of Venus. Now, the ancient alchemists placed under the protection of Diana with lunar horns this first mercury which we have often spoken of under the name of universal solvent. Its whiteness, its silver brightness also earned at the epithet of moon of philosophers and mother of the stone, it is in the way Hermes understands it when he says, speaking of the work, the sun is his father and the moon his mother. Limon of Saint Didier, to help the investigator decipher the enigma, writes in the dialogue of Eudox and Pyrophilus, 
Finally, consider by what means Gaber prescribes to make the sublimations required by this art. For myself, I cannot do more than to echo the wish made by another philosopher. May the stars of Venus and Diana grant you favorable outcomes. Therefore, we can consider the doves of Diana as two parts of dissolving Mercury, the two points of the lunar crescent, against one of Venus, which must tightly embrace its favorite doves. This correspondence is confirmed by the double quality, volatile and aerial, of the initial Mercury whose emblem has always been among birds, and by the very matter from which Mercury emerges, the rocky, chaotic, sterile ground where the doves rest. When the scripture tells us, the Virgin Mary fulfilled the law of Moses, the seven days of purification, Exodus, 13, 2, Joseph accompanied her to the temple of Jerusalem, in order to present there the child and the sacrifice, according to the law of the Lord, Leviticus, 12, 6, 8, that is, a couple of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Thus appears, in the sacred text, the mystery of the ornithogallum, that famous bird's milk, apostrophe rho nu theta omega nu gamma lambda alpha, ornithengala, about which the Greek spoke as something extraordinary and very rare. To milk the birds apostrophe rho nu theta omega nu gamma lambda alpha mu lambda gamma epsilon iota nu, ornithengala emil gain, was a proverb among them equivalent to succeeding, to gaining favor in any endeavor. And we must admit that it is by destiny and success in providence to discover the dove that one must be chosen from the dovecote, the hermetic synonym of Diana's dove and to possess the ornithogallum, synonymous with the hermetic lay de vierge deer to Philolethes. Rho nu iota sigma ornus, in Greek, designates not only the bird in general, but more expressly the rooster and the hen. And it is perhaps from there that the term apostrophe rho nu theta omega nu gamma lambda alpha, ornithengala, bird's milk, obtained by diluting a yolk of egg in hot milk comes from. We will not insist on these reports, because they would reveal the secret operation hidden under the expression Diana's doves. Let's say however that the plants called ornithogales are bulbous liliaceae, with beautiful white flowers, and it is known that the lily is, par excellence, the emblematic flower of Mary. Ninth series, PL. 31. Crawford ceiling eye piercing through the clouds, a man's hand throws against a rock seven balls that bounce back towards it. This bar leaf is adorned with the inscription, dot concaves, sfrgo, or in English as shaken, I rise. A similar subject is noted on one of the coffers of the Lalamon Chapel, in Bourges, but the balls there are replaced by chestnuts. Now, this fruit whose spiny pericarp has given it the common name of Erison, in Greek, chi nu omicron sigma, Ishinos, Erison, chestnut tree of the sea, is a quite exact representation of the philosopher's stone as it is obtained by the short path. It appears, indeed, to consist of a sort of crystalline and translucent core, almost spherical in color, resembling that of rose, ruby, ballet, enclosed in a more or less thick shell, rough to the touch, which at the end of the work is often cracked, sometimes even open, like the husk of walnuts and chestnuts. These are indeed the fruits of the hermetic labor that the celestial hand throws against the rock, emblem of our mercurial substance. Every time the stone, once fixed and perfect, is taken up by the mercury in order to dissolve in it, to nourish itself anew, to increase not only in weight and volume but also in energy, it returns through coction to its state, its color and its primitive aspect. It can be said that after touching the mercury it returns to its starting point. These are the phases of fall and ascent, of solution and coagulation that characterize the successive multiplications that give each rebirth of the stone a theoretical power tenfold of the previous one. However, although many authors do not envision any limit to this exaltation, we believe in the philosophies that it would be imprudent, in terms of what concerns transmutation and medicine, to go beyond the seventh repetition. This is the reason why Jean Lalamond and the adept of Dampierre have only figured seven balls or chestnuts on the motifs we are talking about limited for speculative philosophers. The multiplication is however confined to the practical domain. The more the stone progresses, the more it becomes penetrating and rapidly elaborates. It requires, at each degree of augmentation, only the eighth part of the time demanded. By the preceding operation, generally, and we consider here the long path, it is rare that the fourth repetition requires more than two hours. The fifth almost accomplishes itself in half the time, while twelve seconds would suffice to achieve the immediate. The instantaneousness of such an operation would make it impracticable. On one hand, it would require to reserve a large part of the volume, without ceasing to acquire a proportional amount of mercury, always long and tedious to prepare. In the end, the power multiplied by the fifth and sixth degrees would require, if left to its own volition, a significant mass of gold to orient it towards the metal, otherwise one would risk losing it entirely. 
It is therefore preferable, from every point of view, not to push too far the subtlety of an agent already endowed with considerable energy, unless one wishes, leaving the realm of metallic possibilities and medical uses, to possess this universal mercury, brilliant and luminous in obscurity, in order to construct the perpetual lamp. But the passage from the solid state to the liquid state, which must be achieved in place, being extremely dangerous, can only be attempted by a very learned and very skillful individual. From all that proceeds, we must conclude that the material impossibilities signaled in the context of transmutation tend to ruin the thesis of a geometric progression growing and indefinite, based on the number six, to the pure theorists. Let us guard ourselves from the enthusiasm unreflected, and never let our judgment be swayed by specious arguments, bright but hollow theories, from wondrous producers. Science and nature, reserve enough wonders to satisfy us, without the need to add still the vain fantasies of imagination. Crawford ceiling too, it is a dead tree, with branches cut off, with roots exposed, that this bar leaf presents to us. It does not bear any inscription, but only two alchemical notation signs engraved on a cartouche. One, a schematic figure of a level, expresses the sulfur, the other, an equilateral triangle with an upper vertex, designates the fire. The withered tree is a symbol of usual metals reduced from their mineral state and melted, which the high temperatures of the metal furnaces have deprived of the activity they had in their natural state. This is why philosophers say that dead metals are reintroduced to the work of the great work, until they are revivified, or reincredited according to the consecrated term, because an internal fire never completely abandons them. For the metals, fixed on their plane of allegory, are like an industrial form that we know, retain, in the very depth of their substance, the soul that the common fire has condensed and made dense, but has not been able to destroy. And this soul, the wise have named it fire or sulfur, because it is truly the agent of all the mutations, of all the accidents observed in the metallic matter, and this incombustible seed that nothing can completely ruin, nor the violence of strong acids, nor the ardor of the furnace. A great principle of immortality, charged by God himself to ensure the perpetuity of the species and to reform the body decayed, it persists and is found again in the ashes of calcined metals, while these have suffered the disintegration of their parts and seen their bodily envelope consumed. Therefore, the philosophers judged, not without reason, that the qualities refractory to sulfur, its resistance to fire, could only belong to fire or to some igneous nature spirit. This is what led them to give it the name under which it is designated and which certain artists believe to derive from its aspect, although it has no connection with common sulfur. In Greek, sulfur is called theta epsilon omicron nu, theon, a word whose root is theta epsilon omicron sigma, theos, which means divine, marvelous, supernatural. Tau theta epsilon omicron nu, theon, not only expresses divinity, but also the magical, extraordinary side of a thing. Now, philosophical sulfur, considered as the god and the animator of the great work, revealed by its actions an energy forming comparable to that of the divine spirit. Thus, although we have to attribute the precedence to mercury, for the order of successive acquisitions, we must acknowledge that it is to sulfur, the incomprehensible soul of metals, that our practice owes its mysterious character and in some way supernatural. So, search for the sulfur in the dead trunk of common metals, and you will obtain at the same time that natural and metallic fire which is the principal key of alchemical labor. That is, says Le Mojon de Saint Didier, the great mystery of the art, since all others depend on the intelligence of this one. How satisfied I would be, adds the author, if it were permitted for me to explain this secret unambiguously, but I cannot do what no philosopher has believed to be in their power. All that you can reasonably expect from me, is to tell you that the natural fire is a fire in potency, which does not burn the hands, but which shows its effectiveness as soon as it is slightly excited by the external fire. Crawford ceiling 3, a hexagonal pyramid, made of riveted steel plates, bears, attached to its walls, various emblems of chivalry and hermeticism, pieces of armor and honorable pieces, shields, helmet, vambrace, gauntlets, crown and garlands. Its epigraph is taken from a verse by Virgil, Aeneid, 11, 641, sick, ITVR, AD, Astra, and in English as, thus, to the stars, this is how one becomes immortalized. This pyramidal construction, which form recalls the Athenor, the hieroglyph adopted to designate the fire, is nothing other than the philosophical furnace necessary for the maturation of the work. Two doors on the side are arranged and face each other. They close off glazed windows which allow the observation of the work's faces. Another, located at the base, gives access to the hearth. Finally, a small plate, near the summit, 
serves as a register and as an evacuation outlet for the combustion. Inside, if we refer to the very detailed descriptions of Philolethe, the lesson, Salmon and others, as well as to the reproductions of Rupsissa, Scabus, Pierre Vicot, Huginus Abarma, etc., the Athenor is arranged to receive a bowl of earth or metal, called the nest or the arena, because the egg is subjected to incubation in the hot sand, Latin arena, sand. As for the fuel used for heating, it seems quite variable, although many authors express their preference for thermogenic lamps, at least this is what the masters teach about their furnace. But the Athenor, the abode of the mysterious fire, calls for a less vulgar conception. This secret furnace, demanding a flame, seems to us more in line with the esoteric hermetic prism of invisible light, holding the prepared substance, amalgam or rebus, serving as an envelope and matrix to the central nucleus where these latent faculties that the common fire will soon activate lie dormant. The material alone, being the vehicle of the natural and secret fire, the immortal agent of all our realizations, remains for us the unique and true Athenor. From Greek Theta Nu Alpha Tau Omicron Sigma, which renews and never dies, Philolethe tells us about this dry secret, which the wise could not do without, since it provokes the metamorphosis within the compound, being of metallic essence and of a sulfuric origin. It is recognized as the unique source of all metallic and mineral sulfur, because it is born from the prime mercurial substance of metals, sulfurous, because this fire, in the extraction of metallic sulfur, has taken on the specific qualities of the father of metals. It is thus a double fire, the double-egged man of Basile Valentine, which at the same time holds the attractive, agglutinating and organizing virtues of mercury, and the cicatives, coagulating and fixative properties of sulfur. Provided that one has some tincture of philosophy, he will easily understand that this double fire, the animator of the rebus, needing only the help of heat to move from potential to actual, and to render its power effective, could not belong to the furnace, although it metaphorically represents our Athenor that is to say the place of energy, of the principle of immortality enclosed within the philosophical compound. This double fire is the pivot of the art and, according to the expression of Philolethe, the first agent that makes the wheel turn and moves the axle, it is also often designated by the epithet of wheel fire, because it seems to develop its action according to a circular mode, whose goal is the conversion of the molecular edifice, rotation symbolized in the wheel of fortune and in the Ouroboros. Thus, the matter, destroyed, mortified then reconstituted into a new body, thanks to the secret fire that the furnace excites, rises gradually with the help of multiplications, until the perfection of the pure fire, unveiled under the figure of the immortal phoenix. Sick it or ad astra, and in English, thus one journeys to the stars. Similarly, the worker, faithful servant of nature, acquires, with the knowledge of the sublime, the high title of knighthood, the esteem of his peers, the recognition of his brothers and the honor, more enviable than all the worldly glory, of being among the disciples of Elias. Coffered ceiling four, closed by its tight-fitting lid, the rounded belly pot made of coarse clay, devoid of any noble characteristic except for its utility, a mere vulgar pot of earth, is filled, from its plebeian grandeur and its cracked surface on the coffer. Its inscription affirms that the vessel which we see the image of must open by itself and render manifest, by its destruction, the completion of what it contains in sola.fiant.manifesta.urbana, or in English, the solitary things shall become evident ruin's eye. Among so many diverse figures, emblems with which it fraternizes, our subject seems all the more original because its symbolism is related to the dry path, also called the Saturnine work, based on the iconography described in the texts. This ars brevis only requires the concourse of the crucible and the application of high temperatures. This verity, Henkel had grasped it when he noticed that the artist Elias, cited by Hervatius, pretended to prepare the philosopher's stone and completes it in four days of time, and who showed, indeed, this stone still adhering to the lessons of the crucible. It seems to the author, that he would not be so bold as to try to put into question what the alchemists call the grand month, and not just a few days, which would be a very limited time frame, and if it were, the entire operation would consist of a method in which the greatest degree of fluidity, which we do not obtain by violent, sudden reactions in the laboratories, but this method could not be executed in all the subtleties, and perhaps not all the world would find it practical. But, the inverse of the humid path, whose glass utensils allow to easily control the fire necessary to illuminate the operator at just the right moment, this dry path cannot lack the important time factor, reduced to a minimum, constitutes a serious practice of the ars brevis. On the other hand, the necessity of high temperatures presents the grave inconvenience of a profound mystery within the tightly closed crucible buried in the center of incandescent charcoals. 
It is therefore important to be very experienced, to know the conduct and the power of fire, since from the beginning to the end, to discover the least indication. Indication. All the characteristic reactions of the humid path being indicated in the classic authors, it is possible for the studious to acquire precise enough reference points to authorize them to undertake this long and painful journey. Provided with every guide the daring traveler, up to the extremity of the desert, engages in this arid and scorched wasteland, no marked path, no guide, nothing but the apparent inertia of the earth, of the rock, of the sand. The brilliant kaleidoscope of colored phases does not brighten his uncertain journey, it is blindly that he pursues his way, without any other certainty than his faith, without any other hope than his trust in divine providence. Nevertheless, at the end of his career, the investigator perceived a sign, the only one, whose appearance indicates success and confirms the perfection of sulfur by the total fixation of mercury. This sign consists in the spontaneous breakage of the vessel. Once the time has expired, covering laterally a part of its wall, one notes, when the experiment is successful, one or several lines, of a blinding clarity, clearly visible on the less shining. Background of the crucible. These are the cracks revealing the happy birth of the young chick. Just as at the end of the incubation the hen's egg breaks as soon as the effort of the chick, likewise the shell of our egg breaks as soon as the sulfur is finished. There is, among its effects, an evident analogy, despite the diversity of causes, for, in the mineral work, the rupture of the crucible can logically only be attributed to a chemical action, unfortunately. It is, however, absolutely impossible to conceive or explain. Let us note, however, that the well-known fact occurs frequently under the influence of certain combinations of lesser interest. This is the case, for example, when abandoning new crucibles that have been used only once for the fusion of metallic glasses, in the production of hepatic sulfur or of diaphoretic antimony, and after having thoroughly cleaned them, they are found cracked after a few days, without being able to discover the obscure reason for this belated phenomenon. The considerable widening of their belly shows that the fracture seems to be produced by the push of an expansive force, acting from the center towards the periphery, at room temperature and long after the use of the vessels. Finally, let us signal the remarkable concordance that exists between the motif of Dampierre and that of Bourges, Le Mans Hotel, ceiling of the chapel. Among the hermetic coffered ceilings of the latter, we also see a pot of earth, inclined, whose wide and flared opening is sealed with a parchment membrane tied on the edges. Its pierced belly lets escape beautiful crystal formations of different sizes. The indication of the crystalline form of sulfur, obtained by dry path, is thus very clear and comes to confirm, by specifying it, the esotericism of our bar relief. Crawford Ceiling 5, a heavenly hand, whose arm is clad in iron, wields the sword and the spatula. On the phylactery one reads these Latin words. Dot perscium, et, sonabo, or in English as, I will strike and I will heal. I will wound and I will heal. Jesus said the same, I will kill and I will resurrect. Esoteric thought of a capital importance in the execution of the magistery. It is the first key, assures Le Mojon de Saint Didier, the one that opens the obscure prisons in which sulfur is confined. It is she who extracts the seed from the body, and who forms the philosopher's stone by the conjunction of the male with the female, of the spirit with the body, of sulfur with mercury. Hermes has manifestly demonstrated the operation of this first key with these words. The cavernous metallorum occultus est, qui lapis est venerabilis, color splendidus, men sublimus et mare patens, or in English, hidden in the caverns of the metals, it is the venerable stone, splendid in color, lofty in mind, and expansive in the sea. The cabalistic artifice under which our adept has concealed the technique that Lemojone seeks to teach us, consists in the choice of the double instrument figured on our coffered ceiling. The sword that wounds and the spatula tasked with applying the healing bomb, the sword and spatula, in fact, are truly one and the same agent endowed with the dual power to kill and to resurrect, to mortify and to regenerate, to withdraw and to organize. Spatula, in Greek, is said sigma pi theta eta, and this word also means organizer, spreader, one who originates from sigma pi omega, to pull out, to extract, to uproot. We have here an esoteric locution in the hermetic sense provided by the spatula and the sword. Thus, the investigator, in possession of the dissolvent, easily acting upon the body, destroys and extracts the seed, will have to seek the metallic subject best suited to fulfill his design. Thus, the dissolved metal, broken into pieces, will abandon that fixed and pure grain, the bright gem that it carries within, a brilliant gem adorned with a magnificent color, the first manifestation of the philosopher's stone, Phoebus being born and father of the great elixir.
In an allegorical dialogue between a monster hidden at the bottom of a dark cave, filled with seven full horns of waters, and the wandering alchemist, pressed by questions from the Sphinx boon companion, Jacques Tesson makes him speak as a fabulous representative of the vulgar metals. You must understand, he says, that I, who have descended from celestial regions and have fallen here, in these dregs of the earth where I have been nourished for a space of time, but I desire nothing more than to return there, and the way to do it is that you kill me and then you resurrect me, and by the instrument that you will kill me, you will resurrect me. For, as said by the white dove, he who killed me will make me revive. We could make an interesting remark about the means or instrument, expressly depicted by the steel brace which the celestial arm is equipped with because no detail should be neglected in a study of this kind. But we believe it is appropriate not to say everything and prefer to leave it to whoever wants to take the trouble to decipher this complementary hieroglyph. The alchemical science does not teach, each must learn by themselves, not in a speculative way, but with the aid of persevering work, by multiplying trials and attempts, so as to always submit the productions of the mind to the control of experience. He who fears the labor of the furnaces, the coal dust, the danger of unknown reactions and the insomnia of long vigils, will never know anything. Offered ceiling 6. A stag is depicted wrapped around a trunk of a tree, a dead tree, all of whose branches have been cut by hand. The phylactery that completes this bar relief bears the words, Animica.amicidia. And in English, hostile friendship. The anonymous author of the ancient War of the Knights, in a dialogue between the stone, gold and mercury, has gold say that the stone is a worm swollen with poison, accusing it of being the enemy of man and metals. But nothing could be truer, it is indeed a powerful and redoubtable poison, the mere smell of which, they say, would suffice to cause death. Yet it is from this toxic mineral that universal medicine is made, to which no human malady can resist, no matter how incurable it is recognized to be. But what gives it all its value and makes it infinitely precious in the eyes of the sage is the admirable virtue it possesses to revive metals reduced and melted, and to lose their poisonous properties by leaving them their own activity. Thus it appears as the instrument of the resurrection and redemption of metallic bodies, dead by the violence of the fire of reduction, which is why it bears on its blazon the sign of the Redeemer, the cross. From what we have just said, the reader will have understood that the stone, that is, our mineral subject, is represented in the present motif by the ivy, a living plant of strong, nauseating odor, while the metal has for representation the burning and fruitful mulberry. For it is not a dry tree, simply deprived of its foliage and reduced to its skeleton, that we see here, it would then express, for the hermeticist, the igneous quest, it is a trunk, voluntarily mutilated, that the saw has amputated of its sickly branches. The Greek verb tau mu nu omega signifies equally to saw, to cut with a saw and to extinguish, to sever, to bind tightly, our tree, being at the same time sawed and extinguished. We must think that the creator of these images wanted to clearly indicate the metal and the dissolving action exercised against it. The ivy, embracing the trunk as if to suffocate it, translates well the dissolution by the prepared subject, full of vigor and vitality. But this dissolution, instead of being ardent, effervescent and quick, seems slow, difficult, always impetuous. This is because the metal, although entirely attacked, is only solubilized in part. Thus it is recommended to reiterate frequently the effusion of water on the body in order to extract the sulfur or the seed that makes the lone stone, and the metallic sulfur receives life from the very hands, the repair of its enmity and its hate. This operation, which the wise have named reincarnation or return to the primitive state, mainly aims, for the acquisition of sulfur and its revivification by the initial mercury. It should therefore not be taken literally, this return to the original material of the treated metal, since a large part of the body, formed of course, heterogeneous, sterilized or mortified elements, is no longer susceptible to regeneration. Whatever it is, it suffices for the artist to obtain this principal sulfur, separated from the metal opened and made living by the incisive power of our first mercury. With this living substance, thanks to the incisive power of our first mercury, the new body where friendship and harmony replace aversion, because the virtues and respective properties of the two contrary natures are confounded in him, he may hope to finally attain the philosophical mercury, through the mediation of this essential agent, then to the elixir, the object of his secret desires. Coffered ceiling 7, where Louis Audiot recognizes the figure of God the Father, we simply see a centaur, a banner bearing the sigils of the Senate and the Roman people, hidden halfway. The whole decorated with a standard whose staff is firmly planted in the ground. So it is indeed a Roman standard, and we can conclude that the soil on which it floats is itself Roman. Moreover, the letters, .s.p.q.r.
are the abbreviations of the words Senatus Populusque Romanus, in English that is, the Senate and people of Rome, and was usually accompanying the eagles and formed, with the cross, the arms of the eternal city. This standard, placed expressly to indicate a Roman earth, leads us to think that the philosopher of Dampierre was not ignorant of the particular symbolism of Basile Valentin, Senior Zadith, Mindsicht, etc. For these authors name terre romaine and vitriol roman the terrestrial substance that provides our dissolvent, without which it would be impossible to reduce metals, or even mercurial, or, if you prefer, in vitriol philosophique. Our pays vitriol de Rome, also called vitriol of the adepts, is not the greenish vitriol, but a double vitriolic salt of iron and copper. Chambon is of the same opinion and cites as equivalent the vitriol of Salzburg, which is also a ferrous sulfate cuproferic. The Greeks called it sigma delta eta rho omicron sigma, and the mineralogists the helebrous black because of its strong and disagreeable smell, which, when ground, became black taking on a spongy consistency and a greasy appearance. In his Testamentum, Basile Valentin highlights the excellent properties and rare virtues of the vitriol, but one will not recognize the truth of the words that, as we know beforehand, he intends to extend further. The vitriol, he writes, is a notable and important mineral which none other in nature we could compare, and this because the vitriol familiarizes itself with metals more than all other things. It is very closely allied, because, among all metals, one can make a vitriol or crystal, because vitriol and crystal are not recognized for any single and same thing. This is why I have preferred to excessively praise it more, as reason requires, since the vitriol is preferable to other minerals, and that the first place after metals must be accorded to it. For, well that all metals and minerals should be suffused with great virtues, this one in particular, the vitriol, could alone accomplish the making of the blessed stone, what no one else in the world could achieve only by its imitation. Further on, our adept returns to the same subject by specifying the double nature of Roman vitriol. I tell you this so that you may firmly imprint this argument on your mind, which two parts entwined think intensely about the metallic vitriol, and that you remember that I have entrusted you with this knowledge that one can, from Mars and Venus, make a magnificent vitriol in which the three principles meet, which often serve the birth and production of our stone. Let us also note a very important remark from Henkel concerning vitriol. Among all the names that have been given to vitriol, says this author, there is not a single one that has to do with iron. It is always called chalcanthum, calcitis, cupri rosa, etc. And it is not only among the Greeks and the Romans that iron has been deprived of its share in vitriol. The same has been done in Germany, and today, in all vitriols in general and especially in that which concerns us here, one has to prefer to name it copper water, chalcanthum water, that is, the same as cupri rosa, rose of copper. Crawford ceiling 8, the subject of this bar-relief is quite singular. It depicts a young gladiator, almost a child, furiously hacking away with a sword at a beehive filled with honeycombs, from which the cover has been removed. Two words make up the motto, militivis.gladius, or in English, the honeyed sword. This bizarre act of a fiery and carried away adolescent, doing battle with bees like Don Quixote with his windmills, is nothing else than the symbolic translation of our first work. The original variant of the theme so well known and so often exploited in Hermeticism, the striking of the rock. We know that after their departure from Egypt, the children of Israel had to camp at Rephidim, Exodus 17, 1, Numbers 33, 14, where there was no water to drink for the people. On the Council of the Eternal, Exodus, 17, 6, Moses, three times, struck the rock of Horeb with his rod, and a living water spring gushed forth from the dry stone. Mythology also offers us some replicas of the same prodigy. Callimachus, hymn to Jupiter, 31, says that the goddess Rhea, having struck with her scepter the Arcadian mountain, it split in two and water flowed abundantly from it. Apollonius of Alexandria, Argonauts, 1146, relates the miracle of Mount Dindymus and assures that the rock had never before given birth to the slightest spring. Pausanias attributes a similar fact to Atalanta, who, in order to quench her thirst, made a fountain spring forth by hurling her javelin at a rock in the surroundings of Syphanta, in Laconia. In our bas-relief, the gladiator takes the place of the alchemist, figured elsewhere under the traits of Hercules, hero of the Twelve Labors, or again under the aspect of a knight armed from head to toe as we notice at the portal of Notre Dame de Paris. The beehive that the young man is attacking in that simple and subsequent way we must observe throughout the work, is indeed the living nature. Moreover, we must believe that if the artist of Dampierre gives preference to the gladiator, it is to signify without any doubt that the artist must work or fight alone against the material.
the Greek word mu omicron nu omicron mu chi omicron sigma, monomachos, which means gladiator, is composed of mu nu omicron sigma, monos, alone, and mu chi omicron mu alpha iota, makomai, to fight. As for the beehive, it is privileged to figure the stone in this cabalistic artifice that makes derive the word rock by permutation of vowels. The philosophical subject, our first stone, in Greek pi tau rho alpha, Petra, clearly translates under the image of a beehive or rock, rho omicron chi eta, terms used by the wise to designate the hermetic subject. Furthermore, our swordsman, by striking the beehive with redoubled blows and cutting at random its rays, makes an incoherent, heterogeneous mass of wax, propolis, and honey, an incoherent magma, a real mishmash, to employ the language of the gods, where the honey flows to the point of coating his sword, substituting for Moses' staff. This is the second chaos, result of the primitive combat that we cabalistically call mishmash, because it contains the honey mu lambda iota, meli, viscous and glutinous water of metals, always ready to flow out. The masters of the art assure us that the entire work is a labor of Hercules, and that one must begin by striking the stone. Pegasus, from pi eta gamma sigma, pigas, rock, ice, frozen water or hard and dry ground. And the fable teaches us that Pegasus, among other actions, made spring forth with a blow of his hoof the Hippocrene fountain, I eta gamma, piggy, source, so that the winged courser of the poets merges with the hermetic source, of which it possesses the essential characteristics, the mobility of living waters and the volatility of spirits. As an emblem of the primary matter, the beehive is often found in decorations borrowing their elements from the science of Hermes. We have seen it on the ceiling of the Lalamond Hotel and among the panels of the Winterthur alchemical stove. It occupies even one of the squares of the Game of the Goose, the popular labyrinth of the art sacred, and collection of the principal hieroglyphs of the great work. Coffered ceiling 9, the sun, piercing through the clouds, directs its rays towards a farlouse's nest, containing a small egg and set upon a grassy knoll. The phylactery, which gives the bar leaf its meaning, bears the inscription, dot NEC, hey, NEC, sign, hey, in English as neither, with, you or without you or not you, but nothing without you. Allusion to the sun, father of the stone, followed by Hermes and the multitude of hermetic philosophers. The celestial body, depicted in its radiant splendor, takes the place of the sun metallic, or sulfur, that many artists have believed to be natural gold. A grave mistake, all the less excusable since all authors perfectly establish the difference between the gold of the wise and the precious metal. It is, indeed, the sulfur of the metals that the masters are referring to when they describe how to extract and prepare this first agent, which, moreover, bears no resemblance to ordinary gold. And it is also this sulfur, combined with mercury, which collaborates in the generation of our egg by giving it the vegetative faculty. This is the real father of the stone, since the stone comes from it, hence the first part of the axiom, necte, and as it is impossible to obtain anything without the aid of sulfur, the second proposition is justified, nexine te or, what we say of sulfur is true for mercury, so that the egg, manifestation of the new metallic form emanating from the mercurial principle, if it is to give substance to mercury or the hermetic moon, draws its vitality and its possibility of developing from sulfur or the sun of the sages. In summary, it is philosophically exact to assure that the metals are composed of sulfur and mercury, as taught by Bernard Trevisan, that the stone, although formed of the same principles, does not give birth to a metal, that finally, Sulfur and mercury, considered in isolation, are the only parents of the stone, but cannot be confused with it. We allow ourselves to draw the reader's attention to the fact that the philosophical coction of the rebus provides a sulfur, and not an irreducible assembly of its components, and that this sulfur, by complete assimilation of mercury, endowed with particular properties which tend to distance it from the metallic species. And it is on this constancy of effect that the technique of multiplication and increase is founded because the new sulfur is always capable of absorbing a fixed and proportional amount of mercury. Ansomne. Non CVS. Perdita Dracone. Tot Asti. N. ENS Inta. TA. Aripoli. EL. 32. S. Pereo Penis. Chateau de Dampierre sur Bouton Caisson de la Gaule Riot Setium Suri. 4 TV. Comes. Ilala. X 7th series, PL. 32. Coffered ceiling 1, the tables of the Hermetic Law, on which one reads a phrase in French, but so singularly presented, that Mr. Louis Audiot has not been able to discover the meaning. N.Rien.Gist.Tout. Or in English, in nothing lies everything.
a fundamental motto that the ancient philosophers delight in repeating, and by which they mean to signify the absence of value, the vulgarity, the extreme abundance of the basic matter from which they draw all that is necessary. You will find everything in everything that is nothing other than a styptic or astringent virtue of metals and minerals, writes Basile Valentine in the Book of the Twelve Keys. Thus, true wisdom teaches us not to judge things according to their price, the pleasure one receives, the beauty of their appearance. It leads us to esteem in man personal merit, not the outward or condition, and embodies the spiritual quality they conceal within them. In the eyes of the wise, iron, the pariah of the human industry, is incomparably more noble than gold, and more active than lead, for this luminous live water, this burning and pure water that the common metals mine, the light they are deprived of, gold alone is devoid of it. This sovereign to which stones and men render homage, for which so many consciences have died in the hope of obtaining its favors, has no riches and preciousness but its outer garment. Sumptuously attired, gold is nevertheless nothing but a corpse compared to copper, elevated to the rank of the gods, a corpse ignorant of the powerful and wealthy family of metals, stripped of its mantle, it reveals the lowliness of its origins and appears to us as a simple metallic resin, dense, fixed and fusible, a triple quality that makes it notoriously unsuitable for the realization of our design. Thus, we see how vain it would be to work on gold, for he who has nothing can obviously give nothing. It is therefore to the crude and vile stone that one must address oneself, without repugnance for its miserable appearance, its infected smell, its coloration that repels because of its dirtiness. For these are precisely the characters, little seductive and sordid, which the primordial stone has, and which have always allowed us to recognize it, coming from the original chaos, and that God, at the time of the creation of the universe, would have reserved for his servants and elect. Drawn from, nothing, it bears the imprint and has suffered the name, nothing, but the philosophers discover that in its natural disorderly and disordered state, made of darkness and light, of bad and good assembled in the worst confusion, the nothing contained all that they could desire. Coffered ceiling too, the uppercase letter H topped with a crown, which Mr. Louis Audiot presents as being the blazoned signature of the King of France Henri II, offers today only a chiseled inscription which used to be read as follows. In. Te. Omnis. Dominata. Recambit. In English. In you, all domination will rest, or said another way in you rests all power. We have previously had the opportunity to say that the letter H, or at least the graphic character that appears to it, had been chosen by the philosophers to designate the spirit, the universal soul of things, or this active and all-powerful principle that is recognized to be, in perpetual movement, vibrating. It is on the form of the letter H that the builders of the Middle Ages have erected the facades of cathedrals, temples glorifying the divine spirit, profound interpreters of the aspirations of the human soul in its rise towards the Creator. This character corresponds to the Eta, H, the seventh letter of the Greek alphabet, the initial of the solar verb, dwelling of the spirit, prophet Elijah, in Greek H lambda iota omicron sigma, helios, sun. It is also the head of the mounted spirit, H lambda iota omicron sigma, helios, solar, that the scriptures say to be carried to heaven in a chariot of fire, in a chariot of light and fire. It is still the center and the heart of the two monograms of Christ, IHS, abbreviation of Yeses hominum salvator or Jesus savior of men. It is also the sign that the medieval builders used to designate the two columns of the Temple of Solomon, at the foot of which the workers receive their salary. Jacob and Boaz, freestanding towers of the Metropolitan Churches are only the introduction but high and powerful. It is finally the indication of the precious knowledge acquired from the sage's agent, Scala Philosophorum, of the mysterious promoter of mineral nature transformations, and that of the rediscovered lost word. This agent was once designated among the adepts by the epithet of magnet or attractive. The body charged with this magnet called itself magnesia, and it is this, the intermediary between the eye and the earth, nourishing itself from celestial dynamism, which it transmitted to the passive substance, attracting in the manner of a true magnet. Cyrano de Bergerac, in one of his allegorical tales, speaks thus of the magnesian spirit, about which he seems very well informed, as much as it concerns the preparation of its use. You have not forgotten, I think, writes our author, that I am named Elijah, for I have told you before, you should therefore know that I was in your world and that I lived with Elisha, a Hebrew like me, on the pleasant banks of the Jordan, where I led, among books, a life quite sweet enough not to regret it, even though it flowed away. However, the more the lights of my spirit grew, the less also grew the knowledge of those that I did not have. Never did our priests remind me of Adam, that the memory of that perfect philosophy which he possessed made me sigh. I despaired of being able to acquire it, 
when one day, after having sacrificed for the atonement of the weaknesses of my mortal being, I fell asleep, and the angel of the Lord appeared to me in a dream. As soon as I awoke, I did not fail to work on the things he had prescribed to me. I took about two square feet of magnet, which I put into a furnace. Then, when it was well purged, precipitated and dissolved, I drew the attractive. I calcined all the elixir and reduced it to the size of an average ball. Following these preparations, I built a very light iron chariot, and after a few months, all the constructions being finished, I entered it and got settled. You will ask me how possible for all this attraction. Know that the angel had told me in a dream that if I wanted to acquire a perfect science as I wished, I should go to the moon's world, where you would find before you the paradise of Adam, the tree of science, because as soon as I would have tasted its fruit, my soul would be clarified of all the truths of which a creature is capable, ready for the journey for which I had built my chariot. Finally, I got inside and, when I was well closed in and well supported on the seat, I threw high in the air this ball of diamond. Now, the machine of iron, which I had forged expressly more massive in the middle than at the extremities, was immediately taken up and in perfect balance, as soon as I arrived, made me fly off, attracted, and, once I had leapt where the hand made me start again. Truthfully, it was a spectacle quite astonishing, for the steel of this flying house, which I had polished with great care, reflected on all sides the light of the sun so vivid and so bright, that I believed myself to be carried in a chariot of fire. When I have since reflected on this miraculous ascension, I made myself imagine that I was not unworthy of the ethereal places because of a simple natural body, the vigilance that the seraphim, by the order of God, has ordained for the guardianship of paradise. But because it pleases him to use secondary causes, I believe that he had inspired this means for me to enter, as he wished to use the ribs of Adam to make him a woman although he could have formed her just as well without him. As for the crown that completes the important sign we are studying, it is not that of King Henry II of France, but indeed the royal crown of the elect. It is the one that is seen adorning the forehead of the Redeemer on the crucifixes of the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries, in particular at Amiens, Byzantine Christ called Saint Sof, and at Notre Dame de Treves, top of the portal, the night of the apocalypse, ch. 6, v. 2, mounted on a white horse, emblem of purity, receives as distinctive attributes of his high virtues a bow and a crown, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, our crown, the initiates know what we are talking about, is precisely the chosen domicile of the Spirit. It is a wretched substance, as we have said, hardly materialized, but which it contains in abundance. And this is where the ancient philosophers have fixed in their corona radiata, decorated with protruding rays, which was attributed only to gods or deified heroes. Thus, let us explain that this matter, vehicle of mineral light, is revealed, thanks to the radiant signature of the Spirit, as the promised land reserved for the elect of wisdom. Coffered Ceiling 3, it is an ancient symbol and often exploited that we encounter in this place, the dolphin twisted around the arm of an anchor. The Latin epigraph which serves as its motto gives the reason. Sick.tristis.aver.resetit. Or in English, thus the sad air settled. Thus calms this terrible tempest. We have had several occasions to highlight the important role that remora, the fish that sticks to ships, plays in alchemy. Under the name of dolphin, remora symbolizes the humid and cold principle of the work, which coagulates little by little in contact and by the effect of sulfur, the agent of desiccation and fixity. This last one is here figured by the marine anchor, an organ of resistance to drifts, to which it assures a point of support and stability against the waves. The long operation that allows to realize the progressive stopping and the final fixation of mercury, offers a great analogy with the maritime crossings and the tempests that welcome them. It is a rough and rolling sea that presents in the little constant and regular boiling of the hermetic compound. The bubbles burst on the surface and succeed ceaselessly. Heavy vapors charge the atmosphere of the vessel. The troubled, opaque, livid clouds condense in rushing drops on the effervescent mass. Everything contributes to giving the spectacle of a tempest in reduction. Lifted from all sides, tossed by the winds, the ark floats nevertheless under the divine rain. Asteria prepares to form Delos, hospitable and salvific land for the children of Latona. The dolphin swims on the surface of the impetuous waves, and this agitation lasts until the remora, invisible host of the deep waters, stops the ark, like a powerful anchor, the ship yields to no drift. Calm is reborn then, the air is purified, the water disappears, the vapors absorb. A film covers the entire surface, and, thickening each day, marks the end of the flood, the stage of mooring of the ark, the birth of Diana and Apollo, the triumph of the earth over water, of the dry over the humid, and the era of the new phoenix. In the general upheaval and the battle of the elements, 
This permanent peace, the harmony resulting from the perfect balance of principles, symbolized by the fish fixed on the anchor, sic tristis ora resetit. This phenomenon of absorption and coagulation of mercury by one very inferior proportion of sulfur seems to be the primary cause of the fable of the remora, the small fish to which popular imagination and hermetic tradition attribute the power to stop in their coarse ships of considerable size. Voice of all sailors at sea, in an allegorical and full of teaching story, the philosopher René Francois, one day Emperor Caligula, becoming mad with rage, turning back to Rome with a powerful armed fleet, all superb ships, well armed and sailing at high speed signaled to the harbor, the wind was on point and all sails were set, the waves and the sky seemed to be partisans of Caligula, supporting his designs, when suddenly, lo and behold, the imperial and majestic galley is stopped all at once, the other vessels wonder at this caprice, the pilot doubles the watch, the helmsmen strain their oars, the rowers are at the ram, five by each bench, sweating and panting, the vessel does not move, the wind strengthens, the sea grows angry at this affront, everyone is astonished by the miracle, when the emperor sees a sea monster stopping him in that place, then divers plunge into the sea and, swimming between two waters, go around the floating castle, they find a wicked little fish, half a foot long, which having attached itself to the helm, was taking its time to stop the galley of the mad emperor, it seemed that it wanted to mock the human type, who paws so much with his mounds of gendarmes and his thundering iron which make him lord of the earth, here is, he says in his language of fish, a new Hannibal at the gates of Rome, who holds in a prison fortress the son of an emperor, Rome has extended its triumphant limbs on the earth and the captive kings in its triumph, and I led the procession along the rim, through the stretches of the ocean, the prince of the universe, Caesar became my prisoner, and I will be the Caesar of Caesars, all the power of Rome is now my slave and can make all her effort as much as I wish, I will keep her in my conch prison, while playing and mocking this galleon, I will do more in an instant than they have done in 800 years, massacring the human race and populating the world. Poor Emperor, how far you are from your account, with all your 150 million pounds of revenue, and 300 million men who are at your pay, a naughty little fish has made you its slave. Let the sea be angry, let the wind be furious, that the whole world becomes a convict, and all the trees environs, if they will not take a step without my passport and without my leave. Here is the true Archimedes of fishes, for he alone, arrests the whole world, here is the animated magnet that holds all the iron and the names of the first monarchy in the world, I don't know who calls Rome the golden anchor of the human genre, this fish is the anchor of anchors, oh marvel of God, but this fish shames, not only the grandeur of Rome, this end of the chain that loses its credit here, and a philosophy that makes Aristotle, they find no reason for this effort, that a bankruptcy, because it stops a ship pushed by the four elements, and toothless mouth allows it to enter the middle of the most cruel storms, Pliny said that all nature is hidden like a sentinel, and lodged in a garrison in the smallest creatures, I believe it, and as for me, this average little fish is the moving flag of nature, I think that it is she who hooks and stops these galleys of all her gear without other bridle than the horn of a fishmonger, she who reigns, alas, let us not diminish the horn, which cannot be done without so holy a consideration, the horns of our vain arrogance, with a little sea cleaner and the pirate of nature, he stops and catches all our designs, which sail full sails from one pole to the other, if he uses all his power, to what point will he reduce affairs? If he does everything with nothing, and from a fish, or rather from a little nothing, making fish, he overwhelms all our hopes, alas, when he will employ all his power and all the armies of his justice, hey, where will we be? Case in four, near the tree with golden fruits, a robust and squat dragon exercises its vigilance at the entrance to the garden of the Hesperides. The talisman particular to this subject carries, engraved, this inscription, dot ab dot insomni dot non dot case de vita dot dracone, or in English, not guarded by the sleepless dragon. Outside of the dragon that watches, things are not kept. The myth of the dragon appointed to oversee the famous orchard and the legendary golden fleece as well. Known enough to spare us the trouble of reproducing it. It suffices to indicate that the dragon is chosen as a hieroglyph of the raw mineral matter with which one must begin the work. That is to say what is its importance, the care that must be brought to the study of external signs and qualities capable of allowing identification, of recognizing and distinguishing the hermetic subject among the multiple minerals that nature puts at our disposal. Charged with overseeing the marvelous enclosure where the philosophers go to recover their treasures, the dragon passes for never sleeping, its fiery eyes remain constantly open. It knows neither rest nor fatigue and could not overcome the insomnia that characterizes it and lends it the power of eternal vigilance. It is indeed what is expressed by the Greek name it bears.
Lambda Delta Omega Nu, Leighton, has as its root Delta Chi Omicron Mu Alpha Iota, Decom I, to guard, to see, and, by extension, to live, a word itself close to Delta Rho Kappa Omicron Mu Alpha Iota, Decom I, which lights up the eyes. The primitive language reveals to us, through the envelope of the symbol, the idea of an intense activity, of a perpetual and latent vitality enclosed in the mineral body. The mythologists name our dragon Leighton, a vocable whose assonance is close to Latin and which can be assimilated to the Greek lambda theta omega, litho, to be hidden, unknown, ignored, like the philosopher's matter. The general appearance, the recognized ugliness of the dragon, its ferocity, and its singular vital power correspond exactly with the particularities, properties, and abilities of the subject. The special crystallization of this one is clearly indicated by the flaked epidermis of that one. The colors are alike because the matter is black, punctuated with red or yellow, like the dragon which is its image. As for the volatile quality of our mineral, we see it expressed by the membranous wings with which the monster is equipped, and because it is said to vomit, when attacked, fire and smoke, and because its body ends in a serpent's tail, poets, for these reasons, made it the offspring of Typhon and Echidna. The Greek Tau Upsilon Phi Nu, Typhon, or Tau Upsilon Phi Sigma, Typhos, the Egyptian Typhon, means to fill with smoke, to light up, to kindle. Chi Iota Delta Nu Alpha, Echidna, is none other than the viper. Hence we can conclude that the dragon gets from Typhon its hot, fiery, sulfurous nature, while it owes to its mother its cold, humid complexion, with the characteristic form of Ophidians. If philosophers have always hidden the vulgar name of their matter under an infinity of epithets, they have, in turn, been very prolific concerning its form, its virtues, and sometimes even its preparation. By common agreement, they affirm that the artist should not hope to discover or produce anything outside of the subject, because it is the only body capable, in all of nature, of providing the essential elements. Excluding other minerals and metals, it retains the principles necessary for the elaboration of the great work. By its monstrous but expressive shape, this prime subject clearly appears to us as the guardian and sole dispenser of the hermetic fruits. He is its depository, the conservator vigilant, and our adept speaks wisely when he teaches that outside of this solitary being the philosophical things are not kept, since we vainly search for them elsewhere. Thus, it is from this first body, part of the original chaos and common mercury, that Geber exclaims, Praised be the Most High, who created our mercury and gave it a nature to which nothing can resist, for without it, the alchemists might as well not bother, all their labor would come to naught. But, asks another adept, where then is this orified mercury which, resolved in salt and in sulfur, becomes the radical moisture of metals and their animated seed. It is imprisoned in a prison so strong that nature itself could not extract it, if the industrious art does not provide the means. Case in 5, a swan, majestically poised on the calm water of a pond, its neck pierced by an arrow. And this is its ultimate complaint which is translated by the inscription of this pleasantly executed little subject. Dot propries dot pareo dot penis. In English, I perish by my own wings. I perish by my own feathers. The bird, indeed, is one of the materials of the weapon that will serve to kill. The fletching of the arrow, ensuring its direction, makes it accurate, and the swan's feathers, fulfilling this office, thus contribute to its loss. This bird, whose wings are emblematic of volatility, and whose snowy whiteness expresses purity, possesses the two essential qualities of mercury contained in dross, double nature. We know that it must be conquered by sulfur, issued from its substance and that which conquered it in life, so as to obtain after its death the philosophical mercury, partly fixed and partly volatile, that subsequent maturation will elevate to the degree of perfection of the great elixir. All authors teach that one must kill the living if one desires to resurrect the dead, this is why the good artist will not hesitate to sacrifice the bird of Hermes, and to provoke the mutation of its mercurial properties into sulfurous qualities, since every transformation remains subject to the decomposition beforehand and cannot be realized without it. Basile Valentine assures that one must give a white swan to eat to a double-crossed man, and he adds, the roasted swan will be for the king's table. No philosopher, to our knowledge, has lifted the veil that covers this mystery, and we wonder if it is expedient to comment on such serious words. However, remembering the long years during which we ourselves have stood stunned before this door, we think it would be charitable to assist the worker, who has come so far, in crossing the threshold. Let us extend to him a helping hand and discover, within the limits allowed, what the greatest masters have thought prudent to reserve. It is evident that Basile Valentine, using the expression double igni man, refers to a second principle, 
resulting from a combination of two agents with a hot and burning complexion, having, consequently, the nature of metallic sulfurs. Hence, we can conclude that under the simple name of sulfur, the adepts, at a given moment in their work, conceive of two combined bodies, of properties similar but of different specificity, conventionally meant for only one. This being posed, what will be the substances capable of seeding these two products? Such a question has never received a response. However, if we consider that the metals have their emblematic representatives depicted by mythological deities, sometimes masculine, sometimes feminine, that they possess these particular sulfuric qualities recognized experimentally, symbolism and fable will likely shed some light on these obscure matters. Everyone knows that iron and lead are placed under the domination of Aries and Kronos, and that they receive the planetary influences respective to Mars and Saturn. Tin and gold, subject to Zeus and Apollo, espouse the vicissitudes of Jupiter and the Sun. But why should iron and lead marry tin and silver, subjects of Aphrodite and Artemis dominated by the curvilinear crescent of the goddess Venus and the Moon? Why is Mercury, akin to the messenger of Olympus, the god Hermes, even though it must be equipped with sulfur and fulfill the functions reserved for female alchemists. Must we accept these relations as verifiable, and wouldn't there be, in the distribution of metallic divinities and their astral correspondences, a premeditated confusion? If we were asked about this point, we would respond without hesitation affirmatively. Experience certainly demonstrates that silver possesses a magnificent sulfur, as pure and as lustrous as that of gold, without however always having the same fixity. Lead gives an almost equal color but less stable and very impure. The sulfur of tin, clear, neat, and bright, is white and would rather place this metal under the protection of a goddess than under the authority of a god. Iron, on the other hand, contains much fixed sulfur, of a dark, dull, dirty, and so defective red that, despite its refractory nature, we really wouldn't know what to use it for. And yet, gold accepted, one would vainly seek a more luminous, more penetrating cure, in other metals, a more yielding, more penetrating, and more malleable mercury. Regarding the sulfur of copper, Basile Valentine describes it exactly in the first book of his Deuce Clefs. The lascivious Venus, says he, is well paired with the libertine Mars. Case in 6, two horns of abundance crisscross on the caduceus of mercury. They have for their epitaph this Latin maxim. .virtuti.fortuna.coms, in English as, fortune comes to the aid of virtue. If we have understood well what the celebrated adept wishes to teach, and if we examine with care the existing relations between the metallic sulfurs and their respective symbols, we will scarcely have trouble establishing the esoteric order conforming to the work. The enigma will be deciphered, and the problem of the double sulfur will be easily solved. Wealth accompanies virtue. Exceptional axiom, difficult to contest in its application to true merit, where fortune so rarely thinks of virtue, that one must seek confirmation and the rule elsewhere. Now, it is from the secret virtue of the philosophical mercury, symbolized by the image of the caduceus, that the author of these symbols intends to speak. The horns of abundance represent the wealth of material things that the possession of mercury assures to the good artists. By their crossing an X, they indicate the spiritual quality of this noble and rare substance, whose energy shines like a pure fire, at the center of corporeal exactitude, sublimated. The caduceus, attribute of the god mercury, cannot give place to the slightest ambiguity, both in terms of the secret meaning and the symbolic value. Hermes, father of hermetic science, is at once considered as creator and creature, master of the philosophy and matter of philosophers. His winged scepter carries the explanation of the riddle he proposes, and the revelation of the mystery covering the compound, masterpiece of nature and art, under the vulgar epithet of Mercury of the Wise. Originally, the caduceus was just a simple wand, a scepter attributed to some sacred or fabulous characters belonging more to tradition than to history. Moses, Atalanta, Sibel, Hermes used this instrument, endowed with a sort of magical power, under similar and generative conditions of equivalent results. The Greek pi lambda omicron sigma, palos, is indeed, a rod, a stick, a bundle of javelins, a dart and the scepter of Hermes. This word derives from pi omega, pow, to walk, and it accompanies the truth which means to strike, to share, to destroy. Moses strikes with his rod the arid rock of Sabel, pierces with his javelin. Mercury separates and kills the two serpents engaged in a furious duel, by throwing upon them the rod of the Potassos, that is to say the couriers and messengers, qualified as winged bearers because they had, to indicate their charge. Wings on their hat. The winged Potassos of Hermes thus justifies his function as messenger and mediator of the gods. The joining of the serpents to the wand, completed by the hat or pi tau alpha sigma omicron sigma, 
Patasos, and the ankle boots or Tau Rho Sigma Omicron Iota, Tarsi, gave to the caduceus its definitive form, with the hieroglyphic expression of the perfect Mercury. On the casket of Dampierre, the two serpents show canine heads, one of a dog, the other of a bitch, an imaged version of the two opposite principles, active and passive, fixed and volatile, put in contact with the mediator figured by the magical wand, which is our secret fire. Artifius names these principles Dog of Chorusine and Bitch of Armenia, and it is these same serpents that Hercules as a child suffocates in his cradle, the only agents of the assembly, the combat and the death, realized through the intermediation of the philosophical fire, give birth to the living and animated hermetic mercury. And as the double mercury possesses double volatility, the wings of the Patassos, opposed to those of the ankle boots on the caduceus, serve to express these two qualities combined, in the clearest and most eloquent manner. Panel 7. In this bar a leaf, Cupid, bow in one hand and the other a arrow, rides the chimera on a pile of clouds assembled. The scroll that underlines this subject indicates that Eros is here the eternal master. Eterns. Hick. Domivs. Or in English, eternal. Here. Lord. Nothing is truer, moreover, other panels have shown us. Eros, the mythic personification of concord and love, is, by excellence, the Lord, the eternal master of the work. He alone can achieve the harmony between enemies that an implacable hatred constantly drives to devour one another. He fulfills the peaceful role of priest that we see united. On an engraving of the dews clefts by Basile Valentine, the king and the hermetic queen, it is still he who hurls, in the same work, an arrow towards a woman supporting an enormous water-filled mattress all enveloped in mist. Mythology teaches us that the chimera had three different heads on a body ending in a serpent's tail, one head of a lion, another of a goat and the third of a dragon. The constituent parts of the monster are the lion and the dragon, because they bring into the assembly the head and the tail. In analyzing the body, the dragon's tail corresponds to the top and the bottom. Indeed, in the order of successive acquisitions, the first place belongs to the dragon, which always merges with the serpent. It is known that the Greeks named Delta Rho Kappa Omega knew the dragon rather than the serpent. This is our initial matter, the very subject of the art, considered in its first being and in the state where nature has left it. The lion comes next, and although it is a child of the sages and of a metallic caducity, it surpasses by far its own vigorous parents and becomes, it could be said, more robust than its father. An unworthy son of an old man and a very strong woman, he shows from his birth an inconceivable aversion to his mother. Unsociable, fierce, aggressive, nothing good can be expected from this violent and cruel heir, unless he is returned, by a providential accident, to a calmer and more considered state. Encouraged by his mother Aphrodite, Eros, already unhappy with the character, shoots an arrow of air at him and wounds him grievously. Half paralyzed, he is then brought back to his mother, who, to restore her ungrateful son, gives him her own blood, and a part of this blood, after having saved him, makes him the paying debt to his mother, says the Turb de Philosophs, is always owed by the child to the mother. From the close and prolonged contact of the suffering lion and the dissolving dragon, a new being is formed, regenerated in some way, to mixed qualities, symbolically represented by the goat, or, if preferred, by the chimera itself. The Greek word chim u alpha iota rho alpha, pronounced chimera, also means young goat, cab, chi, gamma mu eta rho. Now, this young goat, who owes its existence and its brilliant qualities to the intervention of Eros, is none other than the philosophical Mercury, born of the Vulcan of the philosophers, and possesses all the faculties required to become the principal Mercury, which is at once our gold, our elixir, and our stone. And that is the whole order of the labor hermetic that the ancient Chimera reveals, and thus says the Philolethes, it is also our entire philosophy. The reader will kindly excuse us for having used allegory to better position the important points of the practice, but we had no other way and continue in this the old literary tradition. And if we reserve, in the narrative, the essential part that falls to little Cupid, master of the work and lord of the oceans, it is solely out of obedience to the discipline of the order, and to not be perjurious towards ourselves. Besides, the perceptive reader will find, scattered voluntarily throughout the pages of this book, complementary indications on the role of the mediator, of which we shall not speak further in this place. Panel 8, here we find a motif already encountered elsewhere, especially in Brittany. It is a small enclosed area, bordered by a circular fence, featuring a stoke, symbolized within a queen's enclosure which is limited by the circular fence, a particular symbol of Anne, wife of Charles XIII and of Louis XII. We see it depicted beside the emblematic porcupine of Louis XII, 
on the grand fireplace of the Lalaman Hotel, in Bourges, its epitaph conveys the same meaning and employs almost the same words as the famous motto of the Order of the Ermine, Malo Mori Quam Fidari, I prefer death to a stain. This order of chivalry, founded in 1381 by Jean V, Duke of Brittany, was to disappear in the 15th century, later restored by the King of Naples, Ferdinand I, in the year 1483, the Order of the Ermine, having lost all hermetic character, was no longer just a patrician chivalry association. The inscription engraved on the scroll of our panel reads, Dot Mori, Hotifs, Bam, Fedari, or in English, to die rather than to be faithless, prefer death to a stain. A beautiful and noble maxim of Anne of Brittany, a maxim of purity, applied to the little stoat whose white fur is made, as it were, the object of the impressed care of its elegant and supple owner. Oh, object of the swift embraces of his ermine, image of the philosophical mercury in the esotericism of the sacred art, the ermine, by the sublimated product it suggests, signifies the absolute cleanliness of sulfur or metallic fire, which contributes to making it all the more dazzling. In Greek, ermine is said Rome mu nu omicron sigma, erminos, a word derived from Rome mu alpha, erma, or Rome mu sigma, ermes, the abyss, the sea, the ocean, it is the pontic water, the philosopher's mercury, the sea purged with sulfur, sometimes. By the water of our sea, what must be read is simply the water of our mother, that is to say of the primitive and chaotic matter called the sage's subject. The philosophers teach us that their second mercury, this permanent water which we are speaking of, which, contrary to other liquids, does not wet the hands, and their source that flows in the hermetic rock. To obtain it, they say, it is necessary to strike the rock three times in order to extract the pure wave mixed with coarse water and solidified, generally figured by rocky blocks emerging from the ocean. The capable Romeo Sigma, Hermes, especially expresses all that inhabits the sea. It evokes in the mind this hidden fish that Mercury has captured and retains in the meshes of its net, the one that the old custom of the Feast of Kings nails sometimes under the guise of sole, dolphin, or even of a bean, hidden among the blades of the traditional galette. The pure and white ermine appears as an expressive emblem of the common mercury united with sulfur fish in the substance of the philosophical mercury. As for the closure, it reveals to us what the external signs are, according to the adept sayings, which constitute the best criterion of the secret product and provide the testimony of a better preparation conforming to natural laws. The palisade surrounding the ermine, and actually, enveloping the serving mercury, serves to explain the design of the stigmata in question. But our state being to define unequivocally, we will say that the Greek word pi alpha lambda iota sigma sigma delta alpha, palisada, derived from pi alpha lambda zeta omega, polizo, to trace, to engrave, to mark with an imprint, has an origin similar to that of the term pi alpha lambda iota sigma sigma xi, palace sax, that is to say a line drawn with chalk, distinctive form, character. And the character of our mercury is, precisely, to affect its surface a network of interwoven lines, woven in the manner of wicker baskets kappa sigma tau alpha sigma, keistas, chests, hampers, gabions, and baskets. These geometric figures, all the more apparent and better engraved than the purer material, are an effect of the all-powerful will of the spirit or the light. And this will impresses on the substance a cruciform external disposition sigma tau alpha upsilon rho sigma, stavros, and gives the mercury its effective philosophical signature. This is the reason why one compares this envelope with the meshes of the net used to catch the symbolic fish, to the Eucharistic basket carried on its back by the L apostrophe chi theta sigma, lichthys, of the Roman catacombs, to the crib of Jesus, cradle of the Holy Spirit incarnated in the Savior of men, to the cyst of Bacchus, which was said to contain we do not know what mysterious object, to the cradle of Hercules suffocated by the snake sent by Juno, and to the child Moses saved from the waters, to the king's cake, bearing the same characteristics, to the cake of Little Red Riding Hood, the most charming creation, perhaps, of the hermetic fables which are the tales of my mother goose, etc. But the significant imprint of the animated mercury, a superficial mark of the work of the metallic spirit, can only be obtained after a series of operations, or purifications, which are long, thankless, and arduous. Also, one must not neglect any pain, any effort, and must not fear time or fatigue, if one wants to be assured of success, whatever one does or attempts, never will the spirit remain stable in an unclean body or insufficiently purified. The motto, which accompanies our ermine proclaims it, prefer death to a stain. May the artist remember one of the great labors of Hercules, the cleaning of the Aegean stables. It is necessary to pass over our earth, say the sages, 
all the waters of the deluge. There lie the expressive images of the labor that demands purification by the task, though simple and easy, is so tedious that it has discouraged a host of alchemists more eager than laborious, more enthusiastic than persevering. Panel 9. Four horns from which flames escape, with the motto, not for struck, in English, in vain, vividly. This is the lapidary translation of the four degrees of our fire. The authors who have discussed it describe them as having different degrees and proportions of the elemental fire acting within the Athenor, on the philosophical rebus. This is at least the sense suggested to beginners, and which they rush into, without too much reflection, in the different practices of our art. However, philosophers certify themselves that they never speak more obscurely than when they seem to express themselves with precision. Thus, their apparent clarity deceives those who let themselves be seduced by the literal sense, and do not seek to ascertain whether it agrees or not with observation, reason, and the possibility to nature. This is why we must warn the artists who would attempt to realize the philosophical processes, that is to say, to submit the philosophical matter to the increasing temperatures of the four regime du fou, that they will inevitably be victims of their ignorance and frustrated with the expected result. That they first seek to discover what the ancients meant by the imaged expression of fire, and that of the four successive degrees of its intensity. For it does not refer in that place to the fire of kitchens, of our chimneys or of the high furnaces. In our work, asserts Philolethes, ordinary fire is only used to keep away the cold and the accidents it could cause. In other words, our author insists that it is the same fire, constant, regular and uniform from one end of the work to the other. Almost all philosophers have taken for example the food decoction or maturation, the incubation of the hen's egg, not with regard to the temperature to be adopted, but with that of uniformity and permanence. Thus, we strongly advise to consider first and foremost the relationship that the wise have established between the Fu and the Sufer, to obtain this essential notion that the four degrees of one must infallibly correspond to the four degrees of the other, which is to say a lot in few words. Finally, in his description so meticulous of the coction, Philolethes does not fail to point out how much the real operation is metaphorical, because instead of being direct, as it is generally believed, it involves several phases or simple repetitions of one and the same technique. In our opinion, these words represent what has been most sincerely said about the practice of the secret four degrees of fire, and, although the order and development of these works are reserved by the philosophers and always shrouded in silence, the special character that this cocotion thus understood will nonetheless allow the discerning artist to find a simple and natural method that should favor the execution. Mr. Louis Audiot, whose some quite spicy fantasies we have noted in the course of this study, has not been asked by ancient science for a plausible explanation of this curious chest. The joker, he writes, also mixes in our texts. Here is a big word. Frustra. Flaming horns. It's in vain that one keeps his wife. We do not believe that the author, moved by compassion for this unfortunate adept, wished to show the slightest irreverence for the memory of his companion. But ignorance is a blind and unfortunate bad advisor. Mr. Louis Audiot should have known better and refrained from generalizing. 11. The eighth and final series includes only one case dedicated to the science of Hermes. It depicts abrupt rocks whose wild silhouette stands in the middle of the waves. This lapidary tableau bears the inscription, .donic.urban.ignes, in English, as long as there will be fires, as long as the fire lasts, allusion to the possibilities of action that man holds from the igneous principle, spirit, soul, or light of things, the unique factor of all material mutations. Of the four elements of ancient philosophy, only three are represented here, the earth, by the rocks, the water by the marine wave, the air by the sky of the landscape carved. As for the fire, animator and modifier of the other three, it is not excluded from the subject but to better underline its preponderance, its power and its necessity, as well as the impossibility of any action on the substance, without the help of this spiritual force capable of penetrating it, of moving it, of changing into actual what it has of potential. As long as the fire lasts, life will radiate in the universe. Bodies, subject to the laws of evolution of which it is the essential agent, will accomplish the different cycles of their metamorphoses, until their transformation is final in spirit, light or fire. As long as the fire lasts, matter will never cease its painful ascent towards integral purity, from the compact and solid form, earth, to the liquid form, water, and from the liquid form to the radiant form, fire. As long as the fire lasts, man will be able to exercise a sovereign industry over the substances that surround him, and, thanks to the marvelous ignited instrument, bend them to his will, subdue them, make them serve his purposes. As long as the fire lasts, 
science will benefit from extended possibilities in all domains of human activity and the field of his knowledge and achievements. As long as the fire lasts, man will be in direct contact with God, and the creature will better know its creator. No subject of meditation appears more profitable to the philosopher. None calls more for the exercise of his thought. The fire envelops us and bathes us everywhere. It comes to us through air, water, the earth itself, which are its conservators and various vehicles. We encounter it in everything that approaches us. We feel it acting within us for the entire duration of our earthly existence. Our birth is the result of his incarnation. Our life, the effect of his dynamism. Our death, the consequence of his disappearance. Prometheus steals the fire from heaven to animate the man he had formed from the clay of the earth. Vulcan creates Pandora, the first woman, whom Minerva endows with movement by breathing into her the vital fire. A simple mortal, the sculptor Pygmalion, desirous to marry his own work, implores Venus to animate, by the celestial fire, his statue of Galatea. To seek to discover the nature and essence of fire, is to seek to discover God, whose real presence has always been revealed under the igneous appearance. The burning bush, Exodus, 3, 2, and the blazing manifestations by which God appeared to Moses at Sinai during the giving of the Decalogue, Exodus, 19, 18, are two figures under which God appeared to Moses. And it is under the figure of a jasper and sardine stone of flame color, sitting on an incandescent throne and full of fire, that St. John depicts the master of the universe, Apocalypse, 4, 3, 5. Note that our Jesus is described by St. Paul in his epistle to the Hebrews, ch. 12, 29, as a consuming fire. Therefore, it is not without reason that all religions have considered fire as the most striking and most expressive image of divinity. A symbol of the pictures and emblem of the most expressive of the universal is the fire that I keep, says Plush 1, since it has become the property of the enclosed area, because it is perpetually in the assembly of peoples. Nothing was indeed in the place that could more naturally predispose to give a sensible idea of power, of beauty, of the purity and of eternity of the being they come to worship. This magnificent symbol was in use throughout the Orient. The Persians regarded it as the most perfect image of the divinity. Zoroaster did not introduce the practice under Darius's Basps, but he enriched it with new views on a practice established long before him. The Pyri of the Greeks were nothing more than this. We find the same use among the Sabines and Romans in other parts of America. Moses maintained the practice of the perpetual fire and prescribed it in detail to the Israelites. The ceremonies from which he made the selection are still, it seems, practiced by them today. And the same symbol, so expressive, so noble, and so capable of throwing man into the illusion, still exists today in all our temples. To pretend that fire comes from combustion is to note a common observation without providing an explanation. The results of modern science for the most part stem from this indifference, whether intentional or not, regarding such an important and universal agent. What to think of the strange obstinacy that certain scholars have to recognize the point of contact that it constitutes, the bond that it creates between science and religion. If heat is born from movement, as is claimed, who then, we might ask, maintains the movement, the producer of fire, if not the fire itself, a vicious circle from which materialists and skeptics will never escape. For us, fire could never be the result or the effect of combustion, but its true cause, it is by the release of grave matter, which it contained, that fire is manifested and the phenomenon known as combustion appears. And whether this release is spontaneous or provoked, Common sense forces us to admit and to maintain that combustion is the result of the released ignited substance and not the primary cause of fire. Imponderable, intangible, always moving, fire possesses all the qualities that we recognize in spirits. It is, moreover, material, since we can see its clarity when it shines, and we feel our spirits uplifted by its radiant heat. Yet, is the spiritual quality of fire not revealed in the flame? Why does it continuously tend to rise, like a true spirit, thwarting our efforts to contain it, to degrade it? Is it not rather the intangible manifestation of this will which, by freeing itself from material bonds, moves away from the earth and draws closer to the celestial homeland? And what is the flame, if not the visible form, the very signature and image of the fire itself? But what we must especially retain, as having priority in the science that interests us is the high purifying virtue that fire possesses. The pure principle par excellence, the physical manifestation of purity itself, it thus signals its spiritual origin and discovers its divine filiation. A rather singular observation, the Greek word pyro, pyre, which serves to designate fire, presents exactly the pronunciation of the French qualifier pure. Also, the Hermetic philosophers, by uniting the nominative to the genitive, 
created the term pi rho, pi upsilon rho sigma, pi or pi rows, the foo do foo, or, phonetically, the pure do pure, and considered the pure Latin and the puter French as the seal of the absolute perfection read in the very color of the philosopher's stone. Our study of the coffers of Dampierre is finished. It remains only to signal a few decorative motifs that have no connection with the preceding. They display ornaments symmetrically arranged, rings, interlacings, arabesques, whether adorned with figures or not, whose craftsmanship denotes an execution subsequent to the symbolic subjects. All are devoid of phylacteries and inscriptions. Finally, the background tiles of a small number of coffers are still waiting for the chisel of the sculptor. It is to be presumed that the author of the marvelous grimoire, whose leaves and signs we have undertaken to decipher and which, for unknown reasons, interrupted a work that his successors could neither continue nor complete for lack of understanding it. Whatever the number, the variety, the esoteric importance of the subjects of this superb collection make the high gallery of the Chateau de Dampierre an admirable collection, a true museum of alchemical emblems, and classify our adept among the unknown masters best instructed in the mysteries of the sacred art. But, before leaving this masterful ensemble, let us permit ourselves to mention the teaching of a curious stone tableau from the time of Jacques Kerr, at Bourges, which seems to us worth recalling at the conclusion, and to serve as a summary. The carved form makes the tympanum of a door opened onto the court of honor and represents three exotic trees, palm, fig, and date, growing amidst herbaceous plants. A frame of flowers, leaves, and hammers surrounds this bar leaf, pl. 33. The panel and the door, from the same family, were known to the Greeks under the name of Phi Omicron Nu Iota Xi, Latin Phoenix, which is our phoenix in Hermeticism. They represent the two magisteria and their result, the two white and red stones, which have only one and the same nature understood under the Kabbalistic denomination of Phoenix. As for the fig tree occupying the center of the composition, it indicates the mineral substance from which philosophers extract the elements of the miraculous rebirth of the Phoenix, and this is the entire work of this rebirth which is agreed to call the great work. According to the Apocryphal Gospels, it was a fig tree, fig tree of Pharaoh, that had the honor of sheltering the fig tree or sycamore of his flight to Egypt, of nourishing the holy family with its fruits and quenching their thirst with the limpid and fresh water that the child Jesus caused to spring from its roots. Now, fig tree, in Greek, is said sigma upsilon kappa, psyche, from sigma upsilon kappa omicron nu, psychon, fig, a word frequently employed for kappa upsilon delta omicron sigma, kaidos, root kappa upsilon omicron, kyo, to carry in one's bosom, to contain, it is the virgin mother who carries the child, and the alchemical emblem of the passive, chaotic, aqueous and cold substance, matrix and vehicle of the incarnate spirit. Sozomen, an author of the 4th century, affirms that the tree of Hermopolis, which bowed before the child Jesus, is called Persia, Hist, Echol, Book V, Chapter 21. It is the name of the Balanus, Balanites Egyptica, a shrub of Egypt and Arabia, a kind of oak called Beta Lambda Alpha Nu Omicron Sigma, Balanos, Acorn, a word by which they also designated the Myrabalan, fruit of the Myrabalan tree. These various elements relate perfectly to the subject of the sages and to the technique of the art brief that Jacques Kerr seemed to have practiced. Indeed, when the artist, a witness to the battle waged by the Remora and the Salamander, robs from the defeated fiery monster its two eyes, he must then apply himself to combine them into one. This mysterious operation, nonetheless easy for those who know how to use the carcass of the salamander, provides a small mass quite similar to the oak acorn, sometimes resembling a chestnut, depending on whether it is more or less clothed in the rough matrix from which it never appears completely free. This gives us the explanation of the acorn and the oak, which one encounters almost always in the hermetic iconography. Chestnuts, particular to the style of Jean Lalamond, the heart, figs, the fig tree of Jacques Kerr, the jingle bell, an accessory of the fool's marats, pomegranates, pears and apples, frequent in the symbolic works of Dampierre and Coulon, etc. On the other hand, if one takes into account the magical and almost supernatural character of this production, one will understand why certain authors have designated the hermetic fruit under the epithet of Myra Balan, and why also this term has remained in the popular mind as a synonym for something marvelous, astonishing or very rare. The priests of Egypt, directors of the college's initiates, who were accustomed to posing as profane, soliciting access to sublime knowledge, this seemingly absurd question, is it sown, in your country, the seat of Halyurge and the Myrobolon? A question that did not embarrass the ignorant neophyte, but which the instructed investigator knew how to answer. 
The seed of Halyurij and the Myrabalan are not other than the fig and the fig tree of our philosophical eagle, which is none other than our philosophical fowl. It is the latter that brings the fabulous eagle of Hermes, with plumage dyed with all the colors of the work, but among which dominates the red, as its Greek name implies, Phi Omicron Nu Iota Xi, Phoenix, Red Purple. Cyrano de Bergerac does not fail to speak of it, in the course of an allegorical story where is mixed the language of birds that almost made me doze off in the shade, he says, I saw when I caught sight in the air of a marvelous bird that hovered over my head, it was sustained by a movement so light and so imperceptible, that I doubted several times if it was not yet a small universe balanced by its own center. It descended little by little, and finally came so close to me, that my eyes, beneath its feet, could see its image, its long tail, and its stomach of enameled azure, its wings of incarna, its purple head made it shine, shaking, a golden crown of which the rays sparkled from its eyes. It took a long time to fly in the clouds, and I was so attentive to everything it would become, that my soul, having folded and as if shortened to the sole operation of seeing, almost reached that of hearing, to make me understand that the bird was talking while singing. Thus, little by little unfurling from my ecstasy, I distinctly noted the syllables, the words, and the discourses it articulated. Here then, as best as I can recall, are the terms in which it arranged the tissue of its song. You are a stranger, if the bird of our land, O oh man, knock whites in us maw to don't Jesus original. For, this secret propensity that we have for our compatriots, is the instinct that drives me to want you to know my life. I see well that you are eager to learn who I am. It is I whom among you is called Phoenix. In each world, there is only one at a time, who lives there spanning the space of a hundred years. For, at the end of a century, when on some mountain of Arabia he is burdened with a large egg in the middle of the embers of his pyre, from which he has sorted the substance of aloe branches and cinnamon and incense, he takes his flight and directs his soaring to the sun, as the homeland where his heart has long aspired to it. He has indeed made all his efforts for this journey, but the heaviness of his egg, whose shells are so thick that it takes a century to incubate, always hinders the undertaking. I very much doubt that you will have difficulty understanding this miraculous production. That is why I want to explain it to you. The phoenix is hermaphroditic, but, among hermaphrodites, it is still another extraordinary phoenix, because, in brackets, the author, seemingly purposefully thus abruptly interrupts his revelation, and bracket, he remained a quarter of an hour without speaking, and then he added, I see well that you suspect of falsehood what I have just told you, but, if I do not speak the truth, I never want to approach your globe, that an eagle never swoops down on me. Another author goes into great detail about the mythical hermetic bird and highlights some peculiarities that would be difficult to find elsewhere. The Caesar of birds, he says, is the miracle of nature, who wanted to show in that bird what it knows how to do, showing itself as a phoenix and forming the phoenix, for it has marvelously enriched it, giving it a crested head with a royal plume and imperious tufts, from which sprout feathers and a crest so dazzling that it seems entirely made of silver and of a star adorned on its head. The downy shirt is of a changeable color, borrowing from all the colors of the world. The large feathers are of flesh, azure, gold, flame. The neck is a torque of all gemstones, and not a rainbow, but an arc in phoenix. The tail is celestial in color with a gold sheen representing the stars. Its feathers, and its entire mantle, is like a primavera, rich with all colors. It has two eyes on its head, shiny and flamboyant, which look like two stars, its legs of gold and its fiery talons. Everything conspires in its kind to show that it knows its worth and how to make its rank felt by the magnificence of its meat alone. So, even in its flesh there is something royal, for it makes its pass not only of tears of incense and bomb chrism. Being in the cradle, the sky, says Lactance, distilled nectar and ambrosia. He alone is the witness of all ages of the world, and has seen the soul's metamorphose from golden age to silver, from silver to copper, from copper to iron. He alone has never kept false company in heaven and in the world. He alone has played with death, and made it his nourisher and his mother, making life spring from life. He has the privilege of time, of life and death together. For when he feels burdened with it, weighed down by a long old age, brought down by such a long series of years that he has seen slip away, one after the other, he lets himself be carried away by a desire and just envy to be renewed by a miraculous death. Then, he makes a pile that alone in the world has no name, for it is not a nest, nor a cradle, nor a place of birth since he leaves life there. Neither is it a tomb, a coffin or a mournful urn, for from there he takes back life, in such a way that I do not know what is another unanimated phoenix, being at the same time cradle and sepulchre, host of life and of death, of all favor and, what is more, favor of the phoenix's decrepitude or its death. Whatever it may be, there, 
on the trembling arms of a palm. He makes a pile of cinnamon twigs and of incense, on the incense of the casket, on the spikenard casket, then, with a pitiful look, recommending himself to the son, his murderer and his father, he perches or lays down on this pyre of balm, to strip himself of his deceitful years. The son, favoring the just desires of this Odyssean bird, lights the pyre, and, reducing it to ashes, wraps him in a veiled mask, making horrendous life. Then, poor nature finds itself in a trance, and, with awful enslavements, fears to lose the honor of this great world, also commands that not a drop of the ash should spill, and that not a drop should fall on the ground. However enraged they may be, they would not dare to run over the fields. Only Zephyr is master, and springtime holds sway, while the ash remains unnamed, and nature holds the hand that favors the return of its phoenix. O oh, great miracle of divine providence! Almost at the same time this cold ash not wanting to leave poor nature for long in this fight gives her the terrifying warmth, I do not know how heated up by the duel and light of the sun, changes into a small worm, then into an egg, finally into a bird more beautiful than the other. You would say that all nature is resurrected, that deed is done according to Pliny, the sky again begins its revolutions as per the usual custom, and you would properly say that the four elements, without making any noise, sing a quartet with their flourishing gaiety, in praise of nature, and to properly welcome the return of the miracle of the birds of the world. E.L. 34. Just as the coffers of Dampierre, the panel with three trees sculpted at the palace of Bourges bears a motto, ornately decorated with flowering branches, the framing border indeed reveals isolated letters, very cleverly disguised. Their assembly composes one of the favorite maxims of the great artist who was Jacques Kerr, de M.A. Joie.dire.fair.tear, or in English, to say my joy holds silence. Indeed, the joy of the adept lies in his occupation. The work, which makes him sensitive and familiar with this marvel of nature, that so many dignitaries qualify as chimerical, constitutes his best distraction, his most noble pleasure. In Greek, the word chi alpha rho, kara, joy, derived from chi alpha rho omega, kiaro, to rejoice, to take pleasure in, to delight in, also means to love. The famous philosopher thus makes a clear allusion to the labor of the work, his most beloved task, which so many symbols, moreover, come to enhance the brilliance of the sumptuous lodgings. But what to say, what to admit about this unique joy, pure and complete satisfaction, the intimate joy of success, as little as possible, if one does not want to perjure oneself, arouse the envy of some, the greed of others, the jealousy of all, and risk becoming the prey of the powerful. What to do then with the result, which the artist, according to the rules of our discipline, commits to using modestly for himself, to use it ceaselessly for the good, to devote the fruits to the exercise of charity, in accordance with the philosophical precepts and with the Christian moral. What then to silence, absolutely everything that regards the alchemical secret and its application, for the revelation, remaining the exclusive privilege of God, the divulgation of the procedures is forbidden, not communicable in clear language, permitted only under the veil of the parable, of allegory, the image or the metaphor. The motto of Jacques Coeur, despite its brevity and its innuendos, shows perfect concordance with the traditional teachings of eternal wisdom. No philosopher, truly worthy of this name, would refuse to subscribe to the rules of conduct it expresses and which can be translated as. From the great work speak little, do much, keep silent always. the bodyguards of Francis II, Duke of Brittany, I, when, around the year 1502, Anne, Duchess of Brittany and twice Queen of France, formed the project of gathering, in a mausoleum, the esteem she had for them, the bodies of her parents who had passed away. She entrusted its execution to a Breton artist of great talent, but about whom we have little information, Michel Cologne. She was then 25 years old. Her father, Duke Francois II, had died at Couron 14 years earlier, on September 9, 1488, leaving her surviving his second wife, Marguerite de Foix, mother of Anne, who died 16 months old. She died in Etamp, on the 15th of May 1487. This mausoleum, started in 1502, was only completed in 1507. 
the plan is the work of Jean Perrille. As for the sculptures, which are among the purest masterpieces of the Renaissance, they are by Michel Colomb, helped in this work by two of his students, Guillaume Regnault, his nephew, and Jean de Chartres, his disciple and servant, although the collaboration of the latter is not absolutely certain. A letter, written on January 4, 1511, by Jean Perrille to the secretary of Marguerite de Bourgogne, on the occasion of work that the princess wished to have carried out in the chapel of Brou, tells us that Michel Colomb deserved at this place and brought us for Moise 20. Acus, the space of five years. The sculpture work was paid for 1,200 acus, and the tomb cost a total of 560 livres, according to the wishes expressed by Marguerite de Bretagne and Francois II, to be inhumed in the Church of the Carmes in Nantes, and had her father's mausoleum, qui part le nom de tombeau de Carmes, under which it is generally known and designated. It became en place, just until the revolution, the epoch at which the Church of the Carmes, having been sold as national property, it was removed and secretly kept by an art-loving amateur eager to save the masterpiece from the revolutionary vandals. The hurricane of last year has, we know, severely damaged the Cathedral of Saint-Pierre, the great pride of Nantes, where we went in 1819, today. The sepulcher vaulted, built under the mausoleum I admire, contains, since the revolutionary night, the two coffins of Francois II, Duke of Brittany, of September 8, 1727, the orders of the king, by Melier, mayor of Nantes, the 16th and 17th of October on the order of the king, and of Marguerite de Bretagne, his first wife, deceased September 25, 1449, and of Marguerite de Foix, second wife, mother of the Queen Anne. A small box was also there, it contained a heart reliquary of gold and moon day, in the shape of an egg, superbly, enameled, and containing the heart of Anne of Brittany, whose body rests at the Basilica of Saint-Denis. Among the descriptive relations that various authors have left us of the tomb of the Karmas, there are very detailed ones. We choose, to give an overview of the work, that of Brother Matthias of Saint-Jean, commoner of Nantes, who published it in the 18th century. But what seems to me more rare and worthy of admiration, this writer says, is the tomb raised in the heart of the church of the said Karmas, which, in the view of everyone, is one of the most beautiful and magnificent that can be seen which obliges me to make a particular description for the satisfaction of the curious. The devotion that the ancient dukes of Brittany had for a long time to the very Holy Virgin Mother of God, the patroness of this church of the P.P. Karmas, and the affection they had for the religious of this house, led them to choose it as the place of their sepulchre. And Queen Anne, by a unique testimony of her pity and affection in this place, wanted to have this beautiful monument erected in memory of her father Francois II and of her mother Marguerite de Foix. It is built in square, of eight feet on each side, and four feet high, its material is all of fine marble from Italy, black and white, and alabaster. The body is elevated on the plan, the ground, of the church, six feet high. The two sides are ornamented with six niches, each of two feet high, whose background is of well-crafted porphyry, and above, surrounded by white marble pillars, in the correct architectural proportions, enriched with arabesques, and very delicately worked. All twelve niches are filled with figures of the twelve apostles, in white marble, each having a different posture, and the instruments of the passion. Two of the columns are arranged opposite each other, each divided into two matching parts with the others. At the end towards the main altar of the church are placed in these niches the figures of St. Francis of Assisi and St. Margaret, patrons of the last duke and duchess who are buried there, and at the other end of the niches, the figures of St. Charlemagne and St. Louis King of France. Below these sixteen niches that surround the body of the tomb, there are as many concavities made round of fourteen inches in diameter, whose bottom is of white marble carved in the shape of a shell, and all filled with figures of mourners in their mourning garments, all in various postures, the work of which is considered of little personal value, but it is admired by all who hear of it. The cover of this body, made of a great marble table not made of a single piece, and which exceeds the solid, the mass of the tomb, by about eight inches, all around in the form of a cornice, to serve as an entablature and ornament of the body. Above this stone lie two large figures of white marble, each eight feet in length, which represent the duke, and the other the duchess with their ducal robes. Three figures of angels in white marble, each three feet high, hold small square cushions, cousins, under the heads of these figures, which seem to soften under the burden, and the angels weep. At the feet of the figure of the duke, there is a figure of a lion lying down represented naturally, which bears on its tunic, civier, the shield of arms of Brittany, and at the feet of the figure of the Duchess, there is a figure of a greyhound, which also wears around its neck the arms of the house of Foix which animates the art wonderfully well. 
but what is even more marvelous in this piece, are the four figures of the cardinal virtues, placed at the four corners of this sepulcher, made of white marble, of the height of six feet, they are so well carved, so well set, and have such a resemblance to nature, that foreigners who have seen nothing better, neither in antiquity nor in modern Italy, France, and Germany. The figure of justice is holding in her right hand a sort of raised rod, and in her left a balance, with clouds parting at her feet, the crown on her head, dressed in fur on the left arm, the collar of the order of equity, the severity and majesty which accompany this virtue. Opposite, on the left side, is the figure of prudence, who has two opposing faces, one of an old man with a long beard, the other of a young maiden, one of her hands, left, holds a convex mirror that she looks at fixedly, and the other a compass, at her feet, there is a serpent, and these things are symbols of the consideration and wisdom with which this virtue proceeds in her actions. At the right angle, on the top side, is the figure of fortitude, dressed in a coat of mail, armor, and wearing a helmet on her head. From her left hand she supports a tower, from the crevices of which a serpent, undragon, emerges that she strangles with her right hand, which signifies the vigor that this virtue puts forth in the adversities of the world to overcome the violence or to support the poor. In the opposite corner is the figure of temperance dressed in a long rope, girded with a cord. From her right hand, she supports a clock's mechanism, and from the other a horse's bit, hieroglyphic of the regulation and moderation that this virtue exercises in human passions. The eulogies that Brother Matthias of saint John gives to these guards of the body of Francois II, represented by the cardinal virtues of Michel Cologne, seem to us perfectly merited. These four statues, says de Camon, are admirable for their grace and simplicity. The draperies are rendered with a rare perfection, and in each figure, one observes a very striking individuality, although all four are equally noble and beautiful. These statues, imbued with the purest symbolism, guardians of the tradition and of the ancient science, which we are particularly going to study, the bodyguards of Francis II, Duke of Brittany. 2. With the exception of justice, the cardinal virtues are no longer represented with the singular attributes that give the ancient figures an enigmatic and mysterious character. Under the pressure of more realistic conceptions, symbolism has transformed. The artists, abandoning all idealization of thought, follow naturalism closely. They adhere closely to the expression of the attributes and facilitate the identification of allegorical figures. But, in perfecting their processes and by approaching more of the traits of living individuals, they did not lose, thank goodness, the grandeur of the allegory. On the contrary, they gave it, by the exactness of the portraits, a more striking relief. In modern formulations, they have unconsciously carried a dual body, the traditional truth. For the sciences of antiquity, transmitted under the veil of various emblems, symbols of the diplomatic and of present paintings have a double signification, one apparent, understandable by all, exoteric, the other hidden, accessible only to initiates, esoteric. In painting, the symbol, limited to a function positive, normal and defined, by individualizing to the point of excluding any connected or relative idea, it strips off that double sense, of the expressive second which precisely accentuates the symbolic value and the essential porte. Thus, paintings of justice, fortune, and love, with their eyes blindfolded, did they only pretend to express uniquely the blindness of one, the blinding of others? Could we not discover, in the attribute of the blindfold, a special reason for this artificial and undoubtedly necessary obscurity? It would suffice to know that these figures, commonly subject to human vicissitudes, also belong to the scientific tradition, to easily recognize it. And one would even realize that the occult sense stops with a clarity superior to that which is obtained by direct analysis and superficial reading. When poets recount that Saturn, father of the gods, should, one believes, with encyclopedia, that such a metaphor serves to characterize an epoch, an institution, etc., of which the circumstances or the results having been favorable to us, we should have only gathered the benefits. But if we give to this general interpretation the positive and scientific reason which constitutes the basis of legends and myths, the truth emerges by itself, luminous and detached. Hermeticism teaches that Saturn, symbolic representation of lead, terrestrial and Saturnine metal, generator of others, is also their unique and natural solvent. The dissolved metal assimilates with the solvent and is lost in it. As such, it is logical and fair to pretend that the solvent eats the metal, and in the marvelous fable the fabulous devourer consumes his progeny. We could give a multitude of examples of this duality of traditional symbolism. That alone would be enough to show that, in addition to the moral and Christian interpretation of the cardinal virtues, there exists a second teaching, secret, profane, usually unknown, 
which pertains to the material domain of acquisitions, of knowledge ancestral, sealed in the form of the same emblems. Thus, we find ourselves, within science and religion, the harmonious alliance so fruitful in marvelous results, which the skepticism of our times refuses to acknowledge and always conspires to dismiss. The theme of the virtues, notably remarked upon by the author in the 16th century, as Mr. Paul Vitry observed, was in the art of that variable era, but still in good standing, as it remained quite fashionable among the Italians, faith, hope, and charity, still often reduced to these three theological virtues in Italy, were of limited attributes, they were the knots of good name, as order in it had remained fairly stable. But there were still four cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, strength, temperance. She was also happily applied to funeral ornaments. She constitutes one of the good fortunes of the ornamentation of the tombs. As for the way to characterize these virtues, it seems to have been established with Orcagna and his tabernacle of gold San Michel almost up to the 14th century. Justice carries the sword and the balance and would not vary in the middle. The essential attribute of prudence is the mirror and the serpent. It is sometimes a man or several books, sometimes a serpent, and there is sometimes added, by an idea analogous to that of Dante, who from the beginning had given eyes to his prudence, the imagers would give two faces to this virtue. Temperance often holds two vessels and sometimes her sword against the torturer, but more often she mixes water with wine. This elementary symbol of sobriety seemed to blend water and wine. It is Samson. She is armed with the shield and finally, strength has the attributes of the skin of a lion on the head and a disc representing the world. Sometimes she has a column, and this will be her definitive attribute, in Italy at least, whether the entire column or broken. In the absence of great monuments, engravings, manuscripts, books took care of spreading the type of virtues all Italy on and could even make them known to those who, like Cologne, had undoubtedly not made the voyage to Italy. A series of Italian engravings from the end of the 15th century, which is known under the name of Tarot of Italy, shows us in the middle of representations of various social conditions, of muses, of gods of antiquity, of liberal arts, etc., a series of figures of virtues, they almost exactly represent the attributes we have just described. We have there a very curious specimen of these documents which could circulate in the workshops of people like Peril, who had followed the expeditions, documents that could circulate in the workshops and provide themes in anticipation of imposing a new style. This symbolic language, moreover, had no difficulty in being understood by us. It was entirely in conformity with the allegorical spirit of the 15th century. To realize this, one only has to think about the Roman de la Rose, and to all the literature that existed then. Les Miniatristes had abundantly illustrated these works and, even outside of these allegories of nature, of deduction and of faux semblant, French art was certainly not unaware of the series of virtues, although it was not as frequently employed as in Italy. However, without absolutely denying the splendid figures of the tomb of the Karmas, any influence in Italian style, Paul Vitry points out the new character, essentially French, that Michel Colomb was to give to the ultramontane elements brought by Jean Peril. Even assuming, the author continues, that they borrowed the original idea from the Italian tombs, Peril and Colomb would not accept, without modification, a theme of the cardinal virtues. Indeed, Temperance will carry in its hands a clock and a bit with its bridle instead of the two vases that the Italians had commonly given her. As for strength, armed and helmeted, instead of her column, she will hold a tower, a kind of crenellated keep, from where a vigorously fighting dragon emerges. Neither in Rome, nor in Florence, nor in Milan, at the Como Gate, south door of the cathedral, do we know anything similar. But if one can easily discern, in the Nantes Cenotaph, the respective part that belongs to the masters Peril and Cologne, it is still unpleasant to see how far personal influence could extend, the personal will of the foundress. For we cannot believe that for five years she was disinterested in a work that was particularly dear to her heart. Queen Anne, this gracious sovereign of the people, in her naive affection, familiarly called the good duchess in her wood of boars, had she not been the esoteric guardian of the mausoleum raised in memory of her parents? We would willingly resolve this question in the affirmative. Her biographers assure us that she was very educated, endowed with a lively intelligence and a remarkable clairvoyance. Her library, which seems to have been important for the time, is depicted by the only account, not dated from Lindsay that I could discover relating to the set of the library formed by Anna Brittany, Index of Expenditures of 1498. There were found manuscript books and prints in Latin, French, Italian, Greek, and Hebrew. Eleven volumes of the Quarante, it is a wonder that Charles VIII, at 16, was already married. We will perhaps be surprised to see featured in the collection of the Duchess, works in Greek and Hebrew, but we must not be surprised. 
It is remembered that she had studied the two languages scholars and that her spirit was above all serious. On us we note that in seeking the conversation of diplomats, to whom she was pleased to respond in their own language, which would justify a very polyglot education, it is without a doubt also the possession of the Kabbalistic Hermetic, du goy Gassoy too on the double science. Did she not also count among the renowned scholars of her time, among her contemporaries? We lack information on this point, which makes it difficult to explain why the great chimney of the Hotel Le Mans in Bourges does not bear an image of Anne of Brittany and the porcine Louis XII, if one does not wish to acknowledge her presence in the philosophical abode of Bourges. Whatever the case, her personal fortune was considerable. The pieces of goldsmithery, gold ingots, gemstones constituted the mass of a treasure nearly inexhaustible. The abundance of such riches facilitated the exercise of a generosity that quickly became popular. The chroniclers teach us that she willingly built it up again, by the gift of a diamond, the poor minstrel who had entertained her for a few moments. As for her livery, it offered the hermetic colors chosen by her, black, yellow, and red, before the death of Charles VIII, and she alone, among the ladies of the oeuvre, wore black and red since that time. Finally, she was the first queen of France, in contrast, dressed in black according to the custom established to that point, wore mourning for her first husband in black, while the custom obliged sovereigns to always wear it in white. The bodyguards of Francis II, Duke of Brittany. 3. The first of the four statues we are going to study is the one that offers us the various attributes charged with specifying the allegorical expression of justice, lion, balance, sword. But beyond the esoteric meaning, different from the moral one attributed to these attributes, Michelle Colomb's figure presents other signs revealing her occult personality. It is not a detail, however small, that has been neglected in any analysis of this genre, which, having been carefully examined, has not been predetermined. The justice is bordered with roses and pearls. Our virtue at the forehead had a ducal crown, which could make one believe that she represented the traits of Anne de Bretagne, a poupla on her right and the pommel of a radiant sun. Finally, it is here that her characteristic is finished first. She appears here unveiled. The peplum that she wore throughout had slipped along the body, retained by the salience of the arms. It comes to double the cloak in its lower part. The sword itself has left its brocade scabbard, which we see now suspended at the tip of the iron, P.L. 35. B.L. 35. D. Cathedral de Nance Tombeau de Francois I. La Justice, 16 siècle. Thus truth at the pinnacle of the justice rests. It's because the very essence of the deity, to whom nothing is concealed, compels the revelation and the manifestation of truth to show itself to all in the full light of equity. The veil, halfway drawn, must necessarily reveal the individuality secreted by a second figure, adroitly concealed under the form and attributes of the first. This second figure is none other than philosophy. In Roman antiquity, they called peplos, in Greek, a veil adorned with embroidery which clothed the statue of Minerva, daughter of Jupiter, the goddess whose birth was marvelous. Indeed, she emerged fully armed from the brain of her father, Jupiter, on the order of the master of Olympus, Vulcan, who split his head. From there the Hellenic name of Athens, Athena, formed from, privative, and noesis, Greek, mind, meaning mind without mother personification of wisdom or knowledge of things, Minerva must be regarded as divine and creative thought, materialized in all nature, latent in us as well as in everything that surrounds us. But it's from a woman's veil, Chalama, that is here in question, and that word would have another form. Peplos symbolizing, Calypto, comes from Calypto to cover, envelop, hide, which has formed Kappa Alpha Lambda Sigma, Calise, Rose Button, Flower, and also, Caliso, Greek name of the nymph Calypso, queen of the mythical island of Ogygia, which the Hellenes called, Thygatros, term neighbor of Theta Upsilon Gamma Alpha Tau Rho, which in the sense of antiquity and grand. We will find it again as the rose mystique, flower of grand oeuvre, under the name of the philosophical stone, so that it's easy to grasp the relationship between the expression of the veil and that of the roses and pearls adorning the fur-trimmed surcoat, since this stone is still called precious pearl, Margarita Prediusa. Alice, you know Father Noel, representative of the Muscovites to this court, told us the day before yesterday how the Tsar had given him a remarkably large and beautiful crown made of gold and the white tunic, covered with a purple drape. She wears on her chest a rich jewel, a symbol of her inestimable value, and places her left foot on a squared stone. One could not better describe the dual nature of the magisterium, its colors, the high value of this cubic stone that carries philosophy in its entirety, masked, for the common people, under the features of justice. Philosophy confers to whoever embraces it a great power of investigation. 
It allows one to penetrate the intimate complexity of things, cutting through them as with a sword, thereby uncovering the presence of the spirit world. These are discussed by the classical masters, who place their center in the sun and derive its virtues and movement from the radiation of the star. It also gives knowledge of the general laws, the rules of rhythm and measures that nature observes in the elaboration, the evolution and the perfection of created things, balance. It establishes, finally, the possibility of acquiring knowledge of the base of, liberation, of meditation, of faith and science on a written work. By the same attributes, this image of philosophy does not only inform, secondly, on the essential points of the labor of the adepts, and proclaims the necessity of manual work imposed on researchers wishing to acquire a positive proof of its reality. Without technical research, without frequent trials and experiences, one can only stray into a science of which the best treatises conceal the physical principles, their application, the material at the same time. He who calls himself a philosopher and does not want to labor for fear of that, or of spending too much money, must be regarded as the most vain of the ignorant or the most audacious of impostors. I can bear witness, said Augustine Thierry, for my part will not be suspect. There is in the world something that nothing can equal the joy that knowledge brings, better than fortune, better than health itself, it's science. The sage's activity is not measured by the spectacular results of the stove, controlled at the furnace, in the solitude and silence of the laboratory, non-attentive to all. It manifests without verbal claim, by the attentive study, the observant and persevering, of reactions and phenomena. He who acts belatedly will verify, sooner or later, the maxim of Solomon, Prov.21, 25, saying that the desire of the lazy will kill him, because his hands refuse to work. The real philosopher fears not because he is not afraid of suffering because he knows that effort is a science, and only she provides the means to hear the sentences and their interpretation, the words of the wise and their profound speeches, Prov, I, 6. As for the practical value of the attributes associated with justice, which look at hermetic work, the student will find by experience that the energy of the universal spirit has its signature in the sword, and the sword has its correspondence in the sun, as the intelligence of the mind to matter perturbed by all the substances of the bodies. It is the only agent of metamorphosis substances of the original matter, subject and foundation of the magisterium. It is through him that mercury is changed into sulfur, sulfur into elixir and the elixir into medicine, receiving then the name of the crown of the wise, by this operation. The triple mutation confirms the truth of the secret teaching and consecrates the glory of its fortunate artisan. The possession of burning sulfur and multiplied, masked under the term of philosophical stone, is for the adept what the triregnum is for the paper crown. The major emblem of sovereignty and of the monarch, the open book, characterized by the radical solution of the metallic body, which, having rid itself of its impurities and given up its sulfur, is then set open. But here, a remark imposes itself under the name of Liber and under the image of a closed book to designate the raw material, holder of the dissolved bodies, the sages have meant to signify the closed book, the general symbol of all crude bodies, minerals or metals, as nature presents them to us or as human industry offers them for trade. Thus, minerals extracted from the deposit, metals from the smelting, are expressed hermetically by a closed book with a seal. Similarly, these bodies, set to alchemical work, modified by the application of occult processes, are translated in iconography with the aid of the open book. It is therefore necessary, in practice, to extract mercury from the closed book so that it can in turn open the living metal and cover it, if we want it to enclose the living metal and if we want the living sulfur that it contains. The opening of the first book prepares the second. For hidden under the same emblem, two closed books, the raw subject and the metal, and two open books, the mercury and the sulfur, although these hieroglyphs it still allows one to realize the second axiom of the work, to join life to life, by uniting the mercury firstborn of nature, to this active sulfur to obtain the mercury of philosophers, a pure, subtle, sensitive, and living substance. This is the operation that the sages have reserved under the expression of the chymical wedding of the brother and sister, for they are all of the same blood and have the same origin, of Gabricius and Bea, of the sun and the moon, of Apollo and Diana. This last term has provided to the Kabbalists the famous ensign of Apollonius of Tiana, under which one believed to recognize a pretended philosopher, although the miracles of this fictitious character, of undeniably hermetic nature, were, for the initiated, dressed with the symbolic seal and consecrated to alchemical esotericism. Case in 5, Noah's Ark floats on the waters of the flood, while nearby a boat threatens to sink. In the sky of the subject read the words, Veritas.Vincit, or in English as, Truth Conquers. 
Victorious truth. We have already said that the arch represents the totality of materials prepared and united under various names of compound, rebus, amalgam, etc., which properly constitute the archi, the igneous matter, the base of the philosopher's stone. The Greek rho chi, arch, signifies commencement, principle, source, origin, under the action of external fire, exciting the internal fire of the archi, the entire compost liquefies, takes on the appearance of water, and this liquid substance, which fermentation agitates and swells, takes on, among authors, the character of the diluvian flood. First jaundiced and turbulent, it is given the name of Latin or Laeton, which is none other than that of the mother of Diana and Apollo, Latona. The Greeks called it Lambda Tau Nu, Latin, from Lambda Tau Sigma, Latos, also written as the Ionic variant of Lambda Tau Sigma, Latos, with the Ionic sense of common, common house Tau Lambda Tau Nu, to Latin, indicative of the common protective envelope to the double embryo. Let us note, in passing, that the catalysts, by one of these calms of which they are accustomed, have indicated that the fermentation must be done with the help of a wooden vessel, or, better, in a tonneau cut in two, to which they apply the epithet of Shen Kru. Latona, mythological princess, becomes, in the language of the adepts, La Tun, La Tano, which explains why beginners find it so difficult to identify the secret vessel where our matters ferment. After the required time, one can see rising to the surface, floating and constantly moving under the effect of ebullition, a very thin film, in meniscus, that the sages have named the philosophical isle, manifestation of the thickening and of the coagulation. It is the famous isle of Delos, in Greek delta lambda omicron sigma, that is to say apparent, clear, certain, which offers an unexpected refuge to Latona fleeing the persecution of Juno, and fills the heart of the artist with an immense joy without mixture. This floating isle, which Poseidon, with a strike of his trident, made emerge from the depths of the sea, is also known as saving art carried on the waters of the flood. Cum viderem quad aqua sensum crassior, nobis disit Hermes, duriurc fieri in Cipiret, Gaudabam, certo enim siabam, ut in venerum quad quarabam, or in English as, when I saw that the water gradually became thicker, Hermes tells us, and began to harden, I rejoiced, for I certainly knew that I would find what I was searching for. Gradually, and under the continuous action of the internal fire, the film thickens, spreads in extent until it covers the entire surface of the molten mass. The floating isle is then fixed, and this spectacle gives the alchemist the assurance that the time of the layers of Latona has arrived. At this moment, the mystery reasserts its rights. A heavy, dark, livid cloud rises and exhales from the warm and stabilized isle, shrouding this land and partitioning, enveloping and dissolving all things in its opacity, filling the philosophical sky with Sumerian shadows, kappa upsilon nu epsilon rho epsilon nu, chimerin, literally to be dark, and, in the great eclipse of the sun and the moon, steals from the eyes the supernatural birth of the hermetic twins, future parents of the stone. The Mosaic tradition reports that God saw the light, that it was good, and towards the end of the flood, makes a warm wind blow over the waters which evaporates them and lowers the level. The tops of the mountains emerge from the immense liquid sheet, and the ark then comes to rest on Mount Ararat, in Armenia. Noah, opening the window of the vessel, releases the raven, which is, for the alchemist and in his tiny genesis, the replica of the Sumerian shadows, of those dark clouds that accompany the elaboration of new beings and regenerated bodies. Through these correspondences, and the material testimony of the work itself, truth asserts itself victorious, despite the deniers, the skeptics, men of little faith, always ready to reject, in the domain of illusion and the marvelous, the positive reality they could not understand because it is not known and even less taught. Case in 6, a woman, kneeling at the foot of a tomb on which this strange word is read. Tiasi. The deepest despair is conveyed. The banner that adorns this figure bears the inscription. Victa.jasset.virtus. Or in English that is virtue lies defeated. Truth lies vanquished. The motto of André Chenier, Louis Audia tells us, by way of explanation, and without considering the time elapsed between the Renaissance and the Revolution. It is not here a question of the poet, but of the truth of sulfur, or of the wise men's gold, which rests under the stone waiting for the complete decomposition of its perishable body. For the sulfurous earth, dissolved in the mercurial water, prepared by the death of the compound, the liberation of this virtue, which is mainly the soul or the fire of sulfur. And this virtue, momentarily predominant over the corporeal envelope, or this immortal spirit, floated on the chaotic waters, until the formation of the new body, as Moses indicates in Genesis, ch. 1, v. 2. 
It is therefore the hieroglyph of mortification that we have under our eyes, and it is this which is also repeated in the engravings of the Preciosa Margarita novella that Pierre Bon de Lombardy illustrated in his treatise on the Grand Oeuvre. Many philosophers have adopted this mode of expression and veiled, under funereal or macabre subjects, the putrefaction specifically applied to the second work, that is to say, the operation charged with decomposing and liquefying the philosophical sulfur, derived from the first labor, into a perfect elixir. Basile Valentine shows us a skeleton standing on its own coffin, in one of his deuce clefts, and paints us a scene of inhumation in another. Flamel places not only the humanized symbols of the Ars Magna on the Chariot of the Innocents, but also decorates his tombstone, which can be seen exposed in the chapel of the Cluny Museum, with a skeleton gnawed by worms with this inscription. Of earth I came and to earth I return. Dot senior Zadith contains, within a transparent sphere, a dying emaciated figure. Henri de Linthout sketches, on a page of the Aurore, the lifeless body of a crowned king lying on the mortuary slab, while his spirit, in the shape of an angel, rises towards a lantern lost in the clouds. And we ourselves, after these great masters, have exploited the same theme in the frontispiece of the mystery of the cathedrals. As for the woman who, on the tomb of Arcason, translates her regrets into disordered gestures, she represents the metallic mother of sulfur. It is to her that the singular vocable engraved on the stone that covers her child belongs. Tyassi. This Baroque term, undoubtedly born from the whimsy of our adept is, in reality, nothing but a Latin phrase assembled in reverse order so that it can be read starting from the end. Sic I at, alas, thus at least. Could he be reborn? The ultimate hope at the heart of the utmost pain. Jesus himself had to suffer in his flesh, die and remain three days in the tomb, in order to redeem mankind, and then to resurrect in the glory of his human incarnation and the fulfillment of his divine mission. Case in 7. Represented in full flight, a dove holds an olive branch in its beak. This subject is distinguished by the inscription, .si, k.fata.vocant, or in English if the fates call you, if destiny calls you. The emblem of the dove with the olive branch is given by Moses in his description of the universal deluge. It is indeed said, Genesis, ch. 8, v. 11, that Noah, having released the dove, saw it return towards evening bringing back an olive branch. This is the sign par excellence of the true path and the march of the operations. For the work of the work being an abbreviation and a reduction of creation, all the circumstances of the divine work must be found in small in the work of the alchemist. Consequently, when the patriarch sends out the raven from the ark, we must understand that it is a question, for our work, of the first durable color, that is to say the black color, because once the composition has become effective, the materials putrefy and take on that dark blue color comparable to the very dark one that the metallic reflections allow to guess on the feathers of the raven. Moreover, the biblical account specifies that this bird, detained by the cadavers, does not return to the ark. However, the analogical reason which attributes to it the black color and the term raven is not uniquely due to its dark appearance. The philosophers have again given to the compost the old medieval oath name of core blue, from which comes the cabalistic term corbeau. Not that it is pleasing to the sight, but because it brings the first happy omen of the philosophical materials. Nevertheless, despite the appearance of the black color, we are inclined to recognize in the apparitions that with reserve, we refuse to welcome these demonstrations which do not attribute any more value than they have. We know how easy it is to detect foreign substances, as long as they comply with the rules of the art. This criterion, therefore, is insufficient and justifies the common axiom that any matter dries up and corrupts in the humidity that is natural and homogeneous to it. This is the reason for which we caution beginners, before giving themselves over to the transports of a joy without tomorrow, to prudently await the manifestation of the color green, the symptom of the desiccation of the earth, of the absorption of the waters, and of the vegetation of the newly formed body. Thus, brother, if heaven deigns to bless your labor and, as the saying of the adept goes, see te fata vocant, you will first obtain the olive branch, symbol of peace and union of the elements, then the white dove that will have brought it to you. Only then can you be certain of possessing that admirable light, the gift of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus sent, on the fiftieth day, Pentecost, to his beloved apostles. Such is the material consecration of the initiatory baptism and of the divine revelation, and as Jesus came out of the water, St. Mark tells us, ch. 1, v. 10, John suddenly saw the heavens open and the Holy Spirit descend upon him in the bodily form of a dove. Case in 8, two forearms whose hands join together, emerge from a cord of clouds. They have for their motto, dot doc dot for them, or in English as, accept and give trust. 
receive my word and hold it dear. This motif is, in essence, a translation of the sign used by alchemists to express the element water. Clouds and arms form a triangle with the tip pointing downwards, a hieroglyph of water, opposed to the fire symbolized by an upright triangle that seems similar but inverted. It is certain that we could not understand our first mercurial water under this emblem of union, since the two clasped hands in a pact of fidelity and attachment belong to two distinct individuals. We have said, and we repeat here, that the initial mercury is a simple product, and the first agent charged with extracting the sulfurous and fiery part of metals. However, if the separation of sulfur by this solvent allows some mercury to be retained, or allows it to absorb a certain amount of sulfur, although these combinations can receive the denomination of philosophical mercury, we should not yet hope to realize the stone solely by this mixture. Experience shows that philosophical mercury, subjected to distillation, easily leaves its fixed body, leaving the pure sulfur at the bottom of the flask. On the other hand, and despite the assurance of authors who grant mercury preponderance in the work, we note that sulfur designates itself as the essential agent, since ultimately it is the one that, as the agent of the elixir or multiplied under that of the stone, is exalted under the name of philosophical fire. Philosophical, in the final product of the work. Thus mercury, whatever it is, remains subject to sulfur, for it is its servant and its slave, which, allowing itself to be absorbed, disappears and confuses with its master. As a consequence, as the universal medicine is a true generation, all generation cannot be accomplished without the aid of two factors, of similar species but of different sex, we must recognize that the philosophical mercury is impotent to produce the stone, and this because it is alone. It is, however, the one that plays the role of the female, but this one, say dispagnet and philolethi, must be united with the second male, if one wants to obtain the compound known under the name of rebus, the first matter of the magister. It is the mystery of the hidden word, or verbum demissum, which our adept has received from his predecessors, which he transmits to us under the veil of the symbol, and for the conservation of which he asks us for our oath, that is to say the promise not to disclose what he has judged good to keep secret, exipi dac fidem. Case in 9. On rocky ground, two doves, unfortunately decapitated, face each other, they carry for an epitaph the Latin adage, dot concordia dot infiara dot amram. Conquered nourishes love, eternal truth, which we find application of everywhere here below, and which the great work confirms by the most striking example that it is possible to encounter in the mineral order. The hermetic work in its entirety is, in effect, a perfect harmony realized after the natural tendencies of inorganic bodies among themselves, of their chemical affinity and, if the word is not too excessive, of their reciprocal love. The two birds composing the subject of our bar-relief represent those famous doves of Diana, an object of despair for so many searchers, and famous enigma imagined by Philolethi to cover the artifice of the wise man's double mercury. By proposing to the sagacity of the aspirants this obscure allegory, the great adept did not elaborate on the origin of these birds, he only teaches, in the briefest way, that the doves of Diana are inseparably enveloped in the eternal embraces of Venus. Now, the ancient alchemist placed under the protection of Diana with lunar horns this first mercury which we have often spoken of under the name of universal solvent. Its whiteness, its silver brightness also earned at the epithet of moon of philosophers and mother of the stone, it is in the way Hermes understands it when he says, speaking of the work, the sun is his father and the moon his mother. Limon of Saint Didier, to help the investigator decipher the enigma, writes in the dialogue of Eudox and Pyrophilus, finally consider by what means Gaber prescribes to make the sublimations required by this art, for myself, I cannot do more than to echo the wish made by another philosopher, may the stars of Venus, and Diana grant you favorable outcomes. Therefore, we can consider the doves of Diana as two parts of dissolving Mercury, the two points of the lunar crescent, against one of Venus, which must tightly embrace its favorite doves. This correspondence is confirmed by the double quality, volatile and aerial, of the initial Mercury whose emblem has always been among birds, and by the very matter from which Mercury emerges, the rocky, chaotic, sterile ground where the doves rest. When the scripture tells us, the Virgin Mary fulfilled the law of Moses, the seven days of purification, Exodus, 13, 2, Joseph accompanied her to the temple of Jerusalem, in order to present there the child and the sacrifice, according to the law of the Lord, Leviticus, 12, 6, 8, that is, a couple of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Thus appears, in the sacred text, the mystery of the ornithogallum, that famous bird's milk, apostrophe rho nu theta omega nu gamma lambda alpha, ornithengala, about which the Greeks spoke as something extraordinary and very rare. 
to milk the birds apostrophe rho nu theta omega nu gamma lambda alpha mu lambda gamma epsilon iota nu ornithin gala meal gain was a proverb among them equivalent to succeeding to gaining favor in any endeavor and we must admit that it is by destiny and success in providence to discover the dove that one must be chosen from the dove coat the hermetic synonym of diana's dove and to possess the ornithogalum synonymous with the hermetic lay de vierge dear to philolethes rho nu iota sigma ornus in greek designates not only the bird in general but more expressly the rooster and the hen and it is perhaps from there that the term apostrophe rho nu theta omega nu gamma lambda alpha ornithin gala bird's milk obtained by diluting a yolk of egg in hot milk comes from we will not insist on these reports because they would reveal the secret operation hidden under the expression diana's doves let's say however that the plants called ornithogales are bulbous liliaceae with beautiful white flowers and it is known that the lily is par excellence the emblematic flower of mary night series pl 31 coffered ceiling i piercing through the clouds a man's hand throws against a rock seven balls that bounce back towards it this bar leaf is adorned with the inscription dot concaves sfrgo or in english a shaken i rise a similar subject is noted on one of the coffers of the lalaman chapel in bourge but the balls there are replaced by chestnuts now This fruit whose spiny pericarp has given it the common name of erison in Greek chi nu omicron sigma eschinos erison chestnut tree of the sea is a quite exact representation of the philosopher's stone as it is obtained by the short path it appears indeed to consist of a sort of crystalline and translucent core almost spherical in color resembling that of rose ruby valet enclosed in a more or less thick shell rough to the touch which at the end of the work is often cracked sometimes even open like the husk of walnuts and chestnuts these are indeed the fruits of the hermetic labor that the celestial hand throws against the rock emblem of our mercurial substance every time the stone once fixed and perfect is taken up by the mercury in order to dissolve in it to nourish itself anew to increase not only in weight and volume but also in energy it returns through coction to its state its color and its primitive aspect it can be said that after touching the mercury it returns to its starting point These are the phases of fall and ascent of solution and coagulation that characterize the successive multiplications that give each rebirth of the stone a theoretical power tenfold of the previous one. However, although many authors do not envision any limit to this exaltation, we believe in the philosophies that it would be imprudent in terms of what concerns transmutation and medicine to go beyond the seventh repetition. This is the reason why Jean Lalamond and the adept of Dampierre have only figured seven balls or chestnuts on the motifs we are talking about. limited for speculative philosophers the multiplication is however confined to the practical domain the more the stone progresses the more it becomes penetrating and rapidly elaborates it requires at each degree of augmentation only the eighth part of the time demanded by the preceding operation generally and we consider here the long path it is rare that the fourth repetition requires more than 2 hours the fifth almost accomplishes itself in half the time while 12 seconds would suffice to achieve the immediate The instantaneousness of such an operation would make it impracticable. On one hand, it would require to reserve a large part of the volume without ceasing to acquire a proportional amount of mercury, always long and tedious to prepare. In the end, the power multiplied by the 5th and 6th degrees would require, if left to its own volition, a significant mass of gold to orient it towards the metal. Otherwise, one would risk losing it entirely. It is therefore preferable from every point of view not to push too far the subtlety of an agent already endowed with considerable energy unless one wishes leaving the realm of metallic possibilities and medical uses to possess this universal mercury brilliant and luminous in obscurity in order to construct the perpetual lamp but the passage from the solid state to the liquid state which must be achieved in place being extremely dangerous can only be attempted by a very learned and very skillful individual From all that proceeds, we must conclude that the material impossibilities signaled in the context of transmutation tend to ruin the thesis of a geometric progression growing and indefinite, based on the number 6, to the pure theorists. Let us guard ourselves from the enthusiasm unreflected and never let our judgment be swayed by specious arguments, bright but hollow theories from wondrous producers. Science and nature reserve enough wonders to satisfy us without the need to add still the vain fantasies of imagination. Coffered ceiling too. it is a dead tree with branches cut off with roots exposed that this bar leaf presents to us it does not bear any inscription but only two alchemical notation signs engraved on a cartouche one a schematic figure of a level expresses the sulfur 
the other, an equilateral triangle with an upper vertex, designates the fire. The withered tree is a symbol of usual metals reduced from their mineral state and melted, which the high temperatures of the metal furnaces have deprived of the activity they had in their natural state. This is why philosophers say that dead metals are reintroduced to the work of the great work, until they are revivified, or reincredited according to the consecrated term, because an internal fire never completely abandons them. For the metals, fixed on their plane of allegory, are like an industrial form that we know, retain, in the very depth of their substance, the soul that the common fire has condensed and made dense, but has not been able to destroy. And this soul, the wise have named it fire or sulfur, because it is truly the agent of all the mutations, of all the accidents observed in the metallic matter, and this incombustible seed that nothing can completely ruin, nor the violence of strong acids, nor the ardor of the furnace. A great principle of immortality, charged by God himself to ensure the perpetuity of the species and to reform the body decayed, it persists and is found again in the ashes of calcined metals, while these have suffered the disintegration of their parts and seen their bodily envelope consumed. Therefore, the philosophers judged, not without reason, that the qualities refractory to sulfur, its resistance to fire, could only belong to fire or to some igneous nature spirit. This is what led them to give it the name under which it is designated and which certain artists believe to derive from its aspect, although it has no connection with common sulfur. In Greek, sulfur is called theta epsilon omicron nu, theon, a word whose root is theta epsilon omicron sigma, theos, which means divine, marvelous, supernatural. Tau theta epsilon omicron nu, theon, not only expresses divinity, but also the magical, extraordinary side of a thing. Now, philosophical sulfur, considered as the god and the animator of the great work, revealed by its actions an energy forming comparable to that of the divine spirit. Thus, although we have to attribute the precedence to Mercury, for the order of successive acquisitions, we must acknowledge that it is to sulfur, the incomprehensible soul of metals, that our practice owes its mysterious character and in some way supernatural. So, search for the sulfur in the dead trunk of common metals, and you will obtain at the same time that natural and metallic fire which is the principal key of alchemical labor. That is, says Le Mojon de Saint Didier, the great mystery of the art, since all others depend on the intelligence of this one. How satisfied I would be, adds the author, if it were permitted for me to explain this secret unambiguously, but I cannot do what no philosopher has believed to be in their power. All that you can reasonably expect from me, is to tell you that the natural fire is a fire in potency, which does not burn the hands, but which shows its effectiveness as soon as it is slightly excited by the external fire. Crawford Ceiling 3, a hexagonal pyramid, made of riveted steel plates, bears, attached to its walls, various emblems of chivalry and hermeticism, pieces of armor and honorable pieces, shields, helmet, vambrace, gauntlets, crown and garlands. Its epigraph is taken from a verse by Virgil, Aeneid, 11, 641, sic, ITVR, AD, Astra, and in English as, thus, to the stars, this is how one becomes immortalized. This pyramidal construction, which form recalls the Athenor, the hieroglyph adopted to designate the fire, is nothing other than the philosophical furnace necessary for the maturation of the work. Two doors on the side are arranged and face each other, they close off glazed windows which allow the observation of the work's faces. Another, located at the base, gives access to the hearth. Finally, a small plate, near the summit, serves as a register and as an evacuation outlet for the combustion. Inside, if we refer to the very detailed descriptions of Philolethi, the lesson, Salmon and others, as well as to the reproductions of Rupsissa, Scavus, Pierre Vicot, Huginus of Barma, etc., the Athenor is arranged to receive a bowl of earth or metal, called the nest or the arena, because the egg is subjected to incubation in the hot sand, Latin arena, sand. As for the fuel used for heating, it seems quite variable, although many authors express their preference for thermogenic lamps, at least this is what the masters teach about their furnace. But the Athenor, the abode of the mysterious fire, calls for a less vulgar conception. This secret furnace, demanding a flame, seems to us more in line with the esoteric hermetic prism of invisible light, holding the prepared substance, amalgam or rebus, serving as an envelope and matrix to the central nucleus where these latent faculties that the common fire will soon activate lie dormant. The material alone, being the vehicle of the natural and secret fire, the immortal agent of all our realizations, remains for us the unique and true Athenor. From Greek theta nu alpha tau omicron sigma, which renews and never dies, Philolethi tells us about this dry secret, which the wise could not do without, 
since it provokes the metamorphosis within the compound, being of metallic essence and of a sulfuric origin. It is recognized as the unique source of all metallic and mineral sulfur, because it is born from the prime mercurial substance of metals, sulfurous, because this fire, in the extraction of metallic sulfur, has taken on the specific qualities of the father of metals. It is thus a double fire, the double-egged man of Basile Valentine, which at the same time holds the attractive, agglutinating and organizing virtues of mercury, and the cicatives, coagulating and fixative properties of sulfur. Provided that one has some tincture of philosophy, he will easily understand that this double fire, the animator of the rebus, needing only the help of heat to move from potential to actual, and to render its power effective, could not belong to the furnace, although it metaphorically represents our Athenor, that is to say the place of energy, of the principle of immortality enclosed within the philosophical compound. This double fire is the pivot of the art and, according to the expression of Philolethe, the first agent that makes the wheel turn and moves the axle, it is also often designated by the epithet of wheel fire, because it seems to develop its action according to a circular mode, whose goal is the conversion of the molecular edifice, rotation symbolized in the wheel of fortune and in the Ouroboros. Thus, the matter, destroyed, mortified then reconstituted into a new body, thanks to the secret fire that the furnace excites, rises gradually with the help of multiplications, until the perfection of the pure fire, unveiled under the figure of the immortal phoenix. Sic it or ad astra, and in English, thus one journeys to the stars. Similarly, the worker, faithful servant of nature, acquires, with the knowledge of the sublime, the high title of knighthood, the esteem of his peers, the recognition of his brothers and the honor, more enviable than all the worldly glory, of being among the disciples of Elias. Coffered ceiling four, closed by its tight-fitting lid, the rounded belly pot made of coarse clay, devoid of any noble characteristic except for its utility, a mere vulgar pot of earth, is filled, from its plebeian grandeur and its cracked surface on the coffer. Its inscription affirms that the vessel which we see the image of must open by itself and render manifest, by its destruction, the completion of what it contains. In or in English, the solitary things shall become evident ruin's eye, among so many diverse figures, emblems with which it fraternizes, our subject seems all the more original because its symbolism is related to the dry path, also called the Saturnine work, based on the iconography described in the texts. This ars brevis only requires the concourse of the crucible and the application of high temperatures. This verity, Henkel had grasped it when he noticed that the artist Elias, cited by Hervatius, pretended to prepare the philosopher's stone and completes it in four days of time, and who showed, indeed, this stone still adhering to the lessons of the crucible, it seems to the author, that he would not be so bold as to try to put into question what the alchemists call the grand month, and not just a few days, which would be a very limited time frame, and if it were, the entire operation would consist of a method in which the greatest degree of fluidity, which we do not obtain by violent, sudden reactions in the laboratories, but this method could not be executed in all the subtleties, and perhaps not all the world would find it practical. But, the inverse of the humid path, whose glass utensils allow to easily control the fire necessary to illuminate the operator at just the right moment, this dry path cannot lack the important time factor, reduced to a minimum, constitutes a serious practice of the ars brevis, on the other hand, the necessity of high temperatures presents the grave inconvenience of a profound mystery within the tightly closed crucible, buried in the center of incandescent charcoals. It is therefore important to be very experienced, to know the conduct and the power of fire, since from the beginning to the end, to discover the least indication. Indication. All the characteristic reactions of the humid path being indicated in the classic authors, it is possible for the studious to acquire precise enough reference points to authorize them to undertake this long and painful journey. Provided with every guide the daring traveler, up to the extremity of the desert, engages in this arid and scorched wasteland, no marked path, no guide, nothing but the apparent inertia of the earth, of the rock, of the sand, the brilliant kaleidoscope of colored phases does not brighten his uncertain journey, it is blindly that he pursues his way, without any other certainty than his faith, without any other hope than his trust in divine providence. Nevertheless, at the end of his career, the investigator perceived a sign, the only one, whose appearance indicates success and confirms the perfection of sulfur by the total fixation of mercury. This sign consists in the spontaneous breakage of the vessel. Once the time has expired, covering laterally a part of its wall, one notes, when the experiment is successful, one or several lines, of a blinding clarity, clearly visible on the less shining. Background of the Crucible. 
These are the cracks revealing the happy birth of the young chick. Just as at the end of the incubation the hen's egg breaks as soon as the effort of the chick, likewise the shell of our egg breaks as soon as the sulfur is finished. There is, among its effects, an evident analogy, despite the diversity of causes, for, in the mineral work, the rupture of the crucible can logically only be attributed to a chemical action, unfortunately. It is, however, absolutely impossible to conceive or explain. Let us note however that the well-known fact occurs frequently under the influence of certain combinations of lesser interest. This is the case, for example, when abandoning new crucibles that have been used only once for the fusion of metallic glasses, in the production of hepatic sulfur or of diaphoretic antimony, and after having thoroughly cleaned them, they are found cracked after a few days, without being able to discover the obscure reason for this belated phenomenon. The considerable widening of their belly shows that the fracture seems to be produced by the push of an expansive force, acting from the center towards the periphery, at room temperature and long after the use of the vessels. Finally, let us signal the remarkable concordance that exists between the motif of Dampierre and that of Bourges, Le Mans Hotel, ceiling of the chapel. Among the hermetic coffered ceilings of the latter, we also see a pot of earth, inclined, whose wide and flared opening is sealed with a parchment membrane tied on the edges. Its pierced belly lets escape beautiful crystal formations of different sizes. The indication of the crystalline form of sulfur, obtained by dry path, is thus very clear and comes to confirm, by specifying it, the esotericism of our bar relief. Crawford Ceiling 5, a heavenly hand, whose arm is clad in iron, wields the sword and the spatula. On the phylactery one reads these Latin words. Dot perscium, et, sonabo, or in English as, I will strike and I will heal. I will wound and I will heal. Jesus said the same, I will kill and I will resurrect. Esoteric thought of a capital importance in the execution of the magistery. It is the first key, assures Le Mojone de Saint Didier, the one that opens the obscure prisons in which sulfur is confined. It is she who extracts the seed from the body, and who forms the philosopher's stone by the conjunction of the male with the female, of the spirit with the body, of sulfur with mercury. Hermes has manifestly demonstrated the operation of this first key with these words. The cavernous metallorum occultus est, qui lapis est venerabilis, color splendidus, men sublimus et mere patens, or in English, hidden in the caverns of the metals, it is the venerable stone, splendid in color, lofty in mind, and expansive in the sea. The cabalistic artifice under which our adept has concealed the technique that Lemojon seeks to teach us, consists in the choice of the double instrument figured on our coffered ceiling. The sword that wounds and the spatula tasked with applying the healing balm, the sword and spatula, in fact, are truly one and the same agent endowed with the dual power to kill and to resurrect, to mortify and to regenerate, to withdraw and to organize. Spatula, in Greek, is said sigma pi theta eta, and this word also means organizer, spreader, one who originates from sigma pi omega, to pull out, to extract, to uproot. We have here an esoteric locution in the hermetic sense provided by the spatula and the sword. Thus, the investigator, in possession of the dissolvent, easily acting upon the body, destroys and extracts the seed, will have to seek the metallic subject best suited to fulfill his design. Thus, the dissolved metal, broken into pieces, will abandon that fixed and pure grain, the bright gem that it carries within, a brilliant gem adorned with a magnificent color, the first manifestation of the philosopher's stone, Phoebus being born and father of the great elixir. In an allegorical dialogue between a monster hidden at the bottom of a dark cave, filled with seven full horns of waters, and the wandering alchemist, pressed by questions from the Sphinx boon companion, Jacques Tesson makes him speak as a fabulous representative of the vulgar metals. You must understand, he says, that I, who have descended from celestial regions and have fallen here, in these dregs of the earth where I have been nourished for a space of time, but I desire nothing more than to return there, and the way to do it is that you kill me and then you resurrect me, and by the instrument that you will kill me, you will resurrect me. For, as said by the white dove, he who killed me will make me revive. We could make an interesting remark about the means or instrument, expressly depicted by the steel brace which the celestial arm is equipped with because no detail should be neglected in a study of this kind, but we believe it is appropriate not to say everything and prefer to leave it to whoever wants to take the trouble to decipher this complementary hieroglyph. The alchemical science does not teach, each must learn by themselves, not in a speculative way, but with the aid of persevering work, by multiplying trials and attempts, so as to always submit the productions of the mind to the control of experience. He who fears the labor of the furnaces, the coal dust, the danger of unknown reactions and the insomnia of long vigils, will never know anything. Hofford Ceiling 6. 
a stag is depicted wrapped around a trunk of a tree, a dead tree, all of whose branches have been cut by hand. The phylactery that completes this bar-relief bears the words, Animicia. And in English, Hostile Friendship. The anonymous author of the Ancient War of the Knights, in a dialogue between the stone, gold and mercury, has gold say that the stone is a worm swollen with poison, accusing it of being the enemy of man and metals. But nothing could be truer, it is indeed a powerful and redoubtable poison, the mere smell of which, they say, would suffice to cause death. Yet it is from this toxic mineral that universal medicine is made, to which no human malady can resist, no matter how incurable it is recognized to be. But what gives it all its value and makes it infinitely precious in the eyes of the sage is the admirable virtue it possesses to revive metals reduced and melted, and to lose their poisonous properties by leaving them their own activity. Thus it appears as the instrument of the resurrection and redemption of metallic bodies, dead by the violence of the fire of reduction, which is why it bears on its blazon the sign of the Redeemer, the cross. From what we have just said, the reader will have understood that the stone, that is, our mineral subject, is represented in the present motif by the ivy, a living plant of strong, nauseating odor, while the metal has for representation the burning and fruitful mulberry. For it is not a dry tree, simply deprived of its foliage and reduced to its skeleton, that we see here, it would then express, for the hermeticist, the igneous quest, it is a trunk, voluntarily mutilated, that the saw has amputated of its sickly branches. The Greek verb tau mu nu omega signifies equally to saw, to cut with a saw and to extinguish, to sever, to bind tightly, our tree, being at the same time sawed and extinguished, we must think that the creator of these images wanted to clearly indicate the metal and the dissolving action exercised against it. The ivy, embracing the trunk as if to suffocate it, translates well the dissolution by the prepared subject, full of vigor and vitality, but this dissolution, instead of being ardent, effervescent and quick, seems slow, difficult, always impetuous. This is because the metal, although entirely attacked, is only solubilized in part, thus it is recommended to reiterate frequently the effusion of water on the body, in order to extract the sulfur or the seed that makes the lone stone, and the metallic sulfur receives life from the very hands, the repair of its enmity and its hate. This operation, which the wise have named reincredation or return to the primitive state, mainly aims, for the acquisition of sulfur and its revivification by the initial mercury. It should therefore not be taken literally, this return to the original material of the treated metal, since a large part of the body, formed of course, heterogeneous, sterilized or mortified elements, is no longer susceptible to regeneration. Whatever it is, it suffices for the artist to obtain this principal sulfur, separated from the metal opened and made living by the incisive power of our first mercury. With this living substance, thanks to the incisive power of our first mercury, the new body where friendship and harmony replace aversion, because the virtues and respective properties of the two contrary natures are confounded in him. He may hope to finally attain the philosophical mercury, through the mediation of this essential agent, then to the elixir, the object of his secret desires. Crawford Ceiling 7, where Louis Audiot recognizes the figure of God the Father, we simply see a centaur, a banner bearing the sigils of the Senate and the Roman people, hidden halfway. The whole decorated with a standard whose staff is firmly planted in the ground. So it is indeed a Roman standard, and we can conclude that the soil on which it floats is itself Roman. Moreover, the letters, dot s dot p dot q dot r, are the abbreviations of the word senatus populusque Romanus, in English that is, the senate and people of Rome, and was usually accompanying the eagles and formed, with the cross, the arms of the eternal city. This standard, placed expressly to indicate a Roman earth, leads us to think that the philosopher of Dampierre was not ignorant of the particular symbolism of Basile Valentine, Senior Zadith, Mindsicht, etc., for these authors name terre romaine and vitriol roman the terrestrial substance that provides our dissolvent, without which it would be impossible to reduce metals, or even mercurial, or, if you prefer, in vitriol philosophique. Our pays vitriol de Rome, also called vitriol of the adepts, is not the greenish vitriol, but a double vitriolic salt of iron and copper. Chambon is of the same opinion and cites as equivalent the vitriol of Salzburg, which is also a ferrous sulfate cuproferic. The Greeks called it Sigma Delta Eta Rho Omicron Sigma, and the mineralogist the Helebrus Black because of its strong and disagreeable smell, which, when ground, became black taking on a spongy consistency and a greasy appearance. In his Testamentum, Basile Valentine highlights the excellent properties and rare virtues of the vitriol, but one will not recognize the truth of the words that, as we know beforehand, he intends to extend further. The vitriol, he writes, 
is a notable and important mineral which none other in nature we could compare, and this because the vitriol familiarizes itself with metals more than all other things. It is very closely allied, because, among all metals, one can make a vitriol or crystal, because vitriol and crystal are not recognized for any single and same thing. This is why I have preferred to excessively praise it more, as reason requires, since the vitriol is preferable to other minerals, and that the first place after metals must be accorded to it. 4. Well that all metals and minerals should be suffused with great virtues, this one in particular, the vitriol, could alone accomplish the making of the blessed stone, what no one else in the world could achieve only by its imitation. Further on, our adept returns to the same subject by specifying the double nature of Roman vitriol. I tell you this so that you may firmly imprint this argument on your mind, which two parts entwined think intensely about the metallic vitriol, and that you remember that I have entrusted you with this knowledge that one can, from Mars and Venus, make a magnificent vitriol in which the three principles meet, which often serve the birth and production of our stone. Let us also note a very important remark from Henkel concerning vitriol. Among all the names that have been given to vitriol, says this author, there is not a single one that has to do with iron. It is always called chalcanthum, calcitus, cupri rosa, etc. And it is not only among the Greeks and the Romans that iron has been deprived of its share in vitriol. The same has been done in Germany, and today, in all vitriols in general and especially in that which concerns us here. One has to prefer to name it copper water, chalcanthum water, that is, the same as cupri rosa, rose of copper. Crawford ceiling 8, the subject of this bar leaf is quite singular. It depicts a young gladiator, almost a child, furiously hacking away with a sword at a beehive filled with honeycombs, from which the cover has been removed. Two words make up the motto, militivis.gladius, or in English, the honeyed sword. This bizarre act of a fiery and carried away adolescent, doing battle with bees like Don Quixote with his windmills, is nothing else than the symbolic translation of our first work. The original variant of the theme so well known and so often exploited in Hermeticism, the striking of the rock. We know that after their departure from Egypt, the children of Israel had to camp at Rephidim, Exodus, 17, 1, Numbers, 33, 14, where there was no water to drink for the people. On the Council of the Eternal, Exodus, 17, 6, Moses, three times, struck the rock of Horeb with his rod, and a living water spring gushed forth from the dry stone. Mythology also offers us some replicas of the same prodigy. Callimachus, hymn to Jupiter, 31, says that the goddess Rhea, having struck with her scepter the Arcadian mountain, it split in two and water flowed abundantly from it. Apollonius of Alexandria, Argonauts, 1146, relates the miracle of Mount Dindymus and assures that the rock had never before given birth to the slightest spring. Pausanias attributes a similar fact to Atalanta, who, in order to quench her thirst, made a fountain spring forth by hurling her javelin at a rock in the surroundings of Syphanta, in Laconia. In our bas-relief, the gladiator takes the place of the alchemist, figured elsewhere under the traits of Hercules, hero of the Twelve Labors, or again under the aspect of a knight armed from head to toe as we notice at the portal of Notre Dame de Paris. The beehive that the young man is attacking in that simple and subsequent way we must observe throughout the work, is indeed the living nature. Moreover, we must believe that if the artist of Dampierre gives preference to the gladiator, it is to signify without any doubt that the artist must work or fight alone against the material. The Greek word mu omicron nu omicron mu chi omicron sigma, monomachos, which means gladiator, is composed of mu nu omicron sigma, monos, alone and mu chi omicron mu alpha iota, macomai, to fight. As for the beehive, it is privileged to figure the stone in this cabalistic artifice that makes derive the word rock by permutation of vowels. The philosophical subject, our first stone, in Greek pi tau rho alpha, petra, clearly translates under the image of the beehive or rock, rho omicron chi eta, terms used by the wise to designate the hermetic subject. Furthermore, our swordsman, by striking the beehive with redoubled blows and cutting at random its rays, makes an incoherent, heterogeneous mass of wax, propolis, and honey, an incoherent magma, a real mishmash, to employ the language of the gods, where the honey flows to the point of coating his sword, substituting for Moses' staff. This is the second chaos, result of the primitive combat that we cabalistically call mishmash, because it contains the honey mu lambda iota, meli, viscous and glutinous water of metals, always ready to flow out. The masters of the art assure us that the entire work is a labor of Hercules, and that one must begin by striking the stone. Pegasus, from Pi Eta Gamma Sigma, Pigas, Rock, Ice, 
frozen water or hard and dry ground. And the fable teaches us that Pegasus, among other actions, made spring forth with a blow of his hoof the Hippocrene fountain. I ate a gamma, piggy, source, so that the winged courser of the poets merges with the hermetic source, of which it possesses the essential characteristics, the mobility of living waters and the volatility of spirits. As an emblem of the primary matter, the beehive is often found in decorations borrowing their elements from the science of Hermes. We have seen it on the ceiling of the Lalamond Hotel and among the panels of the Winterthur Alchemical Stove. It occupies even one of the squares of the Game of the Goose, the popular labyrinth of the art sacred, and collection of the principal hieroglyphs of the great work. Crawford Ceiling 9, the sun, piercing through the clouds, directs its rays towards a farlouse's nest, containing a small egg and set upon a grassy knoll. The phylactery, which gives the bar leaf its meaning, bears the inscription, dot NEC, T, NEC, sign, T, in English as neither, with, you or without you, or not you, but nothing without you. Allusion to the sun, father of the stone, followed by Hermes and the multitude of hermetic philosophers. The celestial body, depicted in its radiant splendor, takes the place of the sun metallic, or sulfur, that many artists have believed to be natural gold. A grave mistake, all the less excusable since all authors perfectly establish the difference between the gold of the wise and the precious metal. It is, indeed, the sulfur of the metals that the masters are referring to when they describe how to extract and prepare this first agent, which, moreover, bears no resemblance to ordinary gold. And it is also this sulfur, combined with mercury, which collaborates in the generation of our egg by giving it the vegetative faculty. This is the real father of the stone, since the stone comes from it, hence the first part of the axiom, necte, and as it is impossible to obtain anything without the aid of sulfur, the second proposition is justified, nec sine te, or, what we say of sulfur is true for mercury, so that the egg, manifestation of the new metallic form emanating from the mercurial principle, if it is to give substance to mercury or the hermetic moon, draws its vitality and its possibility of developing from sulfur or the sun of the sages. In summary, it is philosophically exact to assure that the metals are composed of sulfur and mercury, as taught by Bernard Trevisan, that the stone, although formed of the same principles, does not give birth to a metal, that finally, sulfur and mercury, considered in isolation, are the only parents of the stone, but cannot be confused with it. We allow ourselves to draw the reader's attention to the fact that the philosophical coction of the rebus provides a sulfur, and not an irreducible assembly of its components, and that this sulfur, by complete assimilation of mercury, endowed with particular properties which tend to distance it from the metallic species. And it is on this constancy of effect that the technique of multiplication and increase is founded because the new sulfur is always capable of absorbing a fixed and proportional amount of mercury. Ansomne. Non-CBS. Perdita Dracone. Todd Asti, N. E. N. S. Inta, T. A. Aripoli, E. L. 32. S. Pereo Penis, Chateau de Dampierre sur Bouton Caisson de la Gaulle Riot Set Yem Seri. 4 TV. Comes. Bilala. X. 7th Series, P. L. 32. Crawford Ceiling 1, The Tables of the Hermetic Law, on which one reads a phrase in French, but so singularly presented, that Mr. Louis Audiot has not been able to discover the meaning n.rien.gist.tout. Or in English, in nothing lies everything, a fundamental motto that the ancient philosophers delight in repeating, and by which they mean to signify the absence of value, the vulgarity, the extreme abundance of the basic matter from which they draw all that is necessary. You will find everything in everything that is nothing other than a styptic or astringent virtue of metals and minerals, writes Basile Valentin in the book of the Twelve Keys. Thus, true wisdom teaches us not to judge things according to their price, the pleasure one receives, the beauty of their appearance, it leads us to esteem in man personal merit, not the outward or condition, and embodies the spiritual quality they conceal within them. In the eyes of the wise, iron, the pariah of the human industry, is incomparably more noble than gold, and more active than lead, for this luminous live water, this burning and pure water that the common metals mine, the light they are deprived of, gold alone is devoid of it. This sovereign to which stones and men render homage, for which so many consciences have died in the hope of obtaining its favors, has no riches and preciousness but its outer garment. Sumptuously attired, gold is nevertheless nothing but a corpse compared to copper, elevated to the rank of the gods, a corpse ignorant of the powerful and wealthy family of metals, stripped of its mantle, it reveals the lowliness of its origins and appears to us as a simple metallic resin, dense, fixed and fusible, 
a triple quality that makes it notoriously unsuitable for the realization of our design. Thus, we see how vain it would be to work on gold, for he who has nothing can obviously give nothing. It is therefore to the crude and vile stone that one must address oneself, without repugnance for its miserable appearance, its infected smell, its coloration that repels because of its dirtiness. For these are precisely the characters, little seductive and sordid, which the primordial stone has, and which have always allowed us to recognize it, coming from the original chaos, and that God, at the time of the creation of the universe, would have reserved for his servants and elect. Drawn from, nothing, it bears the imprint and has suffered the name, nothing, but the philosophers discover that in its natural disorderly and disordered state, made of darkness and light, of bad and good assembled in the worst confusion, the nothing contained all that they could desire. Coffered ceiling too, the uppercase letter H topped with a crown, which Mr. Louis Audiot presents as being the blazoned signature of the King of France Henri II, offers today only a chiseled inscription which used to be read as follows. In. Te. Omnis. Dominata. Recambit. In English. In you, all domination will rest, or said another way in you rests all power. We have previously had the opportunity to say that the letter H, or at least the graphic character that appears to it, had been chosen by the philosophers to designate the spirit, the universal soul of things, or this active and all-powerful principle that is recognized to be, in perpetual movement, vibrating. It is on the form of the letter H that the builders of the Middle Ages have erected the facades of cathedrals, temples glorifying the divine spirit, profound interpreters of the aspirations of the human soul in its rise towards the Creator. This character corresponds to the eta, H, the seventh letter of the Greek alphabet, the initial of the solar verb, dwelling of the spirit, prophet Elijah, in Greek H lambda iota omicron sigma, helios, sun. It is also the head of the mounted spirit, H lambda iota omicron sigma, helios, solar, that the scriptures say to be carried to heaven in a chariot of fire, in a chariot of light and fire. It is still the center and the heart of the two monograms of Christ, IHS, abbreviation of Yesus hominum salvator or Jesus savior of men. It is also the sign that the medieval builders used to designate the two columns of the Temple of Solomon, at the foot of which the workers receive their salary. Jacob and Boaz, freestanding towers of the Metropolitan Churches are only the introduction but high and powerful. It is finally the indication of the precious knowledge acquired from the sage's agent, Scala Philosophorum, of the mysterious promoter of mineral nature transformations, and that of the rediscovered lost word. This agent was once designated among the adepts by the epithet of magnet or attractive. The body charged with this magnet called itself magnesia, and it is this, the intermediary between the eye and the earth, nourishing itself from celestial dynamism, which it transmitted to the passive substance, attracting in the manner of a true magnet. Cyrano de Bergerac, in one of his allegorical tales, speaks thus of the magnesian spirit, about which he seems very well informed, as much as it concerns the preparation of its use. You have not forgotten, I think, writes our author, that I am named Elijah, for I have told you before, you should therefore know that I was in your world and that I lived with Elisha, a Hebrew like me, on the pleasant banks of the Jordan, where I led, among books, a life quite sweet enough not to regret it, even though it flowed away. However, the more the lights of my spirit grew, the less also grew the knowledge of those that I did not have. Never did our priests remind me of Adam, that the memory of that perfect philosophy which he possessed made me sigh. I despaired of being able to acquire it, when one day, after having sacrificed for the atonement of the weaknesses of my mortal being, I fell asleep, and the angel of the Lord appeared to me in a dream. As soon as I awoke, I did not fail to work on the things he had prescribed to me, I took about two square feet of magnet, which I put into a furnace. Then, when it was well purged, precipitated and dissolved, I drew the attractive, I calcined all the elixir and reduced it to the size of an average ball. Following these preparations, I built a very light iron chariot, and after a few months, all the constructions being finished, I entered it and got settled. You will ask me how possible for all this attraction. Know that the angel had told me in a dream that if I wanted to acquire a perfect science as I wished, I should go to the moon's world, where you would find before you the paradise of Adam, the tree of science, because as soon as I would have tasted its fruit, my soul would be clarified of all the truths of which a creature is capable, ready for the journey for which I had built my chariot. Finally, I got inside and, when I was well closed in and well supported on the seat, I threw high in the air this ball of diamond. Now, the machine of iron, which I had forged expressly more massive in the middle than at the extremities, was immediately taken up and in perfect balance, as soon as I arrived, made me fly off, attracted, and, once I had left where the hand made me start again. 
Truthfully, it was a spectacle quite astonishing, for the steel of this flying house, which I had polished with great care, reflected on all sides the light of the sun so vivid and so bright, that I believed myself to be carried in a chariot of fire. When I have since reflected on this miraculous ascension, I made myself imagine that I was not unworthy of the ethereal places because of a simple natural body, the vigilance that the seraphim, by the order of God, has ordained for the guardianship of paradise. But because it pleases him to use secondary causes, I believe that he had inspired this means for me to enter, as he wished to use the ribs of Adam to make him a woman, although he could have formed her just as well without him. As for the crown that completes the important sign we are studying, it is not that of King Henry II of France, but indeed the royal crown of the elect. It is the one that is seen adorning the forehead of the Redeemer on the crucifixes of the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries, in particular at Amiens, Byzantine Christ called Saint Sauf, and at Notre Dame de Treves, top of the portal, the night of the apocalypse, ch. 6, v. 2, mounted on a white horse, emblem of purity, receives as distinctive attributes of his high virtues a bow and a crown, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, our crown, the initiates know what we are talking about, is precisely the chosen domicile of the Spirit. It is a wretched substance, as we have said, hardly materialized, but which it contains in abundance. And this is where the ancient philosophers have fixed in their corona radiata, decorated with protruding rays, which was attributed only to gods or deified heroes. Thus, let us explain that this matter, vehicle of mineral light, is revealed, thanks to the radiant signature of the spirit, as the promised land reserved for the elect of wisdom. Coffered ceiling 3, it is an ancient symbol and often exploited that we encounter in this place, the dolphin twisted around the arm of an anchor. The Latin epigraph which serves as its motto gives the reason. Sic dot tristis dot aber dot reset it. Or in English, thus the sad air settled. Thus calms this terrible tempest. We have had several occasions to highlight the important role that remora, the fish that sticks to ships, plays in alchemy. Under the name of dolphin, remora symbolizes the humid and cold principle of the work, which coagulates little by little in contact and by the effect of sulfur, the agent of desiccation and fixity. This last one is here figured by the marine anchor, an organ of resistance to drifts, to which it assures a point of support and stability against the waves. The long operation that allows to realize the progressive stopping and the final fixation of mercury, offers a great analogy with the maritime crossings and the tempests that welcome them. It is a rough and rolling sea that presents in the little constant and regular boiling of the hermetic compound. The bubbles burst on the surface and succeed ceaselessly. Heavy vapors charge the atmosphere of the vessel, the troubled, opaque, livid clouds condense in rushing drops on the effervescent mass. Everything contributes to giving the spectacle of a tempest in reduction. Lifted from all sides, tossed by the winds, the ark floats nevertheless under the divine rain. Asteria prepares to form Delos, hospitable and salvific land for the children of Latona. The dolphin swims on the surface of the impetuous waves, and this agitation lasts until the remora, invisible host of the deep waters, stops the ark, like a powerful anchor, the ship yields to no drift. Calm is reborn then, the air is purified, the water disappears, the vapors absorb, a film covers the entire surface, and, thickening each day, marks the end of the flood, the stage of mooring of the ark, the birth of Diana and Apollo, the triumph of the earth over water, of the dry over the humid, and the era of the new phoenix. In the general upheaval and the battle of the elements, this permanent peace, the harmony resulting from the perfect balance of principles, symbolized by the fish fixed on the anchor, sic tristis ora reset it. This phenomenon of absorption and coagulation of mercury by one very inferior proportion of sulfur seems to be the primary cause of the fable of the remora, the small fish to which popular imagination and hermetic tradition attribute the power to stop in their coarse ships of considerable size. Voice of all sailors at sea, in an allegorical and full of teaching story, the philosopher René Francois, one day Emperor Caligula, becoming mad with rage, turning back to Rome with a powerful armed fleet. All superb ships, well armed and sailing at high speed signaled to the harbor. The wind was on point and all sails were set. The waves and the sky seemed to be partisans of Caligula, supporting his designs, when suddenly, lo and behold, the imperial and majestic galley is stopped all at once. The other vessels wonder at this caprice. The pilot doubles the watch, the helmsmen strain their oars, the rowers are at the ram, five by each bench, sweating and panting, the vessel does not move, the wind strengthens, the sea grows angry at this affront, everyone is astonished by the miracle, when the emperor sees a sea monster stopping him in that place, then divers plunge into the sea and, swimming between two waters, go around the floating castle, 
they find a wicked little fish, half a foot long, which having attached itself to the helm, was taking its time to stop the galley of the mad emperor. It seemed that it wanted to mock the human type, who paws so much with his mounds of gendarmes and his thundering iron which make him lord of the earth. Here is, he says in his language of fish, a new Hannibal at the gates of Rome, who holds in a prison fortress the son of an emperor. Rome has extended its triumphant limbs on the earth and the captive kings in its triumph, and I led the procession along the rim, through the stretches of the ocean, the prince of the universe. Caesar became my prisoner, and I will be the Caesar of Caesars. All the power of Rome is now my slave and can make all her effort as much as I wish, I will keep her in my conch prison. While playing and mocking this galleon, I will do more in an instant than they have done in 800 years, massacring the human race and populating the world. Poor emperor, how far you are from your account, with all your 150 million pounds of revenue, and 300 million men who are at your pay, a naughty little fish has made you its slave. Let the sea be angry, let the wind be furious, that the whole world becomes a convict, and all the trees environs, if they will not take a step without my passport and without my leave. Here is the true Archimedes of fishes, for he alone, arrests the whole world. Here is the animated magnet that holds all the iron and the names of the first monarchy in the world. I don't know who calls Rome the golden anchor of the human genre. This fish is the anchor of anchors. Oh marvel of God, but this fish shames, not only the grandeur of Rome, this end of the chain that loses its credit here, and a philosophy that makes Aristotle. They find no reason for this effort, that a bankruptcy, because it stops a ship pushed by the four elements, and toothless mouth allows it to enter the middle of the most cruel storms. Pliny said that all nature is hidden like a sentinel, and lodged in a garrison in the smallest creatures. I believe it, and as for me, this average little fish is the moving flag of nature. I think that it is she who hooks and stops these galleys of all her gear without other bridle than the horn of a fishmonger. She who reigns, alas! Let us not diminish the horn, which cannot be done without so holy a consideration. The horns of our vain arrogance, with a little sea cleaner and the pirate of nature, he stops and catches all our designs which sail full sails from one pole to the other, if he uses all his power, to what point will he reduce affairs? If he does everything with nothing, and from a fish, or rather from a little nothing, making fish, he overwhelms all our hopes, alas, when he will employ all his power and all the armies of his justice, hey, where will we be? Case in four, near the tree with golden fruits, a robust and squat dragon exercises its vigilance at the entrance to the garden of the Hesperides. The talisman particular to this subject carries, engraved, this inscription, dot ab dot insomni dot non dot case de dita dot dracon, or in English, not guarded by the sleepless dragon. Outside of the dragon that watches, things are not kept. The myth of the dragon appointed to oversee the famous orchard and the legendary golden fleece as well. Known enough to spare us the trouble of reproducing it. It suffices to indicate that the dragon is chosen as a hieroglyph of the raw mineral matter with which one must begin the work. That is to say what is its importance, the care that must be brought to the study of external signs and qualities capable of allowing identification, of recognizing and distinguishing the hermetic subject among the multiple minerals that nature puts at our disposal. Charged with overseeing the marvelous enclosure where the philosophers go to recover their treasures, the dragon passes for never sleeping, its fiery eyes remain constantly open. It knows neither rest nor fatigue and could not overcome the insomnia that characterizes it and lends it the power of eternal vigilance. It is indeed what is expressed by the Greek name it bears. Lambda delta omega nu, Latin, has as its root delta chi omicron mu alpha iota, decom i, to guard, to see, and, by extension, to live, a word itself close to delta rho kappa omicron mu alpha iota, decom i, which lights up the eyes. The primitive language reveals to us, through the envelope of the symbol, the idea of an intense activity, of a perpetual and latent vitality enclosed in the mineral body. The mythologists name our dragon Laden, a vocable whose assonance is close to Latin and which can be assimilated to the Greek lambda theta omega, litho, to be hidden, unknown, ignored, like the philosopher's matter. The general appearance, the recognized ugliness of the dragon, its ferocity, and its singular vital power correspond exactly with the particularities, properties, and abilities of the subject. The special crystallization of this one is clearly indicated by the flaked epidermis of that one. The colors are alike because the matter is black, punctuated with red or yellow, like the dragon which is its image. As for the volatile quality of our mineral, we see it expressed by the membranous wings with which the monster is equipped, and because it is said to vomit, when attacked, fire and smoke, and because its body ends in a serpent's tail, poets, for these reasons, made it the offspring of Typhon and Echidna.
the Greek tau upsilon phi nu, typhon, or tau upsilon phi sigma, typhos, the Egyptian typhon, means to fill with smoke, to light up, to kindle. Chi iota delta nu alpha, echidna, is none other than the viper. Hence we can conclude that the dragon gets from typhon its hot, fiery, sulfurous nature, while it owes to its mother its cold, humid complexion, with the characteristic form of ophidians. If philosophers have always hidden the vulgar name of their matter under an infinity of epithets, they have, in turn, been very prolific concerning its form, its virtues, and sometimes even its preparation. By common agreement, they affirm that the artist should not hope to discover or produce anything outside of the subject, because it is the only body capable, in all of nature, of providing the essential elements. Excluding other, minerals and metals, it retains the principles necessary for the elaboration of the great work. By its monstrous but expressive shape, this prime subject clearly appears to us as the guardian and sole dispenser of the hermetic fruits. He is its depository, the conservator vigilant, and our adept speaks wisely when he teaches that outside of this solitary being the philosophical things are not kept, since we vainly search for them elsewhere. Thus, it is from this first body, part of the original chaos and common mercury, that Geber exclaims, Praised be the Most High, who created our mercury and gave it a nature to which nothing can resist, for without it, the alchemists might as well not bother, all their labor would come to naught. But, asks another adept, where then is this orified mercury which, resolved in salt and in sulfur, becomes the radical moisture of metals and their animated seed? It is imprisoned in a prison so strong that nature itself could not extract it, if the industrious art does not provide the means. Case in 5, a swan, majestically poised on the calm water of a pond, its neck pierced by an arrow. And this is its ultimate complaint which is translated by the inscription of this pleasantly executed little subject. Dot propries dot pareo dot penis. In English, I perish by my own wings, I perish by my own feathers. The bird, indeed, is one of the materials of the weapon that will serve to kill. The fletching of the arrow, ensuring its direction, makes it accurate, and the swan's feathers, fulfilling this office, thus contribute to its loss. This bird, whose wings are emblematic of volatility, and whose snowy whiteness expresses purity, possesses the two essential qualities of mercury contained in dross, double nature. We know that it must be conquered by sulfur, issued from its substance and that which conquered it in life, so as to obtain after its death the philosophical mercury, partly fixed and partly volatile, that subsequent maturation will elevate to the degree of perfection of the great elixir. All authors teach that one must kill the living if one desires to resurrect the dead, this is why the good artist will not hesitate to sacrifice the bird of Hermes, and to provoke the mutation of its mercurial properties into sulfurous qualities, since every transformation remains subject to the decomposition beforehand and cannot be realized without it. Basile Valentine assures that one must give a white swan to eat to a double-crossed man, and he adds, the roasted swan will be for the king's table. No philosopher, to our knowledge, has lifted the veil that covers this mystery, and we wonder if it is expedient to comment on such serious words. However, remembering the long years during which we ourselves have stood stunned before this door, we think it would be charitable to assist the worker, who has come so far, in crossing the threshold. Let us extend to him a helping hand and discover, within the limits allowed, what the greatest masters have thought prudent to reserve. It is evident that Basile Valentine, using the expression double igni man, refers to a second principle, resulting from a combination of two agents with a hot and burning complexion, having, consequently, the nature of metallic sulfurs. Hence, we can conclude that under the simple name of sulfur, the adepts, at a given moment in their work, conceive of two combined bodies, of properties similar but of different specificity, conventionally meant for only one. This being posed, what will be the substances capable of seeding these two products? Such a question has never received a response. However, if we consider that the metals have their emblematic representatives depicted by mythological deities, sometimes masculine, sometimes feminine, that they possess these particular sulfuric qualities recognized experimentally, symbolism and fable will likely shed some light on these obscure matters. Everyone knows that iron and lead are placed under the domination of Aries and Kronos, and that they receive the planetary influences respective to Mars and Saturn. Tin and gold, subject to Zeus and Apollo, espouse the vicissitudes of Jupiter and the Sun. But why should iron and lead marry tin and silver? subjects of Aphrodite and Artemis dominated by the curvilinear crescent of the goddess Venus and the moon. Why is Mercury, akin to the messenger of Olympus, the god Hermes, even though it must be equipped with sulfur and fulfill the functions reserved for female alchemists? Must we accept these relations as verifiable, and wouldn't there be, 
in the distribution of metallic divinities and their astral correspondences, a premeditated confusion? If we were asked about this point, we would respond without hesitation affirmatively. Experience certainly demonstrates that silver possesses a magnificent sulfur, as pure and as lustrous as that of gold, without however always having the same fixity. Lead gives an almost equal color, but less stable and very impure. The sulfur of tin, clear, neat, and bright, is white and would rather place this metal under the protection of a goddess than under the authority of a god. Iron, on the other hand, contains much fixed sulfur, of a dark, dull, dirty, and so defective red that, despite its refractory nature, we really wouldn't know what to use it for. And yet, gold accepted, one would vainly seek a more luminous, more penetrating cure, in other metals, a more yielding, more penetrating, and more malleable mercury. Regarding the sulfur of copper, Basile Valentine describes it exactly in the first book of his Deuce Clefs. The lascivious Venus, says he, is well paired with the libertine Mars. Case in 6, two horns of abundance crisscross on the caduceus of Mercury. They have for their epitaph this Latin maxim. .virtuti.fortuna.coms, in English as, fortune comes to the aid of virtue. If we have understood well what the celebrated adept wishes to teach, and if we examine with care the existing relations between the metallic sulfurs and their respective symbols, we will scarcely have trouble establishing the esoteric order conforming to the work. The enigma will be deciphered, and the problem of the double sulfur will be easily solved. Wealth accompanies virtue. Exceptional axiom, difficult to contest in its application to true merit, where fortune so rarely thinks of virtue, that one must seek confirmation and the rule elsewhere. Now, it is from the secret virtue of the philosophical Mercury, symbolized by the image of the caduceus, that the author of these symbols intends to speak. The horns of abundance represent the wealth of material things that the possession of Mercury assures to the good artists. By their crossing an X, they indicate the spiritual quality of this noble and rare substance, whose energy shines like a pure fire, at the center of corporeal exactitude, sublimated. The caduceus, attribute of the god Mercury, cannot give place to the slightest ambiguity, both in terms of the secret meaning and the symbolic value. Hermes, father of hermetic science, is at once considered as creator and creature, master of the philosophy and matter of philosophers. His winged scepter carries the explanation of the riddle he proposes, and the revelation of the mystery covering the compound, masterpiece of nature and art, under the vulgar epithet of Mercury of the Wise. Originally, the caduceus was just a simple wand, a scepter attributed to some sacred or fabulous characters belonging more to tradition than to history. Moses, Atalanta, Sibel, Hermes used this instrument, endowed with a sort of magical power, under similar and generative conditions of equivalent results. The Greek pi lambda omicron sigma, palos, is indeed, a rod, a stick, a bundle of javelins, a dart and the scepter of Hermes. This word derives from pi omega, pow, to walk, and it accompanies the truth which means to strike, to share, to destroy. Moses strikes with his rod the arid rock of Sabel, pierces with his javelin. Mercury separates and kills the two serpents engaged in a furious duel, by throwing upon them the rod of the Potassos, that is to say the couriers and messengers, qualified as winged bearers because they had, to indicate their charge. Wings on their hat. The winged Potassos of Hermes thus justifies his function as messenger and mediator of the gods. The joining of the serpents to the wand, completed by the hat or pi tau alpha sigma omicron sigma, potassos, and the ankle boots or tau rho sigma omicron iota, tarsi, gave to the caduceus its definitive form, with the hieroglyphic expression of the perfect mercury. On the casket of Dampierre, the two serpents show canine heads, one of a dog, the other of a bitch, an imaged version of the two opposite principles, active and passive, fixed and volatile, put in contact with the mediator figured by the magical wand, which is our secret fire. Artifius names these principles dog of Chorazine and bitch of Armenia, and it is these same serpents that Hercules as a child suffocates in his cradle, the only agents of the assembly, the combat and the death, realized through the intermediation of the philosophical fire, give birth to the living and animated hermetic mercury. And as the double mercury possesses double volatility, the wings of the Potassos, opposed to those of the ankle boots on the caduceus, serve to express these two qualities combined, in the clearest and most eloquent manner. Panel 7. In this bar a leaf, Cupid, bow in one hand and the other a arrow, rides the chimera on a pile of clouds assembled. The scroll that underlines this subject indicates that Eros is here the eternal master. Eterns. Hick. Domives. Or in English, eternal. Here. Lord. Nothing is truer, moreover, other panels have shown us. Eros, 
The mythic personification of concord and love is, by excellence, the Lord, the eternal master of the work. He alone can achieve the harmony between enemies that an implacable hatred constantly drives to devour one another. He fulfills the peaceful role of priest that we see united. On an engraving of the Deuce Clefs by Basile Valentine, the king and the hermetic queen, it is still he who hurls, in the same work, an arrow towards a woman supporting an enormous water-filled mattress all enveloped in mist. Mythology teaches us that the chimera had three different heads on a body ending in a serpent's tail, one head of a lion, another of a goat and the third of a dragon. The constituent parts of the monster are the lion and the dragon, because they bring into the assembly the head and the tail. In analyzing the body, the dragon's tail corresponds to the top and the bottom, indeed, in the order of successive acquisitions. The first place belongs to the dragon, which always merges with the serpent. It is known that the Greeks named Delta Rho Kappa Omega knew the dragon rather than the serpent. This is our initial matter, the very subject of the art, considered in its first being and in the state where nature has left it. The lion comes next, and although it is a child of the sages and of a metallic caducity, it surpasses by far its own vigorous parents and becomes, it could be said, more robust than its father. An unworthy son of an old man and a very strong woman, he shows from his birth an inconceivable aversion to his mother. Unsociable, fierce, aggressive, nothing good can be expected from this violent and cruel heir, unless he is returned, by a providential accident, to a calmer and more considered state. Encouraged by his mother Aphrodite, Eros, already unhappy with the character, shoots an arrow of Arain at him and wounds him grievously. Half paralyzed, he is then brought back to his mother, who, to restore her ungrateful son, gives him her own blood, and a part of this blood, after having saved him, makes him the paying debt to his mother, says the Turb de Philosophs, is always owed by the child to the mother. From the close and prolonged contact of the suffering lion and the dissolving dragon, a new being is formed, regenerated in some way, to mixed qualities, symbolically represented by the goat, or, if preferred, by the chimera itself. The Greek word chim u alpha iota rho alpha, pronounced chimera, also means young goat, cab, chi, gamma mu eta rho. Now, this young goat, who owes its existence and its brilliant qualities to the intervention of Eros, is none other than the philosophical Mercury, born of the Vulcan of the philosophers, and possesses all the faculties required to become the principal Mercury, which is at once our gold, our elixir, and our stone. And that is the whole order of the labor hermetic that the ancient Chimera reveals, and thus says the Philolethes, it is also our entire philosophy. The reader will kindly excuse us for having used allegory to better position the important points of the practice, but we had no other way and continue in this the old literary tradition. And if we reserve, in the narrative, the essential part that falls to little Cupid, master of the work and lord of the oceans, it is solely out of obedience to the discipline of the order, and to not be perjurious towards ourselves. Besides, the perceptive reader will find, scattered voluntarily throughout the pages of this book, complementary indications on the role of the mediator, of which we shall not speak further in this place. Panel 8, here we find a motif already encountered elsewhere, especially in Brittany. It is a small enclosed area, bordered by a circular fence, featuring a stoat, symbolized within a queen's enclosure which is limited by the circular fence, a particular symbol of Anne, wife of Charles XIII and of Louis XII. We see it depicted beside the emblematic porcupine of Louis XII, on the grand fireplace of the Lallemand Hotel, in Bourges. Its epitaph conveys the same meaning and employs almost the same words as the famous motto of the Order of the Ermine, Malo Mori Quam Fidari, I prefer death to a stain. This order of chivalry, founded in 1381 by Jean V, Duke of Brittany, was to disappear in the 15th century, later restored by the King of Naples, Ferdinand I, in the year 1483, the Order of the Ermine, having lost all hermetic character, was no longer just a patrician chivalry association. The inscription engraved on the scroll of our panel reads, Dot Mori, Hotifs, Bomb, Fedari, or in English, to die rather than to be faithless, prefer death to a stain. A beautiful and noble maxim of Anne of Brittany, a maxim of purity, applied to the little stoat whose white fur is made, as it were, the object of the impressed care of its elegant and supple owner. Oh, object of the swift embraces of his ermine, image of the philosophical mercury in the esotericism of the sacred art, the ermine, by the sublimated product it suggests, signifies the absolute cleanliness of sulfur or metallic fire, which contributes to making it all the more dazzling. In Greek, ermine is said Rome mu nu omicron sigma, erminos, a word derived from Rome mu alpha, erma, or Rome mu sigma, 
Hermes, the abyss, the sea, the ocean, it is the Pontic water, the philosopher's mercury, the sea purged with sulfur, sometimes. By the water of our sea, what must be read is simply the water of our mother, that is to say of the primitive and chaotic matter called the sage's subject. The philosophers teach us that their second mercury, this permanent water which we are speaking of, which, contrary to other liquids, does not wet the hands, and their source that flows in the hermetic rock. To obtain it, they say, it is necessary to strike the rock three times in order to extract the pure wave mixed with coarse water and solidified, generally figured by rocky blocks emerging from the ocean. The capable Rome Sigma, Hermes, especially expresses all that inhabits the sea, it evokes in the mind this hidden fish that Mercury has captured and retains in the meshes of its net, the one that the old custom of the Feast of Kings nails sometimes under the guise of soul, dolphin, or even of a bean, hidden among the blades of the traditional galette. The pure and white ermine appears as an expressive emblem of the common mercury united with sulfur fish in the substance of the philosophical mercury. As for the closure, it reveals to us what the external signs are, according to the adept sayings, which constitute the best criterion of the secret product and provide the testimony of a better preparation conforming to natural laws. The palisade surrounding the ermine, and actually, enveloping the serving mercury, serves to explain the design of the stigmata in question. But our state being to define unequivocally, we will say that the Greek word pi alpha lambda iota sigma sigma delta alpha, palisada, derived from pi alpha lambda zeta omega, polizo, to trace, to engrave, to mark with an imprint, has an origin similar to that of the term pi alpha lambda iota sigma sigma xi, palis sax, that is to say a line drawn with chalk, distinctive form, character. And the character of our mercury is, precisely, to affect its surface a network of interwoven lines, woven in the manner of wicker baskets kappa sigma tau alpha sigma, keistas, chests, hampers, gabions, and baskets. These geometric figures, all the more apparent and better engraved than the purer material, are an effect of the all-powerful will of the spirit or the light. And this will impresses on the substance a cruciform external disposition sigma tau alpha upsilon rho sigma, stavros, and gives the mercury its effective philosophical signature. This is the reason why one compares this envelope with the meshes of the net used to catch the symbolic fish, to the Eucharistic basket carried on its back by the L apostrophe chi theta sigma, lichthys, of the Roman catacombs, to the crib of Jesus, cradle of the Holy Spirit incarnated in the Savior of men, to the cyst of Bacchus, which was said to contain we do not know what mysterious object, to the cradle of Hercules suffocated by the snakes sent by Juno, and to the child Moses saved from the waters, to the king's cake, bearing the same characteristics, to the cake of Little Red Riding Hood, the most charming creation, perhaps, of the hermetic fables which are the tales of my mother Goose, etc. But the significant imprint of the animated Mercury, a superficial mark of the work of the metallic spirit, can only be obtained after a series of operations, or purifications, which are long, thankless, and arduous. Also, one must not neglect any pain, any effort, and must not fear time or fatigue, if one wants to be assured of success, whatever one does or attempts, never will the spirit remain stable in an unclean body or insufficiently purified. The motto, which accompanies our ermine proclaims it, prefer death to a stain. May the artist remember one of the great labors of Hercules, the cleaning of the Aegean stables. It is necessary to pass over our earth, say the sages, all the waters of the deluge. There lie the expressive images of the labor that demands purification by the task, though simple and easy is so tedious that it has discouraged a host of alchemists more eager than laborious, more enthusiastic than persevering. Panel 9, Four Horns from Which Flames Escape, with the motto, Dot Verstra, in English, in vain, vividly. This is the lapidary translation of the four degrees of our fire. The authors who have discussed it describe them as having different degrees and proportions of the elemental fire acting within the Athenor, on the philosophical rebus. This is at least the sense suggested to beginners, and which they rush into, without too much reflection, in the different practices of our art. However, philosophers certify themselves that they never speak more obscurely than when they seem to express themselves with precision. Thus, their apparent clarity deceives those who let themselves be seduced by the literal sense, and do not seek to ascertain whether it agrees or not with observation, reason, and the possibility to nature. This is why we must warn the artists who would attempt to realize the philosophical processes, that is to say, to submit the philosophical matter to the increasing temperatures of the four regime du fou, that they will inevitably be victims of their ignorance and frustrated with the expected result. That they first seek to discover what the ancients meant by the imaged expression of fire, 
and that of the four successive degrees of its intensity. For it does not refer in that place to the fire of kitchens, of our chimneys or of the high furnaces. In our work, asserts Philolethes, ordinary fire is only used to keep away the cold and the accidents it could cause. In other words, our author insists that it is the same fire, constant, regular and uniform from one end of the work to the other. Almost all philosophers have taken for example the food decoction or maturation, the incubation of the hen's egg, not with regard to the temperature to be adopted, but with that of uniformity and permanence. Thus, we strongly advise to consider first and foremost the relationship that the wise have established between the Fu and the Sufer, to obtain this essential notion that the four degrees of one must infallibly correspond to the four degrees of the other, which is to say a lot in few words. Finally, in his description so meticulous of the coction, Philolethes does not fail to point out how much the real operation is metaphorical, because instead of being direct, as it is generally believed, it involves several phases or simple repetitions of one and the same technique. In our opinion, these words represent what has been most sincerely said about the practice of the secret four degrees of fire, and, although the order and development of these works are reserved by the philosophers and always shrouded in silence, the special character that this Kokoshin thus understood will nonetheless allow the discerning artist to find a simple and natural method that should favor the execution. Mr. Louis Audiot, whose some quite spicy fantasies we have noted in the course of this study, has not been asked by ancient science for a plausible explanation of this curious chest. The Joker, he writes, also mixes in our texts. Here is a big word, frustra, flaming horns. It's in vain that one keeps his wife. We do not believe that the author, moved by compassion for this unfortunate adept, wished to show the slightest irreverence for the memory of his companion. But ignorance is a blind and unfortunate bad advisor. Mr. Louis Audiot should have known better and refrained from generalizing. 11. The eighth and final series includes only one case dedicated to the science of Hermes. It depicts abrupt rocks whose wild silhouette stands in the middle of the waves. This lapidary tableau bears the inscription, .donic.urban.ignes, in English, as long as there will be fires, as long as the fire lasts, allusion to the possibilities of action that man holds from the igneous principle, spirit, soul, or light of things, the unique factor of all material mutations. Of the four elements of ancient philosophy, only three are represented here, the earth, by the rocks, the water by the marine wave, the air by the sky of the landscape carved. As for the fire, animator and modifier of the other three, it is not excluded from the subject but to better underline its preponderance, its power and its necessity, as well as the impossibility of any action on the substance, without the help of this spiritual force capable of penetrating it, of moving it, of changing into actual what it has of potential. As long as the fire lasts, life will radiate in the universe. Bodies, subject to the laws of evolution of which it is the essential agent, will accomplish the different cycles of their metamorphoses, until their transformation is final in spirit, light or fire. As long as the fire lasts, matter will never cease its painful ascent towards integral purity, from the compact and solid form, earth, to the liquid form, water, and from the liquid form to the radiant form, fire. As long as the fire lasts, man will be able to exercise a sovereign industry over the substances that surround him, and, thanks to the marvelous ignited instrument, bend them to his will, subdue them, make them serve his purposes. As long as the fire lasts, science will benefit from extended possibilities in all domains of human activity and the field of his knowledge and achievements. As long as the fire lasts, man will be in direct contact with God, and the creature will better know its creator. No subject of meditation appears more profitable to the philosopher. None calls more for the exercise of his thought. The fire envelops us and bathes us everywhere. It comes to us through air, water, the earth itself, which are its conservators and various vehicles. We encounter it in everything that approaches us. We feel it acting within us for the entire duration of our earthly existence. Our birth is the result of his incarnation. Our life, the effect of his dynamism. Our death, the consequence of his disappearance. Prometheus steals the fire from heaven to animate the man he had formed from them clay of the earth. Vulcan creates Pandora, the first woman, whom Minerva endows with movement by breathing into her the vital fire. A simple mortal, the sculptor Pygmalion, desirous to marry his own work, implores Venus to animate, by the celestial fire, his statue of Galatea. To seek to discover the nature and essence of fire, is to seek to discover God, whose real presence has always been revealed under the igneous appearance. The burning bush, Exodus, 3, 2, and the blazing manifestations by which God appeared to Moses at Sinai during the giving of the Decalogue, Exodus, 19, 18, 
are two figures under which God appeared to Moses. And it is under the figure of a jasper and sardine stone of flame color, sitting on an incandescent throne and full of fire, that St. John depicts the master of the universe, Apocalypse, 4, 3, 5. Note that our Jesus is described by St. Paul in his epistle to the Hebrews, ch. 12, 29, as a consuming fire. Therefore, it is not without reason that all religions have considered fire as the most striking and most expressive image of divinity. A symbol of the pictures and emblem of the most expressive of the universal is the fire that I keep, says Plush 1, since it has become the property of the enclosed area, because it is perpetually in the assembly of peoples. Nothing was indeed in the place that could more naturally predispose to give a sensible idea of power, of beauty, of the purity and of eternity of the being they come to worship. This magnificent symbol was in use throughout the Orient. The Persians regarded it as the most perfect image of the divinity. Zoroaster did not introduce the practice under Darius's Basps, but he enriched it with new views on a practice established long before him. The Pyrie of the Greeks were nothing more than this. We find the same use among the Sabines and Romans in other parts of America. Moses maintained the practice of the perpetual fire and prescribed it in detail to the Israelites. The ceremonies from which he made the selection are still, it seems, practiced by them today, and the same symbol, so expressive, so noble, and so capable of throwing man into the illusion, still exists today in all our temples. To pretend that fire comes from combustion is to note a common observation without providing an explanation. The results of modern science for the most part stem from this indifference, whether intentional or not, regarding such an important and universal agent. What to think of the strange obstinacy that certain scholars have to recognize the point of contact that it constitutes, the bond that it creates between science and religion. If heat is born from movement, as is claimed, who then, we might ask, maintains the movement, the producer of fire, if not the fire itself, a vicious circle from which materialists and skeptics will never escape. For us, fire could never be the result or the effect of combustion, but its true cause, it is by the release of grave matter, which it contained, that fire is manifested and the phenomenon known as combustion appears. And whether this release is spontaneous or provoked, Common sense forces us to admit and to maintain that combustion is the result of the released ignited substance and not the primary cause of fire. Imponderable, intangible, always moving, fire possesses all the qualities that we recognize in spirits. It is, moreover, material, since we can see its clarity when it shines, and we feel our spirits uplifted by its radiant heat. Yet, is the spiritual quality of fire not revealed in the flame? Why does it continuously tend to rise, like a true spirit, thwarting our efforts to contain it, to degrade it? Is it not rather the intangible manifestation of this will which, by freeing itself from material bonds, moves away from the earth and draws closer to the celestial homeland? And what is the flame, if not the visible form, the very signature and image of the fire itself? But what we must especially retain, as having priority in the science that interests us is the high purifying virtue that fire possesses. The pure principle par excellence, the physical manifestation of purity itself, it thus signals its spiritual origin and discovers its divine filiation. A rather singular observation, the Greek word pyro, pyre, which serves to designate fire, presents exactly the pronunciation of the French qualifier pure. Also, the Hermetic philosophers, by uniting the nominative to the genitive, created the term pyro, pi upsilon rho sigma, pyre pyros, the foo du foo, or, phonetically, the pure du pure and consider the pure Latin and the Puder French as the seal of the absolute perfection read in the very color of the philosopher's stone. Our study of the coffers of Dampierre is finished. It remains only to signal a few decorative motifs that have no connection with the preceding. They display ornaments symmetrically arranged, rings, interlacings, arabesques, whether adorned with figures or not, whose craftsmanship denotes an execution subsequent to the symbolic subjects. All are devoid of phylacteries and inscriptions. Finally, the background tiles of a small number of coffers are still waiting for the chisel of the sculptor. It is to be presumed that the author of the marvelous grimoire, whose leaves and signs we have undertaken to decipher and which, for unknown reasons, interrupted a work that his successors could neither continue nor complete for lack of understanding it. Whatever the number, the variety, the esoteric importance of the subjects of this superb collection make the high gallery of the Chateau de Dampierre an admirable collection a true museum of alchemical emblems, and classify our adept among the unknown masters best instructed in the mysteries of the sacred art. But, before leaving this masterful ensemble, let us permit ourselves to mention the teaching of a curious stone tableau from the time of Jacques Coeur, at Bourges, which, seems to us worth recalling at the conclusion, 
and to serve as a summary. The carved form makes the tympanum of a door opened onto the court of honor and represents three exotic trees, palm, fig, and date, growing amidst herbaceous plants. A frame of flowers, leaves, and hammers surrounds this bar leaf. PL. 33. The panel and the door, from the same family, were known to the Greeks under the name of Phi Omicron Nu Iota Xi, Latin Phoenix, which is our phoenix in Hermeticism. They represent the two magisteria and their result, the two white and red stones, which have only one and the same nature understood under the Kabbalistic denomination of Phoenix. As for the fig tree occupying the center of the composition, it indicates the mineral substance from which philosophers extract the elements of the miraculous rebirth of the Phoenix, and this is the entire work of this rebirth which is agreed to call the great work. According to the Apocryphal Gospels, it was a fig tree, fig tree of Pharaoh, that had the honor of sheltering the fig tree or sycamore of his flight to Egypt, of nourishing the holy family with its fruits and quenching their thirst with the limpid and fresh water that the child Jesus caused to spring from its roots. Now, fig tree, in Greek, is said Sigma Upsilon Kappa, Psyche, from Sigma Upsilon Kappa Omicron Nu, Psychon, Fig, a word frequently employed for Kappa Upsilon Delta Omicron Sigma, Kaidos, Root Kappa Upsilon Omicron, Kyo, to carry in one's bosom, to contain, it is the virgin mother who carries the child, and the alchemical emblem of the passive, chaotic, aqueous and cold substance, matrix and vehicle of the incarnate spirit. Sozomen, an author of the 4th century, affirms that the tree of Hermopolis, which bowed before the child Jesus, is called Persia, Hist, Echol, Book V, Chapter 21. It is the name of the Balanus, Balanites Egyptica, a shrub of Egypt and Arabia, a kind of oak called Beta Lambda Alpha Nu Omicron Sigma, Balanos, Acorn, a word by which they also designated the Myrabalan, fruit of the Myrabalan tree. These various elements relate perfectly to the subject of the sages and to the technique of the art brief, that Jacques Kerr seemed to have practiced. Indeed, when the artist, a witness to the battle waged by the remora and the salamander, robs from the defeated fiery monster, its two eyes, he must then apply himself to combine them into one. This mysterious operation, nonetheless easy for those who know how to use the carcass of the salamander, provides a small mass quite similar to the oak acorn, sometimes resembling a chestnut, depending on whether it is more or less clothed in the rough matrix from which it never appears completely free. This gives us the explanation of the acorn and the oak, which one encounters almost always in the hermetic iconography. Chestnuts, particular to the style of Jean Lalamond, the heart, figs, the fig tree of Jacques Coeur, the jingle bell, an accessory of the fool's marats, pomegranates, pears and apples, frequent in the symbolic works of Dampierre and Coulon, etc. On the other hand, if one takes into account the magical and almost supernatural character of this production, one will understand why certain. Authors have designated the hermetic fruit under the epithet of Myra Ballin, and why also this term has remained in the popular mind as a synonym for something marvelous, astonishing or very rare. The priests of Egypt, directors of the college's initiates, who were accustomed to posing as profane, soliciting access to sublime knowledge, this seemingly absurd question, is it sown, in your country, the seat of Halyurge and the Myra Ballin? A question that did not embarrass the ignorant neophyte, but which the instructed investigator knew how to answer. The seed of Halyurge and the Myra Balan are not other than the fig and the fig tree of our philosophical eagle, which is none other than our philosophical fowl. It is the latter that brings the fabulous eagle of Hermes, with plumage dyed with all the colors of the work, but among which dominates the red, as its Greek name implies, Phi Omicron Nu Iota Xi, Phoenix, Red Purple. Cyrano de Bergerac does not fail to speak of it, in the course of an allegorical story where is mixed the language of birds that almost made me doze off in the shade, he says, I saw when I caught sight in the air of a marvelous bird that hovered over my head, it was sustained by a movement so light and so imperceptible, that I doubted several times if it was not yet a small universe balanced by its own center. It descended little by little, and finally came so close to me, that my eyes, beneath its feet, could see its image, its long tail, and its stomach of enameled azure, its wings of incarna, its purple head made it shine, shaking, a golden crown of which the rays sparkled from its eyes. It took a long time to fly in the clouds, and I was so attentive to everything it would become, that my soul, having folded and as if shortened to the sole operation of seeing, almost reached that of hearing, to make me understand that the bird was talking while singing. Thus, little by little unfurling from my ecstasy, I distinctly noted the syllables, the words, and the discourses it articulated. Here then, as best as I can recall, are the terms in which it arranged the tissue of its song. You are a stranger, 
if the bird of our land, O oh man, knock whites in us maw to don't Jesus original. 4. This secret propensity that we have for our compatriots, is the instinct that drives me to want you to know my life. I see well that you are eager to learn who I am. It is I whom among you is called Phoenix. In each world, there is only one at a time, who lives there spanning the space of a hundred years. 4. At the end of a century, when on some mountain of Arabia he is burdened with a large egg in the middle of the embers of his pyre, from which he assorted the substance of aloe branches and cinnamon and incense, he takes his flight and directs his soaring to the sun, as the homeland where his heart has long aspired to it. He has indeed made all his efforts for this journey, but the heaviness of his egg, whose shells are so thick that it takes a century to incubate, always hinders the undertaking. I very much doubt that you will have difficulty understanding this miraculous production. That is why I want to explain it to you. The phoenix is hermaphroditic, but, among hermaphrodites, it is still another extraordinary phoenix, because, in brackets, the author, seemingly purposefully thus abruptly interrupts his revelation, and bracket, he remained a quarter of an hour without speaking, and then he added, I see well that you suspect of falsehood what I have just told you, but, if I do not speak the truth, I never want to approach your globe, that an eagle never swoops down on me. Another author goes into great detail about the mythico hermetic bird and highlights some peculiarities that would be difficult to find elsewhere. The Caesar of birds, he says, is the miracle of nature, who wanted to show in that bird what it knows how to do, showing itself as a phoenix and forming the phoenix, for it has marvelously enriched it, giving it a crested head with a royal plume and imperious tufts, from which sprout feathers and a crest so dazzling that it seems entirely made of silver and of a star adorned on its head. The downy shirt is of a changeable color borrowing from all the colors of the world. The large feathers are of flesh, azure, gold, flame. The neck is a torque of all gemstones, and not a rainbow, but an arc in phoenix. The tail is celestial in color with a gold sheen representing the stars. Its feathers, and its entire mantle, is like a primavera, rich with all colors. It has two eyes on its head, shiny and flamboyant, which look like two stars, its legs of gold and its fiery talons. Everything conspires in its kind to show that it knows its worth and how to make its rank felt by the magnificence of its meat alone. So, even in its flesh there is something royal, for it makes its pass not only of tears of incense and bomb chrism. Being in the cradle, the sky, says lactance, distilled nectar and ambrosia. He alone is the witness of all ages of the world, and has seen the soul's metamorphose from golden age to silver, from silver to copper, from copper to iron. He alone has never kept false company in heaven and in the world. He alone has played with death, and made it his nourisher and his mother, making life spring from life. He has the privilege of time, of life and death together. For when he feels burdened with it, weighed down by a long old age, brought down by such a long series of years that he has seen slip away, one after the other, he lets himself be carried away by a desire and just envy to be renewed by a miraculous death. Then, he makes a pile that alone in the world has no name, for it is not a nest, nor a cradle, nor a place of birth since he leaves life there. Neither is it a tomb, a coffin or a mournful urn, for from there he takes back life, in such a way that I do not know what is another unanimated phoenix, being at the same time cradle and sepulchre, host of life and of death, of all favor and, what is more, favor of the phoenix's decrepitude or its death. Whatever it may be, there, on the trembling arms of a palm, he makes a pile of cinnamon twigs and of incense, on the incense of the casket, on the spikenard casket, then, with a pitiful look, recommending himself to the son, his murderer and his father, he perches or lays down on this pyre of bomb, to strip himself of his deceitful years. The son, favoring the just desires of this odyssey and bird, lights the pyre, and, reducing it to ashes, wraps him in a veiled mask, making horrendous life. Then, poor nature finds itself in a trance, and, with awful enslavements, fears to lose the honor of this great world, also commands that not a drop of the ash should spill and that not a drop should fall on the ground, however enraged they may be, they would not dare to run over the fields, only Zephyr is master, and springtime holds sway, while the ash remains unnamed, and nature holds the hand that favors the return of its phoenix. O oh, great miracle of divine providence! Almost at the same time this cold ash not wanting to leave poor nature for long in this fight gives her the terrifying warmth, I do not know how heated up by the dual and light of the sun, changes into a small worm, then into an egg, finally into a bird more beautiful than the other. You would say that all nature is resurrected, that deed is done according to Pliny, the sky again begins its revolutions as per the usual custom, and you would properly say that the four elements, without making any noise, sing a quartet with their flourishing gaiety, in praise of nature, 
and to properly welcome the return of the miracle of the birds of the world. El. 34. Just as the coffers of Dampierre, the panel with three trees sculpted at the Palace of Bourges bears a motto, ornately decorated with flowering branches, the framing border indeed reveals isolated letters, very cleverly disguised. Their assembly composes one of the favorite maxims of the great artist who was Jacques Kerr, the M.A. joie.dire.fair.tear, or in English, to say my joy holds silence. Indeed, the joy of the adept lies in his occupation. The work, which makes him sensitive and familiar with this marvel of nature, that so many dignitaries qualify as chimerical, constitutes his best distraction, his most noble pleasure. In Greek, the word chi alpha rho, kara, joy, derived from chi alpha rho omega, kiaro, to rejoice, to take pleasure in, to delight in, also means to love. The famous philosopher thus makes a clear allusion to the labor of the work, his most beloved task, which so many symbols, moreover, come to enhance the brilliance of the sumptuous lodgings. But what to say, what to admit about this unique joy, pure and complete satisfaction, the intimate joy of success, as little as possible, if one does not want to perjure oneself, arouse the envy of some, the greed of others, the jealousy of all, and risk becoming the prey of the powerful. What to do then with the result, which the artist, according to the rules of our discipline, commits to using modestly for himself, to use it ceaselessly for the good, to devote the fruits to the exercise of charity, in accordance with the philosophical precepts and with the Christian moral. What then to silence, absolutely everything that regards the alchemical secret and its application, for the revelation, remaining the exclusive privilege of God, the divulgation of the procedures is forbidden, not communicable in clear language, permitted only under the veil of the parable, of allegory, the image or the metaphor. The motto of Jacques Kerr, despite its brevity and its innuendos, shows perfect concordance with the traditional teachings of eternal wisdom. No philosopher, truly worthy of this name, would refuse to subscribe to the rules of conduct it expresses and which can be translated as. From the great work speak little, do much, keep silent always. the bodyguards of Francis II, Duke of Brittany, I, when, around the year 1502, Anne, Duchess of Brittany and twice Queen of France, formed the project of gathering, in a mausoleum, the esteem she had for them, the bodies of her parents who had passed away. She entrusted its execution to a Breton artist of great talent, but about whom we have little information, Michel Cologne. She was then 25 years old. Her father, Duke Francois II, had died at Couron 14 years earlier, on September 9, 1488, leaving her surviving his second wife, Marguerite de Foix, mother of Anne, who died 16 months old. She died in Etampes, on the 15th of May 1487. This mausoleum, started in 1502, was only completed in 1507. The plan is the work of Jean Perreal. As for the sculptures, which are among the purest masterpieces of the Renaissance, they are by Michel Colomb, helped in this work by two of his students, Guillaume Regnaud, his nephew, and Jean de Chartres, his disciple and servant, although the collaboration of the latter is not absolutely certain. A letter, written on January 4, 1511, by Jean Perreal to the secretary of Marguerite de Bourgogne, on the occasion of work that the princess wished to have carried out in the chapel of Brou, tells us that Michel Colomb deserved at this place and brought us from Moise 20. Acus, the space of five years. The sculpture work was paid for 1,200 acus, and the tomb cost a total of 560 livres, according to the wishes expressed by Marguerite de Bretagne and Francois II, to be inhumed in the Church of the Carmes in Nantes, and had her father's mausoleum, qui part le nom de tombeau des Carmes, under which it is generally known and designated. It became en place, just until the revolution, the epoch at which the Church of the Carmes, having been sold as national property, it was removed and secretly kept by an art-loving amateur eager to save the masterpiece from the revolutionary vandals. The hurricane of last year has, we know, severely damaged the Cathedral of Saint-Pierre, the great pride of Nantes, where we went in 1819, today. The sepulchre vaulted, built under the mausoleum I admire, contains, since the revolutionary night, 
the two coffins of Francois II, Duke of Brittany, of September 8, 1727, the orders of the king, by Melier, mayor of Nantes, the 16th and 17th of October on the order of the king, and of Marguerite de Bretagne, his first wife, deceased September 25, 1449, and of Marguerite de Foix, second wife, mother of the Queen Anne. A small box was also there, it contained a heart reliquary of gold and moon day, in the shape of an egg, superbly, enameled, and containing the heart of Anne of Brittany, whose body rests at the Basilica of Saint-Denis. Among the descriptive relations that various authors have left us of the tomb of the Karmas, there are very detailed ones. We choose, to give an overview of the work, that of Brother Matthias of Saint-Jean, commoner of Nantes, who published it in the 18th century. But what seems to me more rare and worthy of admiration, this writer says, is the tomb raised in the heart of the church of the said Karmas, which, in the view of everyone, is one of the most beautiful and magnificent that can be seen, which obliges me to make a particular description for the satisfaction of the curious. The devotion that the ancient dukes of Brittany had for a long time to the very holy virgin mother of God, the patroness of this church of the P.P. Karmas, and the affection they had for the religious of this house, led them to choose it as the place of their sepulchre. And Queen Anne, by a unique testimony of her pity and affection in this place, wanted to have this beautiful monument erected in memory of her father Francois II and of her mother Marguerite de Foix. It is built in square, of eight feet on each side, and four feet high, its material is all of fine marble from Italy, black and white, and alabaster. The body is elevated on the plan, the ground, of the church, six feet high. The two sides are ornamented with six niches, each of two feet high, whose background is of well-crafted porphyry, and above, surrounded by white marble pillars, in the correct architectural proportions, enriched with arabesques, and very delicately worked, all twelve niches are filled with figures of the twelve apostles, in white marble, each having a different posture, and the instruments of the passion. Two of the columns are arranged opposite each other, each divided into two matching parts with the others. At the end towards the main altar of the church are placed in these niches the figures of St. Francis of Assisi and St. Margaret, patrons of the last duke and duchess who are buried there, and at the other end of the niches, the figures of St. Charlemagne and St. Louis King of France. Below these sixteen niches that surround the body of the tomb, there are as many concavities made round of fourteen inches in diameter, whose bottom is of white marble carved in the shape of a shell, and all filled with figures of mourners in their mourning garments, all in various postures, the work of which is considered of little personal value, but it is admired by all who hear of it. The cover of this body, made of a great marble table not made of a single piece, and which exceeds the solid, the mass of the tomb, by about eight inches, all around in the form of a cornice, to serve as an entablature and ornament of the body. Above this stone lie two large figures of white marble, each eight feet in length, which represent the duke, and the other the duchess with their ducal robes. Three figures of angels in white marble, each three feet high, hold small square cushions, cousins, under the heads of these figures, which seem to soften under the burden, and the angels weep, at the feet of the figure of the duke, there is a figure of a lion lying down represented naturally, which bears on its tunic, Sivier, the shield of arms of Brittany, and at the feet of the figure of the Duchess, there is a figure of a greyhound, which also wears around its neck the arms of the house of Fua which animates the art wonderfully well. But what is even more marvelous in this piece, are the four figures of the cardinal virtues, placed at the four corners of this sepulchre, made of white marble, of the height of six feet, they are so well carved, so well set, and have such a resemblance to nature, that foreigners who have seen nothing better, neither in antiquity nor in modern Italy, France, and Germany. The figure of justice is holding in her right hand a sort of raised rod, and in her left a balance, with clouds parting at her feet, the crown on her head, dressed in fur on the left arm, the collar of the order of equity, the severity and majesty which accompany this virtue. Opposite, on the left side, is the figure of prudence, who has two opposing faces, one of an old man with a long beard, the other of a young maiden, one of her hands, left, holds a convex mirror that she looks at fixedly, and the other a compass, at her feet, there is a serpent, and these things are symbols of the consideration and wisdom with which this virtue proceeds in her actions. At the right angle, on the top side, is the figure of fortitude, dressed in a coat of mail, armor, and wearing a helmet on her head, from her left hand she supports a tower, from the crevices of which a serpent, undragon, emerges that she strangles with her right hand, which signifies the vigor that this virtue puts forth in the adversities of the world to overcome the violence or to support the poor. In the opposite corner is the figure of temperance dressed in a long rope, girded with a cord, from her right hand, 
She supports a clock's mechanism, and from the other a horse's bit, hieroglyphic of the regulation and moderation that this virtue exercises in human passions. The eulogies that Brother Matthias of Saint John gives to these guards of the body of Francois II, represented by the cardinal virtues of Michel Cologne, seem to us perfectly merited. These four statues, says de Camun, are admirable for their grace and simplicity. The draperies are rendered with a rare perfection, and in each figure, one observes a very striking individuality, although all four are equally noble and beautiful. These statues, imbued with the purest symbolism, guardians of the tradition and of the ancient science, which we are particularly going to study, the bodyguards of Francis II, Duke of Brittany. 2. With the exception of justice, the cardinal virtues are no longer represented with the singular attributes that give the ancient figures an enigmatic and mysterious character. Under the pressure of more realistic conceptions, symbolism has transformed. The artists, abandoning all idealization of thought, follow naturalism closely. They adhere closely to the expression of the attributes and facilitate the identification of allegorical figures. But, in perfecting their processes and by approaching more of the traits of living individuals, they did not lose, thank goodness, the grandeur of the allegory. On the contrary, they gave it, by the exactness of the portraits, a more striking relief. In modern formulations, they have unconsciously carried a dual body, the traditional truth. For the sciences of antiquity, transmitted under the veil of various emblems, symbols of the diplomatic and of present paintings have a double signification, one apparent, understandable by all, exoteric, the other hidden, accessible only to initiates, esoteric. In painting, the symbol, limited to a function positive, normal and defined, by individualizing to the point of excluding any connected or relative idea, it strips off that double sense, of the expressive second which precisely accentuates the symbolic value and the essential porte. Thus, paintings of justice, fortune, and love, with their eyes blindfolded, did they only pretend to express uniquely the blindness of one, the blinding of others? Could we not discover, in the attribute of the blindfold, a special reason for this artificial and undoubtedly necessary obscurity? It would suffice to know that these figures, commonly subject to human vicissitudes, also belong to the scientific tradition, to easily recognize it. And one would even realize that the occult sense stops with a clarity superior to that which is obtained by direct analysis and superficial reading. When poets recount that Saturn, father of the gods, should, one believes, with encyclopedia, that such a metaphor serves to characterize an epoch, an institution, etc., of which the circumstances or the results having been favorable to us, we should have only gathered the benefits. But if we give to this general interpretation the positive and scientific reason which constitutes the basis of legends and myths, the truth emerges by itself, luminous and detached. Hermeticism teaches that Saturn, symbolic representation of lead, terrestrial and Saturnine metal, generator of others, is also their unique and natural solvent. The dissolved metal assimilates with the solvent and is lost in it. As such, it is logical and fair to pretend that the solvent eats the metal, and in the marvelous fable the fabulous devourer consumes his progeny. We could give a multitude of examples of this duality of traditional symbolism. That alone would be enough to show that, in addition to the moral and Christian interpretation of the cardinal virtues, there exists a second teaching, secret, profane, usually unknown, which pertains to the material domain of acquisitions, of knowledge ancestral, sealed in the form of the same emblems. Thus, we find ourselves, within science and religion, the harmonious alliance so fruitful in marvelous results, which the skepticism of our times refuses to acknowledge and always conspires to dismiss. The theme of the virtues, notably remarked upon by the author in the 16th century, as Mr. Paul Vitry observed, was in the art of that variable era, but still in good standing, as it remained quite fashionable among the Italians, faith, hope, and charity, still often reduced to these three theological virtues in Italy, were of limited attributes, they were the knots of good name, as order in it had remained fairly stable. But there were still four cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, strength, temperance. She was also happily applied to funeral ornaments. She constitutes one of the good fortunes of the ornamentation of the tombs. As for the way to characterize these virtues, it seems to have been established with Orcagna and his tabernacle of gold San Michel almost up to the 14th century. Justice carries the sword and the balance and would not vary in the middle. The essential attribute of prudence is the mirror and the serpent. It is sometimes a man or several books, sometimes a serpent, and there is sometimes added, by an idea analogous to that of Dante, who from the beginning had given eyes to his prudence, the imagers would give two faces to this virtue. Temperance often holds two vessels and sometimes her sword against the torturer, 
but more often she mixes water with wine. This elementary symbol of sobriety seemed to blend water and wine. It is Samson. She is armed with the shield and finally, strength has the attributes of the skin of a lion on the head and a disc representing the world. Sometimes she has a column, and this will be her definitive attribute, in Italy at least, whether the entire column or broken. In the absence of great monuments, engravings, manuscripts, books took care of spreading the type of virtues a little yawn and could even make them known to those who, like Cologne, had undoubtedly not made the voyage to Italy. A series of Italian engravings from the end of the 15th century, which is known under the name of Tarot of Italy, shows us in the middle of representations of various social conditions, of muses, of gods of antiquity, of liberal arts, etc., a series of figures of virtues, they almost exactly represent the attributes we have just described. We have there a very curious specimen of these documents which could circulate in the workshops of people like Peril, who had followed the expeditions, documents that could circulate in the workshops and provide themes in anticipation of imposing a new style. This symbolic language, moreover, had no difficulty in being understood by us. It was entirely in conformity with the allegorical spirit of the 15th century. To realize this, one only has to think about the Roman de la Rose, and to all the literature that existed then. Le Minia Tristes had abundantly illustrated these works and, even outside of these allegories of nature, of deduction and of faux semblant, French art was certainly not unaware of the series of virtues, although it was not as frequently employed as in Italy. However, without absolutely denying the splendid figures of the tomb of the Karmas, any influence in Italian style, Paul Vitry points out the new character, essentially French, that Michel Colomb was to give to the ultramontane elements brought by Jean Peril. Even assuming, the author continues, that they borrowed the original idea from the Italian tombs, Peril and Colomb would not accept, without modification, a theme of the cardinal virtues. Indeed, temperance will carry in its hands a clock and a bit with its bridle instead of the two vases that the Italians had commonly given her. As for strength, armed and helmeted, instead of her column, she will hold a tower, a kind of crenellated keep, from where a vigorously fighting dragon emerges. Neither in Rome, nor in Florence, nor in Milan, at the Como Gate, south door of the cathedral, do we know anything similar. But if one can easily discern, in the Nantes Cenotaph, the respective part that belongs to the masters Peril and Cologne, it is still unpleasant to see how far personal influence could extend, the personal will of the foundress. For we cannot believe that for five years she was disinterested in a work that was particularly dear to her heart. Queen Anne, this gracious sovereign of the people, in her naive affection, familiarly called the good duchess in her wood of boars, had she not been the esoteric guardian of the mausoleum raised in memory of her parents? We would willingly resolve this question in the affirmative. Her biographers assure us that she was very educated, endowed with a lively intelligence and a remarkable clairvoyance. Her library, which seems to have been important for the time, is depicted by the only account, not dated from Lindsay that I could discover relating to the set of the library formed by Anna Brittany, Index of Expenditures of 1498. There were found manuscript books and prints in Latin, French, Italian, Greek, and Hebrew. Eleven volumes of the Quarante, it is a wonder that Charles VIII, at 16, was already married. We will perhaps be surprised to see featured in the collection of the Duchess, works in Greek and Hebrew, but we must not be surprised. It is remembered that she had studied the two languages scholars and that her spirit was above all serious. On us we note that in seeking the conversation of diplomats, to whom she was pleased to respond in their own language, which would justify a very polyglot education, it is without a doubt also the possession of the Kabbalistic Hermetic, Dugoy Gassoy too on the double science. Did she not also count among the renowned scholars of her time, among her contemporaries? We lack information on this point, which makes it difficult to explain why the great chimney of the Hotel Le Mans in Bourges does not bear an image of Anne of Brittany and the porcelain Louis XII, if one does not wish to acknowledge her presence in the philosophical abode of Bourges. Whatever the case, her personal fortune was considerable. The pieces of goldsmithery, gold ingots, gemstones constituted the mass of a treasure nearly inexhaustible. The abundance of such riches facilitated the exercise of a generosity that quickly became popular. The chroniclers teach us that she willingly built it up again, by the gift of a diamond, the poor minstrel who had entertained her for a few moments. As for her livery, it offered the hermetic colors chosen by her, black, yellow, and red, before the death of Charles VIII, and she alone, among the ladies of the oeuvre, wore black and red since that time. Finally, she was the first queen of France, in contrast, dressed in black according to the custom established to that point, wore mourning for her first husband in black, while the custom obliged sovereigns to always wear it in white. 
the bodyguards of Francis II, Duke of Brittany. 3. The first of the four statues we are going to study is the one that offers us the various attributes charged with specifying the allegorical expression of justice, lion, balance, sword. But beyond the esoteric meaning, different from the moral one attributed to these attributes, Michelle Colomb's figure presents other signs revealing her occult personality. It is not a detail, however small, that has been neglected in any analysis of this genre, which, having been carefully examined, has not been predetermined. The justice is bordered with roses and pearls. Our virtue at the forehead had a ducal crown, which could make one believe that she represented the traits of Anne de Bretagne, a poupla on her right and the pommel of a radiant sun. Finally, it is here that her characteristic is finished first. She appears here on bail. The peplum that she wore throughout had slipped along the body, retained by the salience of the arms. It comes to double the cloak in its lower part. The sword itself has left its brocade scabbard, which we see now suspended at the tip of the iron. P.L. 35. P.L. 35. D. Cathedral de Nantes Tombeau de Francois I. La Justice, 16 siècle. Thus truth at the pinnacle of the justice rests. It's because the very essence of the deity, to whom nothing is concealed, compels the revelation and the manifestation of truth to show itself to all in the full light of equity. The veil, halfway drawn, must necessarily reveal the individuality secreted by a second figure, adroitly concealed under the form and attributes of the first. This second figure is none other than philosophy. In Roman antiquity, they called peplos, in Greek, a veil adorned with embroidery which clothed the statue of Minerva, daughter of Jupiter, the goddess whose birth was marvelous. Indeed, she emerged fully armed from the brain of her father, Jupiter, on the order of the master of Olympus, Vulcan, who split his head. From there the Hellenic name of Athens, Athena, formed from, privative, and noesis, Greek, mind, meaning mind without mother. Personification of wisdom or knowledge of things, Minerva must be regarded as divine and creative thought, materialized in all nature, latent in us as well as in everything that surrounds us. But it's from a woman's veil, Chalama, that is here in question, and that word would have another form. Peplos symbolizing, Calypto, comes from Calypto to cover, envelop, hide, which has formed Kappa Alpha Lambda Sigma, Calise, Rose Button, Flower, and also, Calisso, Greek name of the nymph Calypso, queen of the mythical island of Ogygia, which the Hellenes called, Thygatros, term neighbor of Theta Upsilon Gamma Alpha Tau Rho, which in the sense of antiquity and grand. We will find it again as the Rose Mystique, flower of Grand Ouvre, under the name of the philosophical stone, so that it's easy to grasp the relationship between the expression of the veil and that of the roses and pearls adorning the fur-trimmed surcoat, since this stone is still called Precious Pearl, Margarita Previsa. Alice, you know Father Noel, representative of the Muscovites to this court, told us the day before yesterday how the Tsar had given him a remarkably large and beautiful crown made of gold and the white tunic, covered with a purple drape. She wears on her chest a rich jewel, a symbol of her inestimable value, and places her left foot on a squared stone. One could not better describe the dual nature of the magisterium, its colors, the high value of this cubic stone that carries philosophy in its entirety, masked, for the common people, under the features of justice. Philosophy confers to whoever embraces it a great power of investigation. It allows one to penetrate the intimate complexity of things, cutting through them as with a sword, thereby uncovering the presence of the spirit world. These are discussed by the classical masters, who place their center in the sun and derive its virtues and movement from the radiation of the star. It also gives knowledge of the general laws, the rules of rhythm and measures that nature observes in the elaboration, the evolution and the perfection of created things, balance. It establishes, finally, the possibility of acquiring knowledge of the base of, liberation, of meditation, of faith and science on a written work. By the same attributes, this image of philosophy does not only inform, secondly, on the essential points of the labor of the adepts, and proclaims the necessity of manual work imposed on researchers wishing to acquire a positive proof of its reality. Without technical research, without frequent trials and experiences, one can only stray into a science of which the best treatises conceal the physical principles, their application, the material at the same time. He who calls himself a philosopher and does not want to labor for fear of that, or of spending too much money, must be regarded as the most vain of the ignorant or the most audacious of impostors. I can bear witness, said Augustine Thierry, for my part will not be suspect. There is in the world something that nothing can equal the joy that knowledge brings, better than fortune, better than health itself, its science. The sage's activity is not measured by the spectacular results of the stove, 
Controlled at the furnace, in the solitude and silence of the laboratory, non-attentive to all, it manifests without verbal claim, by the attentive study, the observant and persevering, of reactions and phenomena. He who acts belatedly will verify, sooner or later, the maxim of Solomon, Prov.21, 25, saying that the desire of the lazy will kill him, because his hands refuse to work. The real philosopher fears not because he is not afraid of suffering because he knows that effort is a science, and only she provides the means to hear the sentences and their interpretation, the words of the wise and their profound speeches, Prov, I, 6. As for the practical value of the attributes associated with justice, which look at hermetic work, the student will find by experience that the energy of the universal spirit has its signature in the sword, and the sword has its correspondence in the sun, as the intelligence of the mind to matter perturbed by all the substances of the bodies. It is the only agent of metamorphosis substances of the original matter, subject and foundation of the magisterium. It is through him that mercury is changed into sulfur, sulfur into elixir and the elixir into medicine, receiving then the name of the crown of the wise, by this operation. The triple mutation confirms the truth of the secret teaching and consecrates the glory of its fortunate artisan. The possession of burning sulfur and multiplied, masked under the term of philosophical stone, is for the adept what the triregnum is for the paper crown. The major emblem of sovereignty and of the monarch, the open book, characterized by the radical solution of the metallic body, which, having rid itself of its impurities and given up its sulfur, is then set open. But here, a remark imposes itself, under the name of Liber and under the image of a closed book to designate the raw material, holder of the dissolved bodies, the sages have meant to signify the closed book, the general symbol of all crude bodies, minerals or metals, as nature presents them to us or as human industry offers them for trade. Thus, Minerals extracted from the deposit, metals from the smelting, are expressed hermetically by a closed book with a seal. Similarly, these bodies, set to alchemical work, modified by the application of occult processes, are translated in iconography with the aid of the open book. It is therefore necessary, in practice, to extract mercury from the closed book so that it can in turn open the living metal and cover it, if we want it to enclose the living metal and if we want the living sulfur that it contains. The opening of the first book prepares the second. For hidden under the same emblem, two closed books, the raw subject and the metal, and two open books, the mercury and the sulfur, although these hieroglyph hieroglyphic books really make only one, since the metal comes from the initial matter and the sulfur takes its origin from the mercury. As for the balance, applied against the book, it suffice to note that it conveys the necessity of weights and proportions to believe itself exempt from speaking further. However, this faithful image of the utensil used for weighing, to which chemists assign an honorable place in laboratories, nevertheless contains a high arcane of importance. It is for this reason that we are obliged to give a complete and brief account of what the balance hides under the angular and symmetrical form. When philosophers envisage the ponderous ratios of materials and their alloys, they are talking about a double esoteric knowledge, that of the weight of nature and that of the weight of art. Unfortunately, the wise, says Solomon, hide science, they are bound to remain within the strict limits of their vow, and very meticulous to describe precisely what differentiates the two secrets. We will not go further than they have said, and in all sincerity, the rules of art are exclusively applicable to distinct bodies capable of being weighed, while the weight of nature refers to the proportions relative to the composition of a given body. It is therefore reciprocal quantities of matter that are described, following a regular and understandable order. The authors truly speak of the weight of art. And if it is a question of quantitative values within a binary synthesis and radical, the united principles of sulfur and mercury and the philosophical mercury are the weight of nature then considered. And we will add, in order to satisfy the spirit of the reader, that if the weight of art is known to the artist and rigorously determined by him, on the other hand, the weight of nature is always ignored, even by the greatest masters. It is a mystery that only God knows and whose intelligence remains inaccessible to man. The work begins and is achieved by the weight of art, thus, the alchemist, preparing the way, incites nature to begin and to perfect this great labor. But, between these extremes, the artist does not intend to use the balance, the weight of nature intervening alone. In such a way, in the fabrication of common mercury, this philosophical mercury, the known operations are the cinnabar, imbibitions, etc., and it is possible to know, even approximately, the quantities that are retained or decomposed, what is the coefficient of the assimilation of the base, just as the proportion of the spirits. This is what the cosmopolite lets us understand when he says that mercury takes no more sulfur than it can absorb and retain. In other terms, 
the metal zone assimilable matter, depending directly on its metallic energy, remains always to be assessed. The entire work is therefore always variable and cannot but reflect both the agent and the initial subject. Now, assuming that the agent is obtained with a maximum of virtue, or the material itself, the basic matter, such as we offer it, which is rarely found, la materia maxima is always constant and similar to itself. We will say about this, having often controlled the effect, that the assertions of the authors founded on certain regularities, yellow stains, enforced cracks, plates or red points, extreme, give some indications on this. The mining region could rather provide us with notable differences. The samples, taken from the mass sought, although from the same deposit, reveal not so much to us. Without recurring to abstract mystical interventions, the need for a regular, conforming to philosophical work, in spite of all the naturally necessary imperatives, and which leaves no room for indeterminacies. The pure mercury force, before being further reduced by subdivision, is real. Never in the hands of the worker is there a body of equal power, of transmutatory energy in direct and constant relation with the quantity of materials put to work. Al Champagne, Cathedral de Nantes Tombeau de Francois a Vertical Bar, La Force, 16 Siècle, the bodyguards of Francis II, Duke of Brittany. For here, in our opinion, is the masterpiece of Michel Colomb and the main piece of the Tomb of the Karmas. Alone, writes Léon Palustre, the statue of strength would suffice for the glory of a man, and one cannot defend oneself, in contemplating it, from a lively and profound emotion. The majesty of the posture, the nobleness of expression, the grace of gesture, qualities that one would wish more vigorous, are as many characteristics of a consummate mastery, of an incomparable skill of workmanship. The head covered with a flat morion, with the muzzle of a lion on the head, the bust clad in a finely chiseled hauberk, strength supports a tower with her right hand, and the drape, in the left hand, not bearing any description, but a winged dragon that she strangles while holding its neck. A wide drape with long fringes, whose folds fall on her arms, forms a double sling through which one of her extremities passes. This drape, which, in the spirit of statuary, should have rediscovered the emblematic virtue, comes to confirm what one would have already presumed. Just as justice, strength appears unveiled, P.L. 36. Daughter of Jupiter and Themis, sister of justice and temperance, the ancients honored her as a divinity, without however adorning her images with the singular attributes that we see her presenting today. In Greek antiquity, the statues of Hercules, with the massive club, the lion's pelt draped on the shoulder, personify a force both physical and moral. The Egyptians, too, represented her as a woman of powerful build, having two horns of a bull on her head and an elephant by her side. The moderns depict her in very different ways. Botticelli sees her as a robust woman, simply sitting on a throne. Rubens adjoins a shield to her figure, lying on a lion's skin drapery. Gravelot shows her crushing vipers, a lion's pelt thrown over her shoulders, holding a branch of laurel and holding a sheaf of arrows, while at her feet are crowns and scepters. Anguir, in a bar relief from the tomb of Henri de Longueville, Louvre, seems, to define the force of a lion devouring a boar. Coisevox, balustrade of the marble courtyard, at Versailles, clothes her with a lion's skin and makes her hold an oak ring with one hand, and the base of a column with the other. Finally, among the bar reliefs that decorate the peristyle of the Sansal Peace Church, strength is figured armed with the flaming sword and the shield of faith. Among all these figures and the many others, whose enumeration would be tedious, we find no analogy, in terms of attributes, with those of Michel Colomb and the sculptors of his time. The beautiful statue from the Tomb of the Karmas thus takes on a special value and becomes for us the best translation of esoteric symbolism. One can reasonably deny that the tower, so important in medieval fortification, contains a clearly defined meaning, although we have not been able to discover any part of interpretation. As for the dragon, it is better known for its double expression. From the moral or religious point of view, it is the translation of the spirit of evil, demon, the devil or Satan, for the philosopher and the alchemist, it has always served to represent the prime matter, volatile and dissolving, otherwise called mercury common. Hermetically, we can therefore consider the tower to envelope, the refuge, the protective asylum, the mineralogists say the vein, the mine, of the mercurial dragon. This is also the meaning of the Greek word tau rho sigma iota sigma comma tower, asylum, refuge. The interpretation could be even more complete if we assimilated to the artist the woman who extricates the monster from its lair, and her deadly gesture aimed at the goal she must set for herself in this arduous and dangerous operation. Thus, at least, could we find a satisfactory and practically true explanation, 
of the allegorical subject serving to reveal the esoteric side of strength. But we would have to assume that the secret science to which these attributes refer is known. Now, our statue itself is tasked with informing us both about its symbolic scope and the related branches of this whole that is wisdom, personified by the ensemble of the cardinal virtues. If one had asked the great initiate that was Francois Rabelais what was his opinion, he would have certainly answered, by the voice of Epistemon, that a tower of fortification is as much to say as a tower of strength, and a tower demands courage, wisdom, and power, courage, because danger is there, wisdom, because knowledge is necessarily required, power, because he who has never dared, nothing can he undertake. Moreover, phonetic cabala, which makes the French tour the equivalent of the ancient Tirsus, completes the significance of the Panagrulian tour de force. Indeed, Tirsus is placed and used for the chorus, tau, which, that, chorus, but, term, object that one proposes, thus marking the thing that must be attained, which is the goal proposed. Nothing, one sees, could better suit the expression of the philosopher's stone, dragon enclosed in its fortress, whose extraction was always considered a true tour de force. The image, moreover, is eloquent, because if we find it painful to understand how the robust and voluminous dragon, subjected to the compression exerted between the walls of its narrow prison, does not grasp by what miracle it passes entirely through a simple crack in the masonry. Here too the version of the prodigious, supernatural and marvelous is recognized. Let us finally note that strength bears other imprints of the esotericism it reflects. The braids of its hair, hieroglyphs of the solar arrangement, indicating that the work, subjected to the influence of the star, must echeveler as much as the dynamic sun of the sun. The braid, named in Greek Sera, is adopted to represent the vibratory energy. Because among the ancient Hellenic peoples, the sun was called Seir. The imbricated scales on the gorget of the hauberk are those of the serpent, another emblem of the mercurial subject and replica of the dragon, pebbles too. The fish scales, arranged in a semicircle, decorate the abdomen and evoke the soldering, to the human body, of a mermaid's tail. Now, the siren, a fabulous monster and hermetic symbol, serves to characterize the union of the nascent sulfur, which is our poisson, and the common mercury, called virgin in the philosophical or salt of wisdom. The same sense is given to us again, to which the Greeks gave the same name as to the moon, sigma epsilon lambda nu eta, this word, formed from the root celis, shine, and hele, solar light, had been chosen by the initiates to show that the philosophical mercury derives its brightness from sulfur, as the moon receives its light from the sun. An analogous rationale led to the name siren or siren, to the monster mythical resulting from the assemblage of a woman and a fish, siren, a contracted term from Seir, sun, and helene, moon, also indicates equally mercurial lunar matter combined with the sulfuric solar substance. It is therefore an identical translation to that of the king's cake, clothed in the sign of light and spirituality, the cross, witness of the real incarnation of the solar ray, emanated from the universal father, in the heavy matter, matrix of all things, and terra inanis et vacua or the formless and empty land of the scripture. BL. 37. Champagne. How to draw the Nance. Tombeau de Francois II, La Temperance, 16 siècle, the bodyguards of Francis II, Duke of Brittany. 5. Crowned in matronly splendor. Thus expresses Dubuisson Aubenet in his itinerary in Brittany, in 1636, the temperance of Michel Colombe is endowed with attributes assembled by Cochin. According to the latter, she is dressed in simple garments, a dead horse with its bridle in one hand, and, in the other, the pendulum of a clock or the balance of a watch. Other figures present her holding a bridle or a cup. Quite often at Christmas, she appears supported by a reversed vase, with a dead horse in hand, thus mixing the wine vessel with the water vessel that passes for the soberest animal, is her symbolic drink. The elephant, which passes for the soberest animal, is her symbolic drink. Two emblems, one, of a woman with a turtle on her head, holding a bridle and silver, the other, of a woman in the act of tempering, with pincers, a hot iron and a vase full of water. From the small statue supports the ornate box of a small weighted clock, our model used since the 15th century. We know that the dials of these devices possessed only the needle, as evidenced by this beautiful figure of the epic. The clock, which serves to measure time, is taken for the hieroglyph of time itself and is considered, at first glance, the hourglass, as the principal emblem of old Saturn, PL 37. Some rather superficial observers have believed they recognized a lantern in the clock, easily identifiable however, from the temperance, the error would hardly modify the significance of the symbol, for the sense of the lantern complements that of the clock. Indeed, 
If the lantern enlightens because it carries the light, the clock appears as the dispenser of this light, which is not received in a burst, but little by little, progressively, over the years and with the help of time. Experience, light, truth are synonymous in philosophy. Now, nothing, if not age, permits one to acquire experience, light, and truth. Also, may we be allowed to acquire wisdom under the aspect of an old man, and in time, sole master of senile weariness and fatigue of men having long labored in the pursuit of truth without ever obtaining it. It is this necessity of time or of experience that highlights Francio's Rabelais, in his addition to the fifth book of Pantagruel, writes thus about those philosophers, when they will hold a clear lantern, will adduce God accompanying it and guide themselves, in search of the investigator as Homer called them alloy, and it is this quality that made Homer call humans, that is to say, researchers and inventors, will find the true lantern lit by the sage Thales of Miletus, king of Egypt, who, when questioned by what means things hidden by time are discovered, responded, things hidden by time are discovered by lanterns invented, and it is the cause why the ancients called Saturn time, father of truth, and also of time. They will infallibly also find all knowledge, even the least of what is and what predecessors, barely knew the minimal part of what they knew. But the esoteric range of temperance lies entirely in the bridle that holds the hand on the right. It is with the bridle that one directs the horse. It is by means of this piece, the horseman imposes on his mouth the orientation that pleases him. We can thus consider the bridle as a truly indispensable mediator placed in the right hand directing the march of the horse towards the proposed objective. By this means, of which he has chosen the image among the constituent parts of the harness, is designated in Hermeticism by the name of Kabbalah, and it is by this expression, specially hers, that is the cable, of the kind that the direct expressions serve to identify and recognize, under a single symbolic form, temperance and the Kabbalistic science. With regard to this science, one remark imposes itself, and we believe it appropriate to emphasize that the student not forewarned assimilates willingly Hermetic Kabbalah as an allegorical interpretation system which the Jews pretend to have received by tradition, and which they call Kabbal. In fact, there is nothing common between these two terms, other than their pronunciation. The Hebrew Kabbal and the Hermetic Kabbalah, the latter is therefore strictly limited to the exegesis and to the hermeneutics of sacred texts. The Hermetic Kabbalah applies to books, texts, and esoteric scientific documents of antiquity by means of an age and times remote, while the Kabbal Ebraic doesn't use a process based on the decomposition and explanation of each word or each letter, the Hermetic Kabbalah, on the contrary, is a veritable language. And, just like grammar among us treats didactic treatises of ancient sciences written in Kabbalah, or that they use this language in their essential passages, that the great art itself, according to the very words of Artephius, is entirely Kabbalistic, the reader can understand nothing if he does not possess at least the first elements of the secret idiom. In the Hebrew Kabbalah, three senses can be discovered in each sacred book, of the three interpretations or Kabbalahs offered. The first, called Gematria, involves the analysis of the numerical value of the letters composing the word. The second, named Notarikon, establishes the significance of each letter considered separately. The third, or Temura, it's the same thing, exchange, permutation, employs certain transpositions of letters. This last system, which seems to have been the oldest, dates from the time when the school of Alexandria flourished and was created by some Jewish philosophers anxious to accommodate the speculations of Greek and Oriental philosophy with the text of holy books. We would be no less surprised that the paternity of this method could return to the Jew Philo, whose representation was great at the beginning of our era, because it was he the first philosopher cited as having attempted to identify true religion with philosophy. We know that he tried to reconcile the writings of Plato and the Hebrew texts by interpreting those allegorically, which perfectly concurs with the Hebrew Kabbalah. Whatever it may be, according to the works of very serious authors, we would not assign to the Jewish system a date much earlier than the Christian era, even receding the starting point of this interpretation to the Greek version of the Septuagint, 238 BC. Now, the Hermetic Kabbalah was used, long before this era, by the Pythagoreans and the disciples of Thales of Mile, 640-560, founder of the Ionian school, Anaximander, Pharisides of Syros, Anaximenes of Mele, Heraclitus of Ephesus, Anaxagoras of Clausimenae, etc., in a word, by all the philosophers and Greek scholars, as evidenced by the papyrus of lead. What is generally also unknown, is that the Kabbalah contains and preserves the essence of the mother tongue of the Pelasgians, language deformed but not destroyed, in the primitive Greek, mother tongue of idioms Oceanians, particularly of the French, whose origin Pelasgic is undeniable. Blue language, mother tongue that just needs to know a little too easily find, 
in the various European dialects, the real meaning diverted by time and the migrations of peoples, the language original, at the service of the Kabbalistic job, created for the purpose of veiling, without any doubt, what the sacred text had too clear, the Kabbal Hermetic is a precious key, allowing those who possess it to open the doors of sanctuaries, of these closed books that are the books of traditional sciences, to extract the spirit, and to grasp the secret meaning. Known by Jesus and his apostles, it was likely to maliciously provoke the first renouncement of St. Peter. The Kabbalah was employed in the Middle Ages by philosophers, scholars, literati, diplomats, knights, errant and cavalier troubadours, enchanted schools, travelers and mystics, supporters tourists of the Fa, the echelon of the Magi of Salamanca, which we call Themsburgs because they said to come from the mountain of Venus, discussed among them in the language of the gods, still called gay science or gay savoir, our hermetic Kabbalah. It carries, besides, the name and spirit of Chevalry, where the mystic works of Dante have revealed the true character. The Latin Kabbalus and the Greek Pi Pi Omicron Sigma mean both some horse, and our Kabbalah actually supports the considerable weight, the sum of ancient knowledge and of the Chevalry or medieval Kabbalah, heavy baggage of esoteric truths transmitted over the centuries. This was the secret language of the cavaliers, writers or knights, initiates and intellectuals of antiquity all had this knowledge. One and all, in order to access the fullness of knowledge, metaphorically straddled the Kabbalah, whose spiritual vehicle image is the winged Pegasus of the Hellenic poets. He alone facilitated access to unknown regions. It offered the possibility of seeing and understanding everything, through space and time, ether and light. Pegasus, in Greek Pi Gamma Alpha Sigma Omicron Sigma, derives its name from the word Pi Eta Gamma, source, because it is said to have sprung forth in one blow from the Hippocrene fountain but the truth is of a different order. It is because the Kabbalah nourishes the cause, reveals the principle, the special source of sciences, that its animal hieroglyph has received the characteristic it bears. To know the Kabbalah is to speak the language of Pegasus, the language of the horse, which Swift expressly indicates, in one of his allegorical journeys, the effective value and mystical power. Language characteristic of the philosophers and disciples of Hermes, the Kabbalah dominates all the didactics of the Ars Magna, just as symbolism embraces all iconography. Art and literature thus offer the hidden science the point of their own resources and their faculties of expression. In fact, and despite their particular character, their distinctive technique, the Kabbalah and the symbolism take different paths to arrive at the same goal and to progress in the same teaching. These are the two main columns, erected on the cornerstone of philosophical foundations, which support the alchemical frontone of the Temple of Wisdom. All idioms can give wings in the traditional sense of Kabbalistic words, because the Kabbalah, devoid of texture and syntax, easily adapts to any language, without altering its special genius. It brings to the dialects form the substance of its thought, each idiom bearing originally the names and qualities, so that any language remains always susceptible to vehiculing it, of incorporating it and, consequently, of becoming Kabbalistic through the double acceptance that it takes from this chief. Apart from its pure alchemical role, the Kabbalah has served as a scaffold in the elaboration of several literary masterpieces, which many amateurs appreciate, without however suspecting what treasures they conceal under the charm or the nobility of style. That their authors, be they named Homer, Virgil, Ovid, Plato, Dante or Buddha, were all great initiates. They wrote their immortal works not so much to leave to posterity imperishable monuments of human genius, than to transmit the sublime knowledge of which they were the depositories and that they were to transmit in their entirety. This is how we must judge, beyond the already cited masters, the aged troubadour poems of chivalry, songs of gesture, etc., pertaining to the cycle of the round table and the grail, the works of Francois Rabelais and those of Cyrano Bergerac, Don Quixote by Michel de Cervantes, Gulliver's Travels by Swift, The Dream of Polyphilus, by Francesco Colonna, The Tales of Mother Goose, by Perrault, The Songs of the King of Navarre, by Thibaut de Champagne, The Picaresque, a curious Spanish work which we know less about the author, and a multitude of other works, which, for being less famous, are neither inferior to them in interest nor in science. We will therefore set out the complete and unexposed text of the Solar Kabbalah, having not received license nor found in a text exposed in a discernible form by the rules. It is enough for us to have signaled the place it holds in the study of the secrets of nature and the necessity to start looking for its key. But, to be as clear as possible, we will give, as an example, the version in clear language of a Kabbalistic text original of Naxagoras. Let's hope that the sons of science discover the way to interpret the sealed books and know how to take advantage of a teaching so little veiled. In his allegory, the adept has strived to describe the ancient and simple way, 
the only one followed, formerly, by the old master alchemists. 18th century French translation of the original German text by Nax Agoras. Description of the detailed gold sand that is found near Zwickau, in Misnia, around Niederhohendorf, and other neighboring places, by JNVEJEAC. 5%. ALC. 1715. It will soon be two years since a man from these mines had, from a third party, a certain extract taken from a manuscript in quarto, thick as a thumb, and which came from two other Italian travelers who named themselves thus. It had already been a long time since this extract had been well examined by Mr. N.N., because the latter was able to make it say a lot with the divining rod. Finally, he managed to completely find out of the hands what he was looking for. Here is the extract of this manuscript. I, a village, named Hartzmangrun, near Zwickau. Under the village, there is plenty of good grain. The mine is in veins. 2. Kohlstein, near Zwickau. There is a good vein of grave. French version, in clear language, of the Kabbalistic text of Naxagoras. Description of the detailed method of extracting, of liberating the spirit of gold, enclosed in vile mineral matter, with the design of building the sacred temple of the light and uncovering other analogous secrets, by JNVEJE. 3. Having this stone, called Mountain of the Clasp, go up towards the White Fortress. It is the living water that springs from the disintegrated body, in impalpable powder, under the effect of a natural trituration comparable to that of the Malda. This living and white water gathers at the center, on a crystalline stone, of a semi-blue and stammered color, which can greatly damage and challenge the effort that the operation requires. 4. This luminous and crystalline salt, first being of the divine body, will form, in a second place, in vertigris, it is our copper or brass, and the green lion. V. This sand, calcined, will give its tincture to the branch of gold. The young shoot of the sun will be born in the tower of fire. It is the burnt substance of the stone, the closed rock of the garden where the fruits of ore, so to speak, mature. I have assured myself of this recently. Take good note of this. Vi. Between the first product and the second, stronger and better, it is useful to return to the pond of the dead light, to extract its original matter again. You will find their living water, plated, without constancy, which, on diversification, resists, the fountain of vigor, generative of vigor comprising five points of alchemy. 1715. 7. In the forest of Werda, there is a ditch called Langrath. Going up this ditch, one finds, in the ditch itself, another ditch, advancing into this ditch a length of an arm span from the mountain, one finds another vein of gold of the length of a span. 8. At Undes Hubel there is a ditch where there are grains of gold on mass. This ditch is in the village, near a fountain where the people go to fetch drinking water. 9. After having made various journeys to Zwickau, to the small town of Schlott, to Zoima, to Kruzol, we stopped at Bretmullen, where this place was formerly situated. At Schaman which formerly led to Weinberg, which we call Berenstein, opposite the mountain, going to Berenstein, behind, opposite the song, to the fable, which was there formerly, there is an old deep well within which there is a vein that crosses it. It is strong and very rich in fine gold of Hungary and sometimes even in gold of Arabia. The mark of the vein is on four metal seekers called Alf Seiger's Veer, and it is written near Alf Seiger's Eins. It is a true head of vein. It will soon be two years since a worker, skilled in the art of metallurgy, obtained, through a third agent, an extract of four elements, manually obtained and resembling two mercuries of the same origin, which excellence has made qualify as Roman and which are still always named thus. Known by the antiquity and well studied by the moderns, one can achieve great things, provided that one has received the illumination of the Holy Spirit. It is then that one manages to touch with the hands what one is looking for. Here is the manual technique of this extract. I. A scoriation surmounts the assembly formed by fire, of the pure parts of the vile mineral matter. Under the scoriation, one finds a friable sandy water course. There is the vein or the metallic matrix. Two. Such is the Pierre Cole, a creation of the pure parts of the dung of lead marcasites. Behind, at Gable, there is a blacksmith called Morgan Stern, who knows where there is a good mine, and an underground conduit, where there are crevasses that have been made. There are within it constellations of yellow and the metal is malleable. 3. On the way from Schneeberg to the castle named Wissenberg, there is a bit of water that runs, towards the mountain, it falls into the Molda. Advancing in the Molda, opposite this water, one finds a pond near the river, and beyond this pond, there is a bit of water where one finds a marcasite which can well reward the trouble of going there. 4. At Connersel, on the mountain of God, two leagues from Schoenek, there is an excellent copper sand. 
V. At Grolz, in Folkland, below Schlossberg, there is a garden where there is a rich mine of gold, as I have warned for a while. Take note well. By. Between Werda and Lockenbrendorf, there is a pond called Monstique. Below this pond, one sees an old fountain, at the bottom of the prairie. At this fountain, one finds grains of gold which are very good or vile mineral matter. Friable and granular vein, it is born from iron, tin and lead. It alone carries the imprint of the solar ray. It is she who the expert artisan in the art of tempering steel. The wise call her the morning star. She knows what the artist seeks. It is the underground path that leads to yellow gold, malleable and pure. Rugged path and cut by crevasses, obstacles. 7. In the forest of Werda, there is a ditch called Langrab. Going up this ditch, one finds, in the ditch itself, another ditch. Advancing into this ditch a length of an arm span from the mountain, one finds another vein of gold of the length of a span. 8. At Undes Hubel there is a ditch where there are grains of gold on mass. This ditch is in the village, near a fountain where the people go to fetch drinking water. 9. After having made various journeys to Zwickau, to the small town of Schlott, to Zoima, to Kruzol, we stopped at Bretmullen, where this place was formerly situated. At Schaman which formerly led to Weinberg, which we call Berenstein, opposite the mountain, going to Berenstein, behind, opposite the song, to the fable, which was there formerly, there is an old deep well within which there is a vein that crosses it. It is strong and very rich in fine gold of Hungary and sometimes even in gold of Arabia. The mark of the vein is on four metal seekers called Alf Seiger's Veer, and it is written near Alf Seiger's Eins. It is a true head of vein. But to conclude, on a less austere note, this study of the secret language designated under the name of Hermetic or Solar Kabbalah, we will show how far historical credulity can go, when blind ignorance allows to attribute to certain characters what has only ever belonged to allegory and legend. The historical facts that we offer to the reader's meditation are those of a world of the famous, especially since these prove to be evident and expressive. To a Roman emperor Varius Avitus Bashanus, greeted by soldiers, we do not know too well why, under the names of Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, was nicknamed, we do not know more, Elagabalus. Born in 204, tells us the Encyclopedia, from a Syrian family, vowed to the sun, at Amisa. He was, very young, high priest of the sun, which was represented under the form of a black stone and under the name of Elagabalus. He pretended to form the Caracalla lineage. His mother, Simeas, who frequented the court and was above the favor of Caracalla. His mother, Simeas, who haunted the court and was above that of Caracalla. The beauty of the young high priest seduced the legion of Amisa. Whatever the case, at the age of 14, Elagabalus claimed himself Augustus. The emperor Macron marched against him, but was beaten and killed. The reign of Elagabalus was only the triumph of superstitions and eastern debaucheries. It is not in vain that this singular emperor with painted cheeks had trained the Roman people to give a public cult to the Black Stone and forced the Senate to obey him. Having removed from Carthage the statue of Kylestus, which represented the moon, he celebrated with great pomp his nuptials with this black stone, which figured the sun. He created a senate of women, married successively four women, including A. Vestal, and seemed, from day to day, to change wives, marrying all the prostitutes of Rome, to whom he addressed speeches about the duties of their state. The Praetorians massacred Elagabalus and threw his body into the Tiber. He was eighteen and had reigned for four years. If it is not from history, it is at least a beautiful story, full of panagrulism. Without failing in its esoteric mission, it was certainly, under the alert pen, the warm and colorful style of Rabelais, enormously gained in flavor, in picturesque and in trickery. BL. 38. 1. Champagne. Cathedral de Nantes Tombeau de Francois I. La Prudence, 16 siècle. The bodyguards of Francis II, Duke of Brittany. 6. Before being elevated to the dignity of cardinal virtue, Prudence was for a long time an allegorical divinity to which the ancients gave a head with two faces, a formula that our statue reproduces most accurately and in the happiest way. Its anterior face offers the physiognomy of a young woman as pale as poor, and her posterior face that of a bearded old man who, from the back of his head, extends into the playful waves of a river's beard. Replica of Janus, son of Apollo and the nymph Creusa, this admirable figure yields to none of the other three neither in majesty, nor in interest. At the beginning, she is represented with the shoulders covered by a wide fabric cape, which, falling back on the back over the corsage of chevron waffle. A simple cloth protects the nape, formed into a head cover of a senile face, it comes to be tied at the front, thus freeing the neck adorned with a pearl necklace. The skirt, 
with large pleats, is held at the waist by a girdle with a large, aspect round, but of a character more nasal. Under her arm, she embraces the neck of a young goat, from which she seems to derive some pleasure in seeing her image, while her right hand keeps apart the branches of a dry point compass. Underneath, her body appears coiled upon itself, expires at her feet a serpent. El. 38. This noble figure is for us an evocative and suggestive personification of nature, simple, fertile, multiple and varied under the harmonious harmony, elegance and perfection of its forms that it has been able to sustain until its reflections. Speculum, which was always considered by classical authors as the hieroglyph of the universal matter, and particularly recognized among them as the sign of the substance proper to the magnum opus. Subject of songs, mirror of art draws synonyms hermetic that conceal from the vulgar the true name of the mineral secret. In this mirror, say the masters, man sees nature to discover. It is thanks to him that he can know the ancient truth in its realistic tradition. For nature does not remember her even in her heart. Man himself can never forget the image of the mirror which reflects the reflected image. And to show expressly that it is indeed our microcosm and a small world of wisdom, the sculptor fashioned the convex lens mirror, which possesses the property of reducing forms while preserving their respective proportions. The vindication appears, under the external veil of prudence, the mysterious image of old alchemy, and we are, like prudence, initiated into the secrets of the latter. Moreover, the symbolism of our science lies in the exposition of a formula comprising two terms, two essentially philosophical virtues, prudence and simplicity, prudencia and simplicitas, these are the favorite virtues of masters Basile Valentin and Senior Zadif. One of the woods of the treatise of the Azov represents, in effect, at the feet of Atlas, supporting the cosmic sphere, a bust of Janus. Prudencia, and a young child unraveling the alphabet, Simplicitas, Maiton di que la simplicité apprecient surtout à la nature, comme la première et la plus pure de ses appendages, l'homme, au contraire, semble de way des qualits groupies sous la denomination globale de prudence, provoyance, circumspection, intelligence, sagacit, experience, etc. And although all claim, to reach their perfection, the help of time, some being innate, others acquired, it would be possible to provide in this sense a plausible reason for the double mask of prudence. Truth, less abstract, seems more linked to the positivism of the alchemical attributes of our cardinal virtue. It is generally recommended to unite a healthy and vigorous old man with a young and beautiful virgin. From these chemical marriages, a metallic child must be born and receive the epithet of androgyne, because it holds the nature of both sexes, father and child of himself. For in this place lies a secret that we have not discovered among the best and most sincere authors. The operation, thus presented, appears simple and very natural. However, we found ourselves stopped for several years by the impossibility of obtaining anything more than a philosophical salt, hardly soluble and of no use. It is in the soul, more practiced and familiar with sublime operations, more manageable, leading to parallel results. When the wise speak of their androgyne, they understand under this term the compound of the artificially formed of sulfur and mercury, mixed in direct contact, or, following the consecrated chemical expression, simply combined. This thus indicates the pre-established possession of a sulfur and a mercury previously isolated or extracted, and not of a body generated directly by nature, at the result of the conjunction of the old man and the young virgin. In practical alchemy, what is least known is the beginning. Also, is this the reason why we seize all occasions that are offered to us to talk about the beginning, preferring lament and sin in Iquanure? These sufferings of the head attributed to Basile Valentin, when he said he who has the material will always have a pot to tan leather, and who has flour must not worry about being able to make bread. Now, elementary logic leads us to search for the begetters of sulfur and mercury, if we are eager to obtain, through their union, the philosophical androgyne, otherwise called rebus, compositum to compositus, mercury animated, etc., proper matter of the elixir. From these chemical parents of sulfur and mercury principles, one remains always the same, and it is the mother virgin who yields. In her turn, once her role is completed, she must give way to the younger than her. Thus, these two conjunctions will each engender a progeny of a different sex, the sulfur, of a dry and igneous complexion, and the mercury, of a temperamental lympathetic and melancholic nature. It is not what the authors want to teach us that in the essential that they want to get married twice without losing any of her virginity. Others express it more obscurely and are content to assure that the sun and the moon of the sky are not the stars of the philosophers. We must understand that the artist will never find the parents of the stone directly prepared in nature 
and that he must first form the hermetic sun and moon if he does not want to be deprived of the precious fruit of their alliance. We believe we have said enough on this subject. Few words suffice for the wise, and those who have long valued our opinions will not be called upon to hear us, because they cannot hear us, because it has been refused to us to speak more openly. Collapsed upon himself, his head reversed in the spasms of agony, the serpent, which we see figured at the foot of our statue, passes for one of the attributes of prudence. It is said to be of a very circumspect nature and not consensus pais, but it will die symbolically, represented dying, must be for the necessity of being represented because its inertia does not allow it to exercise such a faculty. It is therefore reasonable to think that the emblem has another meaning, very distinct from the one that affects him. In Hermeticism, its significance is analogous to that of the dragon, which the wise have adopted from the representatives of Mercury. Let us remember the honeyed one, the one from Notre Dame de Paris, those of the crucified serpent of Flamel, those of meditation, which come out of a human skull surmounted by a crucifix of divine, the serpent of Aesculapius, the Greek Ouroboros, serpent's key caught am devorovit, charged to trace the closed circuit of the little universe that is the work. Thus, the Ouroboros are devoured or die, from this to that, each time they are reborn, up to the moment they are struck with a wand, passing by the tempter Eve, killed posterity of the woman crushed the head, Genesis, 3, 15. All express the same idea, enclose the same doctrine, obey the same tradition, and the serpent, hieroglyph of the alchemical principle, can justify the assertion of the sages, who assure that everything they seek is contained in Mercury. It is indeed the true motor, the animator of the great work, because it starts it, maintains it, perfects it, completes it. This is the central mystical point around which the Mercury, embryo of the sulfur, performs its rotation, thus tracing the great physical sign of the sun, father of the light, the spirit and the gold, dispenser of all earthly goods. But, while the dragon represents the mercury stony and volatile, product of the superficial purification of the subject, the serpent, stripped of wings, remains the hieroglyph of the common mercury, extracted from the body of the magnesia or primary matter. This is the reason why certain allegorical statues of prudence have as a tribute the serpent fixed on a mirror, and this mineral mirror, provided by nature, becomes luminous in reflecting the light, that is to say by manifesting its vitality in the serpent, or mercury, which it had kept hidden under a thicker envelope. Thus, thanks to this active agent living and reviving, it becomes possible to restore life to the sulfur of dead metals. In performing the operation, the mercury, dissolving the metal, seizes the sulfur, animates it and dies in it, falling into its own proper corporeity. This is what the masters want to teach when they order to kill the living to resuscitate the dead, to animate the spirits and to reanimate the bodies. Possessing this living and active sulfur, one can philosophically mark his regeneration. It is said, the child of philosophy, in order to obtain, by the interpenetration of these living principles, the philosophical mercury or animated, matter of the philosophical stone, if one has biologically acquired the notions formerly treated above, and that one relates what is said here, the first two doors of the work will easily be open. In summary, he who has an extended and thorough knowledge of the experienced practitioner will notice that the main secret of the work lies in the art of dissolution. And as it is necessary to perform several of these operations, different in their nature, similar in their technique, there are as many secondary secrets, which, properly speaking, only form one. All art therefore comes down to dissolution. Everything depends on it and on the way it is executed. This is the secretum secretorum, the seal of the magisterium's hidden secret. It is alchemy solve that coagula, dissolve, the body, and coagulate, the spirit. And this is done in a single operation comprising two dissolutions, one violent, dangerous, unknown, the other easy, convenient, of common use in the laboratory. Having elsewhere described the first of these dissolutions and given it the allegorical name voila, laid details indispensables, nu ni reviendrons pa. But in order to specify its character, we will draw the attention of the laborious on what distinguishes it from the chemical operations included under the same term. This indication may not be useless. We have said, and we repeat, that the object of the philosophical dissolution is the obtaining of sulfur, which in the magisterium, plays the role of the formative in coagulating the mercury that is associated with it, a property that it holds from its ardent, igneous, and desiccating nature. Everything dry thirsts for moisture, says an old alchemical axiom. But this sulfur, from its first extraction, is never stripped of the mercury forming the core until it constitutes the central nucleus of the metal, called essence or semen. Hence, it results that the sulfur of the dissolved body is actually only the most pure and subtle portion of the body itself. Consequently, we are entitled to consider, 
with a plurality of masters, that the dissolution philosophique reella is the absolute purification of metals, imperfect in their nature. There is no example, physically, of an operation capable of yielding such a result. All the modern methods of treating metals serve only to remove the least tenacious superficial impurities. And these, of little importance, are either carried by the ore or are reduced from the mineral. They do not matter much. On the contrary, the alchemical process, dissociating and destroying the mass of heterogeneous fixations on the core, made of sulfur and mercury, removes the major part of the body and makes it refractory to any further reduction. Thus, it is by this example that a kilogram of excellent fair to suede, of the first category, furnishes a proportion of metallic radical, homogeneous and of pure perfection, varying between 7 grams 24 and 7 grams 32. This body, very brilliant, is endowed with a magnificent violet coloration, which is the color of fire, analogous to the intensity and to that of the iodine vapors, characteristic of isolated iron sulfide. We notice, for the sulfur of iron, isolated, these vapors of iodine, we remark that the incarnate red, the light blue, the violet that come from it, and its mercury are colored in their entirety. Subjected to a combined dissolution, the metal reveals itself in its entirety. Subject to the dissolution combination, the metal reveals itself deprived of impurities, compared to its volumetric, the abundant gold gives off a pale yellow hue, and has a phosphorescence, not having the high density. Already, as beautiful as that of gold, which in a simple chemical dissolution we have taught at the beginning of this book, detaches from the metal a minimal fraction of pure gold and the nitric acid which suffices to prove the possibility of a golden action, more energetic and certain than what one could expect. No one could underestimate the importance and preponderance of dissolution, both in alchemy and chemistry. It ranks first among laboratory operations, and it can be said that the majority of chemical works are subject to its dependence. In alchemy, the great work is comparable to a sequence of various solutions. It is therefore not surprising that the sequence of various solutions elicited the response that the spirit of Mercury gives to Brother Albertus in the dialogue from the Twelve Keys of Basil Valentine. How could the body come into being without the corpus and the spirit replies, by dissolution? No matter the employed route, wet or dry, it is absolutely indispensable. What is the melting, the solitary solution of a metal in its own proper water, if not dissolution? Likewise, the inception, as well as the obtaining of metallic alloys, are true chemical solutions of metals among themselves. Mercury, liquid at ordinary temperature, is nothing but a dissolved metal. All distillations, extractions, purifications require a previous solution and only take effect after the completion of this. And the reduction? Isn't it also the result of two successive solutions, the bodies and the reducers? If, in an initial solution of gold chloride, we immerse a zinc strip, in the second solution, the zinc engages immediately and the gold, reduced, precipitates in the state of amorphous powder. The calculation also demonstrates the necessity of a first solution, that of the precious or impure metal by lead, while the second, the fusion offers oxides to the miners, part of the first operation. As for special manipulations, specifically alchemical, imbibitions, digestions, maturation, circulations, putrefactions, etc., they all depend on a complete solution and represent so many different degrees of the same act of fire. But what distinguishes the philosophical solution from all others, and assures it at least a real originality, is that the solvent does not assimilate to the basic metal that is offered to it. It separates only the molecules, by the rupture of cohesion, seizes on the particles of pure sulfur that they can retain and leaves behind the residue. The major part of the body, inert, disaggregated, sterile and completely irreducible. Thus, one could not obtain with it the metallic soul, as one does with the help of chemical acids. The rest, Known since antiquity, the dissolving philosopher's stone has never been used in alchemy, nor has manual dexterity played a role in its usage. It requires a special skill that its use demands. It is he whom the sages allude to when they say that the work is done with a unique thing. Contrary to the chemists and spagurists, who have a collection of various acids, the alchemists have only one agent, which has received a multitude of names, the latest being that of the alkahest. Detailing the composition of liquors, simple or complex, qualified alkahests, would lead us too far, for the chemists of the 16th and 17th centuries each had their particular formula. Among the best artists who have long studied the mysterious observations of Jean-Baptiste van Helmont and of Paracelsus, we shall mention, Thomson, Epilogosme Chemisci, Leiden, 1673, Welling, Opera Cabalistica, Hamburg, 1735, Tachenius, Hippocrates Chymicus, Venice, 
1666, Digby, Secreta Medica, Frankfurt, 1676, Starkey, Pyrotechnia, Rouen, 1706, Vigany, Medulla Chemii, Danzig, 1682, Christian Lanius, Opera Omnia, Frankfurt, 1688, Langelot, Salamander, Vid, Tillyman, Hamburg, 1673, Helvigius, Introitus ad Physicum and Auditum, Hamburg, 1680, Frederick Hoffmann, Dachado ad Visito, Frankfurt, 1689, Baron Schroeder, Pharmacopoeia, Lyon, 1649, Blickard, Theatrum Chemicum, Leipzig, 1700, Kersetinus, Hermes Medicinalis, Paris, 1604, Begon, Elamon de Chimie, Paris, 1615, J. F. Henkel, Flora Saturnizens, Paris, 1760. Potter, title of the text, signal also an undissolved salt, assigned by its properties, would lead to believe in its alchemical reality, if we were not better informed of its true nature. The way our chemist describes it, the care he takes to keep his composition secret, the desired realization of qualities that he usually tries to define more, would tend to prove it. It remains for me to speak, says he, of a dissolvent, hitherto anonymous, which no author that I know of has clearly mentioned. It is a limpid, volatile, pure, oily, inflammable liquid like the spirit of wine, acid like good vinegar, and which passes in distillation in the form of flaky precipitates. This liquor, digested and cohabited with metals, especially when they have been calcined, dissolves almost all of them. It withdraws the gold from its ores, it dissolves them almost entirely, it leaves behind a resinous substance, and when one removes the dregs of the wine from it, which becomes turbid, it leaves a solution soluble in the spirit of wine, which acquires, in this way, a beautiful color of fire. The residue is completely irreducible, and I am sure that it could be used to distill a soul of gold. This dissolvent is indifferent and mixes equally well with aqueous or oily liquors. It colors itself as much as the indigo or the sea green which seems to be its first state. It is a liquor saturated with ammonia and at the same time greasy, and to speak frankly it is the true menstruum of Weidenfeld, or the spirit of philosophical wine, since it resolves the metallic matter into its first black and red, according to Raymond Lola. This is what made Henry Conrath give, in his amphitheatrum, the name Lenaria to his waterfire and say in Ofu, for it is certain that Junkin has erred when he believed the work of the dissolvent because it corresponds to what we call low forte when he says that the dissolvent which the sages use is a water of extreme bitterness and of an average volatility. These two products are very distinct, one from the other, and very proper to extract metals. The preparation of our dissolvent, although obscure and hidden, is nevertheless easy to do, but I must be discreet about this matter because, as I have only known it for a short time and am still working on it, there still remains a large number of experiments to ensure all its properties. Besides, without talking about the book of Secretus Adeptonum of Weidenfeld, Dickinson seems to have discovered this menstruum in his treatise of Chrysopia. Without contesting the prophet of Pot, no one would doubt the veracity of his description, or the existence of the stone which Weidenfeld calls by Kabbalistic terms, it is undeniable that the solvent spoken of by Pot is not that of the sages. Indeed, the chemical character of its reactions and the liquid state under which it presents itself, strongly suggest a dissolvent. That which is not brought into question are the qualities of a true universal dissolvent. It is a true mineral, of a dry and fibrous consistency, hard, of crystalline texture. It is therefore a salt, and not a liquid, nor a flowing mercury, but a stony salt, of which the alchemists say, sal petri, salt of stone, of which they say that it is hermetically sealed, the philosopher's stone, believed to be the product of the simultaneous sublimation of the sulfur and mercury chloride and ammonium chloride. And this is enough to discard the solvent of pot, as being too far removed from the metallic nature to be conveniently used in the work of the great work. Besides, if the author had presented the spirit of wine mentioned above, I am not sure he would have presented it as the dissolving universal if his particular liquor had been lacking. This principle indeed wants that, in the metals, by the metals, with the metals, the metals can be perfected. Everything that strays from this first truth immediately becomes suspicious for transmutation. In accordance with philosophical teaching and traditional doctrine, everything must first be dissolved, and this should not be done except with the aid of a solvent related to and very close to nature. The embalming sands, which harbor the embryos, or, the metallic agent, extracted from our magnesia on the subject, takes on the appearance of a metallic body, charged with metallic spirits, although to speak properly, 
It is not found in metal. This is what the adepts have engaged with the source of all vitality of metals, minerals, petrifications, and salts, among these denominations. The most familiar is certainly that of Saturn, considered as the Adam Metallicus. Also, we can better complete our instruction on this subject by turning to those who have specially treated this matter. Here is the translation of a very suggestive chapter by Daniel Mullius, dedicated to the study of Saturn, and which reproduces the teachings of two celebrated adepts, Isaac the Hollander and Theophrastus Paracelsus. No skilled hermetic despises Saturn raised to such a degree that it should be preferred to common gold, and it is called the true gold in the subject matter by the philosophers. We will transcribe at this point the approved testimony of the most remarkable philosophers. Isaac Hollandus writes in his vegetable work, Zaka, my son, that the philosopher's stone must be made by means of Saturn, and when it has been brought to perfection, it performs the projection both in the human body, externally as well as internally, as in metals. Zaka also that in the Saturn nerve curves, there is no greater sand current than in Saturn, where we find the concentration of gold than in Saturn where it is hidden. Saturn contains in its interior the true gold, which all the philosophers, on the condition that one removes all its superfluities, that is to say, the feces, and then it is purged, the outside is brought to the inside, the inside is led to the outside, and extreme dryness is achieved, and it manifests externally, and this is its roughness, and it is then the true gold. Saturn, moreover, easily enters into solution and coagulates, it lends itself well to this, thanks to letting its mercury be extracted. It can even be made sublime, at the point that it becomes the mercury of the sun. For Saturn contains so much mercury that it ought to be the mercury of the sun, and its mercury is as pure as that of gold. It is for these reasons that Saturn is, for our work, far preferable to gold, for if we want to extract the mercury from gold, it will take more than a year, whereas with Saturn, the task of extracting the mercury can be accomplished in 27 days. The two metals are good. But you can affirm with more certainty that Saturn is the stone that philosophers have so veiled and covered with their enigmatic language, and which has been, until now, hidden, for if its name were known, many would have found it, who now run after its search, and this art would have become common, vulgar, this work would become short and without great expense. Thus, the philosophers have enveloped its name with great care. Some have wrapped it in wonderful parables, saying that Saturn is the vessel in which nothing foreign should be mixed, except the one who comes from it of such a nature that it does not harm man, since it is life-giving, and provides assistance to the work, since it does not require great labor, and that little time is needed to obtain the light and, shortly after, the sun. Thus we find in Saturn everything that is necessary for the work. It has the perfect mercury, in it are all the colors of the world that can manifest, in it lies the true nourisher, the whitener, the redness, and in it also is the weight. I confide to you therefore that one can understand, after this, that Saturn is our philosophical stone and the Laeton, from which Mercury and our stone are extracted, in a short space of time and without great expense, by means of our brief art, and the stone that one receives is our Laeton, and the sharp water in it is our stone, and that is the pierre at low upon which philosophers have written mountains of books. Theophrastus Paracelsus, in the canon Sanchiam de Saturn, says, Saturn speaks thus of its nature, the six, metals, are joined to me and infuse their spirit in my fallen body, they added that they would not attribute to me their qualities. Males are afraid of the dissolution that I provide in my sharpness, but it is the true quality that consumes me by fire, in such a way that the metals, except the two, sun and moon, are purged by my water. My spirit is the water that softens all the congealed and sleeping bodies of my brothers, but my body conspires with the earth, so much that which it clings to this earth is made similar to it and is brought back into its own body, and I do not know anything in the world that can produce this as well as I can. Chemists must therefore abandon any other process and attach themselves to the resources that can be drawn from me. The stone, which is cold and moist, comes from the water, and by means of which we can coagulate the spirit of the seven metals in the essence of the sun or of the moon, and, by the grace of God, take advantage to the utmost of the three kingdoms we can prepare the menstruum of Saturn which dissolves immediately into the pearls. If the spirits of Saturn are melted in solution, its ashes are assembled en masse and coagulate into the animated oil. Then. By this means, all the metals and the gems can be dissolved in an instant, which the philosopher reserves for their eventual use. So immeasurable is what the philosopher reserves to the point that he deems it inconceivable. But I want to remain as obscure on this subject until I have clarified it. May 16. To complete the study of prudence and the symbolic attributes of our science, it remains for us to speak of the compass that the beautiful statue of Michel Colomb holds in its right hand. Let's do it briefly. 
Already, the mirror has taught us about the art. I shall reveal to you, about the necessary alliance of the subject with the chosen metal, the serpent, its fatal death and the glorious resurrection of the body resulting from this union. In turn, the compass will provide us with the additional indications that are those, of proportions. Without their knowledge, it would be impossible to lead and perfect the work with a regular and precise method. This is what the compass expresses, whose branches serve not only for the proportional measure of distances between them for comparison, but also for the geometric tracing perfect and in accordance with another hermetic cycle of the work. We have exposed, in another part of this work, what is meant by these terms of proportions or of weight, secret veiled in the form of the compass, and we have shown that they contained a double notion, that of the weight of matter and that of the weight of art. We are now addressing this as proportions natural and never mysterious, translated by this adage of Linthout, the virtue of sulfur extends only to a certain proportion of a term. On the contrary, the ratios between the weights of art, always subject to the will of the artist, are expressed by I avoid the dust, composite, la pandus corporis est simplex et silicet de lo pluriel. But, as philosophers teach that mercury is capable of absorbing up to 10 and 12 times its weight of mercury, the need for additional operations, which authors care about only moderately, the imbibitions and the repetitions. We will proceed in the same way and will omit these details from practice to the beginner's own sagacity, because they are of easy execution and of secondary research. The bodyguards of Francis II, Duke of Brittany. 7. In the Nantes Cathedral, at dusk, little by little, darkness, the shadow invades the ogival vaults, like the emptiness, emptying the petrified majesty of the majestic edifice. Beside us, the columns, powerful and stark, rise towards the entangled arches. The cross ribbing touches the grave's monolithic grandeur now accessible to our eyes. A clock chimes. A distant echo now answers the evening call, and the high stained glass windows respond to the half voiced prayer of the tranquil flames of the candles that prick bursts of gold from the darkness of the sanctuary. Then, the service concluded, a sepulchral silence weighs on all these cold stones, witnesses of a distant past, heavy with mystery and the unknown. The four stone guardians, in their frozen posture, seem to emerge, imprecise and blurry, from the heart of this penumbra. Sentinels of the ancient tradition, these symbolic women, watchful, at the angles of the empty space, their rigid, marble-like images, of vanity dispersed, muffled thoughts, heavy and leading to reflection. O oh, vanity of earthly things, fragility and richness of human thoughts, what is present from those of whom you should commemorate the grandeur, a cenotaph, less still, a pretext of art, a support of science, a masterpiece deprived of utility and of destination, a simple historical souvenir, but whose philosophical and moral teaching far exceeds the banality of its first affectation. And, above these noble figures the four cardinal virtues, embodying the four knowledges of the eternal wisdom, the words of Solomon, Prov. 3, 13-19, come naturally to mind. Happy the man who has found wisdom, happy he who prospers in intelligence. For the trade that can be made of it is better than that of silver, and the profit one can derive from it is better than gold. She is more precious than pearls, and all your desirable things are not comparable to her. Long days are in her right hand and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are filled with prosperity. She is a tree of life for those who embrace her, and happy are all those who serve her. The Eternal has founded the earth by wisdom and arranged the heavens by intelligence. The sundial of Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh. This is indeed a building of extreme singularity. Let us remind ourselves, we do not find an analogous image there. The original work is so strongly characterized. It is rather a crystal erected, one original element on a support, than a true monument, and this giant sample elevated on its pedestal, a veritable example cut in the middle of a mineralogy museum rather than in the middle of a park where the public is not allowed to enter. Executed in 1633, on the order of Charles I, by John Milne, his master mason, with the collaboration of John Barton, it is composed mainly of an upright block geometrically cut and carved in relief, with faces crisscrossed with hemispheres and cavities with rectilinear walls, which is supported by a pedestal erected on a pentagonal base formed of three flat steps. This base alone, having suffered from the weather, was said to need restoration, such as the sundial of the Holyrood Palace, P.L. 39, Antiquity, which can always be consulted with benefit, has left us a certain number of sundials with varied forms, found in the ruins of Castelnuovo, Pompeii, Tusculum, etc. Others are known to us through the descriptions of scientific writers, particularly one in particular. This is how the dial called Hemicyclium, attributed to Barassus, 
around 280 BC, comprised a semicircular surface on which a style marked the hours, days, and even months. The one called Scaffi was made from a hollow block, equipped in the center with a gnomon whose shadow was projected on the walls. It would have been made by Aristarchus of Samos, 3rd century BC, as well as the dial discus, made of a round table, slightly raised at the edges. Among the unknown forms that have come down to us, for the most part, only the names are cited. We mentioned, Arachne, which had hours etched, they say, on a spider's web made of thin threads, giving it an arranged segmentation. This invention would be due to Eutyxus of Nidus, around 330 BC, Plinthium, a horizontal disc traced on a square column base, would have for author Scopus of Syracuse, Pelicino, a sundial also cut horizontal, dial of Patrocles, Conum, conic system of Dionysdorus of Amesis, etc. None of these forms or their relationships correspond to the curious edifice of Edinburgh. No one can serve as a prototype. However, its denomination, which justifies its double etymology, is entirely accurate. It is at the same time a multiple sundial and a true hermetic hourglass. Thus, this strange icosahedron represents a complete work of double mnemonics. The Greek word gnomon, which was transmitted to the Latin and French languages, gnomon, possesses another sense when it refers to the shadow casting style, the progression of the shadow on a surface, the march of the sun. It designates the one who takes knowledge, who educates themselves. It defines the prudent, the sensible, the enlightened. This word has its root in gignasco, which is also written nosco, a double orthographic form whose sense is to know, understand, think, resolve. From this comes gamma nu sigma iota sigma, knowledge, erudition, doctrine, from which, our French word gnosis, the doctrine of the Gnostics and philosophy of the Magi, comes. It is known that Gnosis was the ensemble of sacred knowledge that the Magi kept carefully secret and which made, for the initiates only, the object of esoteric teaching. But the Greek root from which Gnomon and Gnosis also formed Nomi, corresponding to the Latin Gnomon, with the meaning of spirit, intelligence. Now, the Gnomes, sprites preordained to the guarding of mineral treasures, watching tirelessly over the gold and silver mines, the deposits of precious stones, appear as symbolic representations, humanized figures of the vital metallic spirit and of material activity. Tradition depicts them as being very ugly and of very small stature. On the contrary, their nature is sweet, their character beneficent, and their connection to the elemental forces obvious. They are easily understood as the hidden reason for legendary stories where a gnome always guards the great gates of terrestrial riches. None of these forms or their relationships correspond to the curious edifice of Edinburgh. No one can serve as a prototype. However, its denomination, which justifies its double etymology, is entirely accurate. It is at the same time a multiple sundial and a true hermetic hourglass. Thus, this strange icosahedron represents a complete work of double mnemonics. The Greek word gnomon, which was transmitted to the Latin and French languages, gnomon, possesses another sense when it refers to the shadow casting style, the progression of the shadow on a surface, the march of the sun. It designates the one who takes knowledge, who educates themselves. It defines the prudent, the sensible, the enlightened. This word has its root in gignasco, which is also written nosco, a double orthographic form whose sense is to know, understand, think, resolve. From this comes gamma nu sigma iota sigma, knowledge, erudition, doctrine, from which our French word gnosis, the doctrine of the Gnostics and philosophy of the Magi, comes. It is known that Gnosis was the ensemble of sacred knowledge that the Magi kept carefully secret and which made, for the initiates only, the object of esoteric teaching. But the Greek root from which Gnomon and Gnosis also formed Nomi, corresponding to the Latin Gnomon, with the meaning of spirit, intelligence. Now, the Gnomes, sprites preordained to the guarding of mineral treasures, watching tirelessly over the gold and silver mines, the deposits of precious stones, appear as symbolic representations, humanized figures of the vital metallic spirit and of material activity. Tradition depicts them as being very ugly and of very small stature. On the contrary, their nature is sweet, their character beneficent, and their connection to the elemental forces obvious. They are easily understood as the hidden reason for legendary stories where a gnome always guards the great gates of terrestrial riches. Do we think that we can find in the special symbol the proof of a fait accompli, that on several faces of the solid, the emblem of the thistle is repeated with significant insistence? Indeed, there are, in effect, six floral capitula and two flowering spikes of the species called serrated urbensis. Can we not recognize, in the clear preponderance of the symbol, with the particular insignia of the Knights of the Thistle Order, 
the affirmation of a secret meaning imposed on the work and constrained by them? Besides, did Edinburgh possess, next to this royal order whose hieroglyphic esotericism leaves no doubt, a center of hermetic initiation under its dependence? We would not, dare affirm it. However, about 30 years before the construction of the sundial, 14 after the official suppression of the order, now a secret brotherhood, we see appear, in the immediate surroundings of Edinburgh, one of the most learned adepts and most fervent proponents of alchemical truth, Seton, celebrated under the pseudonym of the Cosmopolite. During the summer of the year 1601, writes Louis Figuier, a Dutch pilot, named Jacques Housen, was assailed by a storm in the North Sea and cast upon the coast of Scotland, not far from Edinburgh, at a short distance from the village of Seton or Seatown. The shipwreck were helped by an inhabitant of the area who had a house and some lands on the shore. He managed to save several of these unfortunate people, welcomed the pilot into his house, and provided him with the means to return to Holland. This man was named Sethon or Sethonia Scotus. The English Camden, in his Britannia, indeed, very close to the place where the pilot Housen was shipwrecked, mentions a dwelling he calls Sethon House and tells us it was the residence of the Earl of Winton. It is therefore likely that our adept belonged to this noble Scottish family, which would provide an argument of certain value to the hypothesis of possible connections between Sethon and the Knights of the Thistle Order. Perhaps the man had shaped himself in the place where we see him practicing these works of mercy and high morality, which characterize the elevated souls and true philosophers. Whatever the case may be, this fact marks the beginning of a new existence, dedicated to the Hermetic Apostolate, a wandering existence, moved by passionate, bright, sometimes full of vicissitudes, lived entirely abroad, and that martyrdom was tragically to crown two years later, December 1603 or January 1604. It seems therefore that the cosmopolite, uniquely preoccupied with his mission, never returned to his country of origin and that he left it in 1601, after having acquired the perfect mastery of the art. These are the reasons, or rather these conjectures, which have led us to bring the Knights of the Thistle of the famous alchemist closer together, by invoking the hermetic witness of the sundial of Edinburgh. In our opinion, the Scottish solar dial is a replica, more concise and more scholarly, of the ancient Smaragdine table. It was composed of two green marble columns, according to some, or of an artificial emerald plaque, according to others, on which the solar work was engraved in Kabbalistic terms. The tradition attributes it to the father of philosophers, Hermes Trismegistus, who claims the authorship, although his very obscure personality does not allow us to know whether the man belongs to myth or to history. Some claim that this testimony of the sacred science, primitively written in Greek, was discovered after the deluge in a rocky grotto of the Hebron Valley. This detail, even lacking authenticity, helps us better understand the secret meaning of this famous table, which may well have never existed anywhere but in the imagination, subtle and mischievous, of the old masters. We are told that it is green, like the dew of spring, called for that reason emerald of the philosophers. First analogy with the saline matter of the wise, it was written by Hermes, second analogy, since this matter bears the name of Mercury, Roman divinity corresponding to the Hermes of the Greeks. Finally, third analogy, this green mercury serves as a primer for the three works, on which is qualified as triple, hence the epithet Trismegistus, tau rho iota sigma mu gamma iota sigma tau omicron sigma, three times great or sublime, added to the name of Hermes. Thus, the emerald table takes on the character of a pronounced discourse by the mercury of the wise on the manner in which the great work is elaborated. The philosophical work, it is not Hermes, the Egyptian Thoth, who speaks, but indeed the emerald of the philosophers or the Esiac table itself. The generative idea of the Edinburgh dial reflects a similar preoccupation. However, besides limiting its teaching to the sole alchemical practice, it is no longer the matter, in its qualities and in its nature, that it expresses, but only its form or structure, physical. It is a crystalline edifice whose chemical composition remains unknown. Its geometric configuration only allows us to recognize the mineralogical characteristics of saline bodies in general. It teaches us that mercury is a salt, which we already knew, and that this salt derives its origin from the mineral kingdom. This is also what Clavius, the cosmopolite, Limojon of Saint Didier, Basile Valentin, Hugnius a Barma, Batsturf, etc., affirm and repeat to envy when they teach that the salt of metals is the philosopher's stone. We can, therefore, reasonably regard this solar dial as a monument raised to the philosophical vitriol, the initial and first being of the philosopher's stone. Yet, all metals are but salts, which their texture proves and which demonstrates the ease with which they form crystallized compounds. In the fire, these salts melt in their crystallization water and take on the appearance of oil. 
our vitriol obeys the same law, and, as it leads to the artist enough happy fortune to discover and prepare it, it is also received from our predecessors the name of victory oil. Others, considering its color, and always with a design to deceive, have named it green oil, viridiolium, which marks its glassy aspect, its fluidity oily to fire and its coloration all green, viridis. It's this frank coloration that allowed him to give to the profane his true nature. It has been endowed, we are told, with new names, with the names of trees, leaves, herbs, of all that presence a green coloration, to deceive the senseless. The metallic compositions giving green salts have contributed in a large measure to the extension of this nomenclature. Moreover, philosophers, by perfecting order, have preferred to designate green things as hermetic qualifiers, to undoubtedly recall the importance that this color takes in alchemy. The green mackerel, for example, or small mercury, which has become our mackerel, still serves as a disguise, on the first day of April, the personality of the sender. It is a mystical fish, an object of mystifications. It owes its name and its reputation to its brilliant green coloration, streaked with black bands, similar to the mercury of the wise. Bescarel points out that in the year 1430 the mackerel was the only fish of mercury that came up to Paris, where, following a very ancient custom, one appreciated it with onions, stone one. Why do cuttlefishes have the name they bear? Simply because they are grouped in clusters like grapes. Our green mercury, agent of putrefaction and regeneration, made called the cuttlefish sigma eta pi alpha sigma, in the primitive language, the root of this word is suppo, which means to putrefy, to reduce in rottenness. Thanks to its green eggs, the cuttlefish carries a cabalistic name, just as the Saturnia of the pear tree, Saturnia pyri, the great emerald butterfly. The Greek alchemists were accustomed, in their formulas, to derive the hermetic dissolvent by the indication of its color. They assembled, to realize their symbol, two consonants of the word chi alpha rho omicron sigma in English charos, green, the x and the p juxtaposed. Now, this typical figure represents exactly the Greek monogram of Christ, extracted from his name chi rho iota sigma tau omicron sigma in English Christos. Should we see, in this similarity, the effect of a simple coincidence, or that of a reasoned will? Mercury philosophically arises from a pure substance. Jesus is born from a mother without stain. The son of man and the child of Hermes both lead the life of pilgrims, both die prematurely, as martyrs, one on the cross, the other in the crucible. They both resurrect in the same way, one on the cross, the other from the crucible. And the other, the third day. These are indeed curious correspondences, but we cannot assert that the Greek Hermetists knew them or that they used them. Would the audacity to the point of temerity that characterizes esotericism drive us to draw a parallel with such a practice of the Christian religion, which used to occur in May? On that day, in many cities, the clergy would go in procession, the green procession, through bushes and flowering branches, the greenery that decorated the churches, those in particular which were placed under the invocation of Our Lady. These processions have been abandoned today. Only the use of May branches, which comes from it, has been preserved and continues to this day in our villages. Symbolists will discover without difficulty the reason for these obscure rites, if they remember that Maya was the mother of Hermes. Furthermore, it is known that the Dew of May, or the Emerald of Philosophers, is green, and that, as the adept Siliani declares, metaphorically, this indispensable vehicle for the work. So, do we not insinuate that it must be gathered, following the example of certain spagyric practitioners and characters from the Mutus Liber, the nocturnal dew of the month of Mary, attributing to it qualities that we know it to be devoid of. The dew of the wise is a salt, not a water, but it is the particular coloration of this water that serves to designate our subject. Among the ancient Hindus, the philosophical matter was symbolized by the goddess Mudivi, Madeos, humidity, putrefaction, root, moto, to putrefy. Born, it is said, from the sea of milk, she was depicted painted green, mounted on a donkey, and carrying in hand a banner in the middle of which was seen a crow. On the other hand, it seems that hardness pushed to the point of temerity could be attributed to the hermetic solvent through the indication of its color. They assembled, in order to realize their symbol, two consonants of the word chi alpha rho omicron sigma, charos, meaning green, the x and the p juxtaposed. Now, this typical figure represents exactly the Greek monogram of Christ, extracted from his name chi rho iota sigma tau omicron sigma, Christos, should we see, in this similarity, the effect of a simple coincidence, or that of a reasoned will? Mercury is born of a pure substance, Jesus from a mother without stain, 
the son of man and the child of Hermes both lead the life of pilgrims, both die prematurely, in martyrdom, one on the cross, the other in the crucible, they both resurrect likewise, one and the other, the third day. These are curious correspondences, certainly, but we cannot affirm that the Greek Hermetists knew them or that they used them, Hermes too, no doubt, the origin of this green wolf festival, a popular rejoicing whose practice has long been maintained in Jamiges, and which was celebrated on June 24, day of solar exaltation, in honor of St. Ostrobertha. A legend tells us that the saint used to bleach the linen of the famous abbey, where a donkey carried it. One day, the wolf strangled the donkey. St. Ostrobertha condemned the guilty party to perform the service of its victim, and the wolf acquitted itself wonderfully until its death. It is the memory of this legend that perpetuates the festival. However, we are not given the reason why the green color was attributed to the wolf. But we can say, very certainly, that it is by strangling and devouring the donkey that the wolf becomes green, and that is enough. The hungry and ravenous wolf is the agent indicated by Basile Valentine in the first of his twelve keys. This wolf, Lycos, is first gray and does not let it be suspected of carrying the ardent fire. The bright light it keeps hidden in its corpulent body. Its encounter with the donkey makes this light evident. Like, the first glow of dawn, the aurora, the gray wolf has turned into a light, thus our secret fire is the green wolf, and that's when our secret fire, the newborn Apollo, the father of light, takes on the green tint. Since we gather here all that can help the investigator to discover the mysterious agent of the great work, we will also mention the legend of the green candles. This one is related to the famous, black virgin of Marseille, Notre Dame de Confession, which the crypts of the old abbey of saint Victor shelter. This legend contains, behind the allegorical veil, the description of the work that the alchemist must perform to extract from the crude mineral, the living and luminous spirit, the secret fire it contains, in the form of a translucent, green, fusible crystal-like wax, which the sages call their vitriol. Here is this naive and precious hermetic tradition. A young girl from ancient Massilia, named Mart, a simple little worker and long-time orphan, had devoted herself to a particular cult of the Black Virgin of the Crypts. She offered her all the flowers she could pick on the hillsides, thyme, sage, lavender, rosemary, and never missed, no matter how long it took, attending the daily mass. On the eve of Candlemas, the Feast of the Purification, Mart was awakened in the middle of the night by a secret voice inviting her to attend the morning service. Fearing to have overslept more than usual, she hastily dressed, went out, and as if by magic, spreading her mantle on the ground, reflecting a certain clarity, thought it was the upcoming dawn. She quickly reached the threshold of the monastery, whose door was found open. There, meeting a cleric, she asked him to kindly say a mass in her name, but, lacking money, she slipped a modest gold ring, her only fortune, on her finger and placed it, as an offering, under the chandelier. As soon as mass began, what was not the surprise of the young girl to see the white wax of the candles turn green, of a celestial, unknown green, more diaphanous and more brilliant than the most beautiful emeralds or the rarest malachites. She could neither believe nor detach her eyes. When the Ite Misa Est finally came to pull her from the ecstasy of this prodigy, when she found outside, the sense of familiar realities, she realized that the night was not yet finished. The first hour of the day was sounding only at the belfry of San Victor. Not knowing what to make of the adventure, she returned home, the, they came back to the abbey the next morning. There was already, in the same place, a large crowd of people. Anxious and troubled, she inquired. One informed her that no mass had been said since the previous day. Martha, who risked being punished for missing it, decided to wait for the miracle which she had come to attend, a few hours earlier, and the faithful, in droves, followed her to the cave. The orphan had spoken the truth, the bag was still in the same place, under the chandelier, and the candles were still shining, on the altar, with their incomparable green light. In his notice on the old abbey of San Victor in Marseille, Father Loren speaks of the custom, observed by the people, of carrying green candles to the processions of the Black Virgin. These candles are blessed on February 2nd, the day of purification, also known as the Feast of Candlemas. The author adds that the candles of Candlemas must be green, without giving a reason for this color. Documents indicate that these green candles were used in other places, in the Monastery of the Religious of Saint Savour, in Marseille, in 1479, then in the metropolis of saint Savour in Aix-en-Provence, until 1620. Elsewhere, this custom has been lost, while it has been preserved at saint Victor. Regarding the hieroglyphic monograms of the order, the respective monograms of Charles I, beheaded in 1649, and his wife, Marie-Henriette of France. 
the letter C.R., Carolus Rex, apply to the former, M.R., Maria Regina, designate the second. Their son, Charles II, born in 1630, was three years old when the monument was erected, is characterized by the crystal's faces with the initial C.P., Carolus Primkeps, surmounted by a prince's coronet, like those of his father. There, next to the arms of England and the harp of Ireland, five roses and as many thistles, detached and independent, emblems of strength and challenge, of which only he held the threads, woven of gold, and of silver, which once adorned the helmets of knights. Finally, other symbols, which we have analyzed during our studies, complete this hermetic part of the curious edifice. The crowned lion holding the key and the uraeus snake, the spread eagle, St. George slaying the dragon and offering the instrument of his martyrdom, the cross X, the twin rose bushes of Nicolas Flamel, neighboring the Saint-Jacques shell and the we will now direct our visits to the old philosophical dwellings. Indeed, it would not be difficult to multiply these studies, because the examples of hermetic symbolic decorations abound in our ancient constructions that are still numerous today. We have preferred to limit our teaching to the emblems that are most typical and best characterized. But before taking leave of our reader, and thanking them for their kind attention, we will take one last look at the ensemble of the secret science, and, just as the old man, evoking his cherished memories, lingers over the salient hours of the past, we too hope to discover, in this retrospective examination, precious teachings from the genuine son of the hospital, the object of the essential concerns of the true son of Hermes. This important point, where the elements and principles of the highest knowledge are concentrated, could not be sought nor found in life, since life is around us, familiar and it suffices to know how to observe to seize its varied manifestations. It is in depth that we can recognize it, in this domain of pure spirituality, the soul, freed from its ties, takes refuge at the end of its terrestrial journey. It is in the child, who, containing everything, where all presence reigns in the absence, that it is fitting to find the causes that life shows us through multiple effects. Also, is it not at the moment when corporeal inertia is declared, at the hour when nature ends her labor, that wisdom begins to weave its links? Let us therefore bend over the abyss, let us scrutinize its depth, let us dig into the darkness that fills it, and nothingness will teach us. Birth teaches us little, but death, from which life springs, can reveal everything to us. She alone holds the keys to the laboratory of nature. She alone delivers the spirit, imprisoned in the center of the material body. Shadow dispensing light, sanctuary of truth, inviolable asylum of wisdom, she jealously hides and steals her treasures from timid mortals, from the incredulous, from skeptics, from all those who do not know her or who dare not tackle her. For the philosopher, death is simply the pivot that joins the material plane to the divine plane. It is the terrestrial door open to the sky, the bond of union between nature and divinity. It is the chain that links our active earthly existence with the grand future. And if human evolution, in its physical activity, can give us a glimpse of the past and present, it is only to death that the future belongs. Consequently, far from inspiring the sage with a feeling of horror, death should, on the contrary, lift his soul to the heights of serenity and hope. Far from being an object of repulsion, death, an instrument of salvation, appears to us as necessary and useful. And if we are not allowed to shorten the time set by our own destiny, we at least have the eternal permission from the provoker of serious matters, submitted to the orders of God, to the will of man, to summon it. Thus, we understand why philosophers insist so much on the absolute necessity of material death. It is through it that the spirit, ever imperishable and always acting, brews, sifts, separates, cleanses, and purifies the body. It is from death that it holds the possibility of gathering the fragmented parts, of constructing with them a new lodge, of finally transmitting to the regenerated form an energy that it does not possess. Considered from the point of view of its chemical action on the substances of the three kingdoms, death is distinctly characterized by dissolution, profound, deep, and total dissolution of the body. This is why dissolution, called death by the old authors, asserts itself as the first and most important of the operations of the work, the one that the artist must strive to accomplish before all others. He who will discover the artifice of the true dissolution will see the purification operation accomplished, will have in his power the greatest secret of the world. It will also provide a sure means of accessing sublime knowledge. This is the important point, this pivot of the art, according to the very expression of Philolethes, that we wanted to signal to men of good faith, to benevolent and disinterested researchers. Now, by the fact that they are destined to final dissolution, all beings must draw a similar benefit from it. Our globe itself cannot escape this inexorable law. It has its appointed time, as we have ours. The duration of its evolution is ordered, prearranged, 
and strictly limited. The reason demonstrates it, common sense perceives it, analogy teaches it, scripture certifies it. In the noise of a frightful tempest, the sky and the earth will pass away. For a time, half a time, and half of a half time, death will extend its domination over the ruins of the world, over the vestiges of annihilated civilizations. And our earth, after the convulsions of a long agony, will resume the confused state of the original chaos, but the Spirit of God will hover over the waters. And all things will be covered with darkness and plunged into the profound silence of sepulchres.